getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime will take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. I'm Whit Johnson, reporting from Maui. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We're back with the search for two suspected vandals in Nevada. The two men are wanted for toppling ancient boulders at Lake Mead National Recreation Area. The natural rock formations at the Redstone Dunes Trail are protected and started forming when the dinosaurs roamed the Earth. They started forming about 140 million years ago. The damage is unfortunately permanent, and uh, people won't be able to enjoy that particular location as much as they might have before. Those men could face felony charges, including fines and even possible jail time. In Wisconsin, a community is coming together in the search for a woman police say was murdered after going on a first date. Here's ABC's Derek Dennis. This morning, family and friends of 19-year-old Shade Robinson of Milwaukee want closure. I think everybody's just overwhelmed. Robinson's cousin among those searching, saying she's too exhausted to go on camera. They're searching a local park for more of her remains after someone found a severed leg linked to Robinson through DNA evidence. People want to get on the water because obviously he she might be in the water and we don't have the resources. Police say Robinson was last seen on April 1st when she was on a first date with this man, 33-year-old Maxwell Anderson, who's now charged with homicide, mutilation, and arson in Robinson's death. She was gorgeous and her smile could like brighten anyone's day and she just had that personality where she could cheer you up. Anderson is held on $5 million bond. Authorities asked about potential ties to other missing women cases in the area said there's no evidence of any other victims. For now, Shade Robinson's loved ones just want to find her. Our family needs peace and we need closure so I don't want to stop. Milwaukee police also found human remains at three other locations, but an ID is still pending. Rhiannon, Andrew. Really sad story, Derek. Thank you. Coming up, what the lawyer handling O.J. Simpson's will is now revealing. Also ahead, a slam dunk for Caitlin Clark on SNL. Why tonight's WNBA draft will be unlike any other. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. The strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, Legends of the Game, but now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, Reclaim the Forgotten League, a side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. Every Friday, the hottest trends, styles, and must-have. It's time to buy the right stuff and save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime will take you there. 
Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. We're back with a spectacular crash. This car launching into a home near Riverside, California. The driver suffered only minor injuries. He was apparently trying to make a turn, but was going too fast. Now to the brewing showdown over O.J. Simpson's estate. Simpson was acquitted in his criminal trial, but he was later found liable in a civil suit for the killing of his ex-wife and her friend Ron Goldman. Simpson was ordered to pay $33 million to their families, but paid only a fraction of those damages. Simpson's lawyer tells Good Morning America the estate needs to take care of other things first, including Simpson's IRS debt. Mr. Simpson has IRS debt. There's IRS debt that's going to be out there. Don't want to go into any more about it, but it's substantial. And then a host of other creditors, anyone. There's going to be a notice to creditors. So that's a part of the process. Those judgments that you talk about, they're just not on my radar. Simpson had his NFL pension and his actors union residuals. He reportedly made about $400,000 a year. All right, now to the excitement building for tonight's historic draft. Not the NFL's, the WNBA's. We're just hours away from one of the most anticipated drafts in sports history. Caitlin Clark, all but certain to be the number one overall pick. You make a lot of jokes about women's sports, don't you, Michael? On Saturday Night Live, she scolded Weekend Update host Michael Che for roasting the WNBA's popularity and forced him to read jokes she had written. The Indiana Fever have the first pick in this Monday's draft. A reminder that Indiana Fever is a WNBA team and not what Michael Che gave to dozens of women at Purdue University. Back in December, the Fever won the lottery to choose first and hit the jackpot. Clark's expected arrival sent ticket prices through the roof, more than doubling. And now most of their games will be on national TV. In terms of attention, we've never, ever, ever seen anything like this. Clark, along with South Carolina center Camilla Cardozo and UCLA guard Kiki Rice are profiled in an upcoming ESPN docuseries. This moment showing Clark's competitive spirit when she was a girl learning to ride a bike. So I like got out my pink bike and I'm like, Mom, take my training wheels off. Let's go. You know, Blake's learned to ride. Katie's given it a shot and she's doing quite well. Another top contender in tonight's draft, Angel Reese. Despite the LSU forward stardom, analysts do not expect her to be chosen in the top five due to worries about whether she can be effective in the pros. What is for certain, these players are driving historic interest in women's hoops. The national title game scored bigger TV ratings than the men's. Clark, oh my! And tonight's draft will be the first in nearly a decade with a live audience. Even SNL's Michael Che will acknowledge it's a slam dunk for the sport. Thank you. Uh, I can't wait to give this to my girlfriend. You don't have a girlfriend, Michael. <laughs> All right. And you can watch the draft tonight on ESPN at 7.30 Eastern. Should be good. Coming up, former President Trump's trial in New York, how it's affecting Robert De Niro's wardrobe. Plus, why an octopus may not be the best idea for a pet, one family's horror story. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. 
I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from the 2024 campaign trail, I'm Rachel Scott in Des Moines, Iowa. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse, and we begin with Robert De Niro's pants disrupting security at former President Trump's trial. De Niro is shooting a Netflix series near that courthouse in Manhattan, and the Secret Service required his wardrobe truck be relocated for their security detail at the courthouse. Security is tight in New York. Experts say Trump's route from his penthouse to the courthouse will likely change every day as a result. All right, next, Scotty Scheffler's life is changing in monumental ways. The 27-year-old just won his second green jacket at the Masters, becoming the fourth youngest player ever to have two jackets. His wife wasn't there to see it. She's pregnant with her first child. Scheffler says after the baby arrives, golf will move down his list of priorities. Meanwhile, Tiger Woods had a Masters to forget, finishing with the highest score among those who played all four rounds. Next, Girl Power is fueling a brilliant group of amateur engineers in North Carolina. The all-girls robotics team is headed to the World Championship in Texas. The 12 teens call themselves G-Force Robotics. They built a robot. It's named Hellcat. It can respond intelligently to remote commands. And the girls have big dreams for their future. I plan on going into game design. My plan B is going to the Naval Academy to hopefully become a pilot. But I do still want to keep up with robotics and hopefully do maybe battle bots in the future. Their coach says robotics also helps build leadership skills. Next, a pet saga playing out on TikTok. Oh, it got as many twists and turns as an octopus has legs, or are they arms? Nine-year-old Cal had a lifelong dream realized when his dad bought him a pet octopus that they named Terrence. But then Terrence had 50 babies. Dad now has spent thousands of dollars on tanks, water filters, and yes, food. His advice, don't get a pet octopus unless you're ready to lose sleep and also your kid's college fund as well. Ooh, scary <laughs> stuff there. The top headlines next. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Checking more top stories now. Jury selection begins today in former President Trump's historic hush money trial. He has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to cover up a sex scandal before the 2016 election. Twelve jurors and six alternates need to be selected from hundreds of Manhattan residents. White House is urging restraint as Israel decides how to respond to Iran's unprecedented attacks. Most of the missiles and drones were shot down with U.S. help. 
Oil prices, meanwhile, were flat overnight, a sign the markets may be shrugging off the attack. Australia is observing a day of mourning after a stabbing rampage at a mall near Sydney left six victims dead. Police believe the attacker, who had mental health issues, may have targeted women. In Arizona, hundreds rallied for abortion rights days after the state Supreme Court reinstated a law effectively banning abortion. The decision is on hold for at least one more week. Today's weather, severe storms in parts of North Carolina and Virginia and in the plains from Kansas to Omaha. Damaging winds from Oklahoma City into Texas. And finally, the Boston Marathon runners ready to hit the road. They include one man who has run a marathon in all 50 states. Every runner set to line up behind this starting line today has a story. 60-year-old Scott Klein's journey to today's race started 37 years ago when he was 25. I ran with two friends of mine from law school in 1987, really on a lark. But then he spent 25 years running a very different race, practicing law and raising three children with his wife, Michelle, until he turned 50 and dusted off those running shoes. And that led to a kind of strange and amazing odyssey to run a marathon in every state. From Alaska to North Dakota, Alabama to Vermont, telling D Magazine that he even finished the marathon in Maui with a broken bone in his foot. I am not particularly gifted or fast, but I would say that I'm pretty persevering. And ahead of today's race in Boston, he's sharing this message. If you have the opportunity to get off the couch and walk a little bit and then run a little bit, just keep going. Also keeping the spirit going, dozens of golden retrievers brought together on Boston Common over the weekend. Their owners held a meetup to honor the memory of Spencer, the official Boston Marathon dog. Spencer became an iconic symbol of the Boston Marathon after holding a Boston strong flag along the marathon route for nine years. After multiple bouts with cancer, Spencer died last February at the age of 13. Sunday's meetup was a way for these Golden Retriever owners to take a stand against canine cancer. They're Golden Strong! Golden Strong, a big congrats and good luck to all the runners. Today. That's just making news in America this morning. Right now on America This Morning, Trump goes on trial. For the first time, a former U.S. president will stand trial on criminal charges. What to expect today in court as Trump's hush money trial begins and what we're learning about his lawyer's strategy. Happening now, Israel considers whether to retaliate for this weekend's historic attack by Iran, launching hundreds of missiles and drones directly into Israel. President Biden's message to Prime Minister Netanyahu, what officials are saying about U.S. involvement in any potential counterattack. Developing overnight, the mysterious disappearance of two mothers in Oklahoma. Four suspects arrested, and now word that two bodies have been recovered in the area. Plus, what the lawyer handling O.J. Simpson's will is now revealing about Simpson's death. Caught on camera, the men seen damaging a protected rock formation in the West, the charges they could face. Caitlin Clark's big night, why tonight's WNBA draft will be like none before. And later, meet the all-girls high school robotics team, now heading to the world championship. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Monday morning, everyone. I'm Rhiannon Alley. And I'm Andrew Dimber. We begin with the historic trial of former President Trump in the New York hush money case involving Stormy Daniels. Jury selection is scheduled to get underway this morning. Currently, this is the only criminal case against Trump that appears on track to wrap up before the election in November, making the stakes even higher for Trump. So what can we expect in court today? ABC's Perry Russum is at the courthouse in Lower Manhattan. Perry, good morning. Andrew, good morning to you. This morning we are getting some new information on Trump's mood and his strategy as he becomes the first former U.S. president to stand trial on criminal charges. This morning, sources describe former President Trump as angry and irritated ahead of jury selection in his New York criminal trial. This is a fraught moment for all of the people involved, not just the defendant. We've never seen anything even remotely close to this in American history. Trump faces 34 felony counts. 
Prosecutors say his one-time lawyer, Michael Cohen, paid porn star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election to keep her quiet about an alleged sexual encounter with Trump. They claim Trump falsified business records to hide the payment from voters. Trump has pleaded not guilty and denies the encounter with Daniels. Last night, he called the trial election interference, writing, I will be fighting for myself, but much more importantly, I will be fighting for our country. Sources say Trump's legal team will argue he had nothing to do with logging his own financial books and that Cohen is to blame. Cohen spent just over a year in prison in 2018 for lying to Congress, among other crimes. He's expected to tell jurors that Trump directed him to pay Daniels. The whole case falls apart if, if the Trump lawyers are able to persuade the jury that Michael Cohen is not to be trusted. And it'll really come down to if he connects with the jury, and you need all 12 of them. If one of them uh, decides they're not persuaded, then the government effectively loses. Hundreds of potential jurors have been summoned. They'll be asked 42 questions, including whether they've attended a Trump campaign event or follow him on social media. Trump has claimed too many potential jurors have been exposed to negative stories about him. The trial is expected to last up to eight weeks, and Trump is required to attend, meaning he'll be in court four days a week instead of on the campaign trail. Sources also say Trump's lawyers will try to convince him not to hold news conferences in the courtroom hallway, given fears over repeated gag order violations. The judge has warned Trump not to speak about potential jurors. We've never seen a jury selection process for a former president, and this particular president uses you know, his social media account uh, not only to spread misinformation, but also to bully judges, their clerks, the lawyers, the you know, potentially the jurors. If convicted, Trump faces up to four years in prison. And even if he's reelected to the White House in November, he won't be able to pardon himself because this is not a federal case. And here at the courthouse, there's an elaborate security plan in place to protect Trump as well as let court operate as usual. We know at least two accused murderers have court dates today while Trump is inside. Andrew. All right, Perry, thank you so much. And two law enforcement officers have been shot and killed in upstate New York. Officials say a Syracuse police officer and a sheriff's deputy were investigating a suspicious vehicle in the suburb of Liverpool when the shooter opened fire from a house, killing them both. The suspect also died. We turn now to Israel, considering whether to retaliate against Iran for this weekend's historic attack. The White House urging restraint. Here's ABC's Allison Kosick. This morning, new details about Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel, launching more than 100 ballistic missiles and swarms of drones, a larger attack than expected, in retaliation for an airstrike that killed two Iranian generals in Syria this month. A senior U.S. official so surprised at the number of missiles in this weekend's attack that his hand was trembling as he took notes. Three over here, you can see that rocket flying up in the sky just over Jerusalem here now. It's just raining rockets with those sirens blaring out. You can hear the interceptions every few seconds here. Overnight, ABC News confirmed at least half of those Iranian missiles either failed to launch, failed in flight, or crashed before reaching their targets in Israel. Israel says 99% of the drones and missiles ended up being intercepted by Israeli, U.S., and coalition forces. Those that did hit caused minor damage at an Israeli airbase and left a young girl critically wounded from missile shrapnel. While Tehran's massive attack has largely been a failure, a senior official saying that Iran's intent was clearly to be highly, highly destructive, causing significant damage and death in Israel. Now, attention turns to whether Israel will respond. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu meeting with his war cabinet yesterday. One member saying Israel would act in the manner and time that is appropriate for us. His war cabinet reportedly supports retaliating against Iran, but is divided over the timing and scale. U.S. officials, while emphasizing Israel's right to defend itself, say the U.S. will not participate in any counterstrike. Sources say President Biden has urged Netanyahu to slow things down and think carefully about the risk of escalation. Biden's call for restraint, drawing some criticism on both sides of the aisle. If Joe Biden, as some press reports have it, is urging the Israelis not to retaliate at all, 
He is an embarrassment to the United States. On Capitol Hill, lawmakers are now considering a new military aid package for Israel. A vote could come as soon as this week. Iran's government this weekend sent a message to the White House suggesting they were finished after their attack late Saturday, saying they consider this matter closed. The Biden administration is making the case that this was a success for Israel, suggesting retaliation may not be necessary. Rhiannon, Andrew. Allison, thank you. Today is sentencing day for Hannah Gutierrez, the former weapons supervisor on Alec Baldwin's movie Rust. She was convicted of involuntary manslaughter for the death of another crew member who was shot when a gun held by Baldwin went off. She faces up to 18 months in prison. Prosecutors say Gutierrez has shown no remorse. Alec Baldwin is also charged with involuntary manslaughter. His trial begins in July. Now to Oklahoma in the search for two missing mothers, missing since last month police making multiple arrests over the weekend, and now a gruesome discovery. Overnight, police in Oklahoma confirmed they have recovered two bodies while investigating the suspicious disappearance of two mothers from Kansas. One day earlier, authorities arrested four people in the case. Among the charges, first-degree murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy. It's really a big deal. Now, it's somewhat unusual to have four people involved. Um, when two moms disappear. 27-year-old Veronica Butler and 39-year-old Jillian Kelly had been missing since last month when they drove through Oklahoma's panhandle to pick up Butler's children. Their vehicle later found abandoned in a rural area near the Kansas-Oklahoma border. Police say evidence in the vehicle made them suspect foul play. Veronica Butler and the father of her children were reportedly in a bitter custody battle. At least two of the suspects arrested Saturday were were reportedly known to Butler. News Nation reports one is the grandmother of Butler's children, but police have not confirmed that report. So in every case, every homicide case, you have to be able to tie the suspects to the victims. So in other words, can they place either the four of them or at least some of the four at the scene committed this crime Authorities have not confirmed the identities of the two bodies yet or the cause of death. It was five years ago today that a fire nearly destroyed the famed Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. The roof burst into flames. The fire swallowed up the spire and the main bell towers. The cause still hasn't officially been determined, but authorities have pointed at either a cigarette or an electrical problem. Meanwhile, today, the cathedral is nearly restored. The restoration has cost nearly $600 million and is scheduled to reopen in December. Time now for your Monday weather. Oh, look at this. Two men spotted this dust devil along route, route 66 in Arizona. The dust and the tumbleweeds blowing around them, but then quickly moving away. And today, the nation's most severe weather will stretch from Texas all the way to the Dakotas. Tornadoes and large hail are possible as temperatures rise into the 80s. The severe weather threat shifts east tomorrow from Chicago down to Waco, Texas. Checking today's high temperatures, 67 for today's Boston Marathon, 70s around the Great Lakes. Coming up, the all-girls robotics team heading to the world championship. But first, more tourists behaving badly. The men who damaged a protected rock formation in the West and the charges they could face. And what police are saying about the young woman allegedly murdered on a first date. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news.
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. You should see me. The strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Oh, hey, the queens. You should see me in the crowd. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. And that's why at Good Morning America, we're right here. And we got you. We got you. We got you. We're back with the search for two suspected vandals in Nevada. The two men are wanted for toppling ancient boulders at Lake Mead National Recreation Area. The natural rock formations at the Redstone Dunes Trail are protected and started forming when the dinosaurs roamed the Earth. They started forming about 140 million years ago. The damage is unfortunately permanent, and uh, people won't be able to enjoy that particular location as much as they might have before. Those men could face felony charges, including fines and even possible jail time. In Wisconsin, a community is coming together in the search for a woman police say was murdered after going on a first date. Here's ABC's Derek Dennis. This morning, family and friends of 19-year-old Shade Robinson of Milwaukee want closure. I think everybody's just overwhelmed. Robinson's cousin among those searching saying she's too exhausted to go on camera. They're searching a local park for more of her remains after someone found a severed leg linked to Robinson through DNA evidence. People want to get on the water because obviously he she might be in the water and we don't have the resources. Police say Robinson was last seen on April 1st when she was on a first date with this man, 33-year-old Maxwell Anderson, who's now charged with homicide, mutilation, and arson in Robinson's death. She was gorgeous and her smile could like brighten anyone's day and she just had that personality where she could cheer you up. Anderson is held on $5 million bond. Authorities asked about potential ties to other missing women cases in the area said there's no evidence of any other victims. For now, Shade Robinson's loved ones just want to find her. Our family needs peace and we need closure so I don't want to stop. Milwaukee police also found human remains at three other locations, but an ID is still pending. Rhiannon, Andrew. Really sad story, Derek. Thank you. Coming up, what the lawyer handling O.J. Simpson's will is now revealing. Also ahead, a slam dunk for Caitlin Clark on SNL. Why tonight's WNBA draft will be unlike any other. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. You should see me. I'm gonna never stop thinking about you. That's 
The strongest females fight for the survival of their families. We're back with a spectacular crash. This car launching into a home near Riverside, California. The driver suffered only minor injuries. He was apparently trying to make a turn, but was going too fast. Now to the brewing showdown over O.J. Simpson's estate. Simpson was acquitted in his criminal trial, but he was later found liable in a civil suit for the killing of his ex-wife and her friend Ron Goldman. Simpson was ordered to pay $33 million to their families, but paid only a fraction of those damages. Simpson's lawyer tells Good Morning America the estate needs to take care of other things first, including Simpson's IRS debt. Mr. Simpson has IRS debt. There's IRS debt that's going to be out there. Don't want to go into any more about it, but it's substantial. And then a host of other creditors, anyone. There's going to be a notice to creditors. So that's a part of the process. Those judgments that you talk about, they're just not on my radar. Simpson had his NFL pension and his actors union residuals. He reportedly made about $400,000 a year. All right, now to the excitement building for tonight's historic draft. Not the NFL's, the WNBA's. We're just hours away from one of the most anticipated drafts in sports history. Caitlin Clark, all but certain to be the number one overall pick. You make a lot of jokes about women's sports, don't you, Michael? On Saturday Night Live, she scolded Weekend Update host Michael Che for roasting the WNBA's popularity and forced him to read jokes she had written. The Indiana Fever have the first pick in this Monday's draft. A reminder that Indiana Fever is a WNBA team and not what Michael Che gave to dozens of women at Purdue University. Back in December, the Fever won the lottery to choose first and hit the jackpot. Clark's expected arrival sent ticket prices through the roof, more than doubling. And now most of their games will be on national TV. In terms of attention, we've never, ever, ever seen anything like this. Clark, along with South Carolina center Camilla Cardozo and UCLA guard Kiki Rice are profiled in an upcoming ESPN docuseries. This moment showing Clark's competitive spirit when she was a girl learning to ride a bike. So I like got out my pink bike and I'm like, mom, take my training wheels off. Let's go. Here, now that Blake's learned to ride. Katie's giving it a shot and she's doing quite well. Another top contender in tonight's draft, Angel Reese. Despite the LSU forward stardom, analysts do not expect her to be chosen in the top five due to worries about whether she can be effective in the pros. What is for certain, these players are driving historic interest in women's hoops. The national title game scored bigger TV ratings than the men's. Clark! And tonight's draft will be the first in nearly a decade with a live audience. Even SNL's Michael Che will acknowledge it's a slam dunk for the sport. Thank you. I, I can't wait to give this to my girlfriend. You don't have a girlfriend, Michael. <laughs> All right. And you can watch the draft tonight on ESPN at 7.30 Eastern. Should be good. Coming up, former President Trump's trial in New York, how it's affecting Robert De Niro's wardrobe. Plus, why an octopus may not be the best idea for a pet, one family's horror story. The strongest females fight for the survival of their families. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Get ready, America. Every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. I gotta have it in the 
GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, wherever you stream your news, only on ABC News Live. Reporting from Niagara Falls in the path of the total solar eclipse, I'm Rob Marciano. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse, and we begin with Robert De Niro's pants disrupting security at former President Trump's trial. De Niro is shooting a Netflix series near that courthouse in Manhattan, and the Secret Service required his wardrobe truck be relocated for their security detail at the courthouse. Security is tight in New York. Experts say Trump's route from his penthouse to the courthouse will likely change every day as a result. All right, next, Scotty Scheffler's life is changing in monumental ways. The 27-year-old just won his second green jacket at the Masters, becoming the fourth youngest player ever to have two jackets. His wife wasn't there to see it. She's pregnant with her first child. Scheffler says after the baby arrives, golf will move down his list of priorities. Meanwhile, Tiger Woods had a Masters to forget, finishing with the highest score among those who played all four rounds. Next, Girl Power is fueling a brilliant group of amateur engineers in North Carolina. The all-girls robotics team is headed to the World Championship in Texas. The 12 teens call themselves G-Force Robotics. They built a robot. It's named Hellcat. It can respond intelligently to remote commands. And the girls have big dreams for their future. I plan on going into game design. My plan B is going to the Naval Academy to hopefully become a pilot. But I do still want to keep up with robotics and hopefully do maybe battle bots in the future. Their coach says robotics also helps build leadership skills. Next, a pet saga playing out on TikTok. Oh, it got as many twists and turns as an octopus has legs, or are they arms? Nine-year-old Cal had a lifelong dream realized when his dad bought him a pet octopus that they named Terrence. But then Terrence had 50 babies. Dad now has spent thousands of dollars on tanks, water filters, and yes, food. His advice, don't get a pet octopus unless you're ready to lose sleep and also your kid's college fund as well. Ooh, scary <laughs> stuff there. The top headlines next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You should see me. Strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Oh, hey, the queens. You should see me in the crowd. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. 
Checking more top stories now. Jury selection begins today in former President Trump's historic hush money trial. He has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to cover up a sex scandal before the 2016 election. Twelve jurors and six alternates need to be selected from hundreds of Manhattan residents. White House is urging restraint as Israel decides how to respond to Iran's unprecedented attacks. Most of the missiles and drones were shot down with U.S. help. Oil prices, meanwhile, were flat overnight, a sign the markets may be shrugging off the attack. Australia is observing a day of mourning after a stabbing rampage at a mall near Sydney left six victims dead. Police believe the attacker, who had mental health issues, may have targeted women. In Arizona, hundreds rallied for abortion rights days after the state Supreme Court reinstated a law effectively banning abortion. The decision is on hold for at least one more week. Today's weather, severe storms in parts of North Carolina and Virginia and in the plains from Kansas to Omaha. Damaging winds from Oklahoma City into Texas. And finally, the Boston Marathon runners ready to hit the road. They include one man who has run a marathon in all 50 states. Every runner set to line up behind this starting line today has a story. 60-year-old Scott Klein's journey to today's race started 37 years ago when he was 25. I ran with two friends of mine from law school in 1987, really on a lark. But then he spent 25 years running a very different race, practicing law and raising three children with his wife, Michelle, until he turned 50 and dusted off those running shoes. And that led to a kind of strange and amazing odyssey to run a marathon in every state. From Alaska to North Dakota, Alabama to Vermont, telling D Magazine that he even finished the marathon in Maui with a broken bone in his foot. I am not particularly gifted or fast, but I would say that I'm pretty persevering. And ahead of today's race in Boston, he's sharing this message. If you have the opportunity to get off the couch and walk a little bit and then run a little bit, just keep going. Also keeping the spirit going, dozens of golden retrievers brought together on Boston Common over the weekend. Their owners held a meetup to honor the memory of Spencer, the official Boston Marathon dog. Spencer became an iconic symbol of the Boston Marathon after holding a Boston strong flag along the marathon route for nine years. After multiple bouts with cancer, Spencer died last February at the age of 13. Sunday's meetup was a way for these Golden Retriever owners to take a stand against canine cancer. They're Golden Strong! Golden Strong, a big congrats and good luck to all the runners. Today. That's what's making news in America this morning. It's Monday, April 15th. If the worst case scenario was Iran and Israel in open warfare, well, this is about as close as you can get. We start here. For the first time, Iran launches an aerial attack on Israeli soil. This used to be a shadow war, and now it came out into the open. Our reporter was in Jerusalem as explosions went off overhead. Iran says they're ready to call it a day. Well, don't expect Israel to do the same. Israelis see this as a terrific opening to once and for all punch Iran in the nose. Now, the U.S. is desperately trying to keep this from spiraling out of control. And for the first time in history, a former U.S. president faces a criminal jury. These are 34 criminal counts about falsifying business records. We'll set you up for what's about to be an unprecedented trial in New York. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. For years now, even before this war in Gaza began, Israel and Iran have been engaged in the type of shadow war. Maybe Israel hits Iran's cyber infrastructure, and then Iran enlists one of its proxy groups to fire rockets into Israeli territory. Or more lately, Iran might detain an Israeli-owned ship, while Israel responds with an attack on Iranian assets somewhere else. The key to all this 
is it's never the official national military going into the other country's territory. That would be open warfare, right? This is a shadow war. Well, a couple weeks ago, an airstrike from Israel hit Iranian military officials. The key here was they weren't on Iranian soil. They were in Syria, but they were at a consular building, which are usually considered pretty off limits by diplomats at least. Iran was furious and said it would retaliate. Well, on Saturday night, they launched a massive airstrike aimed squarely at Israel itself. It was quite scary when in the middle of the night we started hearing booming. I really hope it won't be a big war now. None of us in Israel want a big war. The war in Gaza has been devastating. It's been brutal, but it has been relatively contained. The question this morning is whether that has all just changed. ABC's foreign correspondent Jordana Miller is based in Jerusalem, where some of these strikes were seen in the air. Jordana, can you just walk us through what happened? Well, you know, Israelis had been told for days that Iran was likely to launch a direct strike from its territory onto Israel. But then everything really went into high gear on Saturday night here. The Israeli spokesperson gave a televised address and said, Iran has launched hundreds of ballistic missiles and cruise missiles and drones, and they're headed our way. He tried to calm the country by saying, you know, we have all our systems in place, our air defense systems. We've dealt with these threats before. Our allies are helping us. And, you know, then we received another update that at about between 1 and 2 a.m., some of the missiles were not shot down, and some of them might be shot down over Israeli territory. The sirens started to go off first in Israel's north, uh, meaning that some had come from the Lebanese and the Syrian border. And then the sirens went off in the south then the West Bank, and then, to many people's surprise, sirens went off here in Jerusalem. And I would say it was just before 2 a.m. when that happened. Um, you know, I have two young kids. We went to crouch in our safe room, and all of a sudden we started to hear these loud explosions. Now, Israel has a multi-layered air defense system. One is the Iron Dome. The middle system is, is called uh, the, the Arrow system using the Patriot missiles. And then they have David Sling, which is the most advanced. We heard probably 10 of these uh, missiles or drones being intercepted right in Jerusalem's old city, which is about a 15 minute walk from where I live. It was a historic night here, of course, because Iran has never struck Israel before. Um, as you said, this used to be a shadow war, and now it came out into the open. Did any of these missiles end up touching down? Uh, like, what, what was sort of the success rate of Israel's defenses here? So between Israel, the United States, and other allies, the Israeli army says that Israel and its partners shot down with a 99% success rate almost all of the 350 missiles and drones that were shot over. That includes over 100 ballistic missiles. Wow. Um, so there were a few ballistic missiles that made it through. One hit the, the Netavim Air Base down in the south. That appears to be one of the main targets. That's where Israel keeps its F-35s. So it looks like the Iranians were trying to take out that air base and destroy some of the F-35s. They didn't get anywhere close to doing that. So it was a, in terms of Israel and its partners, it was a spectacular success. Well, yeah, and we've heard about now U.S. forces scrambling to blow a lot of these ordnance out of the sky. I think it was 70 projectiles shot down by U.S. forces alone. A Navy destroyer brought down three ballistic missiles. How are the United States and Israel and the Iranians, how are they talking about this now? So Iranian leaders are saying, we're finished. We avenged the killing of our top general and commanders. And if Israel attacks again, the Iranians are saying, we will hit them even harder. And they're adding that if the United States takes part in any of Israel's counterstrike, then U.S. bases will also become targets. Of course, 
there are far right leaders in Netanyahu's government, hawks, who are pushing for a major attack. But there's also an element in the war cabinet here hinting that Israel doesn't need to attack immediately. We are devoted to the defense of Israel. We will support Israel. We will defend, help defend Israel. And Iran will not succeed. But one of the most important factors here is what President Biden thinks and wants. And he's been very clear that he does not want an escalation. He doesn't want a war. He's uh, stood by Israel. And what he wants will be a major factor. All right. Uh, Jordana Miller, there in Jerusalem. So glad you're safe and your family's safe. Thank you so much for, for checking in. Thanks, Brad. Now, I'm sure a lot of you, me included, are wondering, what happens next then? What, what are the next steps here? Let's go to Colonel Stephen Ganyard. He's a former Marine and State Department official, now an ABC News contributor. Colonel Ganyard, we had expected Iran to do something. On a scale of like one to 10, how, how alarming did this attack end up being? I think when the attack started, Brad, it was a 10 in terms of how alarmed we were. I can't find anybody, either inside or outside of government, who actually anticipated the numbers of missiles and uh, drones and cruise missiles that were actually shot at Israel. Mm. So that part of it, until we saw how effective the air defenses were and missile defenses were in Israel, was quite alarming. By the end of the night, when we saw how few impacts had any real damage done, uh, it was down to about a two. Huh. So thanks to technology, uh, started out very, very scary and ended up about as happy as an ending as it could have. Hey, um Iran, I'm just thinking from the Iranian perspective, they had a lot of options, right? Because they could have attacked an, an Israeli embassy. They could have had one of their proxy groups launch this attack. They chose to do it themselves, and they chose to do it in Israel itself. Why? I think part of it was that when the Israelis hit the consulate, the so-called consulate in Damascus, which was really just a Quds Force and an IRGC headquarters, they took it as a, a direct assault on Iranian sovereignty because most embassies and consulates are thought of as being sovereign land uh, in whatever country that they're located. And so they saw that. They saw another humiliation of another senior IRGC uh, general and a couple of his cronies uh, taken out. It was a huge embarrassment for I Iran. And really, at home, it all comes back to domestic politics. The mullahs uh, and the, those running the regime in Iran could not uh, stand losing face and not doing anything directly. Mm -hmm. What was really surprising was most people thought that they would come in with some sort of a, well, this is just for a show, you know, maybe we'll, we'll launch 30 drones at uh, Israel to show that we did something. Nobody expected the kind of attack and the magnitude of the attack that we saw. Does that mean that Iran was essentially ready for it? I'm just thinking, if those missiles had all fallen and they had killed thousands of Israelis, Israel would be at a full-scale war with Iran today. Am I getting that right? I, I think so. You know, it's hard to understand your calculus here. We, you know, we have very little uh, insight into how they think or, or what they're thinking or even what their intent is here. But uh, certainly they must have known that Israel would come back at them. You know, they, they made all sorts of pronouncements and they told the U.S. through back channels with a Swiss, hey, we're done, that's it. You know, nothing, nothing further to happen here. And it's like, it's not going to work that way. You know, the gloves are finally off. The shadow war between Israel and Iran that's been going on for decades is now out in the open. Mm. It's the best thing for Netanyahu that he could have ever asked for because now he doesn't have to deal with the Iranian proxies, the Houthis, Hamas, Hezbollah. He can go right at Iran. Mm. So, Like he's been saying for years, like, this is all Iran's doing. And people are like, OK, fine. Well, now it clearly is. Right. And they always had the cutouts. They always had the plausible deniabilities. They always, somebody else was dying for their cause using their money and their weapons. But now there's a direct fingerprint. We know who did this. They deliberately attacked Israel, even though they didn't do much military damage. It does give Israel free reign to go after Iranian military uh, activities and installations inside of Iran. And Iran is very, very vulnerable. Israel has a much better uh, capability to project power through air power, through submarine cruise missiles. Iran does not have anything like the air defenses that Israel has, and they will be essentially vulnerable to any kind of attack that Israel decides to undertake. So Iran put out a statement that basically said, like, OK, we're good. This is over. I'm sure the U.S. would probably love to think that it's over. But is that how Israel sees it? What, what, what do you see sort of playing out now with the U.S. and with Israel and the whole thing here? It, it is what the White House would like. If Israel goes back in and we're, we're hearing from the White House, they know they're going to go do something, but they want to make it 
something proportional, something modest, something that's not going to turn the whole region uh, into a lake of fire. Uh, and so the the White House wants to have things continue to calm down. They don't want this to turn into a regional conflict. On the other hand, the Israelis see Iran as the source of all their problems. Iran uh, is uses the Houthis, Hezbollah, Hamas as proxies, and they all attack Israel. And so now Israel has the chance to go back in and take out that part of the Iranian military that they believe is supplying the surrogates who attack Israel on a daily basis. So from a military perspective here, the Israelis see this as a terrific opening to once and for all punch Iran in the nose and hopefully have Iran calm down and not continue to use its proxies in places like Gaza and Syria and Lebanon. But just to be clear, you see the Israelis now going into Iranian airspace, doing strikes the same way that Iran just did to Israel. I would give it a 90 percent chance. Wow. Unbelievable here. All right. Colonel Stephen Ganyer, thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. Okay, next up on Start Here, any other day, this would be the lead story. The criminal trial of a former U.S. president is about to get underway. We'll take you there after the break. Whenever news breaks... We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all? That's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good morning, America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here, and we got gotcha. you. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. It could be a job all in itself to keep up with the charges against former President Donald Trump. Altogether, Trump faces four criminal indictments in four different cities, all as election season is now in full swing. Well, today, a historic case gets underway in New York City because today, finally, is the day Trump becomes the first former U.S. president to stand trial on criminal charges. It's beginning. In this case, he's accused of falsifying business records of hush money payments. Let's bring in ABC's John Santucci, our executive editorial producer covering investigations. John, you've been prepping for this for months now. Can you just sort of tee me up on, on what this case is and what's about to happen? I mean, this is the first one, Brad. If you can believe it, it's nearly a year ago that Donald Trump was first indicted on criminal charges. And it's that case, that first indictment, that now is going to trial. All I can do is tell the truth. And the truth is that there's no case. They have no case. So, Brad, here's what's interesting. This case is about election interference, but it's not the 2020 election, which most people think about when they hear those words. Right. It's actually 2016. This is about Donald Trump and his ally at the time, Michael Cohen's efforts to 
basically catch and kill. It's a practice we've heard now and become too familiar with. The idea that a damaging story is out there, you pay somebody off to kill it, to make the story go away. And in this case, it's about a payment that was made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. I relish the day that I get to face him and, and speak my truth. Allegedly, she had an affair with Donald Trump, and it's about a payment to catch and kill that story and make it go away. The participant scheme was illegal. And reimbursement payments that Trump made to Michael Cohen that he wrote down as legal fees, which mm. is what we're getting into a real issue here, Brad. The $130,000 wire payment exceeded the federal campaign contribution cap, and the false statements in AMI's books violated New York law. Prosecutors say this is all about falsifying documents, right? Covering up what the actual payments were for and thus to impact the election. Now, on the flip side, Trump's team is going to say, look, this was something related to his personal life. Donald Trump didn't want to embarrass himself and his family, didn't want to cause any pain amongst the Trumps. So thus, he basically made the story go away because it would have upset his personal life. So, like, no one's no one's arguing at the idea that, like, they caught the story and tried to kill the story with money. It's a question of why you did it, whether it's, like, was it to help your election chances? That would be bad. Or just to, like, help your marriage, because that's actually not against the law. Well, it's, it's all of that, and it's also the idea, because at the end of the day, these are 34 criminal counts about falsifying business records, right? So that's really what we're getting to here Got in it. some ways, right? And the idea that the prosecutors are making is that, look, this is what it was for. He lied, et cetera. And what Trump's team is saying, look, it's a personal matter, had nothing to do with the campaign, nothing to do with the Trump organization. So thus, who cares? I see. Okay, and we should add, Trump is denied having an affair. He's also said things like the stormy nonsense happened many years ago, so I guess you can make of that what you will. He also says all of his criminal charges are politically motivated. Uh, John, what happens today? Like, before they even make the opening arguments or something, they have to impanel a jury, right? What's going to happen, Brad, is that hundreds of New Yorkers are going to pile into this small courtroom in downtown Manhattan for jury selection, which is a process all of us have had. We've all gone to jury duty at one point in our lives, or we've avoided it. That's a whole other issue. But if you are a juror that's up for jury duty in Manhattan, you could be on the Trump case. And they've already sent out questionnaires, Brad, asking potential jurors if they're a supporter of Donald Trump's, they're familiar with him, do they subscribe to any conspiracy theories like QAnon? That's going to be something that prosecutors and Trump's legal team are going to ask as they try to whittle this group down. The most important question is going to be, who is on that jury? Brad, if you can find 12 people that don't know who Donald Trump is, man, I think we should, you know, <laughs> I don't know who they are, but God, they're, they're something else, right? But <laughs> We should do a better job. Right? Exactly, right? They're definitely not you, me, and anybody else we work with. But listen, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's not so much about that, right? It's do you have a strong opinion on Donald Trump? And we've all met people that have strong opinions on Donald Trump, whether you like him, love him, or hate him, right? That's something that they're going to try to whittle out is people that are a bit more agnostic mm. to who Donald Trump is. Trump is. Now, that's going to be difficult, certainly, but nevertheless, that's the goal. That eventually, once they have this jury, a jury of 12 plus alternates, they'll be the ones to hear this case that'll go on for several weeks, Brad, in that Manhattan courtroom. Hey, re regardless of even what the verdict is, what will be the effect of this case, just the ongoing trial on the election? What's interesting about that, Brad, is that it affects the election immediately because Donald Trump can't campaign as much. I don't know how you can have a trial. It's going on right in the middle of an election. Not fair. Not fair. Most courts sit on a five-day schedule or a four-day schedule is more typical. Judges usually take Fridays off. This actually is kind of interesting. The judge here does local service, community service, on Wednesdays. So that's going to be the off day. So Donald Trump's going to be in a courtroom Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. When you talk to his campaign staff... It's endlessly frustrating because usually they'll go off and start doing events later in the week because most people are around later in the week. Huh. Wednesdays are kind of complicated. So one of the things Team Trump has talked about is that they'll do campaign events around the New York area, some of which could be in New York, because they're going to try to find a way to reach their supporters. 
I don't think they're going to find a way to flip New York red, but you never know. That's something that they have in a, in a dream somewhere. But this is going to make it complicated to actually get out the message, get out mm-hmm. the vote. And as Donald Trump certainly is the presumptive Republican nominee at this rate, Brad, he still has work to do. There's still a lot of fundraising that needs to happen, a lot of hands that need to be shaken, and a lot of things that need to be worked towards the convention, the debates, and really get us into the fall. So when his schedule is is so caught up because for several hours during the days in a courtroom, it makes the other business just a little bit more complicated. Yeah, especially when we consider how many, there could be more trials down the road. But for right now, it's this one. This is the first time a former U.S. president stands trial criminally. Uh, John Santucci, thank you so much. Thank you, Brad. All right, one more quick break. When we come back, it's tough to keep the streets squeaky clean, but you don't want to welcome everyone to a mouse warming party. One last thing is next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. The strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Oh, hey, the queens. You should see me in the crowd. ABC News, America's number one news source. Reporting from the site of the Key Bridge collapse aboard a ship with the Army Corps of Engineers, I'm Elizabeth Schulze. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And one last thing. Oh, rats. We try to trap them, trick them, and kill them, but could there be a better option? You probably heard that Flocko, the beloved Eurasian owl that escaped the Central Park Zoo, died last month after more than a year of flying free around Manhattan. It was thought he met his demise hitting a window, but further examination revealed a host of health issues, including that Flocko had ingested rat poison. Flocko didn't have to die. Flocko's laws will let birds fly. So last week in New York City, a city councilor proposed a new bill. Instead of putting rat poison out on the streets, which is a risk to dogs, cats, and squirrels who prowl the sidewalks, along then with the birds of prey that chase them, what if we gave the rats birth control? This is a real idea, and actually not a novel one. For years, sanitation departments have experimented with contraceptives that would prevent female rats from giving birth. You just stick them in some bait and let the rats eat them up. The idea is that this would be a more effective long-term plan than killing them. After all, a single pair of rats can theoretically produce 15,000 offspring in the course of a year. But it would also relieve the sanitation workers of what's become a pretty uncomfortable question of animal cruelty. Zoologists say death by poison is extremely painful for rats and mice. Even worse are glue traps, which have now been banned in several American cities. There's a federal bill floating around Congress that would ban them nationwide. Some exterminators prefer carbon monoxide, the gas which can lull animals to sleep, but that's tough to pull off on the scale of a whole housing community or subway stop. 
and that's really the issue here. We got lots of methods in this country for battling rats, but the rats keep winning, even against this birth control plan that's been tried before. So why would it work this time? Well, New York Mayor Eric Adams has made trash a cornerstone of his first term in office. He's commanded local businesses to place their trash in big containers rather than just in bags they toss on the street. He's fining homeowners who put their trash out too early. He's even created a city government position known as just the rat czar. I will bring a science and systems-based approach to reducing New York City's rat population. And it's starting to work. Rat sightings are down significantly. The hope is now that rats have fewer opportunities to scavenge food, they'll snap up this bait even more readily. One researcher said these salty treats taste even better than pizza, which means you also got to make sure this contraception only works on rats because every creature from New York likes the taste of pizza. My apartment had a mouse in it earlier this year, and our solution ended up being not to kill it, but just wait until it went inside a hole in the wall, seal all the gaps and cracks in our house, and then when our neighbors started freaking out about mouse sightings, that's when we knew we had succeeded. Very inhumane to our neighbors, but otherwise, I, I felt like we had all of our bases covered. More on all these stories at abcnews.com or the ABC News app. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love? Pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? That sounds pretty good. Your health, your money, breaking news, music, and of course, good food. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Reporting from Indianapolis, I'm Gio Benitez with Eclipse Watchers from Purdue University. Yeah! Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Right now on America This Morning, Trump goes on trial. For the first time, a former U.S. president will stand trial on criminal charges. What to expect today in court as Trump's hush money trial begins and what we're learning about his lawyer's strategy. 
happening now. Israel considers whether to retaliate for this weekend's historic attack by Iran, launching hundreds of missiles and drones directly into Israel. President Biden's message to Prime Minister Netanyahu, what officials are saying about U.S. involvement in any potential counterattack. Developing overnight, the mysterious disappearance of two mothers in Oklahoma. Four suspects arrested, and now word that two bodies have been recovered in the area. Plus, what the lawyer handling O.J. Simpson's will is now revealing about Simpson's death. Caught on camera, the men seen damaging a protected rock formation in the West, the charges they could face. Caitlin Clark's big night, why tonight's WNBA draft will be like none before. And later, meet the all-girls high school robotics team, now heading to the world championship. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Monday morning, everyone. I'm Rihanna Alley. And I'm Andrew Dimbert. We begin with the historic trial of former President Trump in the New York hush money case involving Stormy Daniels. Jury selection is scheduled to get underway this morning. Currently, this is the only criminal case against Trump that appears on track to wrap up before the election in November, making the stakes even higher for Trump. So what can we expect in court today? ABC's Perry Russum is at the courthouse in Lower Manhattan. Perry, good morning. Andrew, good morning to you. This morning we are getting some new information on Trump's mood and his strategy as he becomes the first former U.S. president to stand trial on criminal charges. This morning, sources describe former President Trump as angry and irritated ahead of jury selection in his New York criminal trial. This is a fraught moment for all of the people involved, not just the defendant. We've never seen anything even remotely close to this in American history. Trump faces 34 felony counts. Prosecutors say his one-time lawyer, Michael Cohen, paid porn star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election to keep her quiet about an alleged sexual encounter with Trump. They claim Trump falsified business records to hide the payment from voters. Trump has pleaded not guilty and denies the encounter with Daniels. Last night, he called the trial election interference, writing, I will be fighting for myself, but much more importantly, I will be fighting for our country. Sources say Trump's legal team will argue he had nothing to do with logging his own financial books and that Cohen is to blame. Cohen spent just over a year in prison in 2018 for lying to Congress, among other crimes. He's expected to tell jurors that Trump directed him to pay Daniels. The whole case falls apart if, if the Trump lawyers are able to persuade the jury that Michael Cohen is not to be trusted. And it'll really come down to if he connects with the jury, and you need all 12 of them. If one of them uh, decides they're not persuaded, then the government effectively loses. Hundreds of potential jurors have been summoned. They'll be asked 42 questions, including whether they've attended a Trump campaign event or follow him on social media. Trump has claimed too many potential jurors have been exposed to negative stories about him. The trial is expected to last up to eight weeks, and Trump is required to attend, meaning he'll be in court four days a week instead of on the campaign trail. Sources also say Trump's lawyers will try to convince him not to hold news conferences in the courtroom hallway, given fears over repeated gag order violations. The judge has warned Trump not to speak about potential jurors. We've never seen a jury selection process for a former president, and this particular president uses, you know, his social media account uh, not only to spread misinformation, but also to bully judges, their clerks, the lawyers, the, you know, potentially the jurors. If convicted, Trump faces up to four years in prison. And even if he's reelected to the White House in November, he won't be able to pardon himself because this is not a federal case. And here at the courthouse, there's an elaborate security plan in place to protect Trump as well as let court operate as usual. We know at least two accused murderers have court dates today while Trump is inside. Andrew. All right, Perry, thank you so much. And two law enforcement officers have been shot and killed in upstate New York. Officials say a Syracuse police officer and a sheriff's deputy were investigating a suspicious vehicle in the suburb of Liverpool when the shooter opened fire from a house, killing them both. The suspect also died. We turn now to Israel, considering whether to retaliate against Iran for this weekend's historic attack. The White House urging restraint. Here's ABC's Allison Kosick. This morning, new details about Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel, launching more than 100 ballistic missiles and swarms of drones, a larger attack than expected. 
in retaliation for an airstrike that killed two Iranian generals in Syria this month. A senior U.S. official so surprised at the number of missiles in this weekend's attack that his hand was trembling as he took notes. Three over here, you can see that rocket flying up in the sky just over Jerusalem here now. It's just raining rockets with those sirens blaring out. You can hear the interceptions every few seconds here. Overnight, ABC News confirmed at least half of those Iranian missiles either failed to launch, failed in flight, or crashed before reaching their targets in Israel. Israel says 99% of the drones and missiles ended up being intercepted by Israeli, U.S., and coalition forces. Those that did hit caused minor damage at an Israeli airbase and left a young girl critically wounded from missile shrapnel. While Tehran's massive attack has largely been a failure, a senior official saying that Iran's intent was clearly to be highly, highly destructive, causing significant damage and death in Israel. Now, attention turns to whether Israel will respond. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu meeting with his war cabinet yesterday. One member saying Israel would act in the manner and time that is appropriate for us. His war cabinet reportedly supports retaliating against Iran, but is divided over the timing and scale. U.S. officials, while emphasizing Israel's right to defend itself, say the U.S. will not participate in any counterstrike. Sources say President Biden has urged Netanyahu to slow things down and think carefully about the risk of escalation. Biden's call for restraint drawing some criticism on both sides of the aisle. If Joe Biden, as some press reports have it, is urging the Israelis not to retaliate at all, he is an embarrassment to the United States. On Capitol Hill, lawmakers are now considering a new military aid package for Israel. A vote could come as soon as this week. Iran's government this weekend sent a message to the White House suggesting they were finished after their attack late Saturday, saying they consider this matter closed. The Biden administration is making the case that this was a success for Israel, suggesting retaliation may not be necessary. Rhiannon, Andrew. Allison, thank you. Today is sentencing day for Hannah Gutierrez, the former weapons supervisor on Alec Baldwin's movie Rust. She was convicted of involuntary manslaughter for the death of another crew member who was shot when a gun held by Baldwin went off. She faces up to 18 months in prison. Prosecutors say Gutierrez has shown no remorse. Alec Baldwin is also charged with involuntary manslaughter. His trial begins in July. Now to Oklahoma and the search for two missing mothers, missing since last month. Police making multiple arrests over the weekend, and now a gruesome discovery. Overnight, police in Oklahoma confirmed they have recovered two bodies while investigating the suspicious disappearance of two mothers from Kansas. One day earlier, authorities arrested four people in the case. Among the charges, first-degree murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy. It's really a big deal. Now, it's somewhat unusual to have four people involved uh, when two moms disappear. 27-year-old Veronica Butler and 39-year-old Jillian Kelly have been missing since last month when they drove through Oklahoma's panhandle to pick up Butler's children. Their vehicle later found abandoned in a rural area near the Kansas-Oklahoma border. Police say evidence in the vehicle made them suspect foul play. Veronica Butler and the father of her children were reportedly in a bitter custody battle. At least two of the suspects arrested Saturday were reportedly known to Butler. News Nation reports one is the grandmother of Butler's children, but police have not confirmed that report. So in every case, every homicide case, you have to be able to tie the suspects to the victims. So in other words, can they place either the four of them or at least some of the four at the scene committed this crime Authorities have not confirmed the identities of the two bodies yet or the cause of death. It was five years ago today that a fire nearly destroyed the famed Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. The roof burst into flames. The fire swallowed up the spire and the main bell towers. The cause still hasn't officially been determined, but authorities have pointed at either a cigarette or an electrical problem. Meanwhile, today, the cathedral is nearly restored. The restoration has cost nearly $600 million and is scheduled to reopen in December. Time now for your Monday weather.
Oh, look at this. Two men spotted this dust devil along route, route 66 in Arizona. The dust and the tumbleweeds blowing around them, but then quickly moving away. And today, the nation's most severe weather will stretch from Texas all the way to the Dakotas. Tornadoes and large hail are possible as temperatures rise into the 80s. The severe weather threat shifts east tomorrow from Chicago down to Waco, Texas. Checking today's high temperatures, 67 for today's Boston Marathon, 70s around the Great Lakes. Coming up, the all-girls robotics team heading to the world championship. But first, more tourists behaving badly. The men who damaged a protected rock formation in the West and the charges they could face. And what police are saying about the young woman allegedly murdered on a first date. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines from southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. You should see me. Come down. Come down. Come down. The strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. And that's why at Good Morning America, we're right here. And we got you. We got you. We got you. We're back with the search for two suspected vandals in Nevada. The two men are wanted for toppling ancient boulders at Lake Mead National Recreation Area. The natural rock formations at the Redstone Dunes Trail are protected and started forming when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. They started forming about 140 million years ago. The damage is unfortunately permanent, and uh, people won't be able to enjoy that particular location as much as they might have before. Those men could face felony charges, including fines and even possible jail time. In Wisconsin, a community is coming together in the search for a woman police say was murdered after going on a first date. Here's ABC's Derek Dennis. This morning, family and friends of 19-year-old Shade Robinson of Milwaukee want closure. I think everybody's just overwhelmed. Robinson's cousin among those searching, saying she's too exhausted to go on camera. They're searching a local park for more of her remains after someone found a severed leg linked to Robinson through DNA evidence. People want to get on the water because obviously he she might be in the water and we don't have the resources. Police say Robinson was last seen on April 1st when she was on a first date with this man, 33-year-old Maxwell Anderson, who's now charged with homicide, mutilation, and arson in Robinson's death. She was gorgeous and her smile could like brighten anyone's day and she just had that personality where she could cheer you up. Anderson is held on $5 million bond. Authorities asked about potential ties to other missing women cases in the area said there's no evidence of any other victims. For now, Shade Robinson's loved ones just want to find her. Our family needs peace and we need closure so I don't want to stop. Milwaukee police also found human remains at three other locations, but an ID is still pending. 
Rhiannon, Andrew. Really sad story, Derek. Thank you. Coming up, what the lawyer handling O.J. Simpson's will is now revealing. Also ahead, a slam dunk for Caitlin Clark on SNL. Why tonight's WNBA draft will be unlike any other. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoon. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. You should see me. I'm gonna The strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Oh, hey. The queens. You should see me in a crowd. We're back with a spectacular crash. This car launching into a home near Riverside, California. The driver suffered only minor injuries. He was apparently trying to make a turn, but was going too fast. Now to the brewing showdown over O.J. Simpson's estate. Simpson was acquitted in his criminal trial, but he was later found liable in a civil suit for the killing of his ex-wife and her friend Ron Goldman. Simpson was ordered to pay $33 million to their families, but paid only a fraction of those damages. Simpson's lawyer tells Good Morning America the estate needs to take care of other things first, including Simpson's IRS debt. Mr. Simpson has IRS debt. There's IRS debt that's going to be out there. Don't want to go into any more about it, but it's substantial. And then a host of other creditors, anyone. There's going to be a notice to creditors. So that's a part of the process. Those judgments that you talk about, they're just not on my radar. Simpson had his NFL pension and his actors union residuals. He reportedly made about $400,000 a year. All right, now to the excitement building for tonight's historic draft. Not the NFL's, the WNBA's. We're just hours away from one of the most anticipated drafts in sports history. Caitlin Clark, all but certain to be the number one overall pick. You make a lot of jokes about women's sports, don't you, Michael? On Saturday Night Live, she scolded Weekend Update host Michael Che for roasting the WNBA's popularity and forced him to read jokes she had written. The Indiana Fever have the first pick in this Monday's draft. A reminder that Indiana Fever is a WNBA team and not what Michael Che gave to dozens of women at Purdue University. Back in December, the Fever won the lottery to choose first and hit the jackpot. Clark's expected arrival sent ticket prices through the roof, more than doubling. And now most of their games will be on national TV. In terms of attention, we've never, ever, ever seen anything like this. Clark, along with South Carolina center Camilla Cardozo and UCLA guard Kiki Rice are profiled in an upcoming ESPN docuseries. This moment showing Clark's competitive spirit when she was a girl learning to ride a bike. So I like got out my pink bike and I'm like, mom, take my training wheels off. Let's go. Hey, now that Blake's learned to ride, Katie's given it a shot and she's doing quite well. Another top contender in tonight's draft, Angel Reese. Despite the LSU forward stardom, analysts do not expect her to be chosen in the top five due to worries about whether she can be effective in the pros. What is for certain, these players are driving historic interest in women's hoops. The national title game scored bigger TV ratings than the men's. Clark, oh my! 
And tonight's draft will be the first in nearly a decade with a live audience. Even SNL's Michael Che will acknowledge it's a slam dunk for the sport. Thank you. I, I can't wait to give this to my girlfriend. You don't have a girlfriend, Michael. <laughs> All right. And you can watch the draft tonight on ESPN at 7.30 Eastern. Should be good. Coming up, former President Trump's trial in New York, how it's affecting Robert De Niro's wardrobe. Plus, why an octopus may not be the best idea for a pet, one family's horror story. You should see me. Strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Oh, hey, the queens. You should see me in the crowd. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from the Oscars red carpet, I'm Melissa Adon. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse, and we begin with Robert De Niro's pants disrupting security at former President Trump's trial. De Niro is shooting a Netflix series near that courthouse in Manhattan, and the Secret Service required his wardrobe truck be relocated for their security detail at the courthouse. Security is tight in New York. Experts say Trump's route from his penthouse to the courthouse will likely change every day as a result. All right, next, Scotty Scheffler's life is changing in monumental ways. The 27-year-old just won his second green jacket at the Masters, becoming the fourth youngest player ever to have two jackets. His wife wasn't there to see it. She's pregnant with her first child. Scheffler says after the baby arrives, golf will move down his list of priorities. Meanwhile, Tiger Woods had a Masters to forget, finishing with the highest score among those who played all four rounds. Next, Girl Power is fueling a brilliant group of amateur engineers in North Carolina. The all-girls robotics team is headed to the World Championship in Texas. The 12 teens call themselves G-Force Robotics. They built a robot. It's named Hellcat. It can respond intelligently to remote commands. And the girls have big dreams for their future. Sure. I plan on going into game design. My plan B is going to the Naval Academy to hopefully become a pilot. But I do still want to keep up with robotics and hopefully do maybe battle bots in the future. Their coach says robotics also helps build leadership skills. Next, a pet saga playing out on TikTok. Oh, it got as many twists and turns as an octopus has legs or are they arms? Nine-year-old Cal had a lifelong dream realized when his dad bought him a pet octopus that they named Terrence. But then Terrence had 50 babies. Dad now has spent thousands of dollars on tanks, water filters, and yes, food. His advice, don't get a pet octopus unless you're ready to lose sleep and also your kid's college fund as well. Ooh, <laughs> scary stuff there. The top headlines next. This is ABC News Live.
with the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You should see me. The strongest females fight for the survival of their families. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Checking more top stories now. Jury selection begins today in former President Trump's historic hush money trial. He has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to cover up a sex scandal before the 2016 election. Twelve jurors and six alternates need to be selected from hundreds of Manhattan residents. White House is urging restraint as Israel decides how to respond to Iran's unprecedented attacks. Most of the missiles and drones were shot down with U.S. help. Oil prices, meanwhile, were flat overnight, a sign the markets may be shrugging off the attack. Australia's observing a day of mourning after a stabbing rampage at a mall near Sydney left six victims dead. Police believe the attacker, who had mental health issues, may have targeted women. In Arizona, hundreds rallied for abortion rights days after the state Supreme Court reinstated a law effectively banning abortion. The decision is on hold for at least one more week. Today's weather, severe storms in parts of North Carolina and Virginia and in the plains from Kansas to Omaha. Damaging winds from Oklahoma City into Texas. And finally, the Boston Marathon runners ready to hit the road. They include one man who has run a marathon in all 50 states. Every runner set to line up behind this starting line today has a story. 60-year-old Scott Klein's journey to today's race started 37 years ago when he was 25. I ran with two friends of mine from law school in 1987, really on a lark. But then he spent 25 years running a very different race, practicing law and raising three children with his wife, Michelle, until he turned 50 and dusted off those running shoes. And that led to a kind of strange and amazing odyssey to run a marathon in every state. From Alaska to North Dakota, Alabama to Vermont, telling D Magazine that he even finished the marathon in Maui with a broken bone in his foot. I am not particularly gifted or fast, but I would say that I'm pretty persevering. And ahead of today's race in Boston, he's sharing this message. If you have the opportunity to get off the couch and walk a little bit and then run a little bit, just keep going. Also keeping the spirit going, dozens of golden retrievers brought together on Boston Common over the weekend. Their owners held a meetup to honor the memory of Spencer, the official Boston Marathon dog. Spencer became an iconic symbol of the Boston Marathon after holding a Boston strong flag along the marathon route for nine years. After multiple bouts with cancer, Spencer died last February at the age of 13. Sunday's meetup was a way for these Golden Retriever owners to take a stand against canine cancer. They're Golden Strong! Golden Strong, a big congrats and good luck to all the runners. That's today. what's making news in America this morning. More
Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Good morning. Welcome to ABC News Live. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Let's get right to our top story this morning. The historic first ever trial of a former president set to begin today. Former President Trump is expected in court in New York City in lower Manhattan for jury selection in the hush money case against him. The Manhattan District Attorney charged Trump with falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney, Michael Cohen. Trump pleaded not guilty to the 34 charges last year, calling the case election interference and a witch hunt. The judge has imposed a limited gag order keeping Trump from making comments about jurors, witnesses, individual prosecutors, and the families of the judge and the district attorney. But Trump has pushed the boundaries of that order, targeting some witnesses and the judge's daughter on social media. The former president has campaigned on his legal battles, telling his supporters he wears the indictments as a badge of honor. Most of the Republican Party has rallied behind him, even as some privately admit the allegations make them deeply uncomfortable. We have full team coverage this morning as the former president is expected to make his way to court right here in Manhattan, starting with our senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky, who has the latest from New York. Docket number 71543, the people of the state of New York versus Donald J. Trump, will be called for jury selection. Lawyers will begin choosing 12 jurors and six alternates to hear this unprecedented case. And I'm proud to do it for you. Have a good time watching. Trump may be wearing his indictment like a badge of honor, but he has repeatedly tried to delay this trial, an appeals court rejecting him each time. So for the next couple of months, Trump will be running to reclaim the White House while spending most of his time on the 15th floor of the courthouse. Thank you very much, everybody. Trump has pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records in a case involving a former president, a publisher, and an adult film actress. I relish the day that I get to face him and, and speak my truth. Prosecutors allege Trump feared for his electoral prospects in 2016 if the public were to learn about Stormy Daniels, who claimed she had sex with Trump, which he denied. The Access Hollywood tape had just surfaced. Trump heard boasting of grabbing women. Hey, when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Prosecutors put Trump at the center of an alleged scheme to bury damaging stories before the 2016 election with the help of David Pecker at the National Enquirer. He now has an immunity agreement with prosecutors. The indictment said Pecker arranged a $130,000 hush payment to Daniels, Michael Cohen wired the money, and Trump falsely recorded monthly reimbursements to Cohen as legal services. For nine straight months, the defendant held documents in his hand containing this key lie. Once jury selection is complete, ex-Playboy model Karen McDougal is expected to testify. So is Trump's longtime trusted aide, Hope Hicks. Trump has said he might testify, too. I would testify, absolutely. Senior investigative correspondent Aaron Kotursky, executive editorial producer John Santucci, and legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer join me now for more on this. Aaron, I want to start with you. You have been following this case since the very beginning. This is a significant day. Talk to us how we got here exactly. It's an unheard of day. A former American president standing trial as a criminal defendant. Donald Trump was the first former president to be charged, now the first former president to stand trial, and he tried feverishly to avoid this day with repeated requests to an appeals court to delay each time his attorneys were turned aside. And now he's preparing to arrive here, go up to the 15th floor of the courthouse for jury selection and perhaps a hearing about uh, his potential testimony in the case. And we got here because, according to Stormy Daniels, the two of them had sex in 2006. He has long denied that. But when he was close to the 2016 campaign, he decided that he didn't want the public to learn about anything Stormy Daniels had to say, true or false. And so he paid $130,000 in hush money arranged through the publisher of the National Enquirer. And according to prosecutors, when he reimbursed his then attorney, Michael Cohen, in monthly installments,
payments. He logged those payments illegally as legal services when in fact prosecutors say it was really campaign related meant to conceal this potential sex scandal from voters. It has been a roller coaster ride uh, for for uh, for so many years now. John, I want to bring you in on this. Uh, what are you hearing from Trump's inner circle about his mindset yeah. going into this trial? You know, yeah. it's interesting. It's almost like um, you know, I've covered Donald Trump for nearly a decade for ABC. It's always this idea that there are multiple Donald Trumps. And speaking to sources, along with our colleagues over the weekend, there are two Donald Trumps right now in the sense that Donald Trump, the candidate, and Donald Trump, the defendant, and the firm, the candidate. Donald Trump was on the campaign trail all weekend, was in a good mood. Apparently, the weather where he was campaigning on Saturday was horrible. One aide said everybody was miserable but him. He was totally in the zone in his moment. Then you pivot to Donald Trump, who's now become a visiting New Yorker because of this trial, Stephanie, and everything I hear, angry livid can't stop talking about it one person said to me it's a rare moment where the public facing bravado we see of donald trump is exactly what we are the close circle of aides around him are seeing behind those closed doors he cannot get over the fact this is happening he is angry at the fact that every delay tactic they have tried to pull out of their box has failed so the reality is that this is going to be a very livid and frustrated donald trump the other thing that i hear which is actually really interesting is that donald trump is finally finding a way to bring more and more of his team around him into the courtroom, right? Having people there to support him, having not only the campaign staff, but members of the Trump organization. Because this is a case where it's been frustrating for him because of what it comes down to, right? It is about, though money and payments, it is about his personal life. And the idea that so much of that is going to be broadcast out to the public, even though there's no cameras, but what we're going to be talking about, as one person said, at the end of the day, it's really just embarrassing to him. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see if he takes a stand at any point. Well, and he's indicated he would. I mean, you know, our Olivia Rubin and Rachel Scott asked him this repeatedly over the last couple of weeks, um, or Rachel, just the last couple of days. He has said he wants to. And one of the things that Aaron and our colleague Catherine Falders are hearing is that that's going to come up this morning, potentially, ahead of jury selection because it has been raised as a possibility. So I do think knowing Donald Trump, and again, don't take my word for it, look at what we've already seen in the last couple of months in the New York Attorney General civil case. Donald Trump believes he is his best spokesperson, his best advocate, and at the end of the day, the best person to testify about him. So I do think, despite everybody saying don't do it, if Donald Trump thinks that there is a modicum possibility he in his words, can make this go away, I bet he takes the sand. We'll see. Brian, I want to bring you into this. Trump's team calls this all a fantasy. How do you expect for them to make their case here? I think this case is going to be about who are the best witnesses for the prosecution. And for the defense team, they're going to say, hey, you've got a person who has lied under oath in court to law enforcement, to Congress, and this is your star witness, Michael Cohen, and try to paint him as a person that no juror can trust. And if you can find some cracks in that kind of argument, and also pointing to Stormy Daniels saying, she's got a financial gain here, and there's a story to be told and a story to be sold. And if the defense can create any kind of doubt in their testimony going forward, that's enough for them. And I think as Donald Trump and as most defense attorneys and most defendants would say, I just need one. And jury selection here is going to be starting to kind of understand that landscape of who's a potential juror who will take the information as the defense wants to present it and say, you know what? You can't really trust the liar. Why would I trust them now? And I think that's the argument they're going to make going forward in this case. Hundreds and hundreds of people uh, basically auditioning for this role of juror. And it'll be so hard to find someone who hasn't been kind of affected by what's been in the news, uh, the rallies, and all, and, and the rhetoric that well, we've well, heard from well, the well, former president. On that. Anybody that doesn't know the defendant, right? I mean, that's so many often the thing when we've all at one point probably gone for, sat for jury selection, right? That's one question. Do you know the defendant? Who in New York, who in the United States would be able to say, no, nah, I don't know who Donald Trump is? Exactly. It'll be very difficult. All right, let's take a live look now. We're looking at live pictures at Trump Tower of Trump Tower, where former President Trump is expected to depart for court any minute. Aaron, this morning uh, may start with a hearing over what prosecutors can ask for the former president during cross-examination, whether he should take the stand. We just talked about it. Uh, what do you think? Can we expect the former president to testify? And what can we expect to hear if he does? What are your thoughts on that? Second. 
This is called a Sandoval hearing, and it's common when a defendant is thinking about taking the witness stand in his own defense. And here, uh, the defense is asking the judge to set limits on the kinds of questions that prosecutors can ask on cross-examination, because prosecutors would want to ask Trump about a lot of things, potentially embarrassing, about his sex life, given what some of this case is actually about. And, and the defense doesn't want the jury to hear any of that. They also would like to ask Trump about uh, prior civil cases involving Eugene Carroll, the writer who twice has won a civil case against Donald Trump, and about the civil case involving business fraud that the former president uh, just paid a $125 million bond to, to, to cover a civil fraud judgment. And the defense doesn't want any of that before the jury. So this hearing that could potentially take place before jury selection begins would be to set the bounds of the kinds of things Trump could ask. And if the judge says everything's fair game, well, then that may make uh, Trump think twice potentially about about taking the witness stand. Absolutely. All right. I want to uh, turn it over to Trevor Olt. This historic trial against the former president is, of course, bringing a lot of attention to the New York courthouse where jury selection is set to begin. As we mentioned, ABC's Trevor Alt is monitoring potential protests there for us. Trevor, what are you seeing? Well, we're starting to see the first people kind of file in here, Stephanie. We are in a park that is literally in the shadow of the courthouse. This is the courthouse here. You see all the media lined up on the sidewalk, and so they're going to be broadcasting throughout the day here. We have just over my left shoulder some of those first demonstrators. So this is where the pro-Trump demonstrators tend to gather. We've seen this in the past when the former president has been here before. It's been a number of uh, flags flying. And uh, Thank you, Trevor. Walking. I'm sorry. Going to have to interrupt for just one second. We are seeing the former president exiting Trump Tower right now here in New York City. You saw him there. He walked out, kind of gave like a fist pump, right? Is that what you saw, John? Yeah, I saw so a fist pump. Also see Trump's lead counsel, Todd Blanche, walking out with him. And again, that is something that, <clears throat> in speaking to sources close to the former president, every day the legal team is expected to take that commute, Stephanie, with Donald Trump to court. Probably, you know, knowing Donald Trump this morning, surrounded by the campaign and the legal staff, getting like a last minute briefing, sort of a rundown of what today is going to be. And now he's going to take that Right. It's interesting. I'm curious, and I'll know hopefully shortly. Every time Donald Trump has gone to court, though many people join him in the motorcade, most often he actually goes in the car by himself, just with his Secret Service detail, usually a little bit of time. Oddly, for Donald Trump, who likes to be surrounded by people, just to sort of have a moment, right, by himself. So we'll know for sure, certainly, if that is the case for this ride. But, you know, it's also a ride that you have to think about Donald Trump, right? This is a guy that wanted to make it in Manhattan. He has often said that Fifth Avenue, 725 Fifth Avenue, which is the address of Trump Tower, is the most famous address in New York. It's something that he always wanted to be as a kid who grew up in Queens living on Fifth Avenue. This is a very different trip for Donald Trump. It is amazing to think one year ago this time he was heading to this courtroom to be arraigned on an indictment of criminal charges. And now for this trial, just the weight of that has got to be hitting him this morning. It's it's also absolutely I agree with you, John. And also this is the as you said famous Fifth Avenue where he said many many years ago where he could shoot someone and probably get away with it and, and never lose a supporter. I mean, and that's something that Donald Trump is hoping that this trial will help him with, right? Just to build support, play into the idea it is a rigged system out to get him, and that is where Donald Trump is hoping. Though personally and criminally, this is not good for him. Politically, it could benefit him. And we are watching that convoy right now making its way uh, through Manhattan, headed to lower Manhattan. It'll probably take a little bit of time with traffic. And, of course, people who are aware that this is happening in New York City probably stopping to, to watch and take pictures. Uh, I want to bring in ABC's contributor of, uh, and former Georgia prosecutor Chris Timmons to talk a little bit about this. Uh, Trump is charged, of course, with falsifying business records to conceal criminal conduct for those that are just joining us. Chris, what does the district attorney need to prove here? Well, so they've got to prove a few different things. One, they've got to prove that he falsified the records. That's the most obvious thing. Uh, the second thing, though, that they've got to uh, prove is that they, he falsified those records as a part of a campaign scheme. Um, so it's not just that the records were false, but also that the purpose behind it or his intent when he was uh, issuing those records, when he was falsifying those records, the intent was to win the election, to keep this information that would be potentially damaging to him out of the spotlight. And so that's one of the things that a lot of people don't remember is that, you know, they think now, well, big deal. Everybody knows about Stormy Daniels. It's, it's not 
nothing uh, huge. But back then, um, you know, the, the Access Hollywood tape hadn't come out. He was still trying to protect his reputation. And back then, the Republican Party was known as, you know, the kind of the family values party. So to have something come out like that at the front of the campaign, they thought would be extremely damaging. And we are watching live images of the former president making his way through Manhattan there to the courthouse. I want to bring Aaron in. Aaron, what is the security protocol there uh, for Trump's appearance? We heard from Trevor saying that there are already people gathered there uh, near the courthouse. What are you seeing and what is that protocol? A number of streets will be blocked to traffic and then pedestrians will be halted in their tracks as the motorcade approaches until former President Trump is safely inside the courthouse and brought up to the 15th floor for today's proceedings. Stephanie, because he is effectively the Republican nominee, that increased the security protocol beyond what he would ordinarily be afforded from the Secret Service as a former American president. And so there, there's a plan outside by the NYPD. The court security officers are handling uh, inside the building and the immediate perimeter and then the Secret Service right around, uh, right around the president. This is, by the way, a criminal courthouse that that's still functioning. At least two murder suspects are scheduled to have hearings uh, today. A guy who shot a couple of people allegedly in Tompkins Square Park. Uh, he's being brought in for arraignment. So there are bad people that are being brought into this uh, courthouse at the same time that Trump is here to begin his criminal trial. And that's certainly going to be a stark image there. For those who are just joining us, we are watching uh, the historic criminal trial of President Trump that is now set to get underway any moment now. We're seeing live images here of the former president's car and his convoy making his way down to that courthouse there where our Aaron Kuturski and Trevor Alt are located. Brian, I want to bring you in. Trump's lawyers have argued that the entire process cannot fairly take place in Manhattan where they argue that too many potential jurors have negative opinions opinions about the former president. We spoke about this uh, just a few moments ago. What is your take on that? I think that's in the ability of any defense attorney to say, hey, I can see what county is not going to be beneficial for me. And I think what Donald Trump's attorneys are looking at are probably elections uh, uh, the way election sorry results from the different counties Manhattan probably not the greatest place for you uh, Brooklyn probably not the greatest Staten Island I'm probably sure he'd want to go there Orange <laughs> County he tried a few <laughs> a few counties north of, of Westchester he would love to go there a lot of times when people look at New York State they say it's a blue state through and through no there are a lot of red pockets and I think that Donald Trump is probably looking towards that area but this standard as I think John has kind of touched on it's not a matter of whether you know who Donald Trump is you like him you don't like him because he's a very polarizing figure I don't think there's many people on the on the middle in terms of how you feel about Donald Trump. The idea is, can you take that information, put it aside, and only weigh the evidence as you see it in the courtroom? And I think there are enough New Yorkers and enough Manhattanites to do that here. But of course, as a defense attorney, you always want to get the best for your client. And John, you mentioned this earlier, yeah. how Trump tried to delay this several times just last week. Yeah. If we saw another delay, yeah. what would this mean for him as he tries to run for president? Well, listen, at the end of the day, they feel that the further they can delay this, they hope to get everything past November. Now, so far, um, out of all the cases they have, because remember, this is one of four, as we were talking about a little earlier, as of all of them right now, this is the only one that has an actual trial date. What I mean by that is the other case that has a date as of now for late May is the documents case, the special counsel's case brought by Jack Smith. That one is obviously not reality because they still haven't firmed that up, so we're waiting to see. But they really want to get these past the election, hoping Donald Trump gets reelected, it all goes away, and then we move on with life. That is just going to be super complicated, right? Because now the fact of the matter is we are heading down there for jury selection with this one. The other cases, though, if we do a quick status report, if you'll indulge me, documents were waiting to find an actual trial date. The January 6 efforts to overturn the election on the federal level, the Supreme Court is going to hear arguments on that next week. Donald Trump trying to say he had presidential immunity. The court has to weigh in. If they buy it, that case goes to limbo. If they don't, the judge has already said she would try to get that back on. On track for maybe a July summer trial. The other case that we're waiting to find out, another state case, is Georgia, the Fulton County case, the efforts to overturn the election there. We were here, the two of us were here almost how many days, a week, something like that, <laughs> going through <laughs> the efforts to disqualify District Attorney Fawny Willis. Trump failed in the efforts there. So now the question is, Willis wants to get that case up and going in August, but that would be a months-long proceeding, which would drive right into November. So all of that's super complicated for the former president and his team. 
game. The one big thing that is the reality of this happening now, right, and I do think it's important, Donald Trump has to be in this courtroom four days a week for the next several weeks. That means he's not campaigning, he's not fundraising. As one aide said to a colleague of ours, Olivia Rubin, overnight, it sucks. That was literally their words because this is the critical time to build up the campaign coffers, to build the cash on hand because they've got to be ready and armed to get into the fall with Joe Biden. Absolutely. And a gag order has been put in place. Yep. Let's talk about that. Chris, I want to bring you in. The judge imposed that limited gag order against Trump last month. How careful does he need to be to avoid violating that order? And, and what happens if he does? I mean, so that's the great question. The best question here is what happens if he does? Typically, if somebody's found in contempt, they end up going into a jail cell. Um, that's, you know, kind of a, a nightmare. I don't know if you can imagine uh, Donald Trump in any sort of cell anywhere, even if it was inside the courthouse. Um, that would just be, be uh, beyond imagination. So uh, I think he's going to try to be a little bit careful, or at least you hope he's going to try to be a little bit careful. It's not a, an extensive gag order. It, it's one where he can't talk about certain individuals, and that shouldn't be too hard. And you, you figure that he's probably not not going to want to press that particular issue since, you know, it, it's not a difficult gag order to follow. Don't talk about the, the families, don't talk about, you know, the court staff, things along those lines. Um, it should, shouldn't be a problem for him. And certainly the danger there is if he violates it, what do you do if you're a judge? Do you put him in a jail cell? Do you force him to write a check? What happens? So I, th I think everybody involved doesn't want to see us uh, pass that line. But of course, it's Donald Trump and John Santucci can tell you better than anybody whether or not he's going to respect that gag order. I'll, right. tell you, I'll tell you the answer, no. <laughs> I mean, he has no self-control at the end of the day, right? I mean, this is Donald Trump who feels that he is a victim here. So any chance he can to fight back, the only thing that will hang over him, jail or fines. And if those start to rack up or actually become real, and we've seen that this judge is not messing around, that could dissuade him. And he'll be able to pull in the reins just a bit. Totally. I've seen some defendants have to write essays. That would be an interesting one if he was held in contempt of court. Th that would be stunning. Yeah, I don't think jail's gonna happen because just the logistics of it, but yeah. an essay or a fine, that but, could be on but the table. like type an essay yourself saying I didn't mean to? Or? I've had many clients have to write essays for showing up late to court and being held in contempt and mm. yeah. I wonder if he could be one of them. just wow. have somebody else write it. All right, <laughs> let's check in with ABC's uh, Trevor Alt, who is downtown there in Manhattan, uh, waiting for the former president to arrive. And Trevor, you mentioned earlier there were uh, people there gathering already. Uh, wh what are we seeing? What, are we seeing both sides here, Trump's supporters and those who are against the former president? Yes, although to be clear, we're not seeing gigantic numbers. There's not really huge demonstrations going on, at least so far. You can see over my shoulder here a lot of the pro-Trump demonstrators waving their flags. This is where they've gathered for uh, previous appearances of the former president at this courthouse. You also notice the barricades that have been set up by police. What tends to happen, at least in my experience here, is that naturally these groups of demonstrators separate on either side. And while there's not a lot of demonstrators so far, and we don't know how big these demonstrations are going to be today, uh, at least some of these people, do appear to potentially be seeking out conflict, not necessarily violence, but we have seen a few shouting matches play out already, some between uh, pro-Trump demonstrators and anti-Trump demonstrators. A few, there was just a little bit ago, there was a man uh, wearing a Latinos for Trump hoodie who was arguing with a man who was holding up an anti-Semitic sign. Uh, they refer to that man as trash. Uh, and so, you know, it, while it is generally uh, safe at, so far, generally calm, there is a, a bit of a heavy tension that is hanging in the air. We've been watching is some of the anti-Trump demonstrators have been kind of filing up here towards the park, too. It's still very early in the morning, Stephanie, so we know that it could definitely get a lot more crowded here before. And we know that police have been taking steps to prepare for those possibilities, Steph. Absolutely, yeah. and we'll check in with you throughout the morning. Uh, let's check in with Aaron now. Aaron, what can you tell us about what's going on uh, just right out there where you're positioned and also what's going to happen inside the courtroom once Trump arrives? You know, I, I was struck just noticing the, the people that are lined up to go through security, and they are, in all likelihood, the potential jurors here. I see a number of them carrying their jury summons, and can you imagine walking into the 15th floor courtroom and seeing the former president of the United States seated there and knowing that you could well be chosen to sit in judgment of him in this historic first criminal trial of a former American president? Once that jury selection does get underway, the potential jurors are going to be asked a, a series of 42 questions to try and weed out bias. The, the judge, the prosecutors, the defense attorneys know everybody's heard of Donald Trump, but they want to make sure they can set aside that view and not have it impact their ability 
to be fair and impartial. So they'll be asked things like, have you ever attended a Trump rally? Have you ever attended an anti-Trump rally? Do you follow him on social media? Where do you get your news? That was an important question for the defense because they'd like to know how people ordinarily filter their information, if at all. And so the, 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 these questions are going to be put to each one of the potential jurors. This process uh, the court is prepared to have last uh, two weeks, if necessary. And of course, we know those potential jurors can't really talk to the media about this, but I would imagine that there's there's some sort of an excitement there because as, as we've all said, this is a historic trial. So to be a part of that jury pool, that would be just astonishing. Uh, John, I want to bring you in. We're, we're talking about the it jury. Could... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Aaron. No, I was going to say, you know, it, 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 people may be excited for it. In fact, they'll, they may beforehand watch a video narrated by ABC's Byron Pitts, who some years ago put together the uh, sort of promotional video for what jury selection is all about. Of course, this is going to be a most unusual uh, voir dire, given the, the nature uh, of the case. But I think, uh, and, and, and Brian and Chris may tell you this, uh, that the lawyers on the case probably do not want a, a potential juror seated if that person is eager to be on the jury because that may be a, a sign that they have a view one way or another or, or could potentially want to, to benefit from their service somehow. Uh, but that's one of the things that the, the lawyers will try to discern what people's level of interest is and, and why they may be so keen to serve if they signal that they do. That is a really good point, Aaron, because, of course, it'd, it'd probably be difficult for them to contain their excitement. I will say I have always wanted to serve on jury duty, but as a military active duty reservist, I cannot, I have not been asked to. But, uh, John, uh, hard to find a juror without an opinion yeah. about the former president. Well, and it's interesting. I mean, jumping off what Aaron and Brian were talking about earlier, uh, first of all, we didn't get a chance to talk, so I'm outing that because we both said we needed to talk before this. But you said something that I actually wanted to talk to you about off air, which is, did they go through the voter rolls in New York to see how it turned out? They did. We didn't talk, so you were, you're good, you're good. Yeah, listen, at least you, you're, you're better at this now, than me. I, I think I'm here because of my legal expertise. <laughs> no, but it's interesting because one of the things they did do, the Trump team went through all of the polling results, the exit polling results and whatnot from previous races, and what they found is that in the last election, 15% of Manhattan residents voted for Donald Trump. So when they looked at all of the boroughs of Manhattan, they said Staten Island would be great for us, Manhattan is the worst for us, and obviously they lost their efforts to try to move the case to a different borough here, Stephanie. But what I do think is interesting, if you look through the 42 questions that have come out of this juror questionnaire, you know, it's in questions that are pretty typical, if you will, you know, opinion about crimes, et cetera, but then things that are just interesting, right? They ask about uh, different ways uh, people consume news and information. They talk about, you know, major publications, New York Times, USA Today, but they also mention social media, and they write in here, do you, you know, subscribe to Truth Social, which is the platform, of course, by the former president. They go through several books uh, that have been written about this case, one of which is Revenge, written by Michael Cohen. Obviously, he's going to be a star witness for prosecutors here. So I do think just the way that they've spent 42 questions in this question, they went out to thousands of New Yorkers to try to pull people in to this potential case. I think it does just show how many um, different issues they're trying to mitigate right, for any potential juror that's going to be coming into these proceedings. To find 12 jurors and six alternates, yeah. correct? And that's going to be the goal, and it's going to be tough. It certainly is. Uh, Chris, I want to check in with you. Walk us through the nuances of this historic case. Sure. So, I mean, I think one of the bigger things, and, and we don't want to lose this when we're talking about jury selection, is looking for leaders that are in this particular case. I mean, because uh, everybody sort of falls on a spectrum of uh, are they a follower or are they a leader? And so the, the strikes that you're going to use, the peremptory strikes, the 10 strikes that each side has, a lot of times when you're thinking about how to exercise that, bias is one factor, but the other factor in it is how big a leader is this particular person going to be? Are they going to be talking in the jury room? Are they going to be creating their own faction? And so a lot of those questions on there that seem fairly innocuous, like, you know, what is your employment? What do you do? They're looking for things like, is this person a supervisor at work? Do they have the power to hire and fire? And if they do, have they ever fired anyone before? When I was a prosecutor, if there was somebody in a jury room or in a, in a jury pool that had uh, the ability to hire and fire and they'd fired somebody in the past, I realized that that was somebody who would not hesitate at all uh, to find somebody guilty if the evidence was in that particular direction, Stephanie. That is very interesting. All right. Uh, John, prosecutors are also 
expected to outline two other alleged uh, payments. Yeah. What can you tell us about those? So the goal here is to show that catch and kill, right, which is this idea of finding a story, catching it, and then killing it by paying it off, was common practice for Donald Trump and his one-time close friend David Pecker, the publisher of the National Enquirer. What they're going to show is that in two separate instances, Karen McDougal, being another woman, a former Playboy model that Donald Trump allegedly had a months-long affair with, was paid $150,000 to make her story of Trump go away leading up to the 2016 election. There's another case involving a former doorman. Similar circumstances. It involves Trump's personal life, less money. But again, this idea that it would be damaging to Donald Trump, it could impact the election, it could impact his personal life, so thus he paid it and made it go away. The case about Stormy Daniels, though, and why this is the one that's criminal, is that it gets into the method by which Donald Trump, Pecker, Michael Cohen, and others covered it up, right? The falsifying of records, right? Saying that it was expenses for legal expenses coming back to Michael Cohen in 10 separate payments that happened after the 2016 election. And of course, that the goal in part was that the payment was made in the fall of 2016 because in Trump's eyes, according to prosecutors, it would impact Donald Trump's efforts or chances to win the 2016 election. So it is election interference. I know that's really confusing for our viewers because so many times, Stephanie, as you well know, we say the words, election interference in Donald Trump, we think of the 2020 election because of how vocal he has been about rigged and stolen. But nevertheless, the term applies to 2016, given this payment was made to, in prosecutors' theory and what they are going to argue, to make it go away to help the election. Before the election took place. Yes. All right, we are, let's take a look at these live images here. The former president arriving at the courthouse here in New York City in lower Manhattan. We saw him as he walked out of Trump Tower uh, earlier this morning, waving to those who were outside. We saw him get into his vehicle, and there he is now uh, stepping out of the vehicle in Lower Manhattan, heading into court uh, for this historic trial. Uh, Chris, we're, we're talking about these payments here uh, they were led, that were allegedly made before the election. How do you expect prosecutors to use those other payments to build their case? Sure. So what uh, they, you know, you're allowed to use what's called similar transactions or, or 404B evidence or evidence of other acts to prove your existing case if the court allows you to do it. And so what they're going to want to do is talk about those additional payments as further evidence, even though they're not charged here. They want to suggest that, look, this shows that the intent behind these payments that he was making to, to you know, Stormy Daniels through Michael Cohen uh, was to, to cover this up for the election. I mean, I think that the defense here, and Brian can tell you better than anybody what uh, how to raise is a great defense in a Manhattan courtroom, but the defense wants to say, no, 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 this was catch and kill because he didn't want to embarrass his family, which wouldn't be a crime even if those business records were fraudulent. It would, however, be a crime or, or, or to cover up the crime uh, if it was for the purpose of the election, Stephanie. So, I mean, that's really the difficult part that, that the prosecutors have to prove is exactly why he was making those payments. And so those additional acts that you're talking about, those additional acts are going to come in to show that, no, this is election related. This wasn't about his family, Stephanie. Thank you for that, Chris. All right, we are now going to switch over to our network coverage here in just a few moments. Right now, live images uh, first before we get to that of the former president there arriving in lower Manhattan for this historic trial. John, what do you think is going through his mind right now? I, I think Donald Trump in part is saying to himself right now, how did I get here? How did this happen? You know, and it's funny, you talk about that image of Donald Trump walking out, waving. Donald Trump had a habit back in the day, um, before he was a candidate Trump, of walking out of that Fifth Avenue apartment, his Fifth Avenue building, and sometimes walking around the building, Stephanie. And he did it because Donald Trump just wanted to see if he was recognized. He would do a little spin. He talks about this. He'd walk out the side door, walk around Gucci, just to see if somebody would catch his eye. Somebody would recognize that he was Donald Trump. Obviously, that was a long time ago. Every Every New Yorker at this point, I would argue, knows who Donald Trump is and what he looks like. But I do think there's a difference of walking out of that building to be noticed and a difference of heading to a day that's going to be so hard for him. I think everything for Donald Trump's bravado of I'm ready to take this, I'm curious to see what those images show. I mean, our, our colleague Peter Haralambas did a fascinating piece talking about uh, Donald Trump from the sketch artist's perspective, right? As people sat there and capture an image of him. We'll obviously see an image soon enough of him walking into court. There's no cameras in, in New York State court, unfortunately, but we will have some still images.
images of him sitting there. And I do think the demeanor of Donald Trump is important, right? As our colleagues who have been in the room have described it over time, uh, Donald Trump is often muttering to himself. He's looking around. He, he, he's very sunken, right? This is not the, the brash bravado of Donald Trump that we see on the campaign trail. This weighs on him. This annoys him. He doesn't want to be here. I do think that's critical. Absolutely. We're going to switch over to the network. Uh, they are coming on the air right now with special coverage of this historic trial. This is an ABC News special report. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. We are coming on the air for a moment never before witnessed in American history a former president on criminal trial. Donald Trump just arrived at the courthouse in Lower Manhattan for the start of his criminal trial here in New York City. Trump is charged with 34 felony counts of falsifying business records, which include allegedly concealing a hush payment to adult film actress Stormy Daniels just days before the 2016 election. He is the first president, past or present, to ever stand trial. And this is the first of four cases for Trump and his legal team. Trump is trying to juggle his legal battles at the same time he is running for president. I want to get right to ABC's Aaron Katursky, who's outside of the courthouse for us in Lower Manhattan. And Aaron, of course, we've been talking about how this is unprecedented. But just give us a, a sense of, of what you're seeing out there, what you're witnessing on the streets in Manhattan. Traffic was briefly halted. Lindsay pedestrians stopped in their tracks on the sidewalk as former President Trump's motorcade pulled up and he entered this courthouse to both cheers and boos from a small group of protesters gathered outside, helicopters flying overhead. He is, after all, a former president and the Republican nominee in 2024, so the security is extra. Everything about this is extra. On one hand, a criminal defendant going inside this courthouse to stand trial is nothing new. This courthouse has seen all manner of mobsters and murderers, but the country has never seen anything like this. A former American president on trial as a criminal defendant. Trump is now headed up to the 15th floor of the courthouse where he's going to enter a rather drab, dreary room. And that's where he's going to be spending most of his time potentially for the next couple of months seeking the White House from the 15th floor of this courthouse that he has used to his political advantage, uh, although the consequences here are certainly potentially dire because, Lindsay, these charges, if he's convicted of them, and he denies them, could land him in prison for up to four years. And, of course, we just saw moments ago him leaving Trump Tower before uh, making that trek downtown to the courthouse. I know you've talked about before prospective jurors are even brought in today. The judge may start uh, with a brief hearing. What would that be about? This would be about the potential former President Trump decides to testify if that happens. And he said he's thinking about it. The prosecutors would want to ask him all manner of potentially embarrassing questions about his sex life, about civil cases where he's been held liable for sexual assault and defamation of E. Jean Carroll, of civil business fraud, and the defense wants the judge to set limits on what prosecutors could ask. This is called a Sandoval hearing. It's common in New York State Court when a defendant is thinking of taking the stand in his own defense, and it may precede the start of jury selection, but once that gets underway, prospective jurors carrying their jury summons who have been through security are going to walk into that courtroom, see the former president, and wonder whether they'll be picked to sit in judgment of him. And Aaron, before we let you go, jury selection expected to last how long? Could be up to two weeks if necessary. The potential jurors are being asked 42 questions to weed out any potential bias. The lawyers here know Everybody in that room has heard of Donald Trump. The question is whether their view of him uh, can get in the way or not of being fair and impartial, Lindsay. Aaron Katursky for us. Want to now bring in our trial attorney and ABC legal contributor, Mr. Brian Buckbeyer. Brian, uh, give us a sense of how difficult it's going to be to select a jury in this case. Extremely difficult, but the judge has created some parameters to try to make that easier. Ultimately, we're going to find someone who doesn't have a bias one way or another, but they may know about the president about this case, but they're willing to put that aside to listen to only the evidence and information that both sides present to ultimately give a verdict, whether it be guilty, not guilty, or worst case scenario, potentially a hung jury. 
So many people will be watching. Brian Buckmeyer, we appreciate your expertise here, and our coverage continues on ABC News Live and abcnews.com. We'll have complete details on World News Tonight with David Muir. For now, I'm Lindsay Davis in New York. Have a good day. This has been a special report from ABC News. You're watching ABC News Live, special coverage of this historic first ever trial of a former president set to begin in just a few moments. Former President Trump has arrived in court in New York City for jury selection in the hush money case against him. There is an image there as he walked out of Trump Tower uh, earlier this morning. The Manhattan District Attorney charged Trump with falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney, Michael Cohen. Trump pleaded not guilty to to the 34 charges last year, calling the case election interference and a witch hunt. The judge has imposed a limited gag order, keeping Trump from making comments about jurors, witnesses, individual prosecutors, and the families of the judge and the district attorney. But Trump has pushed the boundaries of that order, targeting some witnesses and the judge's daughter on social media. The former president has campaigned on his legal battles, telling his supporters he wears the indictments as a badge of honor. Most of the Republican Party has rallied behind him, even as some privately admit the allegations make them deeply uncomfortable. We have full team coverage as jury selection is set to begin shortly. I want to bring in executive editorial producer John Santucci. Uh, John, we are learning the proceedings today may start with a hearing over what prosecutors can ask Trump during cross-examination should yeah. he take the stand. What are your thoughts on that? Will that even happen? Well, listen, Donald Trump has said now twice when asked by ABC News in the last several weeks, Stephanie, that he will indeed take the stand. He's not against it. He said it once point. Um, you know, listen, I think Donald Trump himself believes he is his own best messenger, defense, lawyer, etc. And look, go back just a couple of weeks when we were in the New York Attorney General civil case. Donald Trump did take the stand. He was up there for quite some time and believed that he did a good job. So in this case, which Donald Trump adamantly, as we know, is angry about livid, feels it is all a witch hunt, a prosecution. If Donald Trump, in his view, believes he can do something to help this go away, or if he feels that others have not done a good job, because remember, we often use this phrase with Donald Trump, playing to the audience of one, right? When others are on TV defending him, he's the first person to call with an instant review. If Donald Trump is not satisfied by the team of lawyers that are representing him to have done the job, Donald Trump will take the stand and do it all on his own. We will watch for that. We saw him walk out of Trump Tower this morning. Yeah. Uh, he seemed to be walking alone. He waved to the crowd. Yeah. What are your thoughts on his travels down there? Did he? Do you think he has a team with him? Do he you does. know he has a he, team he, with him? He absolutely has a team with him, and I would divide it actually into three buckets. First, you saw in that image when he emerged as he was pumping his fist in the air, Todd Blanche, who's become, frankly, Donald Trump's busiest attorney. Blanche is leading this case. He is also leading the two criminal probes brought by special counsel Jack Smith. Other attorneys are part of this legal team team going with him and we're told Stephanie that legal team is going to be making this commute with Donald Trump every day as these proceedings in New York continue. The second group is the campaign staff. We know that several of his top aides are going to be rotating in and out over the course of the proceedings because they are still running the Trump 2024 campaign. But I do know of several aides, including his lead spokesperson and senior advisor, Jason Miller, is with him today along with others. The third camp, which is just interesting, this is going to be a rotating cast, if you will, right? Loyal aides, Trump Organization employees, others that have been around with Donald Trump, and others that have really been close to him. And one person that we did see, our Catherine Falders, who, who's always eagle-eyed on these things, pointed it out to me, Walt Nauta. Walt Nada is that aide, you'll recall, Stephanie, that was indicted along with Donald Trump in the documents case brought by special counsel Jack Smith. Nada was with Donald Trump when he went to all of these arraignments, all of these hearings, right by his side. Today, no exception. Still there. John, thank you. I want to bring in Chief Washington Correspondent John Carl. Big picture. This is clearly significant. This is a historic trial. What are you watching for today? Well, it's a big moment. I mean, it's, this is the first time we've seen a former president of the United States go on uh, a trial, a criminal trial. It's uh, the first time we've seen a major party presumptive nominee for president uh, go on trial in the middle of a presidential campaign. And I, I think what's significant here, among many things, is that Donald Trump is there today. He doesn't need to be there. Uh, this is jury selection. Uh, the, uh, the defendant does not need to be there while jury selection is underway. Uh, but he has 
chosen to do this. Uh, he's clearly uh, irritated and angry. You can just uh, check in on his uh, Truth social feed at any moment of the day or night uh, to see uh, how he is lashing out at the very notion that he is under trial. But he is also making the fact that he is under trial essentially the centerpiece of his presidential campaign. There is no real distinction between the campaign and the trial. And of course, the larger context here is this is the first trial, but it is certainly not the last trial. Uh, this is, uh, on virtually every measure, by every measure, the least significant of the legal jeopardy uh, that, that Trump faces. Uh, he, uh, th this is a case where even if he is found guilty, uh, it is unlikely to result in actual jail time. Uh, the other cases, the classified documents case, uh, the, uh, the federal case alleging uh, he attempted to overturn uh, the presidential election illegally, uh, and of course the case in Georgia, all uh, uh, face, uh, are all much more significant and serious allegations that could result in serious years of, of jail time, but still, significant because it's first. It's something we just haven't seen in American history. We certainly have it, and as you said, John, the first, but certainly not the last. This is the first of four criminal prosecutions Trump is facing and may be the only one before the election. John, thank you so much. I want to bring in senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky. Aaron, what's at stake for former President Trump in this case, and what consequences uh, could he face if convicted? I know John touched on it just a bit there with possible jail time, possibly no jail time. What are your thoughts? It's certainly possible if the Manhattan District Attorney's Office is successful here that the DA Alvin Bragg could ask for prison time as part of the sentence. I'm not sure how likely that is uh, given Trump does not have a criminal record. This is a nonviolent offense and he's a former president. Like what does that arrangement even look like? But, uh, but politically, and I think this has played out in some of the opinion polls around the primaries, uh, Americans may look at a conviction uh, a little bit uh, more consequentially. So there are both political and legal consequences uh, at stake here. But we're a ways from that because jury selection is just now getting underway. Uh, and one of the things jurors will be reminded is that they're not to think about the potential outcome of their verdict. They just want to listen to the evidence and, and make a call without thinking of the consequences for Trump himself. I want to bring in our uh, senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, in just a moment. But before we do that, let's take a live look uh, inside the courthouse where former President Trump is attending uh, jury selection in the crim this criminal hush money case. We saw him walk in just a few moments ago. Uh, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. Trump's court appearances, of course, have become unofficial campaign events. He often uses them, as, as you know, as an opportunity to air his grievances and rally his supporters. What are you watching for there? and what impact could this have on his campaign? Look, it could have a big impact. We are just six months out from the November election. And just take a moment. I, we really cannot underscore here just how unprecedented and striking this is to have the presumptive Republican nominee not in a battleground state right now, six months out from Election Day, but inside of a courtroom. I mean, we have never seen this before, to have the presumptive party nominee, who is also now a criminal defendant. John talked about his campaign staff rotating in and out. Again, not of a critical battleground state that they need to win back in order to get the White House. They'll be rotating in and out of New York City as the former president stands trial. And when we zoom out here and look at this politically, yes, we know that the former president has used these legal charges to really supercharge and energize his campaign. His campaign is already fundraising off of this trial today. The former president is firing off one truth social post after another. But when we look at the long term, what does this mean until the November election? When we look at polls, we dig in through those cross tabs, we see that even Trump's own supporters, 13% according to a recent Ipsos poll would not vote for the former president if he were to be convicted of a crime. As a whole, according to that same poll, 24% of Republicans say they would not support him if he were to be convicted of a crime. That is a huge major red flag for the former president when we're looking at these battleground states and seeing just how tight this election could be, Stephanie. 
And it's certainly something that his teams who are with him there this morning are thinking about. Thank you, Rachel. I want to bring in ABC's legal contributor, Brian Buckmeyer. Brian, we've spoken about this. Hundreds of potential jurors are being questioned. Uh, walk us through how exactly this selection process is going to work. So, so I'll just do it really quickly. First, the judge will invite everyone to come in. Depending on what the judge wants, you may see anything from 40, 50, 60 people coming at a time. She'll, he'll just give a, a brief summary of what the case is about. It's about falsification of records. This is what the prosecutor is alleging. Probably will not give much about what the defense is, is arguing at that point, but both sides have decided what is appropriate for the judge to introduce this case on. Do you know the parties who are here? Do you uh, know anything about the case? And then from there, he will allow the jurors to kind of self-select in terms of saying, I can't do this because I don't understand the English language well enough, because I am truly biased about this, because whatever myriad of, of reasons. And typically, the way that works out, the judge would say, you know what, okay, you recognize Brian Buckmeyer, the defense attorney from ABC. Come up here. We'll see whether or not this is a reason to disqualify you. The judge says, you know what, the chaos of this case, we're just going to release everyone off the bat from going from there. Then, as, as uh, Aaron Kertersky has talked about those 42 questions, people who survive that first round will get those 42 questions, and then we'll start to whittle away and whittle away, and each side will have an opportunity to give their own questions to some degree to see who they're going to select. And we were talking about this earlier, how hard it'll be to find a juror that doesn't have an opinion of the former president. Of course, the judge most likely insisting that this needs to be done fairly. Uh, I want to bring in ABC's contributor and former Georgia prosecutor Chris Timmons. Trump is, of course, charged with falsifying business records to conceal criminal conduct. Uh, what does the district attorney need to prove here? So they've got to prove two things. I mean, first of all, it, it's kind of obvious, but you've got to prove that those are false records. Uh, but probably more important, I don't think that's going to be much of an issue in the trial, but probably the bigger issue is why was he falsifying those records? Was he doing it to cover up an illegal campaign uh, uh, expense, or was he doing that to protect his family? I mean, that's the argument that the defense is going to make, and Brian Buckmeyer can tell you, you know, what the defenses are here better than anybody. But from a prosecution side, what I'm worried about is can I make that final point? Can I prove that the purpose behind those payments was to cover up uh, some, or, or to assist uh, with the campaign expenditure that was going to help them get elected. And so, you know, intent is always a tricky thing to prove because you don't have a scanner where you can go in and look at exactly what somebody's thinking. So you have to look at the evidence around it. And part of what we talked about a little earlier was those, those other acts that were going on in the case, but also the timing of all of this um, was, you know, right before the 2016 election. And so that, that sort of makes it a little obvious, but still, when jurors get back there and they're making their decisions on intent, it's always one of the things that the prosecution's worried about, Stephanie. And we also know that uh, Man the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg uh, plans to introduce evidence about two other payments that he alleges Michael Cohen and Trump coordinated uh, to suppress that negative information. We will hear more about that throughout the day, I'm sure. John, I want to uh, check in with you. We, we could hear from some witnesses who were very close to the former president. How critical is that testimony? I think this will be remarkable. You're going to see some people who have known Trump for a long time and have been uh, extremely close to him, people uh, uh, in a couple of cases who have been with Trump since long before he was uh, a presidential campaign uh, a candidate. Uh, Hope Hicks, is, uh, who you recall is the, uh, the spokesperson for the Trump campaign in the very early days, an employee of the Trump organization before uh, Trump was a candidate, and one of the, the, you know, his very closest advisors in those early days, who served all four years uh, in the Trump White House, uh, will be testifying. I, I assume the, the, uh, the line of questioning with her is, is how concerned the campaign was about the allegations of, of Trump paying off a porn star, or the allegation of having an affair with a, a porn star uh, coming out in the midst of the campaign. Also, uh, Rona Graff, uh, a, a longtime uh, uh, Trump, uh, essentially, uh, executive secretary in the Trump organization uh, uh, could be taking the stand. Uh, we also uh, uh, may likely uh, hear from uh, Stormy Daniels herself, uh, maybe even Karen McDougal, the, uh, the former uh, Playboy uh, model uh, who uh, Trump allegedly had an affair with and uh, who, um, uh, uh, you know, her story uh, was killed by the National Enquirer. And we'll hear, you know, I think finally from David Pecker, who is the uh, uh, the, the top executive at the National Enquirer and a close Trump ally uh, who had assured, allegedly, uh, the, uh, 
uh, the former president, the then candidate, uh, that he would work to do so-called catch and kill, uh, get stories that were being shopped around uh, that would impact Trump negatively during the presidential campaign and allegedly kill those stories uh, uh, with payments. Uh, so hearing the testimony, it's one thing, you know, to, to, to read the stories, to, uh, to uh, look through what's been investigated on this, but to actually see people on the stand uh, uh, speaking under oath um, and answering questions about the, uh, uh, about the, this whole episode uh, is an entirely different thing. And of course, uh, the star witness of it all is going to be uh, Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen, who I, I knew, again, well before Trump announced he was a presidential campaign. He was uh, his attorney. He was his fixer. There was nobody more fervently loyal uh, to Donald Trump than Michael Cohen. I mean, he had at one point had said he would take a bullet for the Donald. Uh, this was somebody who was extremely uh, close to him, but is now uh, an avowed enemy of Donald Trump, seen as a traitor. He is the one at the heart of this case because he is the one who physically made the payments to Stormy Daniels uh, to, uh, to not speak about her affair, alleged affair with Donald Trump. So many key players, a real life reality show playing out today. Uh, John, as you know, this historic trial against the former president is, of course, bringing a lot of attention to the New York courthouse where jury selection is happening uh, this morning. We want to check in with ABC's Trevor Alt now, who is downtown outside of the courthouse. Trevor, how is it looking now? Some time has passed. I know you said there was a small group that had gathered uh, earlier this morning, but what are you saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been a few more people that have been pouring in here, Stephanie, and there was a little bit of a fervor as the former president did pull up to the courthouse. You can see a lot of pro-Trump demonstrators here on the other side of the barricade. So we're in a park across the street uh, from the courthouse. And what they actually tend to do, they have these barricades. They have two different ones that work their way right through the middle of the park here. Now, it's very easy to walk around them. But we have found in the past is that people kind of tend to naturally separate themselves based on the political camps that they tend to fall in. Obviously, on the far side over here, you have the pro-Trump demonstrators. So far, there have been a small handful of anti-Trump demonstrators, not a whole lot. But it also, it can be a little bit difficult to gauge just how many people are here demonstrating, given uh, the amount of cameras that we're seeing here. In fact, earlier this morning, we saw a pro-Trump demonstrator and an anti-Trump demonstrator having an argument, just those two people, but surrounding them was about two dozen people who were filming the whole thing. That's kind of representative of what we're seeing here so far this morning. We do know that the police are prepared for larger demonstrations. We're expecting to hear a press conference from uh, an anti-Trump group a little bit later. In terms of the people that we're seeing right now, I mean, you see all of the flags that are flying. On the right here, you have a flagpole with two flags. Interestingly, Stephanie, it's not just Trump 2024, it's also Trump 2028, indicating that they don't want just Donald Trump to win again. They want him to then uh, go further and have a third presidential term. These are kind of the Trump supporters that uh, are here today, the Trump or no one else, or I believe the sign says, keep America Trump, not uh, make America great again. Uh, we are expecting also a few members of uh, the fringe members of the Republican Party to show up walking around here so far this morning. We've seen Rudy Giuliani's son, Andrew, kind of walking about floating between groups. And we've also heard that potentially the disgraced former Congressman George Santos may be coming by here as well. Not huge demonstrations, at least so far, but there is a little bit of a, a tension in the air, as you might imagine. And the NYPD says they are prepared for that. Thank you so much, Trevor. And for those who are just joining us, I just want to recap uh, where we are right now. Jury selection in Donald Trump's New York hush money case is about to begin, marking the beginning of the first criminal trial of a former president. You're looking at a live image there inside the courthouse right here in New York City in downtown Manhattan. We saw the former president walk in through those doors. We saw him walk out this morning out of Trump Tower as he was making his way down town outside Trump Tower waving to those who were outside and jumping in that vehicle that was waiting for him. We saw him walking through these doors and we may be seeing him here shortly uh, and he'll most likely will have something to say about what is taking place today, a historic trial. I want to check in with Aaron Katursky, who is there downtown Manhattan. Trump's lawyers, of course, Aaron, have sought several delays in this case. We were speaking about this earlier. They, they argue that the entire process cannot fairly take place in Manhattan, where they also argue that too many potential jurors have negative opinions about the former president. What's the latest on Trump's attempts to delay this trial? 
He tried three times last week, making three different arguments, and the appeals court turned him down each time, Stephanie. At one point, as you say, he argued that too many potential jurors in Manhattan had been exposed to negative stories about him. But Trump is a, is a national, even international figure, so prosecutors said people in Manhattan have no more exposure to pretrial publicity than anybody else in the country. And the judge said a lot of the pretrial publicity was of Trump's own making because he speaks so often in the hallway at court, on social media, about the criminal charges and the case that he's uh, making. He also argued the judge's bias, that uh, the gag order imposed on him is unfair, but the appellate court turned him down in his uh, emergency request for a delay, though some of those items are still pending, even though the trial itself is about to get underway. What you're looking at behind those uh, tinted glass doors uh, is the, the private elevator that judges use. Uh, but here, uh, given who Trump is, the courtesy is uh, being uh, afforded to him. And so he'll come up to the 15th floor. Uh, he'll walk through those doors. And the courtroom uh, is just next door, a few steps away. But uh, he does have the opportunity to step toward the camera, make remarks, uh, as he often has wanted to do when he's in these courthouse settings, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Aaron. And I, Chris, uh, I know you're still with us. Uh, what's your take on that? Do his lawyers have an argument that he can't get a fair trial? Before we hear your answer, we are looking at a live picture there of the former president walking through those doors that Aaron was just describing, and he is about to speak. We're going to listen in when he does start to speak. The former president, uh, part of this historic trial, marking this today, marking the beginning of the first criminal trial of a former president. Let's listen in. Nothing like this has ever happened before. There's never been anything like it. Every legal scholar said this case is nonsense. It should never have been brought. It doesn't deserve anything like this. There is no case, and they've said it. People that don't necessarily follow or like Donald Trump said this is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. This is an assault on our country. And it's a country that's failing. It's a country that's run by an incompetent man who's very much involved in this case. This is really an attack on a political opponent. That's all it is. So I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much. As you just heard there, the former president speaking there at the courthouse saying he's there's nothing like this has happened before, which is accurate. This is the first uh, trial of this nature. There's he's the former president saying there is no case, calling it an outrage, political persecution, uh, and saying no one has ever seen anything like this. Also adding this is an assault on our country. I want to bring in Jonathan Carl. What, what do you make of this? What do you make of those uh, statements by the former president? Well, he also said that this is uh, the, the current president, although he didn't mention Joe Biden by name until he was referring to, obviously, uh, is very much involved in this case. That's not true. It's something he says all the time. This is the Manhattan district attorney. Uh, obviously, the federal government, the, uh, the, the White House, the president, not, nothing to do uh, whatsoever uh, with this case. But look, largely, uh, what you see there is a man who is uh, facing the first of several criminal trials and saying it's an honor to be there. And the case that he is making is one he makes directly to his supporters in each and every rally that he does in this campaign and through most of his uh, statements on these issues uh, on his own social media platform. Uh, he is trying to say that they, this, this broad sense of they from the president on down, his opponents uh, in the government, uh, are prosecuting him, are persecuting him because their real target is Donald Trump's supporters. That's the case he is making. I am here because their real target is you. I am going to trial on your behalf. Uh, we'll see if that's an argument that plays in a general election. Uh, a, a lot of his 
core uh, supporters within the Republican Party, the people who go to his rallies over and over again, have uh, largely come to, in some way, believe that, uh, that, that, that Trump is basically going there on their behalf, taking the slings and arrows, because, again, this broad sense of they, the deep state, um, the, uh, the, the president, all, you know, the, the sense that it's a much bigger thing than just uh, a, a specific criminal case, that they're going after Trump because their real target is their supporters. What's interesting is just look at the basics of this case. This is a case that a man allegedly had an affair with a porn star and then paid her allegedly $130,000 uh, to stay silent about that affair and uh, funneled those payments through his lawyers and then falsified business records uh, to, to, to cover up the fact that he had uh, paid uh, for, uh, you know, to, that, that so-called hush money. Um, it, it's hard to see how on, the, on a factual basis you would make the case that this is really an effort to go after Trump's supporters, that the real target is Trump's supporters. Um, how many of, of, of those people out there uh, attending his rallies have ever had an affair with a porn star or allegedly paid $130,000 to cover it up? Absolutely, and as you mentioned, those payments, which comprise the of the 34 counts of falsifying business records in the first degree. Uh, John, here we are. The day has come. He was yeah. indicted a year ago. Yep. He's now in court. As expected, Trump made statements that sound more like he's at a rally, not sure. not in court. So, uh, was it surprising? I guess not so. No, not, not so much not, surprising not for surprising you to hear him yeah. say this is an outrage and this is, as John mentioned, more of an attack on his supporters as as opposed to himself. Yeah, it's funny. You know, we all have different ways we take notes. I now have my shorthand. I know what PPP is, political persecution. That's a phrase that Donald Trump has used repeatedly, Stephanie, over the last year since this first indictment in the Manhattan case happened last March. Look. I do think Donald Trump knows what the next couple weeks are going to be. He can say it's an honor for him to be there all he wants. The reality is, as we see, he's angry, he's frustrated, he's panicked about this in one way, because the reality is this takes him away from where he wants to be, should be, with the campaign trail. And a conviction is not good. Look, look at the exit polling data we saw from some of the early states that voted. At least 9% in some cases, different voters said that a conviction could change the way they view this race, that they could could move away from supporting Donald Trump if he was convicted in any of the four criminal cases. That is now going to get tested once this case gets underway, if Donald Trump is convicted. That's part one. Part two, I do think the other thing we have to remember here is that everything that Donald Trump's campaign is built around right now, it's not build a wall, it's not lower your taxes, it's I'm a victim, right? Look at last year alone. $50 million of Donald Trump's campaign cash and super PAC went towards legal fees. That is what Donald Trump has been raising money for, is to make all of these cases go away and pay the people that are helping them there. And I do think just that image of Todd Blanche standing next to him, right? This is the guy leading the Trump legal team. The lawyers behind him a part of that as well. That has changed so much. I mean, you know, John Carl and I, I think, John, we've talked about this a couple times over the years. I think we've lost count how many lawyers Donald Trump has gone through through since he went down that escalator in 2015. Donald Trump has had so many legal problems, but none of them, none of them have come to where today is trial. And the defense, of course, saying that this case is a fantasy unsupported by evidence and testimony. We shall see. Uh, Brian, I will ask you how you would defend this case in just a moment. Want to check in with senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Rachel, Trump has put his legal battles front and center in his mm -hmm. campaign. He has not shied away from that. How is that playing with his supporters, supporters that you've spoken with? Yeah, you know, on one hand, it is energizing a lot of his base, and we see that when we go to these rallies. Of course, the former president really blazed through this Republican primary, which was very crowded at one point. He is the presumptive Republican nominee. His takeover of the, of the RNC is now complete. Lara Trump, his daughter-in-law, uh, is serving as co-chair. Michael Watley, who is someone who has fiercely defended his false claims about the 2020 election, also serving as co-chair. One of his senior advisors is now working 
with the RNC as well. And the former president, we were told, felt really supercharged after a weekend out on the campaign trail. He loved the big crowds that he got uh, in Pennsylvania. But all of that now takes a back seat. And when I was watching the former president sort of deliver these remarks, it reminded me of some of the reporting that John Santucci, Catherine Falders, and Olivia Rubin and I have had uh, within the last 24 hours about sort of how his legal team and his campaign team are on two opposite ends when it comes to this. The legal team does not want to see the former president out there in front of the microphones making these sort of statements. The campaign team does, though, because at the end of the day, this is time that the former president is not spending out on the campaign trail. And so they do want to be able to drive home the message. They know that the former president is the best communicator uh, for his campaign directly. We talked a little about some of the delays. You were talking to Aaron Katursky about that. And it reminded me, Stephanie, of just how many voters I've talked to uh, when I asked them if they could support the former president still if he is convicted of a crime. They take a pause and they go, I'll cross that bridge when we get to it. And so this is exactly what the former president will have to contend with. If he is possibly convicted in this trial, what that will mean, the political implications of that could be very big for his campaign, especially in those battleground states that he has to win back in order to clinch the White House, Steph. Certainly could be consequential. Rachel, thank you. Brian, I want to bring you in. Donald Trump's lawyers have argued that Bragg's case is a deluded fantasy that relies on the testimony of a convicted felon. Of course, they're referring to Michael Cohen. You're a defense attorney. How, how would you defend this case? Very careful. I think it boils down to two different categories. It's about credibility and about preserving an issue uh, for potential appeal. Be and I'll, I'll start with the second one. This is just as much about the first case as it is about the second case. And what do I mean by that? Whether or not Donald Trump loses in this case, there is going to be an appeal. And what issues flow from this case are going to be the battlegrounds that I think are ultimately going to decide this case. Is this a situation of a prosecutor trying to put a square peg into a circular hole where this type of law has never been used for campaign issues? The other issue, I'll go back to the first one now, would be about credibility. Ultimately, the prosecutor is building their case on a man that was convicted of five counts of tax evasion, a count of making false statements, a count of lying to Congress, making financial uh, false statements, all of this. And the prosecutor is saying, you know what, he did three years in a federal prison for lying to everyone he's been before now believe him today. And the defense is going to make the argument is, how can you? We have an actual phrase uh, in court that they're going to try to move, I think, this judge to. It's called falsus in uno, falsus in omnibus. If you're false in one thing, you can be false in all things. And if they can catch Michael Cohen in a lie, they're going to try to throw out his testimony altogether and say you can't build a case on a liar. We'll see how that plays out. Um, just want to remind our viewers, from the start of jury selection to a verdict, this trial could run from six to eight weeks. Uh, I want to bring in uh, Catherine Falders uh, this morning. Uh, may start with a hearing over what prosecutors can ask Trump during cross-examination should he take the stand. We spoke about this earlier. But, Catherine, can we expect Trump to testify? And what can we expect to hear if he does? More of the same? More of what we just heard a few moments ago? Look, probably more of the same if I were Trump's lawyers, and we know from talking uh, to sources close to his legal team that they probably don't want him to take the stand. However, he has made clear that uh, he will likely testify. So what's happening uh, this morning is a hearing that's typically a standard practice before jury selection. It's essentially a hearing to determine what uh, prosecutors can cross-examine Trump on should uh, he take the stand. And, of course, they do this with defendants who have indicated that they want to testify. And Trump has told ABC News that he would be willing to. So that is likely something that will happen this morning. There could be some fireworks from that. We can expect uh, Trump's attorneys will push back on um, what prosecutors will ultimately want to question him on. Uh, but again, that is likely to happen this morning, later in the morning, uh, moving into jury selection. Thank you so much for that, Catherine. And I want to bring in Chris uh, Timmons. Tr Trump is charged with falsifying business records to conceal criminal conduct. Uh, do you think prosecutors have a strong case here? I do, but I think Brian sort of hit the nail on the head in that, you know, it's a little bit of a technical case here. I, I think in terms of proving the underlying facts, look, they've got documents, you know, they're going to be able to show that the payments occurred. They're going to be able to show that they went to her. I mean, it's just unusual in, to even think about that, you know, you've got a, a presumptive nominee at that point, or actually the nominee at that point, making payments to a porn star uh, to cover up an alleged affair. I mean, that's just, you know, kind of, kind of craziness. It's certainly um, something that we've seen, certainly that something that's unprecedented. Uh, but I think the, the you know, the, 
the, the prosecutors have got the documents that they're going to be relying on heavily. So they're not as worried, I, I would think, uh, as far as some of the credibility points that Brian brought up earlier, although that is the way that, that you're going to hit this case. He's absolutely right. Uh, but from a prosecutorial standpoint, Ryan's talking about that that you know square peg and a round hole type thing um, where you are sort of crafting this statute in a way that it's never been done before and the jurors might have a problem with that and that's you know in part where the credibility uh, could play in if they don't like the witnesses if they don't like the charges they may acquit. And again, this should take about six to eight weeks. Prosecutors are expected to present a lengthy case to demonstrate how Trump uses power and wealth. Chris, thank you so much. Also, our thanks to Aaron Katursky, Jonathan Carl, Rachel Scott, John Santucci, and Brian Buckmeyer. Thank you all very much for your time. We will have continuing coverage of the former president's trial all day long, but we're also following another major story, fallout over Iran's assault on Israel, unleashing hundreds of missiles and drones, most of them shot down or failing to reach their target. Israel's war cabinet weighing a response as President Biden and other world leaders try to prevent further escalation. We have team coverage on the tensions in the Middle East. That's coming up next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love? Pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is meeting with his war cabinet today to discuss potential responses to Iran's attack. The cabinet met yesterday but ended their meeting without making a final decision about a response. This after Iran launched a massive missile and drone barrage at Israel over the weekend. Two U.S. officials confirmed to ABC News that at least half of them failed before reaching their targets. CENTCOM says 99% of the others were intercepted. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman has the latest from Tel Aviv in Israel. The world on edge as Israel weighs its response to that swarm of more than 300 Iranian missiles and drones early Sunday, targeting military installations in Israel, some of them streaking right over the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. Israel's war cabinet convening overnight but announcing no decisions. It was one of the largest salvos of ballistic and cruise missiles ever fired. But Israel's missile defense system, along with a combined international effort led by the U.S., intercepting 99% of those threats, including more than 100 ballistic missiles, according to the IDF. U.S. forces alone taking out nearly 90 drones and missiles long before they reached Israel's borders. President Biden on the phone with those airmen Sunday. It made an enormous difference, potentially saving a lot of lives. There was global condemnation of the attack and the G7 with an emergency meeting late Sunday to coordinate a response. 
Some of the missiles did make it past the defenses. In a video circulating online verified by ABC News, you can see missiles striking Israel's Nevotim Air Base. The aftermath seen here, debris from a rocket booster found in southern Israel. Israel saying a seven-year-old girl, severely wounded, was the only casualty. Key to Israel's success, its multi-layered aerial defense system, including the Iron Dome, which specializes in short-range rockets, David Sling, meant to intercept medium-range projectiles, and the Arrow, designed for long-range missiles. Iran has made it clear that it considers the matter closed. An Israeli official tells me that Israel will likely choose the time and place of its retaliation. And there is concern here that a tit-for-tat style response would permanently change the rules of the game. And the U.S. has been very blunt. If Israel chooses to retaliate against Iran, it'll be doing so alone. Matt Gutman for us there in Israel. Matt, thank you. And earlier on Good Morning America, George Stephanopoulos spoke to top White House national security spokesman John Kirby about Iran's attack on Israel, saying Iran is not the power it purports to be despite its military and ballistic missile capability. Here's a portion of that conversation. Iran's missiles did not get through. Are they a paper tiger? I think this showed uh, not, a, not, not in, in addition to Israel's military superiority. I, I think it did show, it did demonstrate uh, that Iran uh, is not uh, the power that it uh, purports to be, that it doesn't have that same military superiority. I want to bring in senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez, ABC News contributor General Robert Abrams, and foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burridge, who is in Tel Aviv, Israel, for us this morning. Thank you all for joining us. Louis, a senior U.S. official says that the Biden administration believes that Israel will strike Iran, saying most of the world thinks this is over. It is not. But Iran has made clear it considers the matter closed. So how significant is that? Well, Stephanie, it's going to be exactly what does Israel do next? And we know that the Israeli War Cabinet has been meeting, but as you said, U.S. officials anticipate that Israel will likely retaliate. Now, what happens next if Israel does retaliate, and how much will they retaliate against Iran? Will it be against proxies? Will it be directly inside Iran? One of the things that I think officials are looking at is if there are Iranian casualties, does that mean that Iran retaliates yet again? As you heard from John Kirby there, Iran maintains a large uh, st stockhold of weapons, uh, particularly ballistic missiles. Uh, what we saw there uh, being launched this weekend, those 115 to 135 missiles from inside Iran, while merely half of them may have failed to reach their targets, they still have a very large inventory inside of Iran. They've been working on those programs for years, and so there is still a threat that that there could be if one retaliation could lead to another. And certainly an escalation if that does happen. General Abrams, I want to bring you in. According to CENTCOM, U.S. forces destroyed 80 drones and at least six ballistic missiles out of the more than 300 launched by Iran. But many didn't have to be shot down. At least 50 percent of them either failed to launch or failed in flight or crashed before reaching their targets in Israel. What do you make of that? And, and was this just a show of force by Iran? Well, first on the on you know not engaging every inbound missile. Um, this is the integrated air and missile defense by Israel and all of their partners in the region, led by the United States and Central Command. Um, you know, this is a sensor electromagnetic sensor program that expands far beyond um, just Israel, and it gives us absolute clarity on the trajectory of inbound missiles. So. You get to save a lot of money and save a lot of missiles by not having to shoot down every one if it's going to land in the middle of the desert. So that's point number one. I, I think that this is uh, the display that we saw on Saturday from Iran, uh, poorly synchronized, poorly executed, and well defended by a well-trained, well-equipped Israeli force as well as the other partners in the region. Um, so I think that the outcome, the minimal, very minimal damage um, was, you know, likely to happen based on all of those factors. But um, there's still more to come, and we'll just have to wait and see what Israel responds with. And in, in general, we overnight, U.S. officials said it would not participate in any Israeli counterattack. But could that change if this all escalates? I don't—I uh, would take the, the White House and others at their word. I don't see— 
um, this in vital national interest of the United States to participate in any follow-on attack by Israel into Iran. But having said that, there are, there are we have lots of U.S. forces in the region, and there is a chance that our U.S. forces could become targets, um, you know, today, tomorrow, later this week, again, as they have been over the last few months. Uh, so we'll just have to wait and see what the U.S. response will be. Yeah, we certainly will. Uh, thank you. Tom, I want to bring you in. The president met with the G7. How are world leaders reacting to this? What have you heard? Well, I think, you know, similar to the U.S., uh, allies like the U.K. and France are lining up behind the White House and calling on Israel for a restrained response. But I think, you know, one element of this is, which is fascinating, it's sensitive and significant, is the role that Arab nations, neighbors of Israel, played in this. We know that Arab nations allowed Israeli jets and other allied jets uh, to operate in their airspace, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. A U.S. official telling us that Arab nations' radar were also key in detecting targets as they fly towards Israel. But Israeli officials are being coy about other uh, elements of that collective defense from Arab nations because, of course, at any time it would be a sensitive matter for those uh, governments. But, of course, after six months of war in Gaza and a very high level of suffering in the Gaza Strip, it's an incredibly sensitive matter. Of course, uh, Israeli officials in a briefing I was just on really talking up the role the United States played in coordinating that overall response involving France, the UK, uh, even Germany in terms of refueling aircraft, uh, saying that, you know, that US general Michael Carilla, who was here in Israel just a day before the attack uh, was vital in setting up that collective uh, defense. And that defense came over months and months of training and coordination and planning. And of course, uh, critical was also the warning, the intel Israel got before that attack. Thank you so much. We will certainly keep a close eye on how this situation progresses. Our thanks to Louis Martinez, General Robert Abrams, and of course, Tom Sufi Burge. Thank you all. Coming up, Hannah Gutierrez, the armorer on the fatal set of Alec Baldwin's movie Rust, is set to learn her fate today. What the maximum penalty is, plus the day's other top stories right after this break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Sabrina. And we're moms, juggling tons of stuff every day, like all you moms out there. And you know what we love? Really love pop culture. So listen now to our new podcast, Pop Culture Moms, wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to ABC News Live. It is a historic day for former President Trump as jury selection is underway in his criminal trial in his hush money case. Prosecutors put Trump at the center of an alleged scheme to bury damaging stories of an affair before the 2016 election. He has pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records. And that image you're seeing there, that was video of the former president uh, walking through that uh, there in the courtroom, walking to the courtroom in downtown Manhattan. We, of course, will have team coverage all day on ABC News Live. Now to some of the day's other top stories. The weapons supervisor for Alec Baldwin's film Rust will learn her prison sentence today. Hannah Gutierrez was convicted of involuntary manslaughter last month for the death of another crew member who was shot when a gun held by Baldwin went off. She faces up to 18 months in prison. Baldwin is also charged with involuntary manslaughter. His trial is scheduled to start in July. ABC News has learned the FBI is now investigating whether criminal wrongdoing led to the crash that brought down the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Sources say agents are now on the cargo ship looking into whether the crew left port with the knowledge something could be wrong with the ship. Six people were killed when the container ship Dolly struck the piers of the bridge on March 26. 
And the highly anticipated WNBA draft tips off tonight. Caitlin Clark is expected to be the number one pick with Angel Reese and Camilla Cardoso not too far behind. The excitement comes after the women's NCAA championship game drew more viewers than the men's final for the first time ever. You can see the WNBA draft live tonight at 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. Thank you so much for streaming with us on this morning. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you anytime. With the latest news context and analysis, you can always find us on various streaming services as well, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. News never stops. We'll be right back. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The crown in crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. It's the crush of families. On the ground in Ukraine. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Reporting from Burlington, Vermont, right in the heart of the path of totality. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good morning, I'm Stephanie Ramos. You're watching ABC News Live. First, we are following breaking news this morning. On this Monday morning, the historic first ever trial of a former president getting underway. Former President Trump is now in court in New York for jury selection in the hush money case against him. Earlier, he addressed reporters and these images here just coming into us of the former president sitting in that courtroom. But we heard from the former president earlier today calling this all an outrage and saying he is proud to be there. This is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. The district attorney charged Trump with falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney, Michael Cohen. Trump pleaded not guilty to the 34 charges last year, calling the case election interference and a witch hunt. We have full team coverage as jury selection gets underway, starting with ABC News' investigative reporter, Olivia Rubin, and a look at what's at stake. I never thought anything like this could happen. For the first time in American history, a former president of the United States standing trial on criminal charges. These are felony crimes in New York State, no matter who you are. Former President Donald Trump fought repeatedly to delay the case beginning today, accusing him of illegally hiding payments he orchestrated to porn star Stormy Daniels to silence her affair allegations during his 2016 White House bid. The evidence will show that he did so to cover up crimes relating to the 2016 election. Multiple judges rejected Trump's last-ditch efforts to halt the trial brought by the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Now hundreds of potential jurors are being questioned in a courthouse downtown. 
And I don't know how you can have a trial that's going on right in the middle of an election. Not fair. Not fair. Lawyers for both sides will whittle that group down to just 12 jurors and six alternates, asking them questions to root out any bias. It includes, have they ever attended a Trump rally, subscribed to the conspiracy movement of QAnon, or followed an anti-Trump organization on social media? The process expected to take as long as two weeks. The whole point of jury selection is to find out not just do people know who the parties are involved, not just did they know the charges, but rather can they set all of that information aside and be a fair and impartial juror in this particular case. The charges, 34 counts of falsifying business records. The crime, not the alleged sexual activity, but the paperwork used to keep the payments to Stormy Daniels quiet. Prosecutors say Trump disguised the payments he made to his one-time lawyer and fixer Michael Cohen for Daniels to bury her affair claims, labeling them instead as legal payments for a non-existent retainer agreement with Cohen. He directed me to make the payments. He directed me to become involved in these matters. Prosecutors say those disguised checks cut from the Trump organization to Cohen were part of a larger catch-and-kill scheme devised by Trump and his allies with the publisher of the National Enquirer. Together, prosecutors say they would repeatedly buy negative stories about Trump, only to never publish them. He was very concerned about how this would affect the election. To help his campaign. To help him and the campaign. Trump has pled not guilty to the charges and has called the case election interference. He also claims the affair with Daniels never happened. Did you know about the $130,000 payment to Daniels? Trump is no stranger to the legal system, but he has only come face to face with a jury during his presidential bid for the White House once before. Earlier this year, a nine-person jury heard a civil defamation case brought against Trump by the writer E. Jean Carroll who accused Trump of sexually assaulting her in the 1990s and then defaming her when she went public with her allegations in 2019. There, Trump personally analyzed the potential jurors, often craning his neck and turning around as they answered questions. He never attended the first trial, where a jury found him liable for sexual assault and defamation of Carroll. Some jurors the second time around in the trial to determine damages against Trump appeared visibly shocked when they entered the room only to see the former president of the United States seated there. After days of witnessing Trump's behavior in court, including storming out of the courtroom, that jury of seven men and two women found Trump liable for defamation and ordered him to pay $83 million in damages. We will immediately appeal. We will set aside that ridiculous jury. Now Trump is repeating that process again, but these jurors will be charged with deciding a criminal case. If convicted, he could face a maximum of four years in jail for each of the 34 counts. And again, this is the first of four criminal prosecutions Trump is facing. Our thanks to Olivia Rubin for that report. I want to bring in our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. John, this is a significant trial. We haven't seen this before, a trial involving a former president. What are you watching for? Yeah, and not only that, but a trial that's playing out in the middle of a presidential campaign, not just a former president, uh, but the Republican, presumptive Republican nominee for president now. Uh, what I am watching for is how Trump will use the next six to eight weeks. And remember, this is a, a trial that is going to play out over the course of the next two months throughout this, uh, the, the, a very significant part of, of the presidential campaign. Uh, and he doesn't need to be there today during jury selection, but once this trial is underway, he is required uh, to be there in the courtroom. The court will be in session uh, for four uh, days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And he is going to use this as not just uh, uh, an effort to defend himself against these criminal charges, but he will use it as a center piece of his presidential campaign. Uh, we saw a little dose of that uh, just a short while ago when he came out in front of the cameras and called this a political prosecution um, and suggested that somehow the, uh, the Biden White House was behind what the Manhattan District Attorney is doing. I think we'll be seeing a lot more of that. Uh, but this is a... Uh, th th this is both an opportunity for Trump to lean into what is the central message of his campaign, which is essentially that he has been a victim uh, and, by extension, his 
uh, supporters have been victims of a unfair political prosecution. Uh, but but there's a real risk here because we have seen a uh, time and time again uh, that voters uh, say that whatever they may or may not think of his indictments, that actually a, a felony prosecution, that him being convicted of a felony could well change how they view Donald Trump. And John, you bring up a good point that the president, the former president, didn't need to be there today for jury selection. I want to bring in our legal contributor, Brian Buckmeyer. I do want to, would like you to break down the jury selection process, but share with our viewers why he may have shown up today when he doesn't really have to be there. Well, it's a criminal case rather than a civil case. So in a criminal case, you have the right to be present for each and every proceeding of your case. So it's his right to be there. And with most rights, you can waive them as well. But put aside for a second, and I know it's hard to, that he's the former president, he's Donald Trump. Any criminal defendant should be present during jury selection because it just shows them how much you care in terms of those proceedings. Ultimately, a jury of your peers is going to be making a decision about you, and you don't want to be absent for that. Think about the way we talk about the E. Jean Carroll with Donald Trump, that he wasn't there for the guilt phase, but he was there... Uh, uh, for the for the sentencing portion there's always that air of did you really care why were you not there and then in terms of your second part of your question in the process again it's going to be the judge having their preliminary statements do you know this person this is the nature of the case this is how long the case will go do you think you'll be able to sit and be impartial in this case for those people who say no i can't on their on their own the judge is going to say you're excused maybe this isn't the right trial for you and then we're going to go through those 42 questions that we've heard uh, john and aaron talk about and potentially an opportunity for either the prosecution or the defense to have their own questions. And through that, you're going to try to get that fair and impartial jury, as everyone says, but also to a large extent, you're going to try to find a jury, whether you're the defense or prosecution, to someone who's going to be receptive to your theory of the case. Are you, as a defense attorney, are you going to believe that if I say, hey, once a liar, always a liar, don't believe them now, oh, that's a good thing for you? Maybe the defense wants that. Prosecutors are going to try to eliminate that person. The prosecutor will say, well, do you believe in law enforcement? Do you, or do, you, do you believe in these charges? Do you think that Donald Trump did something wrong? I want that person, but the defense is going to try to get them out. And it's a bit of gamesmanship until you get that 12 plus alternates. Mm -hmm. It'll be hard to find a, a juror that doesn't have an opinion of Donald Trump. I mean, we've spoken about this. It's going to be a very difficult process. John, I want to turn to you, our executive editorial producer here. What are Trump's attorneys looking for in these pr prospective jurors? Well, listen, they know they're not going to get a MAGA supporter that's, you know, out there waving a flag, right? But they also don't want somebody that thinks Donald Trump is the worst person on the face of the earth. So they need somebody that's somewhat middle of the road, somebody that's followed the case, obviously. They know that they're not going to get away from that. But somebody doesn't have a really strong opinion against Donald Trump. One thing I've heard uh, from one uh, Trump advisor is that, look, we need somebody um, that is open-minded, hears us, but in some ways, they say, look, you know what, if you get like a cop or a firefighter or somebody that, you know, they think would be a Trump supporter or at least open to his perspective on this, that is a win for us. I also think that, you know, it's anybody um, that comes in hostile towards Trump. I mean, Brian, we were talking about this earlier, is not somebody they're going to want, quite literally, and obviously in New York, there's a lot of that tension. But Donald Trump, one of the things that we've reported, you know, Rachel Scott talked about this earlier, uh, her, Catherine Falders, and my colleague Olivia Rubin and I, is that Donald Trump still believes there are some New Yorkers that support him. And one of the things that we're expecting, Stephanie, is that during the off days of this trial, Wednesdays, the day that Donald Trump doesn't have to be in court, one of the things the campaign is talking about is campaigning around the Big Apple, if you can believe it, right? Actually getting into some communities that Donald Trump believes he has some support. I'm not sure where that's going to be in New York, especially in Manhattan, where only in the 2020 election they won 15 percent of the vote on the island. But nevertheless, that's what they believe. Let's turn to ABC News contributor and former Georgia prosecutor Chris Timmons. Chris, Trump is charged with falsifying business records to conceal criminal conduct. The case focuses on following the money. So kind of walk us through this. How can we expect prosecutors to really lay out that evidence? So I think, you know, Stephanie, it, it's it's not that exciting, uh, but a lot of the case is going to revolve around the documents. I mean, I think they're going to be able to prove that these payments were made. You've got the, the live witness testimony, which obviously has some credibility issues when you're talking about one witness in the form of Michael Cohen, who's been convicted of perjury, and then the other witness, uh, who's Stormy Daniels, who is a porn star, uh, and obviously is going to have some baggage that's going to be associated all, along those lines and, and with that, her former employment. Uh, but I think they're going to focus on the documents. I think they're going to focus on 
kind of consistencies with those documents from their witnesses. I mean, the witnesses are going to take some credibility hits, just as Brian talked about earlier. Uh, but, you know, when you match their their statements up with the documents, you can build credibility using those documents to, to help you get your case uh, across the goal line. Uh, the other thing, though, Stephanie, one of the things I want to touch on with regard to jury selection is it's important to look for leaders when you're talking about who you want on that jury. You're not just looking for folks that are going to be unbiased, but you really, really want to know who's going to be back in that jury room talking, who's our potential for because you're going to have jurors that fall into two camps. You're going to have folks that are followers and folks that are leaders. And when you're in a jury selection type situation, you kind of almost have like a, a four level grid where you're looking at people and trying to figure out, are they leaders? Are they sympathetic to my case? And if they're against us uh, and they're a leader, we want to strike them. And the former president will sit throughout all of this. Chris, thank you so much. Our thanks to, to Jonathan Carl, John Santucci, Brian Buckmeyer uh, as well. We will have continuing coverage of the former president's trial all day long, but we're also following another major story, fallout over Iran's assault on Israel, unleashing hundreds of missiles and drones, most of them shot down or failing to reach their target. Israel's Boer cabinet weighing a response as President Biden and other world leaders try to prevent further escalation. We have team coverage on the tensions in the Middle East, and that is coming up. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine, Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is meeting with his war cabinet today to discuss potential responses to Iran's attack. The cabinet met yesterday, but ended their meeting without making a final decision about a response. This after Iran launched a massive missile and drone barrage at Israel over the weekend. Two U.S. officials confirmed to ABC that at least half failed before reaching their targets. CENTCOM says 99% of the others were intercepted. I want to bring in and senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez, and ABC News contributor General Robert Abrams, and foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burge in Tel Aviv, Israel, for more on this. Selena, I want to start with you. We hear President Biden is urging Prime Minister Netanyahu to slow things down. What more do you know about their conversation? Yes, yeah, Stephanie. Well, the president essentially told Netanyahu to take the win, that he's already proven that Israel's military is superior. So from here, as you say, he should just take it slow, think carefully and strategically. The president also made clear that if Israel decides to strike back, that they will do so alone. The president has been deeply concerned since the start of this conflict that this could escalate into a wider war. So while the U.S. showed it's willing to defend Israel, it's staunchly behind that, it's not going to go on the offensive. Now, it appears here that Iran is 
is saying they're essentially done here unless Israel decides to respond and they're warning they would then respond accordingly. So right now the ball is very much in Israel's court. But despite the pressure we're seeing from U.S. officials onto their Israeli counterparts, a senior administration official says they believe that Israel still will strike back and that this is not over. Now it's just a matter of time. We'll see what happens. Thank you, Selena. Louis, uh, a senior U.S. official, says that the Biden administration believes that Israel will strike Iran, saying, quote, most of the world thinks this is over. It is not. But Iran has made clear it considers the matter closed. So how significant is that? And, and what could a possible retaliation mean for that region? Stephanie, as Selena just said, the ball is in Israel's court right now because that Israeli war cabinet is going to have to determine what kind of a response they're actually going to do or undertake against Iran. It could be that they could target proxies. It could be that they could actually strike at inside uh, Iran, just as Iran did against Israel this weekend. How could they go about doing that? Well, one, in one, one plan long seen has been that Israel, with its high-end uh, fighter jets, could launch attacks inside of Iran. But that means we undertake taking um, long missions that require uh, air midair refueling. Now, while Israel does have midair refueling, the United States has even more. And I think what we've seen, the message privately being expressed to Israel is that the United States will not assist Israel if it undertakes some kind of a military response against uh, Iran. Uh, but again, Israel has much many capabilities. They have long-range ballistic missiles of themselves so that they may not need uh, any kind of manned aircraft. But again, it's all up to Israel now to determine what happens next. And then if there are any casualties inside of Iran as a result of this new retaliation, we could see things escalate if Iran retaliates yet again. Uh, General Abrams, I want to turn to you. According to CENTCOM, U.S. forces destroyed 80 drones and at least six ballistic missiles out of the more than 300 launched by Iran. Overnight, U.S. officials said it would not participate in any Israeli counterattack. And as Louis just mentioned, the U.S. staying out of it. But could we see that change if this escalates, if there is this back and forth? Do you see the U.S. stepping in at any point? Well, at this point, based on all the information that we've seen and heard from, you know, all the parties and especially from the White House, I'd say no. I don't think we'll see U.S. forces participating in an Israeli direct attack on Iran. But we should remind everyone that we, we've got a lot of troops there in the Middle East, as you know, Stephanie. And uh, there is a good chance that uh, there could be collateral damage or even a direct attack against U.S. troops by Iran or by Iranian proxies. And then that could actually change the calculus in terms of the administration. But for now, I'd say we should take the administration at its word that they will not participate and authorize participation in an Israeli kinetic attack against Israel, I mean against Iran. Having said that, though, I'd caveat by saying Israel has a full range of options, both kinetic and non-kinetic, and especially with cyber, um, that could require some U.S. assistance, but it would obviously not be known to the world. And we, of course, will see with time what direction Israel does go in. Tom, the Israeli war cabinet members are meeting today where officials are considering a response to Iran's attack. What's the latest on that? Yes, Stephanie, we just had word that the Israeli war cabinet meeting has broken up. It's the second meeting of the war cabinet in 24 hours. Uh, we have no indication at this stage whether a decision was reached uh, in that meeting. Uh, of course, I think there is a consensus here in Israel that there has to be a response. The question is what type of response, the scale of the response and the timing of that response. And of course, as the general just said, uh, yes, all options are on the table. It could be a cyber attack. Uh, more hardline elements in Netanyahu's government are pushing for a more hardline military response directly against Iran. But of course, allies like the United States, other allies in Europe, Arab nations who were critical, of course, in helping Israel defend itself against Iran in the early hours of Sunday morning, uh, they're all pressing Israel to be restrained, to not give something to Iran that means that they have to necessarily strike back against Israel. And then we're into a much more dangerous ballgame. 
Certainly a situation we will continue to watch throughout the day very closely. Our thanks to Selena Wang, Louis Martinez, General Robert Abrams, and of course Tom Sufi Burge. Thank you all. This unprecedented attack by Iran now has us asking what could the impact of the strike have on our markets and oil prices? Our business reporter Alexis Christophorus is tracking that part of the story for us. Good morning, Alexis. Good morning, Stephanie. Yeah, we're taking a look at the oil markets and the stock market because unrest in the Middle East, of course, has Wall Street on high alert. Oil prices are a little changed today after rallying Friday in anticipation of Iran's attack on Israel. Analysts say the risk of escalating warfare in the Middle East has already been factored into this year's roughly 20 percent rise in crude oil prices. And stocks are actually rallying today after having their worst week in months. That's after this weekend's drone and missile attack was largely thwarted by an international effort and did little damage. Now, stocks are also reacting to a much better than expected report on March retail sales today. That report, just the latest proof that Americans continue to spend despite stubbornly high inflation. Now, what happens next with oil and the stock market largely depends on Israel's response to the attack. Oil prices are currently at a six-month high of around $90 a barrel. That's a level we haven't seen since the early days of the Israel-Hamas war. Analysts say if the conflict escalates, we could see oil easily top $100 a barrel as turmoil in the Middle East then threatens oil supply in that region and could put key shipping routes in jeopardy. If that were to happen, it could send gas prices above $4 a gallon and also push inflation even higher. Remember, just weeks ago, U.S. stocks were rallying to record highs on hopes the Fed would deliver three interest rate cuts this year. Those hopes were dashed after new reports confirmed inflation is back on the rise. And in addition to all of this, the conflict in the Middle East, those March retail sales reports, investors focusing on corporate earnings from major companies are coming out today and in the weeks ahead. They're looking for more clues on inflation and, Stephanie, the health, the overall health of the U.S. economy. That happened really quickly. It really did. Thank yeah. you, Alexis. Sure. We'll have more of the day's top stories right after this break. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Let's take a look at some of the day's top stories. The weapons supervisor for Alec Baldwin's film Rust will learn her prison sentence today. Hannah Gutierrez was convicted of involuntary manslaughter last month for the death of another crew member who was shot when a gun held by Baldwin went off. She faces up to 18 months in prison. Baldwin is also charged with involuntary manslaughter. His trial is scheduled to start in July. Security at the Boston Marathon is on high alert after law enforcement agencies have identified what they're calling a broad set of potential soft targets for an attack. That is according to a threat assessment obtained by ABC News. Officials say the most significant threat facing this marathon comes from lone offenders and small groups of individuals looking to commit acts of violence, particularly at designated viewing areas. 
Boston law enforcement says 48 local, state, and federal public safety organizations will be positioned throughout the city. And the path of that race, police say they know of no specific threats to the area. And in much lighter news, the highly anticipated WNBA draft tips off tonight. Caitlin Clark is expected to be the number one pick with Angel Reese and Camilla Cardoso not too far behind. The excitement comes after the women's NCAA championship game drew more viewers than the men's final for the first time ever. You can see the WNBA draft live tonight at 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. We do want to thank you for streaming with us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis. We'll be right back. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? Appreciate <laughs> you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I watch do. you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. I'm Stephanie Ramos. We are following breaking news on this Monday morning. The historic first ever trial of a former president is getting underway. We're getting a look at former President Trump inside the courtroom for jury selection in the hush money case against him. Earlier, he addressed reporters saying he is proud to be there. Take a listen. This is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. The district attorney charged Trump with falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney, Michael Cohen. Trump pleaded not guilty to the 34 charges last year, calling the case election interference and a witch hunt. We have full team coverage this morning as jury selection gets underway. Want to bring in ABC's executive editorial producer, John Santucci, ABC's legal contributor, Brian Buckmeyer, senior reporter, Catherine Falders, and ABC's political director, Rick Klein, thank you all for joining me this morning. John, I want to start with you. We're learning the judge has already denied some of Trump's motions. What are you hearing from inside the court? Well, for the moment, it's really just going through the process of things, right? Setting the calendar, days we're not going to be in, we're going to wrap the day early for Passover. I mean, a lot of the process stuff, we're starting to get into the actual motions here. The judge already saying that, you know, he's keeping the case. We're going ahead here, folks, but thanks for trying. They're also getting into the beginning portions of what they're going to look for as far as asymmetry with the jury. Again, just going through the motions. Now, Donald Trump, according to our Lucian Brueggemann, who's watching the feed from the overflow of court and others that, of course, have been watching Donald Trump for the last several you know, minutes that he's actually been in this courtroom, uh, say that the former president's 
demeanor uh, is listening intently. His arms folded, he's moving around in his chair a little bit, he's leaning in at certain times. I mean, taking all of this in, right? He's flanked by his legal counsel, Todd Blanche, of course, the lead attorney, lead attorney on this case for the former president. And of course, District Attorney Alvin Bragg is also in the room, Stephanie, which is not too surprising. We have seen many of the prosecutors involved in the four criminal cases Donald Trump faces have shown up at some point during the proceedings where Trump has been in the courtroom. So for this one, this is day one. This is just the beginning, and we've got a lot to go. A lot to go, and we were speaking about this earlier. He didn't really have to be there today for jury selection. It's optics and also yep. the opportunity that was given to him to be there, so he made himself present, totally. made himself known. Uh, Brian, I want to turn to you. We, we just heard uh, John mention this about asymmetry, that motion on Amos asymmetry on the juror's questionnaire uh, was denied. What do you make of that? How significant is that? It's, it's again, it's like John said, it's housekeeping. This is okay. what you hear in terms of trials that I have done, trials that other people would do. Uh, but it is significant in the sense of you've got to make the, the, the motion. Um, the way we describe it when it comes to appeals down the road, if you don't use it, you lose it. In the sense of if you don't make the argument here and the judge makes an incorrect uh, ruling, if you go and appeal and you say, well, I knew the judge was wrong, but I didn't object to it because I knew it was wrong. I was going to make the argument here. And an appellate court would say, no, 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 no. You, if you don't use it, you lose it. You have to make the argument here here, preserve the issue, and then appeal it later, Donald Trump knows that this case is not the last one. There's going to be an appeal. So each and every issue is going to make sure that every judge and every prosecutor who sees a case dots their I's and crosses their T's, because if they don't, he's going to let this case just live out through appellate uh, arguments. Mm -hmm. Follow this to the letter. Th Brian, thank you. Catherine, I want to turn to you. Prosecutors are focusing on these payments Trump allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then-attorney Michael Cohen. What can you tell us about how they've built their case and what evidence they plan to show? And Stephanie, as we've been talking about with all the guests, this goes back to 2016, that Trump was worried that his uh, election prospects would be hurt if uh, people found out about Stormy Daniels. So prosecutors are putting him, alleging that he is right at the center of this hush money payment that was allegedly wired by his former uh, lawyer, Michael Cohen. Uh, as we've reported, we expect prosecutors to rely uh, heavily on witnesses, former White House employees when Trump was president, along with longtime aides at the Trump Organization for example. We've reported that they expect, prosecutors expect to call his longtime assistant, Ronna Graff, who was essentially there for every crucial moment, maybe not involved in decision-making in meetings, for example, uh, but definitely a witness and on the sidelines there. So uh, obviously this is only jury selection. It's probably going to last the whole week. We're not into opening statements or them building their case in any way yet, uh, but that is ultimately down the line what we could see uh, from prosecutors in terms of how they plan to build their case and what witnesses Trump's longtime current and former aides uh, that they plan to call. Right. This is just the beginning in this part of the saga. Rick, I want to turn to you. Trump has used these court appearances as unofficial campaign events. We heard him earlier right there at the courthouse. He sounded as though he was at a rally. How are these legal battles factoring into his messaging and how is that playing with voters? Yeah, we've seen for some time, Stephanie, how the political and the legal have become one, right? You, 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 when he's talking in uh, outside a courtroom, he's talking about politics. When he's talking at a campaign rally, he's talking about his legal cases. They are so linked, and, and, and they have no choice now but to embrace the fact that this is the reality, that four out of every uh, five days, four out of every five weekdays are going to be consumed by time in court for the foreseeable future just on this one case. And that gives the, the former president access to a very loud microphone, uh, literal microphones that he can just go to outside of court. Of course, his social media platform is another way to, uh, to express himself. He might be somewhat uh, constrained in what he can say, and he's been railing about those constraints in, in attacking the limited gag ruling that's in effect. But he still is going to have plenty to say. And in fact, in some cases, he may have too much to say uh, because uh, him, him kind of freelancing outside a court about things that just happened inside may not be the best in terms of legal strategy. But he's going to be in the news cycle. And if there's anything that he knows well, it's how to dominate said news cycle. Um, ab absolutely. And, and John, we, we've been talking about this. The, we know that the jury selection process is expected to take the week, but how challenging is that going to be, being that everyone knows who he is? 42 questions, thousands of New Yorkers receive those 42 questions, and thousands are going to pile into that courtroom, Stephanie. It's going to be extremely challenging because who in the state of New York and the United States doesn't have an opinion or know who Donald Trump is? Look, the other thing you have to remember, too, less than 15 percent, 12 percent in the last 
last election, 10 and the one before that, voted for Donald Trump in the island of Manhattan. So really, there's not going to be a MAGA supporter that would end up on this case anyway, but it's somebody that would at least have an open mind to Donald Trump is what his legal team is going to be hoping for here. But that questionnaire, those 42 questions, some of them basic. I had it somewhere. I think you took my paper from me, Brian. But, you know, one of the things that are on there is that, you know, do you have a strong opinion of Donald Trump? Are you a subscriber or supporter of QAnon, a conspiracy theory? You know, one of the things that jurors are always asked is how they get their news and information. New York Times, ABC, et cetera. But on this questionnaire, they're asked if they are subscribers to Truth Social, Donald Trump's social media platform. So all of this is going to be really heavily complicated to wade through. I think they're going to take at least two weeks to get this jury. And that was my next question. Yeah. Can they really get it done well, they just have this to. week? And not this week. I don't think two so. Weeks. I, I think two weeks. I mean, you, you think, what do you think? You think it goes three? I don't think so, Brian. I'll, I'll do the over. I, I would say over two weeks. I get over? two and a half. Over if you're, two weeks if you're for talking the jury selection. No, you're talking no Wednesdays? I'm talking no Wednesdays. No Wednesdays, four days, eight days. I can see it being a 10 to 12 day selection, and that would bring us to doing four days a week. Yeah, I don't think it's that crazy. You, you just want to spend more time with me. Is that <laughs> I mean, I'm stealing <laughs> your stuff. Right back here every single day yeah, exactly. with, with a break on Wednesdays. Yeah, yeah. Sounds about Catherine, right. Catherine, we expect to hear, and you mentioned this earlier, from some former members of Trump's inner circle, but how critical could their testimony be? Well, it depends, but I think it could be extremely critical. We've reported uh, some aides that you haven't heard of. They're not household names. Madeline, Madeline Westerholt, for example, she was uh, crucial in the beginning of the Trump White House, for example. She was his uh, top aide. She was the director of Oval Office Operations. We uh, have reported that we expect her to be called under a subpoena. Uh, also, and we were talking about this a little earlier, Rona Graf, who's uh, Trump's longtime secretary at the Trump Organization. Uh, these are people who, while they might not have been crucial to meetings or decision making uh, were witnesses and knew everything that was going on in the inner workings of whether it was the White House or whether it was the Trump Organization. We've also reported longtime aide uh, Hope Hicks is expected uh, to testify as well. So uh, again, as you guys have been talking about, we're in the early stages here, but it will be uh, striking to see these longtime aides uh, to Trump ultimately uh, take the stand being called uh, by prosecutors, for example. It will be striking in, in, in aides that have known him for, for so long. Now, Brian, we, we've talked about this. The, the defense says this is a fantasy, unsupported by evidence and testimony. And, and, and speaking of that evidence, obviously the Manhattan DA is that mounting evidence that they'll present. How would you tackle this as a defense attorney? How, how would you mount this case against Trump? So in the beginning, it starts right now at jury selection, because what you're looking for is finding a receptive jury. And what I would say is the facts are the facts, but who interprets them is a whole other game. Uh, I've got a baby on my mind. I've got a two-year-old at home. If I was to tell you that pasta and apple juice is the greatest meal in the world, we would probably disagree. But I think our kids would be like, let's eat that five days a week. It's not necessarily the facts that change, but who is receiving it. And so for the defense team here with Donald Trump, they're saying, we have a liar who's going to take the stand, someone who is a noted liar, and we're going to try to paint them as a liar again against Donald Trump. Are we going to find people, regardless of political affiliation, where they are in, in Manhattan, what, what they bring into the background, are we going to get people who are not going to trust a liar no matter what they say on the stand, and then build your case around the themes and ideas of that? And I think that's the case here for Donald Trump. And also dependent on the those those aides and those folks that take the stand. Uh, Rick, how are Trump's political allies reacting to this trial? Well, some of them are ignoring it uh, and going out business as usual. It's a very busy week in Washington on Capitol Hill, so members of Congress can kind of dig in on that. But what has been striking throughout this process is how many, even the people that were his rivals during the primary season that uh, seems like a long time ago, were willing to back up his basic assertion of this being a witch hunt, um, providing no evidence to, to back that up, but suggesting that this is all politically motivated. And it is notable that this being the first case to go to trial, it's widely seen as, uh, as the weakest, and in terms of the politics, maybe um, the, the, the hardest one to make an actual case around that, that gets to the law. And, and that, I think, has helped Donald Trump along the way, certainly as it did during the primaries. It's the general election now, though, and things will be different. And the idea that 
Donald Trump is going to be dominating the news every day, basically, for the, for the next umpteen weeks, uh, suggests that it's going to be a challenge to break through for other candidates like, like President Biden. So I do think most of his allies have stayed very loyal to him, particularly on this case, which, again, is, is a little bit more of a tenuous legal argument that's being made, a, a little more indirect than some of the cases around January 6th, say, or classified documents. Um, I, I have no, no sign that Republicans are going to break with him over this trial. But uh, we have seen in public opinion polling that if he is convicted of a crime, there are people saying they're less likely to support him as a result. Whether that, that transfers over into reality remains to be seen. Exactly. If he is convicted, we'll see how they react. Brian, uh, by the way, I loved your example of the toddler and the pasta <laughs> and the apple juice. That is still on my yeah. mind. Sorry. It's a lot <laughs> no, of meals at home. We, it, we can all relate to that. We can all relate to the toddler situation. But it makes sense. It's like, who is receiving that information? Who is receiving that testimony, that evidence? That is crucial. Uh, but Trump says this case should have never been brought. We heard him earlier this morning saying this is an outrage. This is political persecution. Um, what do you make of that? I mean, the evidence the evidence is there. The, the, the DA has mounted their case. But when you hear the former president say this, I shouldn't even be here. This should have never been brought. What do you make of that? So this is an argument that a lot of attorneys, friends and I have that go back and forth on is this a case that should have been brought. The facts are the facts. And we can all see how those facts may fit into the framework that is falsifying business records in the first degree. But what does that mean? Falsifying business records typically are just a misdemeanor. You, you put a wrong or a false information, you omit it, whatever it may be. But what the DA in this case is saying is that he put false information into documents with the intent to commit another crime. And the question has always been, what is that other crime? How are you elevating this from misdemeanor to felony? And the facts are the facts, yes. But the question is as to what his camp is arguing, what many attorneys could make an argument for is, why do these facts fit this scenario? People, politicians, have always been paying off people to, to keep them silent. NDAs, we're, we're following Sean Combs in other cases. We, we've looked at R. Kelly and, other, and Weinstein, all those other kind of cases where NDAs have and happened, where you pay people to not speak. But the question is, why is it here that they're rapidly ele elevating to a felony level? And that's where he's saying, this is a witch hunt, this is unique, this has never happened before, and that's the ground on which he's standing on. And we'll see what the defense brings forward and, and, and totally. to prove their case. I want to thank... Everyone who has joined us this morning, John Santucci, Brian Buckmeyer, Catherine Falders, and Rick Klein, thank you all for your time. We, of course, will have continuing coverage of the former president's trial all day long, but we are also following another major story, fallout over Iran's assault on Israel, unleashing hundreds of missiles and drones, most of them shot down or failing to reach their target. Israel's war cabinet weighing a response as President Biden and other world leaders try to prevent further escalation. We have team coverage on the tensions in the Middle East, and that is coming up next. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to Good Morning America.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is meeting with his war cabinet today to discuss potential responses to Iran's attack. The cabinet met yesterday, but ended their meeting without making a final decision about a response. This after Iran launched a massive missile and drone barrage at Israel over the weekend. Two U.S. officials confirmed to ABC that at least half failed before reaching their targets. CENTCOM says 99% of the others were intercepted. I want to bring in and senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez, and ABC News contributor General Robert Abrams, and foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burge in Tel Aviv, Israel, for more on this. Selena, I want to start with you. We hear President Biden is urging Prime Minister Netanyahu to slow things down. What more do you know about their conversation? 
Yes, yeah, Stephanie. Well, the president essentially told Netanyahu to take the win, that he's already proven that Israel's military is superior. So from here, as you say, he should just take it slow, think carefully and strategically. The president also made clear that if Israel decides to strike back, that they will do so alone. The president has been deeply concerned since the start of this conflict that this could escalate into a wider war. So while the U.S. showed it's willing to defend Israel, it's staunchly behind that, it's not going to go on the offensive. Now, it appears here that Iran is saying they're essentially done here unless Israel decides to respond and they're warning they would then respond accordingly. So right now the ball is very much in Israel's court. But despite the pressure we're seeing from U.S. officials onto their Israeli counterparts, a senior administration official says they believe that Israel still will strike back and that this is not over. Now it's just a matter of time. We'll see what happens. Thank you, Selena. Louis, uh, a senior U.S. official says that the Biden administration believes that Israel will strike Iran, saying, quote, most of the world thinks this is over. It is not. But Iran has made clear it considers the matter closed. So how significant is that? And, and what could a possible retaliation mean for that region? Stephanie, as Selena just said, the ball is in Israel's court right now because that Israeli war cabinet is going to have to determine what kind of a response they are actually going to do or undertake against Iran. It could be that they could target proxies. It could be that they could actually strike at inside uh, Iran, just as Iran did against Israel this weekend. How could they go about doing that? Well, one in one one plan long seen has been that Israel, with its high-end uh, fighter jets, could launch attacks inside of Iran. But that means we undertake taking um, long missions that require uh, air mid-air refueling. Now, while Israel does have mid-air refueling, the United States has even more. And I think what we've seen, the message privately being expressed to Israel is that the United States will not assist Israel if it undertakes some kind of a military response against uh, Iran. Uh, but again, Israel has much many capabilities. They have long-range ballistic missiles of themselves so that they may not need uh, any kind of manned aircraft. But again, it's all up to Israel and now to determine what happens next. And then if there are any casualties inside of Iran as a result of this new retaliation, we could see things escalate if Iran retaliates yet again. Uh, General Abrams, I want to turn to you. According to CENTCOM, U.S. forces destroyed 80 drones and at least six ballistic missiles out of the more than 300 launched by Iran. Overnight, U.S. officials said it would not participate in any Israeli counterattack. And as Louis just mentioned, the U.S. staying out of it. But could we see that change if this escalates, if there is this back and forth? Do you see the U.S. stepping in at any point? Well, at this point, based on all the information that we've seen and heard from, you know, all the parties and especially from the White House, I'd say no. I don't think we'll see U.S. forces participating in an Israeli direct attack on Iran. But we should remind everyone that we, we've got a lot of troops there in the Middle East, as you know, Stephanie. And uh, there is a good chance that uh, there could be collateral damage or even a direct attack against U.S. troops by Iran or by Iranian proxies. And then that could actually change the calculus in terms of the administration. But for now, I'd say we should take the administration at its word that they will not participate and authorize participation in an Israeli kinetic attack against Israel. I mean, against Iran. Having said that, though, I'd caveat by saying Israel has a full range of options, both kinetic and non-kinetic, and especially with cyber, um, that could require some U.S. assistance, but it would obviously not be known to the world. And we, of course, will see with time what direction Israel does go in. Tom, the Israeli war cabinet members are meeting today where officials are considering a response to Iran's attack. What's the latest on that? Yes, yeah, Stephanie, we just had word that the Israeli war cabinet meeting has broken up. It's the second meeting of the war cabinet in 24 hours. Uh, we have no indication at this stage whether a decision was reached uh, in that meeting. Uh, of course, I think there is a consensus here in Israel that there has to be a response. The question is what type of response, the scale of the response and the timing of that response. And of course, as the general just said, uh, yes, all options are on the table. It could be a cyber attack. Uh, more hardline elements in Netanyahu's government are pushing for a more hardline military response directly against Iran. But of course, allies like the United States, other allies in Europe, Arab nations who were critical, of course, in helping Israel defend itself against Iran in the early hours of Sunday morning, uh, they're all pressing Israel to be restrained, to not give something to Iran that means that they have to 
necessarily strike back against Israel and then we're into a much more dangerous ball game. Certainly a situation we will continue to watch throughout the day very closely. Our thanks to Selena Wang, Louis Martinez, General Robert Abrams, and of course Tom Sufi Burge. Thank you all. This unprecedented attack by Iran now has us asking what could the impact of the strike have on our markets and oil prices? Our business reporter Alexis Christophorus is tracking that part of the story for us. Good morning, Alexis. Good morning, Stephanie. We're taking a look at the oil markets and the stock market because unrest in the Middle East, of course, has Wall Street on high alert. Oil prices are a little changed today after rallying Friday in anticipation of Iran's attack on Israel. Analysts say the risk of escalating warfare in the Middle East has already been factored into this year's roughly 20 percent rise in crude oil prices. And stocks are actually rallying today after having their worst week in months. That's after this weekend's drone and missile attack was largely thwarted by an international effort and did little damage. Now, stocks are also reacting to a much better than expected report on March retail sales today. That report, just the latest proof that Americans continue to spend despite stubbornly high inflation. Now, what happens next with oil and the stock market largely depends on Israel's response to the attack. Oil prices are currently at a six-month high of around $90 a barrel. That's a level we haven't seen since the early days of the Israel-Hamas war. Analysts say if the conflict escalates, we could see oil easily top $100 a barrel as turmoil in the Middle East then threatens oil supply in that region and could put key shipping routes in jeopardy. If that were to happen, it could send gas prices above $4 a gallon and also push inflation even higher. Remember, just weeks ago, U.S. stocks were rallying to record highs on hopes the Fed would deliver three interest rate cuts this year. Those hopes were dashed after new reports confirmed inflation is back on the rise. And in addition to all of this, the conflict in the Middle East, those March retail sales reports, investors focusing on corporate earnings from major companies are becoming Coming out today and in the weeks ahead, they're looking for more clues on inflation and, Stephanie, the health, the overall health of the U.S. economy. That happened really quickly. It really did. Thank yeah. you, Alexis. Sure. We'll have more of the day's top stories right after this break. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. And that's why at Good Morning America, we're right here. And we got you. We got you. We got you. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Let's take a look at some of the day's top stories. The weapons supervisor for Alec Baldwin's film Rust will learn her prison sentence today. Hannah Gutierrez was convicted of involuntary manslaughter last month for the death of another crew member who was shot when a gun held by Baldwin went off. She faces up to 18 months in prison. Baldwin is also charged with involuntary manslaughter. His trial is scheduled to start in July. Security at the Boston Marathon is on high alert after law enforcement agencies have identified what they're calling a broad set of potential soft targets for an attack. That is according to a threat assessment. A 
contained by ABC News. Officials say the most significant threat facing this marathon comes from loan offenders and small groups of individuals looking to commit acts of violence, particularly at designated viewing areas. Boston law enforcement says 48 local, state, and federal public safety organizations will be positioned throughout the city. And the path of that race, police say they know of no specific threats to the area. And in much lighter news, the highly anticipated WNBA draft tips off tonight. Caitlin Clark is expected to be the number one pick with Angel Reese and Camila Cardoso not too far behind. The excitement comes after the women's NCAA championship game drew more viewers than the men's final for the first time ever. You can see the WNBA draft live tonight at 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. We do want to thank you for streaming with us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. This is our combat operations center. We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Yeah, Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? That sounds pretty good. Your health, your money, breaking news, music, and of course, good food. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love you that. Me. Reporting from the Federal District Courthouse in Washington, D.C., I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the news is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Today on ABC News Live, first, we're following breaking news. The historic first ever trial of a former president is getting underway. Former President Trump is inside the courtroom for jury selection in the hush money case against him. The district attorney charged Trump with falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney, Michael Cohen. The judge has already denied a motion from Trump's legal team regarding jury selection and another aimed at forcing the judge's recusal. The judge will also allow evidence involving Trump's interactions with the National Enquirer and an alleged hush money payment to another woman. Earlier, Trump addressed reporters at the courthouse saying he is proud to be there. Take a listen. This is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. Trump pleaded not guilty to the 34 charges last year, calling the case, quote, election interference and a witch hunt. We have full team coverage as jury selection gets underway, starting with ABC News investigative reporter Olivia Rubin and a look at what's at stake. I never thought anything like this could happen. For the first time in American history, a former president of the United States standing trial on criminal charges. These are felony crimes in New York State no matter who you are. 
former President Donald Trump fought repeatedly to delay the case beginning today, accusing him of illegally hiding payments he orchestrated to porn star Stormy Daniels to silence her affair allegations during his 2016 White House bid. The evidence will show that he did so to cover up crimes relating to the 2016 election. Multiple judges rejected Trump's last-ditch efforts to halt the trial brought by the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Now hundreds of potential jurors are being questioned in a courthouse downtown. I don't know how you can have a trial that's going on right in the middle of an election. Not fair. Not fair. Lawyers for both sides will whittle that group down to just 12 jurors and six alternates, asking them questions to root out any bias. It includes, have they ever attended a Trump rally, subscribed to the conspiracy movement of QAnon, or followed an anti-Trump organization on social media? The process expected to take as long as two weeks. The whole point of jury selection is to find out not just do people know who the parties are involved, not just did they know the charges, but rather can they set all of that information aside and be a fair and impartial juror in this particular case. The charges, 34 counts of falsifying business records. The crime, not the alleged sexual activity, but the paperwork used to keep the payments to Stormy Daniels quiet. Prosecutors say Trump disguised the payments he made to his one-time lawyer and fixer Michael Cohen for Daniels to bury her affair claims, labeling them instead as legal payments for a non-existent retainer agreement with Cohen. He directed me to make the payments. He directed me to become involved in these matters. Prosecutors say those disguised checks cut from the Trump organization to Cohen were part of a larger catch-and-kill scheme devised by Trump and his allies with the publisher of the National Enquirer. Together, prosecutors say they would repeatedly buy negative stories about Trump, only to never publish them. He was very concerned about how this would affect the election. To help his campaign. To help him and the campaign. Trump has pled not guilty to the charges and has called the case election interference. He also claims the affair with Daniels never happened. Did you know about the $130,000 payment to Daniels? Trump is no stranger to the legal system, but he has only come face to face with a jury during his presidential bid for the White House once before. Earlier this year, a nine-person jury heard a civil defamation case brought against Trump by the writer E. Jean Carroll who accused Trump of sexually assaulting her in the 1990s and then defaming her when she went public with her allegations in 2019. There, Trump personally analyzed the potential jurors, often craning his neck and turning around as they answered questions. He never attended the first trial, where a jury found him liable for sexual assault and defamation of Carroll. Some jurors the second time around in the trial to determine damages against Trump appeared visibly shocked when they entered the room only to see the former president of the United States seated there. After days of witnessing Trump's behavior in court, including storming out of the courtroom, that jury of seven men and two women found Trump liable for defamation and ordered him to pay $83 million in damages. We will immediately appeal. We will set aside that ridiculous jury. Now Trump is repeating that process again, but these jurors will be charged with deciding a criminal case. If convicted, he could face a maximum of four years in jail for each of the 34 counts. Our thanks to Olivia Rubin, who is outside the courthouse now. And Olivia, we are learning the judge has reaffirmed his decision that prosecutors cannot play the Access Hollywood tape or from many years ago or Trump's defamation from the E. Jean Carroll case. So what is the latest? Exactly. It's a win for Donald Trump, who did not want that infamous Access Hollywood tape uh, that came out just before the 2016 election to be played before the jury. So it's a small win for him, but one of the few that he has gotten this morning, because Stephanie, remember, jury selection has not actually gotten underway yet. What is going on on the 15th floor of the courtroom is that lawyers for Trump and the prosecutors are going over, again, some of what the evidence is going to be to come into this case. And prosecutors have now just this 
this morning su successfully gotten in some more information about uh, the National Enquirer, the publication that worked with Donald Trump allegedly to hide some of these stories before 2016. And they will also get in some more information about Karen McDougal, who is another woman that was allegedly paid because of her claims about Donald Trump, though she is not related to the charges here. So a win for Donald Trump in the sense that the tape won't be played, but some losses in that there is more evidence coming in that he doesn't necessarily want before the jury, Stephanie. Thank you, Olivia. I want to bring in executive editorial producer John Santucci. John, we just heard from Olivia there that the yeah. Access Hollywood tape cannot be played, yep. but the judge will allow evidence about the National Enquirer and Karen McDougal, uh, the woman that Trump allegedly had an affair with. Yep. So what do you make of that? Well, listen, the whole idea is that prosecutors are trying to set up the idea this was a pattern for Donald Trump, this idea of catching and killing. And just quickly to break it down, catching a bad story, killing it by paying off the people that could potentially cause damage to Donald Trump and others. And in the case of Karen McDougal and a doorman who worked for Donald Trump at one time. This was something that happened before the Stormy Daniels payment. It was done with David Pecker. So thus, it was a rinse and repeat performance for Donald Trump when he did do the Stormy Daniels payment with Michael Cohen, of course, making the payment and then the reimbursements that came thereafter. So really, the idea is to show, you know, if there's ever any evidence or uh, basically an idea presented by Trump's defense team. Well, you know, we never did this before. Well, wait a second, you did this two times before, maybe there are others, right? This idea that it was an ongoing relationship between Pecker, Cohen, and Trump to catch the story, kill it, make it go away. And Brian, what do you make of the motions the judge denied? How could that affect the case? It's going to affect the case in the sense of what the tenor of the of the arguments are and, and also how either side are going to say, well, this is a little too far and this is maybe not enough. What I think we're going to hear a lot of when reporting comes out of what was argued in this court, he's going to hear this phrase a lot saying, more prejudicial than probative. And that's probably the reason why the tape was de denied. It's too prejudicial for you to hear the former president's own words saying you can just come up on them and grab them by this. And the judge will say, well, what is this really probative of? What are we learning from this other than making Donald Trump look like a bad guy? Mm -hmm. Which in many ways is what the prosecutor wants to kind of convince the jury. And so the judge is going to kind of straddle that line of like, all right, if you're trying to prove this catch and kill theory that this is not just one but many instances, I let you be probative to an extent, but not so far that you're going to prejudice the jury to just say like, well, this is a bad guy that we're finding guilty, not necessarily the, the facts articulate that of the crimes he's accused of. Right, right. How does that video relate to these alleged payments that were That's made? That's right. Exactly. Uh, Catherine, I want to bring you in. ABC's senior reporter, Catherine Falders. Catherine, the judge imposed a limited gag order against Trump last month. Is the former president really being careful in, in trying to avoid violating that order? And, and then if he does violate that order, what happens? It, well, look, it's a good question. I don't think he's being particularly careful, given some of his comments over the weekend on a social media platform, True Social. Uh, and, and look, I think it's something that his lawyers, at least from talking to sources close to the legal team, it's something they're worried about here. They don't really want him to approach that camera in the hallway. They really don't want him to do those press conferences uh, following his court appearances that he is known to do, uh, especially, Stephanie, as it relates to jury selection. Trump is already on notice from the judge. Uh, when he extended the gag order, for example, uh, over jury selection. So uh, there is a worry inside Trump world that he will violate it. He has violated gag orders in the past. So, look, I, I don't know. This is all fluid. John Santucci knows this as well from talking to sources. You can't really tell him not to go to the camera. Uh, but it is something that his lawyers are keeping an eye out for. They don't want him to violate this gag order. And if he does, there could be a warning. There could be sanctions. He could be fined as he was in the past. We'll just have to see uh, what he ultimately does in terms of his public comments uh, throughout the day and, of course, after this wraps up. Yeah, we will just have to wait and see how he reacts. ABC's political director Rick Klein is also with us. And, Rick, Trump says the gag order is a violation of his protected political speech. Do you think that is playing into his campaign strategy? 100% of this. I mean, I think it, it goes back to months ago when he talked about how he was being persecuted and forced off the campaign trail into courtrooms. And he would go to court oftentimes without any reason to actually be there um, and then fundraise over the fact that he was he was dragged into court, even though, again, he didn't have to be there. Similarly, he's fundraising over the fact that he is being limited um, in some fashion from what he is able to say publicly about this case. He is being, saying things and doing things that most ordinary defendants would probably end up in jail for, frankly. Uh, if you 
if you violate uh, gag orders and if you say the kind of provocative things and often false things about people involved in a trial, most citizens don't get to do that. He has gotten a lot of leeway, not just in this case, but across a range of cases about what he has said and done. But he is also getting a lot of political mileage over the fact that he's been limited in any way. And the point he's made over and over again about this being in the middle of a campaign and being unfair has been a consistent one and something that comes up outside courthouses, but also at his campaign rallies. And when we talk to his supporters across the country, they point that out as well to see all of these cases going on at the same time, to be have the former president limited in what he can say about him. That all adds up to a powerful political argument that Trump has been uh, using for some time. Lots to watch. The first of four criminal prosecutions Trump is facing and maybe the only one before the election. We will speak once again, I'm sure, <laughs> later today and throughout this entire process. Our thanks to you, Olivia Rubin, John Santucci, Brian Buckmeyer, Rick Klein, and Catherine Falders. Thank you all. We, of course, will have continuing coverage of the former president's trial all day long. We will be right back, but we're also following another major story, fallout over Iran's assault on Israel, unleashing hundreds of missiles and drones, most of them shot down or failing to reach their target. We have team coverage on the tensions in the Middle East. That's coming up. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is meeting with his war cabinet today to discuss potential responses to Iran's attack. The cabinet met yesterday but ended their meeting without making a final decision about a response. This comes after Iran launched a massive missile and drone barrage at Israel over the weekend. Two U.S. officials confirmed to ABC News that at least half failed before reaching their targets and Israel says 99 percent of the others were intercepted. One to bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez, ABC News contributor General Robert Abrams, and foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burge in Tel Aviv, Israel, for more on this. Thank you all for joining us. Tom, I want to start with you. Israeli war cabinet members are meeting today where officials are considering a response to Iran's attack. What do we know so far? Yes, yeah, Stephanie, we know that the second uh, Israeli war cabinet meeting in just 24 hours has now broken up. Israeli officials saying that uh, the possible response, the options that Israel has uh, were discussed, but there's no indication at this stage uh, that Israel has actually made a decision. Uh, clearly, it's looking at a range of options and also the timing of any response would be clear. I mean, clearly, there is a consensus that Israel has to respond. The scale and nature of that response uh, is still up in the air. 
And clearly Israel is under pressure from allies like the United States to rein in its response, to not go for something that would be deemed to be too escalatory. Uh, we just come off a briefing from the Israeli Air Defense, uh, Israeli Air Force, and an official there confirming uh, the importance of not only U.S. coordination of that allied response in the overall defense uh, on Sunday morning, but also the crucial role that Middle Eastern countries played, uh, allowing Israeli jets to operate in their air defense to shoot down those missiles and drones. Uh, and that sort of broad coalition, the support, will be a factor when it comes to the Israeli government's decision making on what type of response it will make. Certainly will. Many waiting to hear what direction Israel will go in. Tom, thank you. Selena, I want to turn to you. How is President Biden responding to all of this? Yeah, well, look, after the attack happened, the president spoke to Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu over the phone, and his message to him was, take this slow, don't escalate things, and think very carefully and strategically about your next step. Now, the president made clear that, look, they were willing to defend Israel, but if Israel decides to strike back, they will do so alone. The president wants to prevent this conflict from spreading into a wider war, something he's been very careful about since October 7th. And right now, as Tom was saying, the ball is very much in Israel's court. But despite this pressure we're seeing from the president, from U.S. officials, the Biden administration does believe that Israel is going to respond in some way. That's according to a senior U.S. official. And the president very much wanting to stress to Netanyahu, though, to take the win. Take the win here. You already proved that your military is superior after this onslaught from Iran. Israel coming out ahead. And, and Louis, Israel says that 99% of Iran's missiles and drones that made it to Israel were intercepted. Earlier on Good Morning America, top White House national security spokesman John Kirby said Iran is not the power it purports to be, despite its military and ballistic missile capability, but that the U.S. is going to stay vigilant. So what does that tell you about uh, Iran's military capabilities and where the U.S. stands exactly? Stephanie, Iran's military capabilities have still remain strong. I mean, the fact that some of these missiles did not hit their targets, that roughly half of them are the ballistic missiles that were launched from inside Iran towards Israel, uh, did not make it towards uh, uh, as close to Israel as we had originally thought, um, doesn't imply that they still don't have significant military capabilities. Now, what we are understanding now is that essentially uh, Iran's, maybe the, the, their guidance systems, their launch systems are not going to be as effective. But it gets to the question of volume. When you have such a large inventory as the Iranians do, um, they have that capability. And even if their missiles don't all launch and hit their targets, that is the, it's still a potential threat. And for American forces, that is another consideration. It could, if, if Israel responds and with the retaliation against Iran, could this then lead Iran to pose a threat to U.S. forces in the region? And that is something that they have said publicly now. Um, so I think that is something that officials here at the Pentagon are taking a very much a close look at just in case. Yeah, an escalation, definitely not what many people want to see. General Abrams, I want to bring you into this conversation. A senior U.S. official says the Biden administration believes Israel will strike Iran, saying most of the world thinks this is over. It is not. But Iran has made it clear it considers the matter closed. So what could a possible retaliation mean for that region? Well, I think it really depends on the scale, scope, and the timing of any sort of action taken by Israel. Um, and they've got a full range of options to include kinetic and non-kinetic options. So I, I think the region's response um, will be based upon what exactly Israel does. And we'll, we'll just have to wait and see what that's exactly going to look like. We certainly will. We'll keep a close eye on it as well. Thank you all for your time and your insights. Really appreciate it. Selena Wang, Louis Martinez, General Robert Abrams, Tom Sufi Burge, thank you. Coming up, who dreams are about to come true? We are just hours away from tonight's WNBA draft. We have a look at all of that excitement that is coming up next. What does it take? to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The 
house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismael? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! <laughs> For our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from Mazatlan, Mexico, covering the total solar eclipse, I'm Matt Rivers. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Guess what? Today is tax day. You should probably know this. Business reporter Alexis Christophorus is joining us for more on some last minute tax tips. Talk about last minute. Talk about right up day against of. it, right? We're not going to shame anybody no, here. No, 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 no. You know who you are, but you have <laughs> until midnight tonight to file your taxes and avoid getting hit with penalties and interest. It's not too late, though, to save on your tax bill. First thing, you want to be sure you're taking all of the credits you qualify for. If you have kids, you may be eligible for a $2,000 tax credit per qualifying child, depending on your income and your filing status. And not to be confused with the child tax credit is the child and dependent care tax credit. If you paid expenses for daycare, preschool, or another form of caregiving for, say, a spouse or a parent who's unable to care for themselves, you might qualify for this credit. It starts at $3,000. And if you paid qualified education expenses for an eligible student, you may be able to claim a credit of up to $2,500 with the American Opportunity Tax Credit. If you bought an electric vehicle last year, check and see if it is on the list of EVs that qualify for a credit of up to $7,500. You also have until midnight tonight to make a tax-friendly contribution to your traditional IRA. It's not too late. The max here, $6,500, $7,500 if you're 50 or over. And if you know you're going to need more time to file, just go to irs.gov and request an extension. It'll give you an extra six months to submit your taxes until October 15th. But remember, an extension to file is not an extension to pay. So if you owe money, you still need to make payment by tomorrow or by tonight. Use your previous year's taxes to help estimate what you owe. And if you can't pay the entire amount right now, don't panic. Go to irs.gov, set up a payment plan. The IRS actually wants to work with you so that you can pay your bill. Right, and they want to get their money too. <laughs> That's a huge part of it, yes. <laughs> Alexis, thank you so much. Those are great tips. And, and yes, yeah, we all lead busy lives. So if today's a day for you to get your yes. taxes done, hey, you're getting it done. Clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. Thank you. <laughs> all right, the WNBA draft kicks off tonight as well. After that epic championship game between the Iowa Hawkeyes and South Carolina Gamecocks, it is now the second most watched non-Olympic women's sporting event in U.S. history. Our Faith Abube has more from a sports bar in Minneapolis dedicated to celebrating women athletes. It's a rite of passage for any sports fan, catching the big game at your local sports bar. And with the popularity of women's sports on the rise, sports bars aren't just for the boys anymore. It's great that this is finally happening and that women's sports are finally getting the, the platform that they deserve. Bars for women's sports popping up across the country, from a bar of their own in Minneapolis to the sports bra in Portland. Women's sports are what everyone's excited about, what everyone's talking about, what everyone is tuning into. Undefeated South Carolina has 
won its third national championship. The women's NCAA championship game drawing more viewers than the men's final for the first time ever. No one has done more to grow the popularity of this game than Caitlin Clark. Caitlin Clark, the likely number one pick, generating huge crowds. Interest in the game with that number one pick, the Indiana Fever, surging with 13 times as many tickets sold compared to this time last year. It feels really comfortable to walk in a space where you already know that you're gonna have some sort of shared interest with the people who are in there. one are allowing fans to get a front row seat to witness history and also of course we'll be glued in to the WNBA draft tonight 7 30 Eastern live on ESPN back to you Stephanie it's gonna be fun thank you so much Faith and thank you for streaming with us I'm Stephanie Ramos ABC News live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis we'll be right back news breaks it's so important to always remember that lives are changed here in london in buffalo uvalde texas edinburgh scotland reporting from rolling fork mississippi ukrainian refugees here in warsaw we're heading to a small community outside of mexico city getting you behind the stories as they happen abc news live prime we'll take you there stream abc news live weeknights wherever you stream your news only on abc news live with so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Here's to Good Mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because... You know what will make the morning better? A little Ray of Sunshine. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a carry in it. How important it made to USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my L. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. ABC News, America's number one news source. Good afternoon, I'm Stephanie Ramos. Today on ABC News Live, first, we are following breaking news. The historic first ever trial of a former president is getting underway. Former President Trump is inside the courtroom for jury selection in the hush money case against him. The district attorney charged Trump with falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney, Michael Cohen. The judge has already denied a motion from Trump's legal team regarding jury selection and another aimed at forcing the judge's recusal. 
The judge will also allow evidence involving Trump's interactions with the National Enquirer and an alleged hush money payment to another woman. Prosecutors will not, though, be allowed to play the infamous Access Hollywood tape or video from Trump's deposition in the E. Jean Carroll defamation case, nor will they be allowed to introduce unproven sexual misconduct allegations a number of other women against him made ahead of the 2016 election. Earlier, Trump called the trial an assault on America. He has pleaded not guilty to the 34 charges against him. You see him there as he made his way through the courthouse in downtown Manhattan here in New York City. We, of course, have full team coverage as jury selection gets underway. We will start with executive editorial producer John Santucci. John, a prosecutor is seeking admission of Trump's alleged witness intimidation into evidence. Mm -hmm. How significant is that in this trial? Well, it is hugely significant because, again, you have to remember there are so many witnesses that come into play in Donald Trump's orbit, both his campaign, his political life, and his personal life. So any idea that Donald Trump intimidated a witness from not telling the truth over the course of the last year as we were getting ready for this trial will be hugely consequential. I mean, listen, we're talking about some people that have worked with Donald Trump for decades. Let's talk for a second about Rona Graff, his longtime assistant at the Trump Organization. Donald Trump, believe it or not, in his entire professional career, Stephanie, only had two executive assistants, Norma Federer and Rona Graff. They both knew everything about Donald Trump. I can tell you our former colleague, the late great Barbara Walters, when I first started covering Donald Trump, had one piece of advice to me, get to know Rona, she knows everything. And wow. that exactly is clear in the fact that she's on this witness list by prosecutors. Rona knew where everything was, her office was right next to Donald Trump's, and before it was Rona, it was Norma. Norma, of course, has passed away, but Rona is alive and well and will be critical to prosecutors' case. Because the other thing you have to remember, too, is that a lot of Donald Trump's life as a businessman was not documented on computers or email. It was all paperwork. You know, I, I had many times where we would send, you know, different proposals or things for ABC to Donald Trump when he was a candidate, and they would print it out for Trump, and he'd write back notes on it, and he would hand it to his assistants. That obviously was the way he did his operations, his bookkeeping, et cetera. So I do think that's hugely important and will come into play in this case about the paperwork, about the falsifying of documents, and those assistants would know that. Now, Rona Graff no longer works at the Trump Organization. Another witness that has been called Madeleine Westerhout was the assistant at the White House for quite some time. She had a leave after she allegedly made some disparaging comments about members of Trump's family out in public around media. Nevertheless, did Donald Trump ever contact the two of them or any of the witnesses? Perhaps there's some evidence comes into play. Could be consequential. Need to see. And John, you mentioned this earlier, how a lot of these aides have been loyal for so many years. Sure. It, I mean, with someone who's had such personal ties to or, or connection with Donald Trump, mm -hmm. are they going to break? Are they going to, I mean, you would assume that they would be just as loyal there on the stand. 100%. I think that obviously the only one that would falls into a unique bucket is Michael Cohen, right? John Carl talked about this earlier in our programming. Michael Cohen had described himself at one point as Donald Trump's pit bull, right? That he would do anything and everything to protect Donald Trump. That pit bull has flipped, and that obviously has changed things. And we're looking at live pictures right here. Uh, you guys can see this of the former president there just coming out of the courtroom. I believe they're taking a 10 to 15 minute break. They just took that break. He is going back into the courtroom now. That is in downtown Manhattan. And we saw him earlier as well calling this a political persecution and kind of treating it as a campaign rally. Some of the same statements we've heard in the past. Uh, uh, Brian, I want to bring you into this. The judge will not allow prosecutors to introduce the sexual misconduct allegations a number of women made against Trump at the end of his 2016 campaign. The judge said prosecutors are allowed, though, to show the jury video clips of Trump from some of his campaign events where he appears agitated about some of these allegations. We saw it this morning. He appeared agitated this morning as well. What do you make of that, the judge making these decisions this morning? It makes sense. What I think the judge is attempting to do is trying to ground this evidence in relevance, and that's what a lot of judges and defense attorneys and prosecutors do. And so you start off with the question of, okay, you have this bit of information. You have this Hollywood access tape. You have uh, these... Uh, allegations of sexual assault. How are these relevant to the question as to whether or not Donald Trump falsified business records? Now, if they play into the idea that this is catch and kill scheme that he has, bad allegations come up, he sends his fixers out there to kind of 
hush the, the, the noise, so to speak, then that makes sense. But if these sexual assault allegations are not connected to any form of that catch and kill or any form of that falsifying business records for the purpose of getting elected, then the judge is going to say, well, why is this relevant? The prosecutor is going to push back and say, this is the environment in which Donald Trump existed in. This bad press was coming at him left, right, and center. A lot of them surrounded around sexual assault allegations, and that's why he felt this way. The judge is saying, you know what, in private, I don't think it's going to come in, but if he's agitated and we can see it during the election process, then it now becomes relevant because he's uh, having this emotional response based on these allegations and he's trying to get elected. So I think it's really walking a tightrope there. Mm -hmm. And just to jump in for a quick second, sorry, Brian, but Stephanie, you know, it's interesting. Our team is getting this real-time reporting. There's obviously no cameras in there. Right before that break, prosecutors made a statement in open court saying, quote, shortly we will be seeking an order to show cause as to why the defendant should be held not be held in contempt. This, of course, um, says that Trump violated Merchant's gag order. That's going to be quite striking, right? Now, obviously, you know, Catherine Folder has touched on this earlier in our coverage that Donald Trump has gotten dangerously close to violating the gag order in a lot of his public statements on the campaign trail, bopping around court across social media. So if there is an argument about to be presented on that front, we're going to need to watch that. As you just noted, Donald Trump walking back into court. If that's where we're going, one, interesting that we're still not in jury selection, but two, if right on day one they're going to make this argument that he violated the gag order and potentially what consequences come with that, we'll see. We definitely will. I mean, we and you say that this is the this is the very first day to see this on the first day says a lot. We've heard from Trump even earlier, sounding agitated, and, and also he's said in the past that this gag order is a violation of his protected political speech. Mm -hmm. Still sticking with general terms earlier today, though, not bringing up individuals that are at the center of this case. I want to bring in ABC News contributor and former Georgia prosecutor Chris Timmons. Uh, Chris, what do you make of that contempt motion? I think that shows that the prosecution is going to be aggressive. I mean, they're coming out of the gate swinging because, uh, you know, if you listen to Donald Trump's comments, it didn't directly violate the gag order. I think he was a little more kind of general than he was sort of more specific. He was talking about witch hunt. He was talking about, you know, this is a, a purely political action that it's being orchestrated by uh, the former president of the United or the, the current president of the United States, just as John Carl mentioned earlier in our coverage. Um, and so I, I think by moving to, um, you know, find him in contempt, straight out of the gate suggests that prosecution is going to be very aggressive in this case. And it also shows that they recognize the two-front war that they're fighting. They're fighting the war that's the the, the battle that's going on in the courtroom there in in, uh, in in New York. But the other battle they're fighting is the the public battle that they're that they're fighting out there. And you got to remember, once you've got jurors in place, they're they're told that they're not supposed to watch the news. They're told that they're not supposed to pay any attention to the media. But jurors do, unfortunately. Brian Buckmeyer can tell you, unfortunately, they do play pay attention to the coverage even in when they're told not to so some of those words that he's speaking are intended to inflame the jury and help him get a not ver a guilty verdict in this case and, and Chris we we heard from him yeah just a few moments ago or this morning as Trump was entering the courtroom uh, talking about how this is an out outrage political persecution Brian we've seen we we've seen the president today saying these statements jury selection that process hasn't even started mm -hmm. we've already the judge has already brought up the gag order so what are the next steps as we move through this week which is supposed to focus on that jury selection process yeah so the, the process in which we're going through right now you call pre pre-trial uh, motions or pre-trial arguments. And so you get out, what's the schedule going to look like? Um, how are we going to bring these jurors in? Uh, each party saying, do you want to bring anything forward? And now we're hearing the prosecutor saying, hey, we want to revisit this gag order issue because it appears that Donald Trump might have violated it. Uh, the judge wants to get all of that out of the way because once you start bringing jurors in, the train has proverbially left the station and you don't want to stop. You want that process to be smooth and continuous. And so what I would expect is the judge is taking a quick break, what we just saw a few moments ago. Most of the arguments may have come about. They might talk about this gag order. I think that might be the, lo the last big thing to discuss. Uh, of course, Donald Trump's attorneys always have that one more extra argument they want to make at the 11th hour. But I would expect that after the lunch break, and here in New York, we take, typically take a lunch break from about 1 p.m. to 2.15. I would expect at 2.30, the judge is going to say, you know what? The train's leaving the station. Let's start bringing the jurors in and start this process. I want to bring in ABC's political director, Rick Klein. Uh, Trump's 2016 political rallies are also part of this trial. Could this change the way he campaigns, the way he moves forward? 
There's no question that this is going to change the, the substance of his campaign. First, anything that happens in that courtroom are things that he's likely to be raising money off of and talking about outside of the courtroom. Uh, and secondly, uh, the, 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 the real-time interaction uh, that, that you often see at his campaign rallies sometimes is built around the, 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 kind of, uh, the kind of rhetoric that he puts out there. 2016, we remember the locker-up chants. They take on a different tone in the context of today. Uh, and just from a functional matter, um, for the foreseeable future, he's not going to have a lot of time to do campaigning out on the trail. He'll have weekends and, for now, Wednesdays, because this court doesn't sit on Wednesdays. Other than that, he's going to be uh, relegated to, to sitting in that courtroom and maybe popping up here and there uh, relatively close by. Uh, this is going to be the big messaging uh, messaging piece of the campaign, most likely for a while. And think about how busy things have been, the kind of big issues we're talking about with is Israel and Iran and abortion rights. Uh, there's a huge number of things that candidates could be talking about right now. Uh, his rival, President Biden, is going to be out on the trail in Pennsylvania over the next couple of days, Tuesday and Wednesday. And, and that's something that former President Trump can't do. Now, we should note that it, it, there are, have been times where he has used courthouse appearances essentially as campaign events, and the rhetoric um, mixes mixes with with each other. And he likes that that the idea of, of looking there, looking like he's in battle, looking like he's going to, to fight for his own voters. But it does put uh, some serious constraints on what he can do as a candidate. It certainly does. A ABC's uh, senior reporter, Catherine Falters, I want to bring you in. So we know that the Manhattan DA also plans to introduce evidence about two other payments that Trump allegedly made uh, uh, with Cohen, that Cohen and Trump coordinated uh, to suppress, suppress negative uh, stories. Uh, and that includes evidence about the National Enquirer and Karen McDougal, another woman Trump allegedly had an affair with. How significant is that to be able to bring in those other, that, that other piece of evidence? Well, it's significant because prosecutors are going to use these uh, two payments and these instances to go uh, right to the heart of what they've said is uh, Trump's character. So they want to use that to build on their case here. For example, that just involves uh, one payment. Of course, uh, we saw Trump's lawyers push back on that. They think it's irrelevant. They think it's too salacious, I think, is one of the words that they used. Um, but obviously, the judge did not rule in Trump's favor on that. Now, as it relates to the Access Hollywood tape that we've talked about a lot here, uh, the judge did uphold a previous ruling where he said uh, that this tape, uh, audio or video of the tape cannot be played. Prosecutors will be allowed to use Trump's words, but specifically the judge said he doesn't want that played to the jury. He doesn't want the jury to hear it, doesn't want them to see the video. Uh, so again, all of this is uh, what's happening before jury selection, which still hasn't gotten underway yet. The judge in the beginning of the day said he wanted to tie up some loose ends. So that's what they're doing right now. Of course, we'll wait to see uh, what happens on this potential uh, contempt ruling. That could be a big deal as it relates to the gag order. So uh, still, uh, let's just say some a bit of fireworks uh, this morning uh, before the jury actually, before jury selection actually gets underway here, Stephanie. Thanks, Catherine. Tying up some loose ends, some, some administrative items taking place this morning before that jury selection process. And Brian, let's talk a little bit more about that. It's, we were speaking about this earlier. It's obviously going to be difficult to find someone who isn't extremely familiar with the former president. Uh, and Right now, we're looking at sketches of the former president there in the courtroom. But as we look at that, Brian, how how are how is this process going to play out? There are a certain set of questions that the potential jurors will need to answer. But how how are they going to select these twelve jurors and six alternates? I think if you got. 12 attorneys in a room and ask them this exact question, you probably get different ones, but I'll go with the more general. Jury selection is equal parts are equal part science. And when we talk about the science from the 42 questions, how the judge starts and then moves on, but a lot of in that art part of it is kind of reading the tea leaves. And what both sides are gonna do is they're gonna take things like the age, gender, what part of New York City, because we as New Yorkers know there's a very different mentality from someone who is born and raised in Harlem than someone who was born and raised in Midtown, for example, or Alpha of its city or the Upper East Side, uh, their employment. How many years have they been in the city? Are they born and, br and, and bred New Yorkers who have been here forever, or are they kind of transplants? I've only been here for a year or two. And also race. And they're going to take all of those factors and kind of read the tea leaves and say, what is this person going to think about when they're presenting the information? The best example, I, I, I'll give you myself. I'm a 36-year-old man who lives uh, in, lived in Harlem. I'm an attorney. I've been in New York for over a decade, and I'm black. I, I'm guessing 
guessing that someone would take that and be like, well, what is this person going to think about when they get these facts? And that's what the prosecutor and the, and the defense are doing here, kind of reading the tea leaves from what they garner from the, from the potential jurors. And the judge, of course, will likely insist that the, their view should not interfere with being fair. Well, they'll suggest it, but what they... I'll give you one last example. When we talk about picking a juror, we always talk about, I want fair and impartial. And I say, it's a lot like picking a spouse. Like, you always want that, the, the, the big factors, the kind, the, the smart, the this. Well, at least when I picked my spouse, I was like, she's very attractive, too. Like, I might not say it out loud, but I hope I get that. And for the defense attorneys, yeah, you can laugh, I know. Um, for defense attorneys... <laughs> I love your examples I'm sorry. today. We're on apple top. juice, yeah, macaroni. Pasta and apple juice. No, no, I'm going to make the connection. But you will, just as will. much as a defense attorney says, I want fair and impartial, no. I want someone who's going to buy the facts as I present them going forward. And the prosecutor is going to say, say the same thing. Oh, I want fair and impartial. No. You want that attractive juror who's going to buy what you're selling to some degree. And so that, I think, is going to be the like little hidden undertone we're going to see here, what jurors are going to be more impartial to one side over the other, even though both sides won't really say it out loud. You brought it together. It makes perfect sense. <laughs> you did. Right. Thank you very much, Brian. And thanks to the rest of our team, John Santucci here at the desk, Rick Klein, Catherine Falders, and Chris Timmons. Thank you all. Former President Trump is heading back to court. Actually, he went back. He is in court right now. You're just looking at sketches of the former president in that courtroom. We, of course, will be covering this historic trial all day long. But we're also following another major story, fallout over Iran's assault on Israel, unleashing hundreds of missiles and drones, most of them shot down or failing to reach their target. We have team coverage on the tensions in the Middle East, and that is coming up. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is meeting with his war cabinet today to discuss potential responses to Iran's attack. The cabinet met yesterday, but ended their meeting without making a final decision about a response. This comes after Iran launched a massive missile and drone barrage at Israel over the weekend. Two U.S. officials confirmed to ABC News that at least half failed before reaching their targets, and Israel says 99% of the others were intercepted. One to bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez, ABC News contributor General Robert Abrams, and foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burge in Tel Aviv, Israel, for more on this. Thank you all for joining us. Tom, I want to start with you. Israeli war cabinet members are meeting today where officials are considering a response to Iran's attack. What do we know so far? Yes, yeah, Stephanie, we know that the second uh, Israeli war cabinet meeting in just 24 hours has now broken up. Israeli officials saying that uh, the possible response, the options that Israel has uh, were discussed, but there's no indication at this stage uh, that Israel has actually made a decision. Uh, clearly, it's looking at a range of options and also the timing of any response would be clear. I mean, clearly, there is a consensus that Israel has to respond. The scale and nature of that response uh, is still up in the air. And clearly, Israel is under pressure from allies like the United States to rein in its response, to not go for something that would be deemed to be too escalatory. Uh, we just come off a briefing from the Israeli Air Defense, uh, Israeli Air Force, and an official there confirming uh, the importance of not only U.S. coordination of that allied response in the overall defense 
uh, on Sunday morning, but also the crucial role that Middle Eastern countries played, uh, allowing Israeli jets to operate in their air defense to shoot down those missiles and drones. Uh, and that sort of broad coalition, the support, will be a factor when it comes to the Israeli government's decision making on what type of response it will make. Certainly well. Many waiting to hear what direction Israel will go in. Tom, thank you. Selena, I want to turn to you. How is President Biden responding to all of this? Yeah, well, look, after the attack happened, the president spoke to Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu over the phone, and his message to him was, take this slow, don't escalate things, and think very carefully and strategically about your next step. Now, the president made clear that, look, they were willing to defend Israel, but if Israel decides to strike back, they will do so alone. The president wants to prevent this conflict from spreading into a wider war, something he's been very careful about since October 7th. And right now, as Tom was saying, the ball is very much in Israel's court. But despite this pressure we're seeing from the president, from U.S. officials, the Biden administration does believe that Israel is going to respond in some way. That's according to a senior U.S. official. And the president very much wanting to stress to Netanyahu, though, to take the win. Take the win here. You already proved that your military is superior after this onslaught from Iran. Israel coming out ahead. And, and Louis, Israel says that 99% of Iran's missiles and drones that made it to Israel were intercepted. Earlier on Good Morning America, top White House national security spokesman John Kirby said Iran is not the power it purports to be, despite its military and ballistic missile capability, but that the U.S. is going to stay vigilant. So what does that tell you about uh, Iran's military capabilities and where the U.S. stands exactly? Stephanie, Iran's military capabilities have still remain strong. I mean, the fact that some of these missiles did not hit their targets, that roughly half of them are the ballistic missiles that were launched from inside Iran towards Israel, uh, did not make it towards uh, uh, as close to Israel as we had originally thought, uh, doesn't imply that they still don't have significant military capabilities. Now, th what we are understanding now is that essentially uh, Iran's, maybe the, the, their guidance systems, their launch systems are not going to be as effective. But it gets to the question of volume. When you have such a large inventory as the Iranians do, um, they have that capability. And even if their missiles don't all launch and hit their targets, that is the, it's still a potential threat. And for American forces, that is another consideration. It could, if, if Israel responds and with the retaliation against Iran, could this then lead Iran to pose a threat to U.S. forces in the region? And that is something that they have said publicly now. Um, so I think that is something that officials here at the Pentagon are taking a very much a close look at just in case. Yeah, an escalation, definitely not what m many people want to see. General Abrams, I want to bring you into this conversation. A senior U.S. official says the Biden administration believes Israel will strike Iran, saying most of the world thinks this is over. It is not. But Iran has made it clear it considers the matter closed. So what could a possible retaliation mean for that region? Well, I think it really depends on the scale, scope, and the timing of any sort of action taken by Israel. Um, and they've got a full range of options to include kinetic and non-kinetic options. So I, I think the region's response um, will be based upon what exactly Israel does. And we'll, we'll just have to wait and see what that's exactly going to look like. We certainly will. We'll keep a close eye on it as well. Thank you all for your time and your insights. Really appreciate it. Selena Wang, Louis Martinez, General Robert Abrams, Tom Sufi Burge. Thank you. Coming up, who dreams are about to come true? We are just hours away from tonight's WNBA draft. We have a look at all of that excitement that is coming up next. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here.
Welcome back. Guess what? Today is tax day. You should probably know this. Business reporter Alexis Christophorus is joining us for more on some last minute tax tips. Talk about last minute. Talk about right up day against of. it, right? We're not going to shame anybody no, here. No, 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 no. You know who you are, but you have <laughs> until midnight tonight to file your taxes and avoid getting hit with penalties and interest. It's not too late, though, to save on your tax bill. First thing, you want to be sure you're taking all of the credits you qualify for. If you have kids, you may be eligible for a $2,000 tax credit per qualifying child, depending on your income and your filing status. And not to be confused with the child tax credit is the child and dependent care tax credit. If you paid expenses for daycare, preschool, or another form of caregiving for, say, a spouse or a parent who's unable to care for themselves, you might qualify for this credit. It starts at $3,000. And if you paid qualified education expenses for an eligible student, you may be able to claim a credit of up to $2,500 with the American Opportunity Tax Credit. If you bought an electric vehicle last year, check and see if it is on the list of EVs that qualify for a credit of up to $7,500. You also have until midnight tonight to make a tax-friendly contribution to your traditional IRA. It's not too late. The max here, $6,500, $7,500 if you're 50 or over. And if you know you're going to need more time to file, just go to irs.gov and request an extension. It'll give you an extra six months to submit your taxes until October 15th. But remember, an extension to file is not an extension to pay. So if you owe money, you still need to make payment by tomorrow or by tonight. Use your previous year's taxes to help estimate what you owe. And if you can't pay the entire amount right now, don't panic. Go to irs.gov, set up a payment plan. The IRS actually wants to work with you so that you can pay your bill. Right, and they want to get their money too. <laughs> That's a huge part of it, yes. <laughs> Alexis, thank you so much. Those are great tips. And, and yeah, yes. we all lead busy lives. So if today's I a day for you to get your yes. taxes done, hey, you're getting it done. Clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. Thank you. <laughs> all right, the WNBA draft kicks off tonight as well. After that epic championship game between the Iowa Hawkeyes and South Carolina Gamecocks, it is now the second most watched non-Olympic women's sporting event in U.S. history. Our Faith Abube has more from a sports bar in Minneapolis dedicated to celebrating women athletes. It's a rite of passage for any sports fan, catching the big game at your local sports bar. And with the popularity of women's sports on the rise, sports bars aren't just for the boys anymore. It's great that this is finally happening and that women's sports are finally getting the, the platform that they deserve. Bars for women's sports popping up across the country, from a bar of their own in Minneapolis to the sports bra in Portland. Women's sports are what everyone's excited about, what everyone's talking about, what everyone is tuning into. Undefeated South Carolina has won its third national championship. The women's NCAA championship game drawing more viewers than the men's final for the first time ever. No one has done more to grow the popularity of this game than Caitlin Clark. Caitlin Clark, the likely number one pick, generating huge crowds. Interest in the game with that number one pick, the Indiana Fever, surging with 13 times as many tickets sold compared to this time last year. It feels really comfortable to walk in a space where you already know that you're going to have some sort of shared interest with the people who are in there. one are allowing fans to get a front row seat to witness history and also of course we'll be glued in to the WNBA draft tonight 7 30 Eastern live on ESPN back to you Stephanie it's gonna be fun thank you so much Faith and thank you for streaming with us I'm Stephanie Ramos ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis we'll be right back This is ABC News Live. The crush of families. On the ground in Ukraine. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Reporting from the Fulton County, Georgia courthouse, I'm Rena Roy. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Welcome back to ABC News Live First. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Today, we are following breaking news. The historic first ever trial of a former president is getting underway. Former President Trump is inside the courtroom for jury selection in the hush money case against him. The Manhattan District Attorney charged Trump with falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney, Michael Cohen. Prosecutors say they may ask for Trump to be held in contempt arguing he has violated the partial gag order the judge imposed. Trump has been ordered not to attack witnesses, individual prosecutors, or family members of the judge and district attorney. Trump has pushed the limits of that order, targeting the judge's daughter over her work as a political consultant. Earlier, Trump called the trial an assault on America. He has pleaded not guilty to the 34 charges against him, and we will have full team coverage as jury selection gets underway. But we are starting with ABC News investigative reporter Olivia Rubin and a look at what's at stake. I never thought anything like this could happen. For the first time in American history, a former president of the United States standing trial on criminal charges. These are felony crimes in New York State, no matter who you are. Former President Donald Trump fought repeatedly to delay the case beginning today, accusing him of illegally hiding payments he orchestrated to porn star Stormy Daniels to silence her affair allegations during his 2016 White House bid. The evidence will show that he did so to cover up crimes relating to the 2016 election. Multiple judges rejected Trump's last-ditch efforts to halt the trial brought by the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Now hundreds of potential jurors are being questioned in a courthouse downtown. I don't know how you can have a trial that's going on right in the middle of an election. Not fair. Not fair. Lawyers for both sides will whittle that group down to just 12 jurors and six alternates, asking them questions to root out any bias. It includes, have they ever attended a Trump rally, subscribed to the conspiracy movement of QAnon, or followed an anti-Trump organization on social media? The process expected to take as long as two weeks. The whole point of jury selection is to find out not just do people know who the parties are involved, not just did they know the charges, but rather can they set all of that information aside and be a fair and impartial juror in this particular case. The charges, 34 counts of falsifying business records. The crime, not the alleged sexual activity, but the paperwork used to keep the payments to Stormy Daniels quiet. Prosecutors say Trump disguised the payments he made to his one-time lawyer and fixer Michael Cohen for Daniels to bury her affair claims, labeling them instead as legal payments for a non-existent retainer agreement with Cohen. He directed me to make the payments. He directed me to become involved in these matters. Prosecutors say those disguised checks cut from the Trump organization to Cohen were part of a larger catch-and-kill scheme devised by Trump and his allies with the publisher of the National Enquirer. Together, prosecutors say they would repeatedly buy negative stories about Trump, only to never publish them. He was very concerned about how this would affect the election. To help his campaign. To help him and the campaign. Trump has pled not guilty to the charges and has called the case election interference. He also claims the affair with Daniels never happened. Did you know about the $130,000 payment to Daniels? Trump is no stranger to the legal system, but he has only come face to face with a jury during his presidential bid for the White House once before. Earlier this year, a nine-person jury heard a civil defamation case brought against Trump by the writer E. Jean Carroll who accused Trump of sexually assaulting her in the 1990s and then defaming her when she went public with her allegations in 2019. There, Trump personally analyzed the potential jurors, often craning his neck and turning around as they answered questions. He never attended the first trial, where a jury found him liable for sexual assault and defamation of Carroll. Some jurors the second time around in the trial to determine damages against Trump appeared visibly shocked when they entered the room only to see the former president of the United States seated there. After days of witnessing Trump's behavior in court, including storming out of the courtroom, that jury of seven men and two women found Trump liable for defamation and ordered him to pay $83 million in damages. We will immediately appeal. We will set aside that ridiculous jury. Now Trump is repeating that process again, but these jurors will be charged with deciding a criminal case. 
If convicted, he could face a maximum of four years in jail for each of the 34 counts. Let's bring in executive editorial producer John Santucci, ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer, and ABC News political director Rick Klein for more on this. And also our thanks to Olivia Rubin for that report. John, we were talking about this earlier. We yeah. heard from the former president there at the courthouse speaking mm -hmm. to reporters, speaking to the camera, saying this is an outrage, this is an assault on the country. Yep. But, but we've also seen him kind of walk this fine line around this partial gag order. Yeah. He's kind of speaking generally, not about the individual individuals that will likely take the stand. So talk to us a little bit about that. How exactly is he walking this fine line? And, and he could still this he could still be in jeopardy uh, I, yeah. and go against this gag order. Uh, right. I mean, listen, I, I would say he's walked the fine line today. Congratulations. You did great on day one. But let's talk about the weekend in the last couple of days. He has not done a good job of walking this line at all. He has hit the judge. He has hit prosecutors. And we now know from our team that's in court right now, Stephanie, that prosecutors at this moment in time right now are making that argument argument that Donald Trump has violated that gag order and they believe he should be held in contempt. We don't have a read as of yet because it's just gotten underway. As we noted a little earlier ago, they took a quick break. So that is probably, as Brian and I were talking about earlier, probably one of the last motions we're going to see before we actually get into what today was supposed to be, which is jury selection. But the reality is that Donald Trump sometimes is his own worst enemy. And when Donald Trump is in front of a microphone and gets, as he says, you know, he's revved up by the crowd, that's exactly what happened this weekend. He's talking about the judge. He's, you know, posting things on social media. The worst thing for Donald Trump is that little button. I don't know what you technically call it on Truth Social, but let's pretend it's Twitter, even though it's called X now. So it's re-Xing or retweeting. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what the phrase is, right? But the reality is that is Donald Trump using his megaphone and projecting that rhetoric. So that is going to be something we're going to need to see very shortly here if prosecutors are making that argument. And we're looking at images of the former president there in the courtroom. Those taken this morning. We also saw the sketches of Trump there in the courtroom as well right here in New York City. Now, Brian, what do prosecutors need to show in order for Trump to be held in content? And, and what consequences could he face? Prosecutors need to show evidence that Donald Trump was on notice and that he knowingly violated the orders of the court. It, it could be anything. Typically, we see it in terms of orders of protection. Don't be around this person's home, school, place of business. He here it's don't speak uh, disparagingly as to these individuals. And so prosecutors will likely come forward with the social media posts from True Social, from X, from Instagram, wherever it may be, and say, Judge, here are the statements. We know that Donald Trump posted them himself. You can show either through uh, the way that he speaks, the way that he's posted other um, posts, because he obviously can't be someone who's handling his social media. And then they'll go back to the order itself and say, this is what you said, Judge, this is a violation. Typically, as an attorney, I'd have to tell people that you can face up to a year in prison for a misdemeanor contempt of court, but I don't think we're there here when it comes to Donald Trump. I think the big thing is what is the, the proverbial sticks, so to speak, uh, when it comes to punishing Donald Trump? The logistics of having someone even incarcerated just for a, a half a day to show the punishment with a former president, how is that going to work out? Are you going to put him behind the courtroom that has typically their own little holding cells and have Secret Service stay there with him? And what, like, I don't know how that would work. And so that's why I even say, like, jokingly, more likely than not, we're talking about fines or maybe something the judge kind of Im improvises on their own and say, you know what? I want you to write an essay about the importance of, of, of following uh, court orders and you have to hand it to me by here. I've seen judges say, you know what? You're going to buy opposing counsel lunch or something of that nature. It, I think it's going to be something small like that, maybe hit him in the pocketbook or something a little bit more personal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would he really write an essay? I <laughs> don't know. I, maybe his team. Maybe, maybe his team. I, I've seen it before, wow. but I definitely don't think he's going to be in a holding cell. It's got, I, I, more likely than not, I'd probably say the, the essay somewhat jokingly, it's probably going to hit him in the pocketbook mm -hmm. in some sort of a fine. Sort I will say fine. that would be the first essay that ever be signed in Sharpie. That would be new. That would be something <laughs> we've never seen before we had to do it. <laughs> unique, very unique. Rick, uh, I want to bring you in. Trump argues this gag order limits his political speech. Would you say... Uh, that statement plays into his campaign messaging? 
100 percent. I think it is a campaign message when he says it. He says it in fundraising appeals. He says it at rallies. He tells it to supporters all the time. How about uh, as another example in his view of how unfair this is. And it's a it's a testament to his ability to control the messaging and uh, the, the thinking of so many of his supporters that that's been internalized the way it has. This is a, you know, the, the gag orders, as Brian and others will know, they don't happen all the time, but they happen in, in cases that, that have particular uh, histories with defendants or uh, or particular public scrutiny. And these, these gag orders have been pretty narrowly tailored. Uh, and so far, he's gotten a lot of leeway in what he's been able to say and do. Uh, and judges are, I think, rightly trying to, to carve around the fact that we're in the middle of a political campaign. He has and continues to, to test the limits. He also gets a lot of benefit from the perception that he is limited in what he can say, because that, that feeds the campaign argument that he's been making to, to so much success for so many months. Right. And, and John, the judge rules prosecutors can admit evidence related to Trump's attacks on his former attorney, Michael Cohen. Mm -hmm. So how significant is that? Well, I'm going to answer that question in two seconds, but okay. I just want to flag there's a little bit of breaking news from our team. So it sounds like from our team in court, Lucian Brueggemann, who's just sent a note to our, our, our main uh, email system here, is that the judge is trying to move things along rather quickly to get ahead to jury uh, selection here. The judge saying, this is what we're going to do. Everyone's going to sit down and relax to both attorneys. Quote, we have 500 jurors waiting for us, and to be honest with you, I'm not interested in getting into this minutia with you. Talking about all of the motions that are coming up right now in court, saying at one point as he's going through this that so much of this has been frivolous this morning, and he just wants to get to actually the course of business, which is to seat a jury. And but they have been there for the last couple of hours, they about have. three hours or so? Yeah, starting first thing this morning, and, and nevertheless, we're probably going to get to lunch and not begin jury selection. But to answer your question quickly about Michael Cohen, basically what happened here is that the judge said, listen, if the defense presents anything about attacking Michael Cohen's character, then it opens the doors for prosecutors to introduce other evidence about Michael Cohen. So really, this is all going to be a very interesting game to watch, if you will. Not that it's a game as a fun one, but in the sense that if you do this, then th that happens. And that really is going to get to a place of where how long this case is going to go, depending on, frankly, if they want to stick within some of the guardrails for the judge, but if they test the limits, judge already saying, fine, do that, then this happens. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Michael Cohen, mm. uh, Rick Klein, this question is for you. Cohen once said he would take a bullet for Trump before becoming a local critic. How damaging could his testimony be politically for Trump? Could it affect well, him? Well, start with the fact that he is a admitted liar, uh, admitted to, to having lied to Congress, uh, lying in court, lying to the public and the media. Now, in his telling, those lies were told in service of Donald Trump, and he has since acknowledged that uh, that, that, that he that he needs to have seen a, di a different path, um, and, and he's served time as a uh, as as someone who's admitted to that lying. But as someone like John Santucci, who knew Michael Cohen when he was a loyalist to Donald Trump, getting a full portrait of who he was to him is still kind of an astounding fact. This was the ultimate insider, uh, the ultimate uh, lawyer slash, uh, slash uh, body man slash you name it, anything he needed to do, fixer he needed to do, he would do it for Trump. And the fact that he ultimately uh, turned on him in this most public way makes him potentially a very compelling witness. But the first thing the jury is going to have to do is believe him for it to be effective because it's so easy to question his credibility by his own admission about uh, previous areas where he's lied or been inconsistent. So much of the case, to my mind, is going to hinge on that because he's the guy that can connect all of these dots and make this about uh, not just a, a hush money payment, but also about a campaign. There aren't many people that are as well situated um, in this in this case to to bring it all together as Michael Cohen. It'll definitely be interesting to see what he has to say when he takes the stand. Now, Brian, Trump's team is filing a new motion seeking a delay in the trial. We already saw them try to delay this trial three times last week. So, how do you see that playing out? I think no sooner than they finish the sentence for their argument, the judge will make a ruling and say, no, let's just move on. Because ultimately, again, I understand from a defense standpoint, I have done it myself. I'm sure that the moment I'm done finishing this sentence, I'm going to get many prosecutors who are going to text me and say, oh, that's your stance on last minute delays. Uh, but you do it because the argument is, again, if you don't make that argument here, you cannot appeal it down the road. And they want every appellate argument that they can make uh, going after this trial if they do lose. But ultimately, the judge has already signaled as John has said, we've got 500 jurors waiting for us. This is about to start, whether you like it or not. If there's an issue, we'll take it up later. The appellate court can listen to it, but we're going to start this trial, and I don't think any argument's going to delay that at this point.
The, yeah, this is going to take some time. Thank mm -hmm. you, Brian. Thank you, John, as well. And Rick Klein, thank you all. We will have continuing coverage of the former president's trial all day long right here on ABC News Live. We're also following another major story, fallout over Iran's assault on Israel, unleashing hundreds of missiles and drones, most of them shot down or failing to reach their target. Israel's war cabinet weighing a response as President Biden and other world leaders trying to prevent further escalation. We have team coverage on the tensions in the Middle East coming up. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine, Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is meeting with his war cabinet today to discuss potential responses to Iran's attack. The cabinet met yesterday but ended their meeting without making a final decision about a response. This after Iran launched a massive missile and drone barrage at Israel over the weekend. Two U.S. officials confirmed to ABC News that at least half failed before reaching their targets and Israel says 99% of the others were intercepted. Let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez, and ABC's national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy, and foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burge in Tel Aviv, Israel, to talk about this. Tom, we want to start with you. Israeli war cabinet members met today where officials were considering a response to Iran's attack. What do we know so far? Yes, Stephanie, the second meeting of the War Cabinet within 24 hours is now broken up. We have no word yet on whether a decision has been made over Israel's possible response or about the possible timing of any potential action Israel is due to take. Uh, what we are getting, though, is, is interesting comment from an Israeli official speaking uh, to ABC News, and that official uh, saying that he or she believes that any Israeli response will be, in their words, carefully calibrated uh, to not uh, jeopardize the success of Saturday night. And of course, the, s the success from Israel's point of view and the coalition around it, namely the United States, is of course the high shoot down of those Iranian uh, missiles and drones uh, in, in that mass attack, unprecedented attack. But of course, this is a high stakes moment for Israel. Uh, Iran has effectively rewritten the rules here in the Middle East. Up until now, Iran was effectively fighting a kind of shadow war using only proxies like Hezbollah and the Houthis in Yemen uh, to attack Israel. Uh, now the rules of the game have changed and the Israeli government you know, is, is weighing up its, its options. And of course, even within the Israeli government, there are competing interests and views. And that is this sort of crucial moment that now uh, faces the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. 
And we know the Biden administration has told Israel to slow down. I want to bring in Selena Wang. Selena, uh, tell us exactly how President Biden and his team is responding. Yeah, well, look, in that phone call after the attack, President Biden's message to Netanyahu was basically take the win here. You've already shown that Israel's military is superior, that you have a coalition of people helping you. You were able to take down almost all of the drones and missiles coming at you. So he's now asking Netanyahu to take it slow, think carefully and strategically about his next steps. He's also made very clear to Israel that if they decide to strike back at Iran, they will do so alone, that the U.S. is not going to help. Clearly, the U.S. is able to help on the defensive side, but they're not going to go on the offensive. President Biden, his priority here is to prevent this from escalating into a wider war. They're very concerned that if Israel counterstrikes and there are any deaths in Iran, that this could be a tit for tat where we see things really spiral here. So that is really the focus of this administration now. But despite all the pressure you're seeing from the U.S. to the Israelis, to Tom's point, they likely are going to respond. They are bracing for that. The question now is with the ball in Israel's court is what they do next. Exactly. What direction do they go in? Thank you. Louis, uh, this next question is for you. Israel says 99% of Iran's 300 missiles and drones that made it to Israel were intercepted. But Israeli officials say Iran significantly increased the number of missiles it would fire. Uh, why is that? Is, is, there, is there anything there at the Pentagon or, or any officials that have spoken to that? Stephanie, that's something that we're trying to chase down here at the Pentagon uh, because there was U.S. intelligence coming in in real time to the Situation Room uh, about the extent of the Iranian uh, attack on Israel. We know that there was a first salvo of 80 missiles um, that w first went, went out towards uh, Israel, and then there was a second salvo a few, uh, maybe an hour or so later. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to ascertain is exactly, uh, remember, the drones were launched. It took hours for them to fly all the way westward towards Israel, and it gave uh, the, the United States and uh, Israel, most importantly, time to react and to prepare the defenses that they already had ready in place. Um, so the question is, did the Iranians then see that and then say, we need to launch a second salvo. Um, so that's something that we're trying to narrow down here on the U.S. side. Obviously, that's coming in from Israeli officials. And, and Mick, I want to bring Mick into this conversation. A U.S. official tells ABC they expect Israel to take some sort of countermeasure, but it's unclear how big. But Iran has made it clear it considers the matter closed. So what could a possible retaliation mean for the region? So I think it's, it is clear that the Israelis feel they have to have some response or they would set a paradigm, whereas they attack these IRGC Quds Force officers, the primary Iranian entity that deals with proxies that attacks Israel, and then, it's, then it, Iran feels they can attack directly into Israel from Iran. So from Tom's uh, uh, comments, it looks like they're going to go more on the low end, which is obviously in line with what the White House would like to see. White House potentially wouldn't like to see any response in Iran. But it's also important to point out that there is history here. So President Reagan asked Israel not to strike the nuclear facilities in Iraq. They did. Uh, President Bush asked him not to strike the nuclear facilities in Syria. They did. So there is a history here of them doing this either way. But hopefully, hopefully it's done in a way that doesn't uh, bring Iran into feeling like they have to do an even larger attack, if any, uh, back into Israel. But that's the biggest concern. That's how these, uh, these conflicts turns into wars and gets, uh, gets escalated very quickly. The ball is in Israel's court. We will see what direction they go in. Thank you all. Thank you, Selena, Louis, General Robert Abrams, and Tom Sufi Burge. More of the day's top stories right after this break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. 
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I'm Mola Lenghi in Beirut, Lebanon, and wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Let's take a look at some of the day's top stories. The weapons supervisor for Alec Baldwin's film Rust will learn her prison sentence today. Hannah Gutierrez was convicted of involuntary manslaughter last month for the death of another crew member who was shot when a gun held by Baldwin went off. She faces up to 18 months in prison. Baldwin is also charged with involuntary manslaughter. His trial is scheduled to start in July. Security at the Boston Marathon is on high alert after law enforcement agencies have identified what they're calling a broad set of potential soft targets for an attack. That is according to a threat assessment obtained by ABC News. Officials say the most significant threat facing this marathon comes from lone offenders and small groups of individuals looking to commit acts of violence, particularly at designated viewing areas. Boston law enforcement says 48 local, state, and federal public safety organizations will be positioned throughout the city. And the path of that race, police say they know of no specific threats to the area. And in much lighter news, the highly anticipated WNBA draft tips off tonight. Caitlin Clark is expected to be the number one pick with Angel Reese and Camilla Cardoso not too far behind. The excitement comes after the women's NCAA championship game drew more viewers than the men's final for the first time ever. You can see the WNBA draft live tonight at 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. We do want to thank you for streaming with us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis. We'll be right back. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I watch do. you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Here's to Good Mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping... Make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because... You know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. And that's why at Good Morning America, we're right here. And we got you. We got you. We got you. Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Today on ABC News Live, first, we are following breaking news. The historic first ever trial of a former president is getting underway. Former President Trump is inside the courtroom for jury selection in the hush money case against him. The Manhattan District Attorney is seeking to hold Trump in contempt of court after charging him with falsifying business records to conceal payments he allegedly made to Stormy Daniels through his then attorney, Michael Cohen. The judge appears to be growing impatient with Trump's legal team after hours of back and forth over various motions. Judge Juan Merchant abruptly ended the debate, saying 500 jurors are waiting to be vetted and there's more important work to be done. Earlier today, Trump called the trial an assault on America. He has pleaded not guilty to the 34 charges against him. We have full team coverage as this trial gets underway with jury selection. We want to bring in executive editorial producer John Santucci. The district attorney, John, is now seeking to hold Trump in content. Yeah. We saw him walk in. We saw him speak to reporters. And yep. now this. What's the latest? So it's actually nothing to do with statements Donald Trump has made to camera. It's actually social media posts Donald Trump made on his social media platform Truth Social. So what prosecutors are arguing in court, Stephanie, that on three occasions, Donald Trump made posts intimidating witnesses that could be a part of this case or statements that involved witnesses in this case. So for each of those instances, the prosecutors in this case are asking the judge to fine Donald Trump $1,000. So if we do the math times three, a $3,000 fine is what prosecutors are seeking. Now, our team is very quickly, based off of the statements Donald Trump has made, I'm sorry, the prosecutor have made in court polled what we believe these social media statements are. It appears it's comments attacking Stormy Daniels. Um, another comment uh, that he uh, posted about was reacting to a post by Michael Avenatti, who at one point was Stormy Daniels' attorney, if you recall, often by her side when things first came to fruition. And there is a third post, we're still trying to locate it, something about Michael Cohen being a liar. And obviously that would attack his credibility. So what prosecutors are saying is that, look, this gag order that Judge Merchan put into effect not only was about the prosecutors or the judge's family or others, it involved witnesses. And these posts very clearly from the mind of prosecutors are targeting, attacking those witnesses and violating that gag order. Now the judge has not ruled on that. They just broke for lunch, but you got to imagine when they come back, we're going to get a sense if this will be the first fine Donald Trump gets from this court. And we were speaking about this earlier, how Trump had been walking this fine line when it came to this gag order. I want to bring in Chief Washington Correspondent Jonathan Carl. Uh, John, prosecutors asked the judge to allow evidence of Trump's alleged witness intimidation. What can you tell us about this alleged pressure campaign to keep witnesses off the stand at this trial? 
Uh, th this has been an issue with Donald Trump, actually, in, in several of his cases. He's actually had to be uh, admonished uh, by, by more than one judge, reminded not to intimidate witnesses. Uh, so this is uh, something, the, 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 an effort to, uh, uh, to intimidate this, the central witness in this case, Michael Cohen. Uh, Trump's former longtime lawyer, somebody who uh, himself spent time in jail uh, on uh, charges related uh, in part to uh, these payments to Stormy Daniels. Uh, you know, it's it, it sometimes it, it seems a little uh, it, it's intimidation. Uh, reminding witnesses that uh, that they'll be taken care of uh, if they um, uh, if they don't cross Donald Trump. Uh, but there is a this has been a recurring theme uh, with Trump in each of his cases. Uh, thank you, John. I want to bring in ABC's uh, contributor and former Georgia prosecutor Chris Timmons. Uh, Chris, the judge says there are 500 potential jurors waiting to be vetted. How unusual is that? And to have that many people sitting there waiting, and what does that say about the magnitude of this case? So, Stephanie, I mean, it, it definitely tells you it's a high-profile case. You know, normally you get a jury of maybe 40 people, maybe 48 people, if it looks like it's controversial. This would be the, the veneer that comes in uh, at first for the jury selection. Here, the fact that they summon 500, they know that this is not the uh, just any ordinary case. This is not just any ordinary high-profile case. This is probably the highest-profile case to have happened, um, arguably, in the history of this country. You've got a former president on trial. And so with that, you've got to bring in 500 people because you've got to narrow it down. Can we find, you know, the, the 12, the, the 16, the 18, depending on how many alternates, that can be fair, that can put aside, in, and we're not looking for people that haven't heard about the case, but what we are looking for are folks that can put aside any beliefs that they've formed about this case and render a fair and impartial jury, or fair and impartial verdict, Stephanie. And, and this jury selection process expected to take just this week, probably going into next week as well. Uh, I want to bring in Rick Klein, our political director. Rick, Trump's attorney, says he wants to attend every, every day, every day of this trial. Is this the new campaign trail? Yes, uh, it is. And it, look, it has been for some time for Donald Trump, where he spent more time in courtrooms, often by choice, uh, than on the actual campaign trail. Now it is going to be more of a situation where he's required to be there for all the official proceedings. He acknowledged to the judge that he understands that, that he recognized that. This is not a surprise to the campaign. The people running the campaign don't particularly like it, but they're stuck with it. And this is going to be the reality of this campaign, is that Donald Trump, as the a presumptive Republican nominee for president and a former president himself, is essentially going to be campaigning from inside and outside a courthouse for the four foreseeable future for at least four days or so every week. Uh, they're going to have to put campaign rallies on weekends. They're going to have to schedule things for Wednesdays and maybe after or even before the court session begins if he wants to do anything else. But this is the reality. Uh, it is, again, this is not how any campaign manager would ever design it. But if anyone is designed himself to take advantage of a situation like that, it is the former president who knows the media landscape so well, who knows the cameras so well and the, and the microphones that are waiting for him, uh, which could also be problematic. If, he's, if he says too much outside court, but I, I expect that the campaign will very much continue. It's not like it's on pause just because he's on trial. And thanks, Rick. And John Sentry, do you want to bring you in? John, yeah. uh, more, let's talk more about this proposed fine. It, it, this is day one. Yep. Is, do you think this at all will kind of reel Trump in, will rein him in? Like, will this stop him from speaking to cameras before going into the courtroom, especially if, he, if he's expected to be there every single day of the trial? Will this kind of uh, restrict him? Well, it's interesting, right? Because it's almost like, you know, we all know Donald Trump in front of a microphone is dangerous, if you will, if you're his lawyers especially, but the fact of the matter is it's Donald Trump with something like this that now caused him a problem, right? That he's literally sitting there, sometimes late at night, we, you know, listen, we wake up in the morning, we have all the notifications that Donald Trump has done it. I remember so many times waking up campaign aides and eventually White House aides to Donald Trump saying, hey, what do you think about this tweet? And they would say, what tweet are you talking about, right? Most people are not with him when he is on social media. So the idea is that people can try to step in, give him a nudge, give him a look when it's in person, but this is where Donald Trump has to actually be his own hall monitor, right? Like you can't post and comment things, you can't retweet things, or whatever we call it on, on Truth Social. So I do think if this actually goes through, you know, look, $3,000 to Donald Trump in a past couple of months, you'd say, yeah, not that much. 
He's on the hook for nearly $500 million between the New York AG fine, what he owes E. Jean Carroll in the defamation case. So I don't know. Maybe you say to yourself, eh, let me knock it off. I've got a lot of bills at the moment. That would be the thought. Mm -hmm. And when we saw him this morning, he, we were speaking about this, he kept it pretty general. He didn't bring up individuals who were expected to take the stand. However, yeah. on, on the social media platform, he, of course, talked about Michael Cohen. Brian, uh, Trump's team has filed another motion to delay the trial. We saw that they tried to delay the trial last week, three separate times. What's their goal with these motions? Just to extend this process as, as much as possible? Mm -hmm. Delay, delay, delay has been the tactic for most, if not all, of his cases, ultimately trying to push them beyond the election. Ultimately, if he gets elected as the next president, he gets to turn around and say, I can't go to court, I'm, I'm running a country. I can't abide by whatever potential punishment he does receive uh, if he is convicted of this case. Uh, and also, he, he gets to say, you know what, I've got bigger fish to fry, and can ultimately, uh, as the president, kind of look and say maybe this case should be terminated because I, I've got other things to do. Um, but in t what I'm really interested about is this contempt of court that we're probably going to hear about either uh, immediately after the lunch break or some other time. When we talk about contempt of court, uh, I think specifically this one, if we're talking about a $1,000 fine, that's the misdemeanor criminal contempt that we have here in New York. And I think the big arguments here are either that he intentionally uh, disobeyed or resisted a lawful process or mandate, or the other one I can see the argument being that he, that's an intentional failure to obey uh, to fail to obey any mandate process or notice issued upon him. And I think what's gonna happen here is the process gonna say, hey, he intentionally did this. Like he named names and he was told not to do this. And I think the pushback for the defense will be that it was too vague. It was too general. And you're getting into this First Amendment issue where he should be allowed to say, I question the credibility of the people coming forward. He's not making direct threats as to try to harm anyone. And I think that's gonna be the play that we're gonna see come 2.15, 2.30 after the lunch break. All right, we will see. Let's check in with senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky, who is outside the court. Aaron, you have been watching these proceedings from the overflow room. What does that seem like? Well, we've seen the, that the prosecutors from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office have made a motion to try and hold former President Trump in contempt of court over his uh, extrajudicial statements, namely three social media posts that prosecutors believed were disparaging of witnesses in the case and therefore a violation of the limited gag order Judge Juan Mershon imposed. The judge said he would think that over over lunch. The defense attorneys pushed back and said uh, Trump's social media posts were not uh, in violation of the gag order. But it gives you a sense of, of just how contentious the proceeding is. And we haven't even started jury selection yet. At one point, the judge noted we have 500 potential jurors waiting for us. And he didn't want to get into the minutia of some of the legal wrangling that the, the defense attorneys and the prosecutors were, were trying to argue. So we expect that after the lunch break, we'll get into jury selection uh, proper. But we've had a look at, at former President Trump throughout the proceedings. He does appear to be engaged, uh, actively conferring with his attorneys. At one point, in fact, defense attorney Todd Blanche appeared to, to kind of whack Trump on the arm a little bit as if to say, uh, OK, I got it enough. Uh, but we're not sure what that specific dialogue was like. But the former president is clearly interested in what his lawyer is communicating to the judge. That is very interesting. And we're looking at, uh, we were seeing sketches of the former president there in the courtroom. Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, let's check in with senior reporter Catherine Folders. Catherine, Trump is, of course, facing legal battles on multiple fronts. What are you watching for as this case moves forward? I know earlier you were speaking of the, the, the aides and, and certain individuals that are expected to take the stand. But what's sticking out? What are you looking out for the most? Well, uh, I think during the jury selection process, that will be interesting to see, uh, for example, what Trump's lawyers strike potential jurors on, uh, whether it be for cause, whether it be what they've said uh, is bias. Do Trump's lawyers try and do another Hail Mary attempt uh, to ask for another change of venue? I'm told that that's something that they could try. Uh, logistically, I don't know really how that would work or even if the judge would allow it. Uh, but I think what's fascinating here is you see that image right there, uh, Trump, the one that you just had before before and his, his uh, lead lawyer, Todd Blanche, sitting beside him. Uh, Blanche came on uh, the Trump legal team just for this case. He's now leading uh, the federal cases, the Jack Smith probes, uh, so January 6th in the classified documents case. And what's even more striking is when you saw Trump exit Trump Tower today with his legal team, he was also exiting with another one of his co-defendants in another case, Walt Nauda, his valet, his top aide, who was charged alongside him uh, federally in Florida uh, for 
for Trump's alleged efforts to conceal and obstruct the classified documents probe. So, uh, of course, this is just one uh, of the legal challenges that Trump is facing. He has uh, so many additional matters outstanding. How does the legal team juggle all of these? There's various different hearings in various different districts. But uh, as Rick and Santucci and Carl have also been talking about here, uh, Trump is really using this to blend the political with the legal. He has said before that Joe Biden is taking him off the campaign trail when he didn't really have to be there. It, he's trying to capitalize on this and use his legal challenges as a way to boost his political campaign. You will see a lot of that through his rhetoric, but also through the people around him, whether it be his lawyers or his top campaign aides who have been seen there today. And we will see what happens after lunch there as the court is in recess. Catherine, thank you so much. And thanks to the rest of our team, Aaron, uh, John, Brian, Chris Timmons, the whole team with you all day long. We will have continuing coverage of the former president's trial here on ABC News Live. More of the day's top stories, including the latest on tensions in the Middle East. Stay with us. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You Watch do. you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to Good Morning america.com or scan this qr code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed why do so many people start their day here from abc news this is start here to be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories a lot of news today so let's get into it listen now to the daily news podcast honored with four edward r murrow awards and see why the new york times calls it a news podcast worth listening to start here abc news make it your daily first listen now that's a part of the story i bet you didn't see coming wherever you get your podcasts start here Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is meeting with his war cabinet today to discuss potential responses to Iran's attack. The cabinet met yesterday, but ended their meeting without making a final decision about a response. This after Iran launched a massive missile and drone barrage at Israel over the weekend. Two U.S. officials confirmed to ABC News that at least half failed before reaching their targets, and Israel says 99% of the other were intercepted. Let's bring in senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez, and ABC's national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy, and foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burge in Tel Aviv, Israel, to talk about this. Tom, we want to start with you. Israeli war cabinet members met today where officials were considering a response to Iran's attack. What do we know so far? Yes, Stephanie, the second meeting of the War Cabinet within 24 hours has now broken up. We have no word yet on whether a decision has been made over Israel's possible response or about the possible timing of any potential action Israel is due to take. Uh, what we are getting, though, is, is interesting comment from an Israeli official speaking uh, to ABC News, and that official uh, saying that he or she believes that any Israeli response will be, in their words, carefully calibrated uh, to not uh, jeopardize 
the success of Saturday night and of course the, s the success from Israel's point of view and the coalition around it, namely the United States, is of course the high shoot down of those Iranian uh, missiles and drones uh, in, in that mass attack, unprecedented attack. But of course this is a high stakes moment for Israel. Uh, Iran has effectively rewritten the rules here in the Middle East. Up until now, Iran was effectively fighting a kind of shadow war using only proxies like Hezbollah and the Houthis in Yemen uh, to attack Israel. Uh, now the rules of the game have changed and the Israeli government you know, is, is weighing up its, its options. And of course, even within the Israeli government, there are competing interests and views. And that is this sort of crucial moment that now uh, faces the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And we know the Biden administration has told Israel to slow down. I want to bring in Selena Wang. Selena, uh, tell us exactly how President Biden and his team is responding. Yeah, well, look, in that phone call after the attack, President Biden's message to Netanyahu was basically take the win here. You've already shown that Israel's military is superior, that you have a coalition of people helping you. You were able to take down almost all of the drones and missiles coming at you. So he's now asking Netanyahu to take it slow, think carefully and strategically about his next steps. He's also made very clear to Israel that if they decide to strike back at Iran, they will do so alone, that the U.S. is not going to help. Clearly, the U.S. is able to help on the defensive side, but they're not going to go on the offensive. President Biden, his priority here is to prevent this from escalating into a wider war. They're very concerned that if Israel counterstrikes and there are any deaths in Iran, that this could be a tit for tat where we see things really spiral here. So that is really the focus of this administration now. But despite all the pressure you're seeing from the U.S. to the Israelis, to Tom's point, they likely are going to respond. They are bracing for that. The question now is with the ball in Israel's court is what they do next. Exactly. What direction do they go in? Thank you. Louis, uh, this next question is for you. Israel says 99% of Iran's 300 missiles and drones that made it to Israel were intercepted. But Israeli officials say Iran significantly increased the number of missiles it would fire. Uh, why is that? Is, is, there, is there anything there at the Pentagon or, or any officials that have spoken to that? Stephanie, that's something that we're trying to chase down here at the Pentagon uh, because there was U.S. intelligence coming in in real time to the Situation Room uh, about the extent of the Iranian uh, attack on Israel. We know that there was a first salvo of 80 missiles um, that first went, went out towards uh, Israel, and then there was a second salvo a few, uh, maybe an hour or so later. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to ascertain is exactly, uh, remember, the drones were launched. It took hours for them to fly all the way westward towards Israel. And it gave uh, the United States and Israel, most importantly, time to react and to prepare the defenses that they already had ready in place. Um, so the question is, did the Iranians then see that and then say, we need to launch a second salvo? Um, so that's something that we're trying to narrow down here on the U.S. side. Obviously, that's coming in from Israeli officials. And, and Mick, I want to bring Mick into this conversation. A U.S. official tells ABC they expect Israel to take some sort of countermeasure, but it's unclear how big. But Iran has made it clear it considers the matter closed. So what could a possible retaliation mean for the region? I think it's, it is clear that the Israelis feel they have to have some response or they would set a paradigm, whereas they attack these IRGC Quds Force officers, the primary Iranian entity that deals with proxies that attacks Israel, and then, it's, then it, Iran feels they can attack directly into Israel from Iran. So from Tom's uh, uh, comments, it looks like they're going to go more on the low end, which is obviously in line with what the White House would like to see. White House potentially wouldn't like to see any response in Iran. But it's also important to point out that there is history here. So President Reagan asked Israel not to strike the nuclear facilities in Iraq. They did. Uh, President Bush asked him not to strike the nuclear facilities in Syria. They did. So there is a history here of them doing this either way. But hopefully, hopefully it's done in a way that doesn't uh, bring a Iran into feeling like they have to do an even larger attack, if any, back into Israel. But that's the biggest concern. That's how these uh, these conflicts turns into wars and gets uh, gets escalated very quickly. Our thanks to Selena Wang, Louis Martinez, Mick Mulroy, and Tom Sufi Burge. Thank you all. More of the day's top stories right after the break. so many people.
people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. There was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all? That's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good Morning America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here and we got gotcha. you. You're watching America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news. Exclusives. Live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. I'm Zoreen Shah reporting from the New Hampshire primary. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Let's take a look at some of the day's top stories. The weapons supervisor for Alec Baldwin's film Rust will learn her prison sentence today. Hannah Gutierrez was convicted of involuntary manslaughter last month for the death of another crew member who was shot when a gun held by Baldwin went off. She faces up to 18 months in prison. Baldwin is also charged with involuntary manslaughter. His trial is scheduled to start in July. Security at the Boston Marathon is on high alert after law enforcement agencies have identified what they're calling a broad set of potential soft targets for an attack. That is according to a threat assessment obtained by ABC News. Officials say the most significant threat facing this marathon comes from lone offenders and small groups of individuals looking to commit acts of violence, particularly at designated viewing areas. Boston law enforcement says 48 local, state, and federal public safety organizations will be positioned throughout the city. And the path of that race, police say they know of no specific threats to the area. And in much lighter news, the highly anticipated WNBA draft tips off tonight. Caitlin Clark is expected to be the number one pick with Angel Reese and Camila Cardoso not too far behind. The excitement comes after the women's NCAA championship game drew more viewers than the men's final for the first time ever. You can see the WNBA draft live tonight at 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. We do want to thank you for streaming with us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, then bought him a gun. You don't get to walk away from that. That's a criminal act. Only on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? That sounds pretty good. Your health, your money, breaking news, music, and of course, good food. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love you that. Me. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're gonna take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Let's get right to our top story. The people of the state of New York versus Donald J. Trump, the first ever criminal trial of a former president of the United States. Right now, Trump is in recess as he attends the trial there in Manhattan for jury selection in the hush money case against him. The culmination of a year-long indictment by Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Trump is charged with 34 counts of allegedly falsifying documents to hide those payments he made to porn star Tor Stormy Daniels to keep her quiet about an alleged affair prior to his run for the White House in 2016. Trump has pleaded not guilty to the charges, claiming that the case is just election interference as he continues to campaign for the November election. And he continued to push that claim as he entered the courthouse this morning, the former president attempting to discredit the case, calling it an assault on America. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. We have full team coverage of this historic New York criminal trial. Joining me now, our senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky, also executive editorial producer, John Santucci. Elizabeth Schulze is here in Washington. Jay O'Brien is up on the Hill. Former Georgia prosecutor Chris Timmons is with us and criminal defense attorney Tim Jansen. We have a full slate. Aaron, uh, let's start with you. Talk to us about what has happened so far today. It's all been preliminary so far at this historic first criminal trial of a former American president. Former President Trump paused at the door to the courthouse, then walked down the center aisle, took his place at the defense table, and conferred frequently with his attorneys during the proceedings, which have all focused on preliminary matters. The judge immediately turned aside a request to recuse himself from the case. Trump has been pushing for that over the political work of the judge's daughter. He said that was just based on innuendo, no need for that. And then he took up a number of evidentiary matters as Trump's attorneys and prosecutors squabbled over which evidence should be allowed. And, and then just before lunch, prosecutors asked the judge for permission to file uh, a request to hold Trump in contempt of court because they say he violated the judge's limited gag order with a series of social media posts disparaging witnesses. The judge's order prevents Trump from attacking witnesses in the case along with others. Uh, and defense attorney said, well, he didn't do it, but the judge said he's going to consider it now during the lunch break. All right, we'll see what happens then during the lunch break. Chris, Trump is charged with falsifying his business records, as we know, to conceal this alleged criminal conduct. As a former prosecutor, what exactly does the DA need to prove? Because everyone pretty much knows by now the name Stormy Daniels, the fact that she wrote a scathing book, uh, and also Michael Cohen. I mean, we know how he has thrown his former boss under the bus and has been very open about uh, their relationship and Trump's activities. 
So, Kira, what I think everybody has to remember is that this case is coming out of what happened back in 2016. And what was going on at that time, allegedly, at least according to the prosecutors, was that Donald Trump was paying this money uh, to uh, keep Stormy Daniels from coming forward and thus jeopardizing his chances of being elected in 2016. I think the hardest part that the, the prosecution is going to have is intent. I think Donald Trump's got a number of arguments on what his intent was. Look, I thought I was just paying legal fees. I didn't pay any attention. I didn't know that this, these were hush money payments. I had no involvement in that. There's a lot of different things he could say. And finally, I think what he could say is, look, I was just paying this money because I didn't want my family to find out that I had these affairs going on. I didn't really care about the election. Look, I mean, you know, I got elected regardless of the, these things coming out. I still have a ton of support despite, you know, having these things in my background or these alleged things in my background. And finally, I think he'll also deny that he ever had an affair with Stormy Daniels. So there's a lot to look at. And, and your job as a prosecutor really is to disprove the defenses, to get around that high beyond a reasonable doubt burden. So, Tim, you're a criminal defense attorney. Trump has denied having an affair with Stormy Daniels, even though she gives far too many cringy details in her book. How would you be approaching this case if you were on the Trump legal team? Well, of course, you know, Michael Cohen has been labeled a serial perjurer. He's a convicted felon. Uh, Stormy Daniels has drafted a letter in 2018 in which she said, not only did I not do this, but we never had an affair. Uh, she was motivated by money. And, and clearly, they're going to have a hard stretch proving the intent issue. Did Trump know? Well, they're going to have to rely on the testimony of Michael Cohen, convicted felon, who's labeled as a serial perjurer, to prove that Trump knew this wasn't legal fees. Um, and I think Trump probably will not testify. He would probably be his own worst enemy. The prosecution would love him to testify. But I think they're going to be able to prove that they cannot prove the intent. Remember, this; these are misdemeanor charges that have been now trumped up into federal charges in a state courtroom. There are a lot of hurdles that this prosecution is going to have to get over. And Trump has a really good defense team. So John Trump has made at least, what, 11 attempts now to delay yeah. the trial. He loves to delay, and so far it has worked in his favor. But could things actually change this time around? Well, well it feels like 11, 12. I mean, he tried again today in the Court of Appeals in New York. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen just yet on that one. It's not mattering, right? Because look at where we are at this moment. We are in this courtroom. We are going through a calendar, Kira. We are getting the rules for the road as jury selection, as many expect, will get underway once lunch ends. And the reality is Donald Trump has succeeded in delating three of the other cases, but one somehow has gotten through and this just happens to be it. Look, the other part of this, though, is that this makes things extremely complicated for Donald Trump, the candidate. Obviously, he's the defendant in that courtroom, but as we all know, he is a candidate for the 2024 race for the White House. So being in court four days a week, as one aide said to me, makes it impossible for him to do the things we need him to do, get out there and campaign, race money. Now, they're going to find ways around that, doing, you know, remote events, sending him out on Wednesdays and over the weekends. But nevertheless, Kira, this case, however long it goes, makes it very difficult, as you well know, for Donald Trump to actually do what he should be doing right now, campaigning. Well, Elizabeth, does he really need to campaign? Because he seems to use these moments in time uh, to help his reelection campaign. His polls are still very strong. So thoughts on that, plus President Biden. Do you think he'll use this in any way, shape, or form to his advantage? Because it doesn't seem to really help him when he does. Well, and Kara, we've seen just how intertwined the former president's campaign and his legal battles are. They're one and the same at this point. He's using every opportunity to try to raise awareness about the fact that the White House race is just a few months away. But when it comes to President Biden, he is staying far from this. Do not expect to hear from the president or the White House about this trial. In fact, Kara, we haven't heard from the White House on any of the four criminal indictments that the former president is facing. And that's because they say they don't want to interfere with the court system. They are trying to draw a very clear contrast here with the former president who has relentlessly attacked the judicial system and tried to accuse the former president or the current president without evidence of interfering with these cases. So for now, the White House says the president is governing. We expect uh, Kira, unlike Trump, President Biden will be hitting the campaign trail this week. Tomorrow, he's heading out to Pennsylvania where he'll be spending most of the week. So, Jay, what's the word up there on Capitol Hill? Are lawmakers talking about this, paying attention? Do they have their TVs on? <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, it, 
to the amount that they're paying attention, I'm not quite sure. We've heard a little bit of reaction today from Republican lawmakers, the usual suspects, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, Troy Nels of Texas, who's made it his mission to come out and defend Donald Trump at every turn, uh, called these charges a quote-unquote total sham. But to the point that Elizabeth and John made about Trump using this at every turn to help his campaign, he's also used those four criminal cases, not just this one, to bend Republicans on Capitol Hill to his will. House Republicans are investigating Alvin Bragg's prosecution right now. We've also seen Republican leaders up here on the Hill, from Mike Johnson, a staunch Trump ally, to Mitch McConnell, who's had a very public break with Trump until recently, come out against these charges, say that they view them as political. Mitch McConnell has endorsed Donald Trump. So the point being, we now see Republicans who maybe even months ago, when there was an active primary, might have been somewhat fractured in lockstep behind Donald Trump, preparing themselves for the general election that is already upon us. All right, Aaron, John, Elizabeth, Jay, Chris, and Tim, appreciate you all. We'll be checking back in with you, of course, throughout the afternoon. All right, we are still following the fallout from Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel. For the second day in a row, Israel Prime Minister, Israeli Prime Minister and his war cabinet are meeting to discuss their response to Saturday's attack. The U.S. is making it clear to Israel that if it does strike back militarily, it will do so alone. But Biden, just a short time ago, reaffirming his support for Israel and adding, together with our partners, we defeated that attack. Both countries confirming Iran's attack was pretty much a failure. At least half of those strikes failed before even reaching their targets, while almost all of them were intercepted and shot down. We have team coverage, starting off with our foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burridge there in Tel Aviv, senior White House correspondent Selena Wang in Washington, senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez, and also ABC News contributor and former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, Mick Mulroy. So, Tom, the Israeli War Cabinet reconvening today. Let's talk about... What do we know, if anything, uh, with regard to Israel's potential response here? Yeah, Kira, it's the second uh, meeting of the Israeli War Cabinet in just 24 hours since that, since that unprecedented Iranian attack on Israeli soil in the early hours of Sunday. Uh, we haven't got any word yet if uh, the Israeli government has reached a decision, uh, what the timing of any possible response could be. But we're getting some interesting comment from one Israeli official who, in their words, says that any Israeli action will be quote, carefully calibrated not to jeopardize the success of Saturday. The success, of course, being the high shoot-down rate of the, of his, by Israel uh, of those drones and missiles as they even, before they even got into, many of them even got into Israeli airspace, and of course the wider coalition around it. But of course this is a high-stakes moment for Prime Minister Netanyahu. It's a big, big decision. On the one hand, he has to make sure that Iran, other people in the region, don't think that an attack of this nature can go uh, unpunished. Uh, but at the same time, the U.S. and other allies are weighing in on Israel and telling them to, to hold back, refrain from, from doing something more severe, which would probably uh, mean that Iran would respond again. So, Selena, how involved is the White House at this point? Well, look here, right now the White House is watching very carefully. They're on edge and they're really urging restraint. In a phone call after that attack, President Biden essentially told Netanyahu to take the win, that you've already proven that the Israeli military is superior, you did not face any significant damage, and really urging restraint here, telling Netanyahu to take things slow, think very carefully and deliberately about the risk of escalation here. And we did just hear the president in his first on-camera remarks in the Oval Office since that Iranian strike, and he touted the unprecedented military onslaught from Iran and the ability of the U.S. and its partners along with Israel to combat it and take a listen to what else he said here. We're committed to a ceasefire that will bring the hostages home and preventing conflict from spreading beyond what it already has. We're also committed to the security of our personnel and partners in the region, including Iraq. So the president there keeping the focus as well on what's happening in Gaza. Remember the relationship between Biden and Netanyahu, it is frosty. Just less than two weeks ago, the president had threatened to change U.S. policy if Netanyahu doesn't do more to protect civilians in Gaza. But the president's focus, Kira, here is to keep things from escalating. He made it clear to Netanyahu as well that if they strike back at Iran, the U.S. is not going to get involved. They are not going to help. So, Louis, 99% of Iran's targets intercepted, shot down. According to Israel, uh, what does that tell you about Iran's military capabilities and, more importantly, Israel's? 
Kira, I mean, we have heard for years about Iran's military capabilities, how they have heavily invested in their ballistic missile program, and it is a threat. It remains a threat. Um, I think what you saw on Saturday was the combination effort on the part of the United States, working with Israel, working with other partner nations in the region, and also in Western Europe, to essentially help defend Israel from any kind of a big attack from Iran. That big attack did take place. And so, uh, as we heard from Tassoui Barrage there in Tel Aviv, uh, the Israelis want to build on that relationship, on that success that they had over the weekend, diplomatically, and in terms of a potential response uh, against Iran. Uh, so, what you, we, we, I think what we've learned is that the United States uh, and Israel have developed a significant technological advantage in being able to destroy a, a large number of these incoming missiles. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's still remains a threat, and you can't always count on that technology to bring down every single weapon. That is true. And Mick, if the U.S. doesn't back Israel in a potential military response, how could or would it damage their relationship? I think Israel is looking at this, if they don't respond to this very uh, large attack by Iran directly at Israel, they'll set a new paradigm. But they're having to balance that with what obviously appears the U.S. does not want to see a direct strike in Iran. I do think that the United States has made it clear, as you point out, that they won't be involved in any offensive actions, but they've also made it clear that they will be in defensive actions. And that means a lot to Israel, because this is a very difficult uh, scenario to defend against. As Louis pointed out, it was very successful, uh, but it's very, it's very deliberate and it's very expensive. So I think the relationship uh, will, of course, endure, uh, especially since the U.S. has showed, shown so much commitment to Israel's defense and will, if this does escalate or not. Tom, we are also learning more details as to what intel Israel and the U.S. received ahead of the attack. Yeah, that's right. A, a senior Israeli Air Force official on a briefing uh, this afternoon uh, basically said that the majority of the intel Israel got about uh, giving it an advance warning about the Iranian attack uh, came from coalition partners. And that response was in response to a question uh, related to the actual actions of Middle Eastern nations uh, in the overall defense uh, in the early hours of Sunday morning. Now, Israeli officials are holding back on much detail they're giving and about those specific nations. Uh, Jordan has already admitted that it intercepted uh, either is uh, Iranian drones or missiles in its airspace but Israeli officials are stressing that you know those Arab nations did allow Israeli jets to operate within their airspace and potentially coalition jets as well and, and, and that support was clearly clearly vital and if you look at the overall support that Israel got uh, in that successful defense of that Iranian attack uh, you, you clearly kind of think that actually that gives the US and other allies more leverage when it comes to the very tricky conversations with the Israeli government on how and when they might respond. All right, Tom, Selena, Louis, and Mick, appreciate it. Thank you. Sentencing day for Rust Armor Hannah, Hannah Gutierrez is the latest on that case when we return. Whenever news breaks, we are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3.
What You Need to Know, a third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. It's me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, the movie set armor convicted of involuntary manslaughter in the Rust film shooting is set to be sentenced today. Hannah Gutierrez faces a maximum of 18 months in jail after a jury found her guilty of two counts of involuntary manslaughter for the shooting that resulted in the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. For more, let's bring in our legal contributor and defense attorney, Shauna Lloyd. She's been following it from the very beginning uh, when this all went down. So as for today, what do you expect uh, the judge to rule, Shauna? What do you think? You know, Carol, when we look at this normally, we would expect it to be on the lower end of the sentence, right? Hannah Gutierrez does not have a previous criminal history. Uh, she has roots to the community. She has the things that would typically allow for a lower sentence. But with this being a first, a case of first impression, it's the first time a movie set is being really looked at in this way. I expect to see the judge give a higher penalty than we would ordinarily expect to see, just due to the deterrence. And part of sentencing, let's remember, is deterrence deterring others from making the same mistake. And I think that that is going to be a part that plays in this sentence, particularly for this trial. All right. And let's talk about what's next just within the overall legal case. I mean, we have our eyes on Alec Baldwin as well. Absolutely. From Hannah's team, you may expect to see an appeal. I would not be surprised at all to see an appeal of the sentence and the verdict. And later down the road, we do have to look forward to Alec Baldwin will be on trial for his charges. And they are likely watching this sentencing very closely to see what they can foreshadow for his future and his trial as well. All right. Shanna Lloyd, appreciate it. We'll follow uh, everything today right along with you. Coming up, the 128th Boston Marathon, off and running. We've got the latest results for you next. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. This is our combat operations center. We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here, Made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. We're reporting on board a U.S. Navy destroyer in the eastern Mediterranean. I'm Maggie Ruley. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live.
Some other top headlines we're following for you this hour here on ABC News Live. The FBI launching a criminal investigation into the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse in Baltimore. Authorities are looking into whether the ship's crew knew something was wrong before even leaving port. Agents were on the ship searching today, late last month. The cargo ship Dolly lost power before crashing into that bridge, killing six people. It's being called one of the worst humanitarian crises in recent history. Today marks one year of the brutal civil war in Sudan, a bloody conflict between the Sudanese armed forces and a paramilitary, paramilitary group called the Rapid Support Forces. The UN says 25 million people are in need of humanitarian aid, and in just one year, the war has displaced 8 million people and killed an estimated 14,000 human beings. Humanitarian agencies say the death toll is much likely to be higher as that country remains impossible for observers to even enter. From Hopkinton to the Back Bay, the 128th Boston Marathon is off and running. The results are racing in, too. Ethiopia's Sese Lemo won the men's race with a final time of 2 hours, 6 minutes, 18 seconds. Helen O'Beary from Kenya breaking the pack for a repeat win in the women's race, 2 hours, 22 minutes, and 37 seconds. Then Marcel Hoog from Sweden took first place in the men's wheelchair race at 1 hour, 15 minutes, and 33 seconds. Britain's Eden Rainbow Cooper winning the women's wheelchair race. That she did in one hour, 35 minutes, and 11 seconds. So A.J. Simpson could prove to be a pretty polarizing person in death as he was in life because a battle is brewing over his estate now and there are new questions as to whether the families of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman will get the millions of dollars they are still owed. Ariel Reshef has the details. A looming showdown over disgraced former football star O.J. Simpson's estate. Simpson died last week after a battle with prostate cancer. His last will and testament filed in a Nevada court on Friday. His estate placed in a newly created trust with his longtime attorney Malcolm Laverne as executor, who says he does not know how much the estate is worth. Personal belongings, uh, anything they had like that is going to be part of the estate. So there will be, I will be doing inventorying and trying to see what is out there. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder. Simpson was infamously acquitted in a criminal trial for the brutal 1994 stabbing deaths of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. But he wasn't off the legal hook. In 1997, Simpson was found liable for the slayings in a civil suit and ordered to pay more than $33 million in damages. But Simpson only paid a fraction. Now, the Goldmans want what they're legally owed. Ron Goldman's sister, Kim, telling ABC News, our family will follow the law as we always have. We will continue to do our due diligence. But the executor of Simpson's estate, defiant, saying it's my hope that the Goldmans get zero, suggesting the estate needs to take care of other things first, including his former client's substantial IRS debt. There's going to be a notice to creditors. When those claims come in, we will deal with them and they'll be in a pecking order. O.J. Simpson had an estimated net worth of upwards of $10 million in the early 90s. But after his fall from grace, mostly lived off of his NFL pension and actors union residuals, reportedly earning $400,000 a year. Uncle Sam is going to be first, right? And depending on the assets, if he owed taxes, it could be a situation where after the taxes are paid, there's next to nothing left. So then if you're the Goldman's, you have to calculate, is this even worth doing? And with Simpson's assets set to go through the Nevada court probate process, the Brown and Goldman families could be paid a piece of whatever Simpson left behind. Again, his executor says the value of his estate is still unclear. Kira? All right, Ariel, thank you. And thank you to all of you for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News. To all the stories that matter to you, you can always find us on your favorite streaming service, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. 
do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. What's good to watch? Read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Let's get right to our top story today. The people of the state of New York versus Donald J. Trump, the first ever criminal trial of a former president of the United States. Right now, Trump is sitting in a New York courtroom as attorneys begin jury selection in the hush money case against him, the culmination of a year-long indictment by Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Trump is charged with 34 counts of allegedly falsifying those documents to hide payments he made to Stormy Daniels to keep her quiet about an alleged affair prior to his run for the White House in 2016. Trump has pleaded not guilty to the charges, claiming the case is just election interference as he continues to campaign for the November election. And he continued that push and the push that claim as he entered the courthouse this morning, the former president attempting to discredit the case, calling it an assault on America. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. We have full team coverage of this historic New York criminal trial, starting with our investigative correspondent, Olivia Rubin, and a look at what's at stake. I never thought anything like this could happen. For the first time in American history, a former president of the United States standing trial on criminal charges. These are felony crimes in New York State, no matter who you are. Former President Donald Trump fought repeatedly to delay the case beginning today, accusing him of illegally hiding payments he orchestrated to porn star Stormy Daniels to silence her affair allegations during his 2016 White House bid. The evidence will show that he did so to cover up crimes relating to the 2016 election. Multiple judges rejected Trump's last-ditch efforts to halt the trial brought by the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Now hundreds of potential jurors are being questioned in a courthouse downtown. I don't know how you can have a trial that's going on right in the middle of an election. Not fair. Not fair. Lawyers for both sides will whittle that group down to just 12 jurors and six alternates, asking them questions to root out any bias. It includes, have they ever attended a Trump rally, subscribed to the conspiracy movement of QAnon, or followed an anti-Trump organization on social media? The process expected to take as long as two weeks. The whole point of jury selection is to find out not just do people know who the parties are involved, not just did they know the charges, but rather can they set all of that information aside and be a fair and impartial juror in this particular case. The charges, 34 counts of falsifying business records. 
The crime, not the alleged sexual activity, but the paperwork used to keep the payments to Stormy Daniels quiet. Prosecutors say Trump disguised the payments he made to his one-time lawyer and fixer Michael Cohen for Daniels to bury her affair claims, labeling them instead as legal payments for a non-existent retainer agreement with Cohen. He directed me to make the payments. He directed me to become involved in these matters. Prosecutors say those disguised checks cut from the Trump organization to Cohen were part of a larger catch-and-kill scheme devised by Trump and his allies with the publisher of the National Enquirer. Together, prosecutors say they would repeatedly buy negative stories about Trump, only to never publish them. He was very concerned about how this would affect the election. To help his campaign. To help him and the campaign. Trump has pled not guilty to the charges and has called the case election interference. He also claims the affair with Daniels never happened. Did you know about the $130,000 payment to Stormy Daniels? Trump is no stranger to the legal system, but he has only come face to face with a jury during his presidential bid for the White House once before. Earlier this year, a nine-person jury heard a civil defamation case brought against Trump by the writer E. Jean Carroll who accused Trump of sexually assaulting her in the 1990s and then defaming her when she went public with her allegations in 2019. There, Trump personally analyzed the potential jurors, often craning his neck and turning around as they answered questions. He never attended the first trial, where a jury found him liable for sexual assault and defamation of Carroll. Some jurors the second time around in the trial to determine damages against Trump appeared visibly shocked when they entered the room only to see the former president of the United States seated there. After days of witnessing Trump's behavior in court, including storming out of the courtroom, that jury of seven men and two women found Trump liable for defamation and ordered him to pay $83 million in damages. We will immediately appeal. We will set aside that ridiculous jury. Now Trump is repeating that process again, but these jurors will be charged with deciding a criminal case. If convicted, he could face a maximum of four years in jail for each of the 34 counts. Thanks again to our investigative correspondent, Olivia Rubin, there. Joining us now, senior reporter Catherine Falders, executive editorial producer John Santucci, our Elizabeth Schulze here in Washington. Jay O'Brien's up on the Hill, and then former Georgia prosecutor Chris Timmons joins us once again. So, Catherine, what's happened so far in the courtroom? So, so far, Kira, this morning and early this afternoon uh, has been a lot of procedural hurdles that uh, they have to get through here. So, uh, look, there have been some wins for Donald Trump, some not wins for Donald Trump. The judge uh, said that he will allow prosecutors to introduce evidence uh, about the Trump campaign's interactions with the National Enquirer, for example, and Trump's alleged affairs uh, with former Playboy model Karen McDougal. The judge uh, did say that he will not allow prosecutors to play that infamous Access Hollywood tape. Uh, to play video or audio of it. They can use uh, Trump's words, though, at trial. So that's what uh, the morning has been like up until now. They were having a brief break. Uh, prosecutors uh, with the DA's office, of course, have also asked the judge permission uh, to seek to hold former President Trump in contempt for alleged violations of the judge's order against attacking witnesses. They have uh, said specifically there are three social media uh, posts here. Um, the order would seek a $1,000 fine for each one of those. Uh, so we're waiting to see what the judge says about that. But it's very clear that the judge now wants to move into jury selection. So uh, when they come back from lunch, it will go into jury selection. Of course, that's what we've been waiting for all day. That process will start soon, Kira. So Chris, what do you make of these rulings and how do you think they could impact the case overall? Well, I mean, I think here the judge is just ready to get going. Um, I mean, I, you know, the, the latest rulings anyway tell him, look, we're, we're here. We've wasted half a day on some of these procedural matters. You know, many of them important. Many of them he was just irritated uh, that had been brought before him. But he's ready to go. He's ready to get moving on this particular case. He wants to, you know, talk to the first 500 jurors, Kira. I mean, it's just unimaginable how many people that are there for that jury selection. The biggest I've ever seen is 250, and that was over the course of a week. Um, you know, but he's got 500 people there. They're waiting to get into the courtroom. He wants to get started with jury selection. So, John, just before the lunch break, prosecutors said they intended to seek to hold Trump in contempt for three posts on his social media site. They say they violate, he violated the gag order. Really no surprise there. He's done that in the past. What posts are they referring to? 
Well, Catherine just touched on this a couple of minutes ago, Kira. I mean, these are posts that Donald Trump made uh, right after that gag order was imposed by Judge Mershon. Uh, and what they were, they focused on attacks Donald Trump made on several witnesses, including Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen. And again, sometimes, you know, it's always about Donald Trump's words and rhetoric out in the campaign trail, but it is at times his posting on social media that can cause him headaches later on. And clearly, that's exactly what has happened here. Prosecutors want a thousand dollar fine for each of those. Now, we don't know what the judge is going to do. He said he would take that under advisement while they was heading into the lunch break. So do they come and address that now or does he, you know, deal with it at some point down the road? Because as we've all been noting, he wants to move ahead to jury selection, saying there are 500 jurors that are waiting today. Because remember, if they don't get to that today, those jurors get a free pass because they showed up. It actually moves down the list to the next trove of jurors. And already, this is going to be a very difficult and complicated case to seat a jury of 12 jurors and six alternates. So any day, any group of people that is missed really does complicate things and frankly adds to a little bit of a delay here potentially. All right, and Elizabeth, the trial could you know, take Donald Trump largely off the campaign uh, trail for up to eight weeks, uh, but doesn't seem to have impacted uh, his race for the White House so far. It seems like every time he does have a trial or a hearing, it just uh, pushes his poll numbers even higher. Well, and Kira, we've talked so much about how these trials overall, not just this, but the four criminal indictments that the former president is facing have helped boost his support among at least some of his supporters. But the fact is that this has become so entwined in his political strategy. Already we are seeing the former president send out fundraising emails based on the proceedings that have happened here today. But it does undoubtedly complicate at the very least the scheduling of his campaign. If he's going to be sitting in a courthouse for four days a week and his lawyers have made very clear today, Kira, that he wants to be personally involved in a lot of what's going on in this trial, that that means he won't be out on the campaign trail in those days. Now, could he go out on the weekends? He's, as John pointed out, does a lot of his campaigning through social media. But this does set up a clear contrast with how he will actually be able to get out on the trail and when. And that's something that the White House, while they are not commenting on this trial at all, President Biden himself will be hitting the trail this week. He's going to spend most of his week in Battleground, Pennsylvania, Kira. So, Jay, what are the former president's allies on the Hill saying today? Well, it's interesting, as you noted to Elizabeth, every time the former president has one of these proceedings in court, it helps his campaign. And every time he goes to court, too, Republicans on places like Capitol Hill rally around him. Some of them are what we've come to call the usual suspects, the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world, Matt Gates, Troy Nels, who tweeted today, as they often tweet, that they feel that these charges are political, that the former president is being victimized. But we've also seen the upper echelons of Republican leadership on Capitol Hill get behind Trump. Speaker Mike Johnson had that press conference with Trump last week. He has been a staunch ally of the former president's Mitch McConnell, as you and I were talking about earlier, who previously was no friend to Donald Trump, particularly after January 6th, has endorsed him now. And so one of the things we're watching for here on Capitol Hill is as the former president's legal calendar plays out and merges with the campaign, what does that do to the overall political dynamic on Capitol Hill, where these Republicans are so used to and so frankly ready to come out every day and defend him as we've seen them do over the last few months. All right, Catherine, Chris, John, Elizabeth, and Jay, thank you so much. We will track this, of course, as we take you now to the White House, where National Security Council Coordinator uh, John Kirby is taking questions and briefing the press. Let's listen in. Or drones. President Biden instructed the United States to defend Israel to the maximum extent possible and defeat that attack, and we did. With the support of our partners, the United States enabled Israel to spectacular spectacularly defeated. Despite launching more than those 300 weapons from Iran in the region, Israel and a coalition of partners were able to defeat 99% of the attacks. There was virtually no infrastructure damage to Israel. But their attack requires an unequivocal condemnation from the international community. And so, as Karine said, the president convened the G7 yesterday and they have forcefully condemned that attack and urged for calm and de-escalation. And I'd like to take just a few minutes to correct the record on uh, a few points that have come out in the last uh, several hours. I've seen reporting that the Iranians meant to fail, that this spectacular and embarrassing failure was all by design. 
I've also seen uh, Iran say that they provided early warning to help Israel prepare its defenses and limit any potential damage. All of this is categorically false. To coin the phrase from the president, or still a phrase from the president, it's malarkey. This attack failed because it was defeated by Israel, by the United States, and by a coalition of other partners committed to Israel's defense. So let's be straight. Given the scale of this attack, Iran's intent was clearly to cause significant destruction and casualties. Iranian leaders launched so many missiles and other munitions because they knew that many were going to be defeated. But the aim was to get as many of them through Israel's, Israel's defenses as possible. Now, I've also seen this speculation about messages passed forth and warnings. We did receive me messages from Iran, and they received messages from us too. But there was never any message to us or to anyone else on the time frame, the targets, or the type of response. In fact, before yesterday, it was presumed that 100 ballistic missiles might overwhelm even the best defensive systems. That was Iran's intent, and as you all saw for yourself, it didn't work. This attack was defeated thanks to our preparations, to a coalition of committed partners, and to Israel's remarkable defensive systems. And I want to focus on that last point for just a moment. Israel today is in a far stronger strategic position than it was only a few days ago. Iran's vaunted missile program, something it has used to threaten Israel in the region, <coughs> proved to be far less effective. Israel's defenses, on the other hand, proved even better than many had long assumed. Israel's defense was strengthened by a coalition of countries led by the United States and working together. <coughs> the United States has never before so extensively and so directly defended Israel from attack. <coughs> to ensure that that continues to be the case, the House of Representatives must urgently pass the National Security Supplemental, which has already passed the Senate with overwhelming bipartisan support. That supplemental includes funding that the President requested for the Iron Dome and David Sling systems, systems that saved countless lives this weekend and have saved many lives from Hamas and from Hezbollah rockets over the past six months. Passing that bill is the fastest and surest way to get Israel the aid it needs. And we must act urgently to replenish Israel's air defenses, just as Congress must act urgently to replenish, replenish Ukraine's air defenses, which also continue to be attacked every single day with the same Iranian-made Iranian drones. Now, finally, much of the world today is standing with Israel. When the President spoke to the G7 leaders yesterday, they were unified in their condemnation of Iran and their determination to hold Iran accountable at the President's direction. Our teams are now following up with G7 capitals on new multilateral sanctions to target Iran's missile and other nefarious programs. G7 countries that had yet to designate the IRGC a terrorist organization are now considering doing so. And going forward, we will be working to further isolate Iran internationally and increase economic and other forms of pressure. So that's the upshot here. A stronger Israel, a weaker Iran, a more unified alliance of partners. That was not Iran's intent when it launched this attack on Saturday night, not even close. And again, they failed. They failed utterly. Now, as you also know, President Biden is welcoming both the Iraqi Prime Minister and the uh, Prime Minister Peter Fiala of the Czech Republic to the White House. President and Prime Minister Al Sudani from Iraq will discuss the U.S. and Iraq's shared vision for our broad, multifaceted relationship. During the meeting, these leaders will reaffirm their commitment to advancing regional stability, to expanding opportunities for Iraq's people, and reinforcing Iraq's sovereignty, security, and stability. The Iraqi Prime Minister will be here for almost a week. And in that time, he will meet a range of administration officials, including both Secretary Blinken at the State Department and Secretary Austin at the Defense Department. He will have opportunities to share his priorities and vision for Iraq with a variety of audiences here in Washington and in other parts of the United States. Now, of course, the President will be taking the opportunity to discuss how we will continue to work with Prime Minister Sudani to defuse regional tensions and to prevent Iraq from being drawn into conflict. Iraq, the President firmly believes, is central to the region's stability. And then later, as Kareem previewed, uh, he'll have a chance to meet with uh, President, uh, I'm sorry, Prime Minister Fiala to celebrate the 25th anniversary uh, of the Czech Republic as a NATO ally. Over the past 25 years, our alliance has grown stronger, and the relationship between our two countries have grown even closer as we've deepened defense cooperation, including through the Czech Republic's purchase of 24 F-35 fighters earlier this year. 
The President will congratulate the Prime Minister on legislation that Czechia recently passed, requiring it to spend at least 2 percent of its GDP on defense, which, as you know, is the NATO goal. Leader, the leaders will also discuss their strong support for Ukraine, and the President will thank the Prime Minister for leading an effort to help secure nearly 1 million rounds of ammunition for Ukraine. And one more thing, if you'll just bear with me, I'm almost done. Today marks the one-year conflict in Sudan. Since fighting erupted a year ago, civilians have been forced to bear the brunt of this senseless conflict. Thousands have been killed and wounded. Women and girls have been kidnapped and assaulted. Hundreds of thousands of families have been displaced. Communities and livelihoods have been utterly destroyed. And famine now is threatening to take hold. That's why the United States continues to commit resources to create conditions for a potential peace process, to hold accountable actors who are seeking to sow more violence, and to assure that humanitarian assistance reaches the civilians who urgently need it. We reiterate our calls for all parties in this conflict to lay down their weapons and put an end to this intolerable violence for the future of Sudan, but most of all for the future of the Sudanese people. Thank you. Appreciate your patience. Um, uh, Israel's military chief just said, quote, there will be a response to the attack in Iran. So does the U.S. have any indication of what those next steps are from Israel? We will let the Israelis speak to that. Does the U.S. expect to be consulted in advance of them taking any next steps? Uh, I, I won't get into our diplomatic uh, conversations or expectations. Uh, the Israeli government uh, will determine for themselves uh, if there's going to be a response and what that response is going to look like. And are you able to discuss um, the specific roles played by other members of the regional coalition from over the weekend, specifically Jordan and Saudi Arabia, whether they helped shoot down missiles or what other actions they may have done? No, I think we'll let uh, other members of the coalition speak for themselves. Um, John, Israel is reportedly looking at options that would send a message to Iran but not cause casualties. Is the administration presenting alternatives to Netanyahu? This is, uh, these, this is an Israeli decision to make, um, whether and how they'll respond uh, to what Iran did on Saturday, and we're going to leave it squarely with them. Their decision to make, but are you making suggestions? <laughs> we are not involved in their decision-making process about a potential response. And just, uh, is the president, does he have any plans to speak to Netanyahu again? I, I don't have anything on the calendar to speak to, but uh, look, I mean, they've, they've spoken frequently over the last six months. They'll absolutely speak again at the appropriate time. Thank you, Corrine. Um, John, just one day before the attack, President Biden issued a warning to Iran, don't, and now the U.S. is not taking any part in an Israeli reprisal. So does that signal to Iran that it can defy the U.S.? without facing any consequences? I don't know, man. If I'm sitting in Tehran and I'm taking a look at what just happened on Saturday night, I don't think I'd be betting that the United States is uh, not willing to get engaged here and help defend Israel. I mean, you had American fighter pilots in the air, in combat operations, shooting down drones and missiles that were heading towards, uh, towards Israel, as well as U.S. Navy destroyers at sea, knocking them down from there. So. The message should be very clear to anybody. When the president says we're going to take our commitments to the region seriously, when we're going to help Israel defend itself, we got skin in the game and we proved that. I understand what you're saying about deterrence, but what about consequences? As I just said, and Corrine also let in, he, he had a conversation with G7 leaders. He'll be engaging with other allies and partners. Uh, we, have achieved, uh, we have seen swift condemnations about what Iran did from the international community, and we're going to be working with international partners to, to uh, to, to work up options to hold Iran appropriately accountable. And then just uh, on the logistics of this, with roughly 300 drones and missiles shot down, can you talk about <coughs> how you will assess the debris fields and the shrapnel and how much that um, impacted people on the ground? Well, we're not going to be doing any kind of an assessment uh, of uh, the impact on the ground. The Israeli Defense Forces and Israeli officials have already been out and about looking at the impact on the ground. There were very few missiles that got through. And the only damage that was done, it was very minor damage to one air base in, in Israel um, that did not even put that air base out of commission. The Israelis have already spoken to this. I believe they've already released imagery of some of the things they found on the ground. Sadly, a, a young girl, an innocent civilian, less than 10 years old, was severely wounded. That was the only casualty that we're aware of.
Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, John, a couple of questions on Iran and then on Iraq on the Prime Minister visit. You just said that the White House were not informed of the timing of the Iranian attack on Israel. But the President told us that he, the attack is going to be sooner than later, and almost a day after the attack happened. So just can you explain this one? I never said we didn't have an idea. I never said we didn't have uh, information that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, we could, uh, that we could uh, act on and speak to our uh, Israeli counterparts about what I said was Iran never delivered a message giving us the time and the targets the time. No, 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 no timing. I mean, I want to be clear this whole narrative out there that Iran passed us a message with what they were going to do is ridiculous Do you believe that Iranian nuclear sites is a legitimate target? Uh, I, here, I'm not going to get into targeting discussions here from the podium. Let me ask you about the Prime Minister. Uh, is the White House satisfied with the way that the Iraqi government is reining in the militias in Iraq, considering they are one of the proxies of the Iranian regime? We're going to we're going to have an in-depth discussion with the Prime Minister and his team about uh, the uh, continued activities of militia groups uh, in Iraq, um, and uh, and we'll reinforce. Uh, our views about how seriously we take the force protection of our, our troops and our facilities there. And we'll also expect, I fully expect that, uh, that uh, we'll talk with the Prime Minister about uh, the counter-ISIS mission in, in, in Iraq and its, and its potential future. And finally, just when he said, in the spirit of partnership, uh, we disagree with the United States. And he mentioned something like, we need a new system for international law, to respect international law, international and humanitarian law, protection of civilians, and diplomatic missions. So he's hinting at the Israeli attack in Damascus. He's also hinting about not doing enough to respect international law. Is this a point of disagreement between you and the Iraqi government? You'll have to talk to the prime minister about what he meant by those comments. Uh, Iraq is a, a key partner, one we really value. We wouldn't be having this meeting today. He wouldn't be having meetings this week if it wasn't an important relationship. As I said, the president believe, believes that Iraq is critical to regional stability. Good, Dan. Thanks, Green. Thanks, Admiral. Um, you said just now that um, this yeah, Iran's Well, as many times as reporters can ask John Kirby the question, he continues to say the same thing, and that is we don't have any indication that Israel has made any type of decision on if they will respond to Iran or know what they might do, and we are not getting involved, period. Even reporters following up saying, okay, well, are you maybe suggesting alternatives or ways to go at this? Again, John Kirby said saying we are out completely of this situation. So is it going to stay that way? Good question. Let's bring in our White House correspondent, Selena Wang, also former Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, Mick Mulroy. Um, Selena, let's start with you. I mean, we're not getting anything new, as hard as reporters will press for questions, but John Kirby is standing pretty strong in that he's has no idea what Israel is about to do and that the U.S. is going to actually, in every sense of the word, not going to be a part of it, whatever it is. Yeah, Kira, Kirby there is dodging a lot of those questions and what you can see him doing. He's just trying to underscore that the U.S. is not getting involved in their decision-making process and that it's up to Israel how they want to respond. He's also there trying to underscore and clarify that Iran didn't give the U.S. any heads up about what the targets were, what exactly they were going to do. He wanted to stress, he said, that Iran's intent was clearly to cause significant disruption and casualties. The reason why, he says, they launched so many munitions is because they were hoping that as many of them as possible would get through Israel's defenses. And again, he's highlighting what we've already heard from the president, touting the capabilities of Israel in combination with the U.S. and other partners to defeat almost all of those munitions coming through into Israel. Now, but we do know, Kira, though Kirby didn't say this on the podium, we know that during their phone call, the president urged Netanyahu to take things slow. He urged restraint for him to think very strategically and carefully about the next steps. Because, of course, the U.S. wants to avoid any escalation wants to avoid this from spiraling into a wider war. So Mick, clearly Israel will strike Iran. We just don't really know exactly how that's going to happen. And John Kirby saying and however it does play out, the U.S. will not get involved. But what happened if a strike does happen and people are killed inside of Iran, that this ends up being a, a, a huge escalation in the conflict? Will the U.S. still stay on the sidelines?
Akira, I think what, what Admiral Kirby is doing here is uh, they certainly, we, the United States government, want to know when or, when or Israel makes a decision and what they're going to do to prepare. But we don't want to look like we participated in it because we're not going to be involved in the actual offensive action. And I think that's where he's really trying to draw the line. I think... Uh, contrary to what people thought Iran might have done, I think he just shot that down, uh, literally, pardon the pun. Uh, they may tr uh, basically uh, send a message of where they're striking to be able to remove individuals from those facilities. And that might be uh, a way to mitigate whether this escalates substantially. All right, Selena Wang, Mick Mulroy, thank you both so much. Appreciate it. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We've got a lot of news on the other side. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Let's get right to our top story. The people of the state of New York versus Donald J. Trump, the first ever criminal trial of a former president of the United States. Right now, court is back in session after the judge ordered a short break for lunch. Former President Trump is present in that courtroom as attorneys begin jury selection in this hush money case against him, the culmination of a year-long indictment by the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Trump is charged with 34 counts of falsifying documents to hide payments that he made to poor Porn star Stormy Daniels to keep her quiet about an alleged affair prior to his 2016 presidential campaign. Trump has pleaded not guilty to the charges, claiming the case is just election interference as he continues to campaign for a second run at the White House. The judge has imposed a limited gag order, keeping Trump from making comments about people directly and indirectly involved in the case. But prosecutors are now seeking to hold Trump in contempt for allegedly violating that gag order on social media. We have full team coverage of this historic New York criminal trial. Joining me once again, investigative correspondent Olivia Rubin, also executive editorial producer John Santucci, Elizabeth Schulze here in Washington with us, former Georgia prosecutor Chris Timmons, also a part of the conversation. So Olivia, Donald Trump, he is under this partial gag order in this case. Prosecutors are now seeking to have him held in contempt. What did he put out there on social media? <laughs> Well, prosecutors are pointing to just three posts that they say were in violation of the order, which says that Donald Trump cannot talk about potential witnesses in the case. And they have pointed to posts where they say he is attacking two potential witnesses, specifically that is Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen, who are at the center of this case. And just as court got underway after that lunch break, the judge has now set a hearing on this issue for next Wednesday. So remember, court is not supposed to be in session on Wednesdays. 
days, but it leaves Wednesday open for any other business the court may have. So he has set an afternoon hearing next Wednesday on the contempt issue. And Trump's team has until the end of the week to file their own paperwork. But Kira, I would just point out, look at the time. We are at 2 o'clock now, and so far they have dealt with evidence issues. They have dealt with contempt. They have dealt with almost everything except jury selection, which they still have not gotten to. And the day is ending supposedly today at 4.30. So a question of, is going to be when are they going to get jury selection started, which is why everyone is here today. All right, Chris, well, let's talk about uh, prosecutors, what they need to show in order for Trump to be held in contempt here and what consequences could he face? I mean, this is a little deja vu. I think we've been in this position before. We have, Kira. Um, you know, the, the former president, as John Santucci could tell you, is, is not at all afraid uh, to give his opinion on things, even when a court says that he shouldn't. Um, so, you know, the, what they're going to be looking at is, did he disobey a direct order of the court? If he did, then it's a misdemeanor contempt action, and it could be handled a lot of different ways. It could be handled either through a fine of some sort. It could be handled possibly through jail time, although that would be a logistical nightmare, uh, thinking about what they'd have to go through to be able to hold uh, the former president in custody while he served out his contempt sentence. Yeah, indeed. And Elizabeth, you know, Trump continues to argue that the partial gag order limits his political speech. So let's just talk about how that could or could not play into his campaign messaging here. Well, so far, Kira, the former president has used every legal case against him to try to bolster his political case. We've seen him completely intertwine his campaign for re-election and his legal woes. And that's going to continue to be the case. We already see him today, Kira, trying to fundraise off of the limited proceedings that have happened so far. His lawyers have also made clear that he wants to be very involved attending these, uh, these proceedings in person, which complicates his schedule for his political campaign. If he's sitting in a courthouse in Manhattan four days a week, that only leaves a couple days where he can get out on the campaign trail on the weekends. But the former president's using social media instead to try to get his message out. I do think the thing that we really want to look at here, Karen, we've talked a lot about how so far that has really bolstered support among a lot of Trump supporters. But if you look at a recent Reuters Ipsos poll, it did find that 13 percent of Trump supporters said that if he is convicted of a crime, they would not vote for him. So the question becomes, if this is really the only trial that does proceed before the election, does that put into question some of the support if there is a conviction? Does that change uh, how those supporters feel? Interesting. All right. We won't know until, indeed, that time comes. And, John, you think this case is more about the payment or more about the motivation to, you know, of the hush money? Well, and it's a totally about the motivation, right? Because, listen, at the end of the day, the motivation was Donald Trump did not want the uh, allegations from Stormy Daniels to come out and impact the 2016 election. So that's at the core of it, right? And that's why we're going to not, though they're not part of the criminal charges, we are going to hear other examples of Donald Trump and David Pecker catching and killing damaging stories that could impact Donald Trump leading up to the 2016 election. But the real thing here at the end of the day, this is a case when you really boil down and take all the noise and the witnesses away, comes down to paperwork, right? It's 34 criminal felony counts of falsifying documents. So that's what we're going to be talking about here. The way that Donald Trump concealed those payments to Michael Cohen after the 2016 election, how they were labeled as legal fees, which they clearly weren't. They were payment back to Cohen for catching and killing Stormy Daniels' story, hoping it would all go away. But look, nearly, what, uh, eight years later, here we are. It hasn't gone away. If anything, it's made Donald Trump's life far more complicated. Yep. And Olivia, jury selection uh, underway. Donald Trump has filed yet another motion to delay this trial. So what's the new argument? And could we hear a decision soon? Well, we don't know because it's filed under seal. But what we do know is that Donald Trump has been trying essentially everything he can to push out this trial, even though now he is sitting in the room for jury selection set to begin any minute. So think back to just last week. There were three attempts by Donald Trump denied to push off the case to challenge the gag order. So nothing is really working. But it's an, a, a tactic that we have seen from Donald Trump before, essentially throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. So I think 
there is sort of a sense among Donald Trump's team, at least from speaking to one source, that maybe they still have a little bit of time to buy themselves to hopefully get something to stick. So it's kind of contrary to popular belief. Think about it. He's in there. Jury selection is going to start, but there has not been a jury seated yet. So is there still some time that he could hopefully throw something at the wall and have it stick? That apparently is the hope here, but we do not know this latest effort yet. All right, Olivia, John, Elizabeth, Chris, thank you all so much. We'll be checking in with you, of course, a little later. Meanwhile, more fallout from Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel. For the second day in a row now, Israel Prime Minister and his war cabinet are meeting to discuss their response to Saturday's attack. The U.S. is making it clear to Israel that if it does indeed attack Iran, it will do so alone. But Biden, just a short time ago, reaffirming his support for Israel and adding together with our partners, we defeated that attack, both countries confirming that Iran's strikes, well, they pretty much were a failure. At least half of them failed before even reaching their targets, while almost all of them were intercepted and shot down. We have live team coverage on this. Our other top story, our White House uh, correspondent Selena Wang is in Washington. Also, Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez. Also, our WABC reporter Josh Inninger is in Jerusalem. And also, our contributor and former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, Mick Mulroy. Josh, let's start with you. Do we know anything uh, with regard to this ongoing cabinet uh, meeting with Netanyahu and uh, his, his uh, forces? What we know, Kira, is that there's a big debate going on among the war cabinet. There are certain right-wing members of Benjamin Netanyahu's governing coalition who want to send a very strong message to Iran and want to hit them hard. There are other people, both on that war cabinet, and I would also add around the world, in particular in Washington, who are who are trying very hard uh, to get uh, Netanyahu to, you know, take his finger off the button, so to speak, and try to hold off. Remember. This this was a reaction to a reaction. The Biden administration is very concerned about a further uh, escalation here. And actually, you could see it in the rhetoric you'll hear all day today from John Kirby with the National Security Council, from the White House, from the Pentagon, talking about how successful this was on Saturday night, how brilliantly they fended off the attack from Iran and how Israel really has a, a just a world-class defense strategy. That all may be true, but the fact that they're harping on it so much much really does seem like they're trying to pump up Netanyahu and make him feel like, you know, he already won and he does not have to fight back against Iran. There's huge imperative to try to prevent a further escalation in this region, Kira. So, Selena, the president reaffirmed his support for Israel today, but of course, officials are saying that the U.S. Uh, will not help Israel uh, in any way if it chooses to re retaliate. Yeah, and Kira, I think this is a message that was just being discussed with you earlier, is that President Biden is telegraphing to Netanyahu in the phone call to take the win, that you've already proved to the world that Israel's military is superior to Iran's. So from here, the president's message is take it slow, think very carefully and deliberately about your next steps and how that could lead to escalation. Now, we do know that the president did also convene a meeting with the G7 leaders, and we did just hear Kirby on the podium saying that they are considering sanctions against Iran. Iran's missile program. This attack from Iran has shifted the focus a bit away from all the harsh criticism we've seen from world leaders on Israel's military campaign in Gaza. Remember, it was just a couple weeks ago where the president had threatened to change U.S. policy if Netanyahu didn't do more to protect civilians in Gaza. So the relationship between those two, it is frosty. And the question now is just how much of, his, of the president's advice is Netanyahu going to take? Is he going to restrain his response here? The U.S. making very clear that if Israel strikes back, they're going to do it alone. So, Louis John Kirby reiterated that Iran's attack failed this weekend. Uh, we saw that. Uh, that's significant um, because Iran is, you know, of course, using this as propaganda to talk about that uh, this was a big win for them, holding Israel accountable, but nothing got through. Kira, what this uh, incident this weekend showed is the technological advance that the United States have has, uh, w along with Israel, in air defense systems. Uh, the Iranians have built up their ballistic missile program for decades. Um, they have hundreds, if not more than a thousand, of these types of weapons that can travel long distances in short amounts of time. Uh, we understand that the flight time from these ballistic missiles from Iran uh, towards uh, Israel was about 12 to 13 minutes. Not a lot of time, but enough time 
uh, for air defense systems to get working. Now, in this scenario, what we saw was Israel working to in tandem with the United States, as well as some other countries like the United Kingdom and France, as well as some regional partners, presumably some of the Arab nations there in the Middle East, uh, who were helping them and provided assistance. And so what you had is this, like uh, an unofficial coalition, if you will, that was assisting Israel in its air defenses that night. So I think that is something that we need to take into consideration. And it's obviously something that I think the Israelis want to maintain. And, the, and I think that could be placed in jeopardy should uh, Israel attempt some kind of a military response to what we saw this weekend. Mick, what do you think about the exchange of intelligence? Um, what Israel knew, what the U.S. knew, uh, other partners uh, knew ahead of this attack. Can you kind of dig into a little bit of that? And, and where exactly did that go? And, and did that help in any way? So, Kira, now that uh, Admiral Kirby made it clear that there was no uh, message sent from Iran regarding when this attack would take place, it really does show how significant the intelligence effort was in thwarting this attack. And that intelligence likely, of course, came from the United States, but also from many of these partners that Louis just referenced. The United States have been building this uh, relationship up for many years, and I think it showed. Thanks, guys. We want to take you straight to Santa Fe, New Mexico right now. The news is breaking. Hannah Gutierrez, the armorer on the set of The Rust, you see right there being sentenced after last month's uh, finding of her guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Let's listen. The courtroom gets cleared. Please do an order of remand to the transport order to the Department of Corrections and the judgment and sentence. Yes, Your Honor. All right. We are in recess. All rise. And you're looking at live pictures right now. Uh, it happened so fast. Uh, we got word that uh, Hannah Gutierrez Reed was indeed receiving her sentencing. It literally took about less than 10 seconds as we look at these live pictures still inside the courtroom. Hannah Gutierrez Reed, uh, the Rust film armorer who was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter last month for the 2021 onset fatal shooting of cinematographer Halina Hutchins, uh, just received her sentence from the judge in that New Mexico courtroom. Looks like 18 months in prison. Brian, you were paying close attention as well. Uh, that happened uh, pretty quickly. Also, our Mola Lenge is just outside the courthouse there in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Brian, let's start with you. I, I'm somewhat shocked. I'm shocked in the sense that this is a first arrest and Hannah Gutierrez Reed got the maximum that a person can get for what's considered a fourth degree felony in New Mexico, that being 18 months in prison. Now, depending on how that prison sentence works out for her, she could be afforded what's called good time. And so she might not serve the full 18 months. It might be reduced based on the programs and her status in prison. But still, that is a strong message. When it comes to sentencing, judges typically look at a number of things, rehabilitation, punishment and deterrence. I think when you look at an 18-month sentence, the judge relied heavily on punishment and deterrence to make sure that Hannah Gutierrez got the message, but also others in the film industry going forward. And she was responsible uh, for the firearm safety and storage uh, there on the set of, of, of Rust. Um, and she also became the first person to stand trial and be convicted in this case. So now uh, she stands, as you said, uh, with the maximum sentence here, 18 months in prison. How do you see this impacting Alec Baldwin as we get ready uh, for his case? I think it's going to be a very uh, big and scary wake-up call for Alec Baldwin because where many experts might say, you know what, low-level felony, first-time arrest, you may get probation, you may get someone of a slap on the wrist. No. If Hannah Gutierrez is doing 18 months in prison, there becomes a much more likely reality that if Alec Baldwin is found guilty, he could be suffering from the same amount of jail time depending on how the facts play out. Because while Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was ultimately the person responsible for the firearm on the set, Alec Baldwin occupies both 
hats, so to speak, in the Russ movie set. He is both the actor who was given the gun, but also the producer that is in charge of the production itself. And we saw some pretty forceful video of Alec Baldwin speaking to others, and, and I think as a prosecution, we'll color it, kind of contributing to this environment of chaos that led to underfunding, people not doing their job properly, and just as we saw with Hannah Gutierrez Reed, live bullets all over the set. So we're waiting for Mo Lange. He's there inside the courtroom, uh, heard everything uh, come down in real time there. So we wait for him to get to the cameras. Um, Brian, uh, let, let's kind of backtrack a little bit. One thing that I noticed throughout the whole court proceedings, even up to today, if you look back to the day when Hannah Gutierrez um, was active there on the set as the armorer, um, she had much, a, quite a different look. <laughs> Color, uh, her hair was different colors, a lot of piercings. You know, she looked very uh, rebellious, even the pictures of her uh, with firearms. And then all throughout uh, her trial, she changed her completely changed her look. She didn't even look like the same person. Um, and, and, and in addition to that, what else do you think she tried to do to portray an image or a message um, that um, she shouldn't receive the maximum sentence, that, that she is a different person now, she realizes what has happened? Um, how did that impact, you think, what happened today, just her change in attitude, demeanor, look throughout the trial? Well, as a defense attorney, we often try to tell our clients that from the time you walk into a court at trial to the time that you walked out, all eyes are on you, and you want to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward. Um, some of my clients, uh, again, I'm a former public, public defender, so they don't all typically come with, with uh, dress shirts and suits and whatnot, and they don't know what to wear. I often say, you know what? Um, wear your Sunday best if, if, you, if you're a person of faith, or, or wear what you would wear uh, to go on, on a first date if you can have something nice, clean cut and whatnot, because you want to present as an individual that a jury will look and say, you know what, this person is one of us. This person is not someone that I would think is capable of committing a crime. If my client is Hannah Gutierrez Reed, I would say, I want you to look like my daughter, my niece, my sister, someone that I can have compassion for when it comes down to not only the guilt or innocence, but also when the judge ultimately decides uh, if you should be sentenced to the max or somewhat less than that. And so that's why I think the appearance was as it was. Um, we, we all do it. I, I would give the example of uh, I wear very nice suits when I'm here with you, Kira, but this is not what I wear in the day-to-day, -day, especially when I'm taking care of a two-year-old. So you kind of dress for the occasion. Yeah, it, it was interesting to watch. And um, I'm just looking back at what exactly uh, Hannah Gutierrez uh, had said uh, throughout uh, her trial here and now uh, ending with, with the sentencing that we have, have just witnessed of, of the maximum 18 months. Um, looking back, she did um, address uh, the court saying, Your Honor, when I took on rust, I was young, I was naive, but I took my job as seriously as I knew how to, despite not having proper time, resources, and staffing. I just did my best to handle it. Today, I humbly ask you to consider probation. I beg you, please don't give me more time. What did you make of what she had to say? I thought that was a great line of saying, you understand, I did wrong here, uh, but also to suggest that her actions didn't go far, far surpass that of negligence. And that's ultimately what this case was about. It was that she didn't meet industry standards, that she conducted herself in a way that made it a dangerous environment for other people around. And so I think she told that line very well of saying, I understand the mistakes that I've done. However, these are my reasonings, not necessarily excuses, because you're still taking responsibility for that. And I thought that would have softened uh, the judge to some degree, but ultimately, while it is an involuntary manslaughter, while she did beat uh, the tampering charges, I think at some point also there were jail call videos and recordings of her kind of not really taking ownership uh, after being convicted. I think that all ultimately went to the judge's mindset of, hey, I'm going to give you what the prosecutors ask, and that is being the max. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I'm not a New Mexico judge. I would have bet that maybe not probation, maybe six to 12 months in jail would have made sense, but the judge said someone died and gave a very high uh, jail sentence, the maximum that she could hand down. I mean, bottom line, there was a live bullet on the set, Brian, and it was her job. 
you know, to check those guns, uh, to check to see if there were uh, live bullets, to make sure that the set was safe. And if we learned one thing, uh, there never should have been a live bullet uh, around any of those individuals. So now the question is, um, has she been held accountable here in, in the eyes of even Helena Hutchins' family? I, I'd love to know what they are thinking uh, about this sentencing. Uh, no doubt, probably feel it should be a lot tougher considering what happened. Absolutely, and, and I think that the only limitation, if you're looking at this from the Le Helena Hutchins uh, family, the only limitation is the charge itself because the prosecutor went after a charge that clearly they were capable of attaining if they went for a higher homicide charge uh, rather than involuntary manslaughter going up to manslaughter or rather than manslaughter trying to go for a lower level of murder I think they would have been unsuccessful there so I think the prosecution did the right move here of putting forth the strongest charge that they could succeed on and that's what they did um, but the reality is that I often tell people the justice system always falls short in terms of giving justice 18 months of Hannah Gutierrez Reed's life all incarcerated is no exchange for that of the life of Helena Hutchins. Her jail time is not going to bring Hutchins back. And so this, I think, is the closest that we can bring the uh, family of the victim to justice here. Brian, stay with me. Prosecutors at the mic just outside the courthouse there. Let's listen in. How much of a role do you think the jail phone calls played in this sentencing? I can tell you that they, they played a, a, a very big role in my recommendation. I don't know uh, how much of a role they played for the court. What does this sentencing say about the Baldwin trial? You know, I, I wouldn't want to comment on it. The cases are very different. Uh, I think that sentencing is something that's, um, to a certain degree, individual. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't say that this is um, uh, anything reflective of what may happen in that case. Can you walk us back to the jail calls? You said that they made a big decision in your recommendation. That's what you spoke about when you first got up there. When you heard those calls, you mentioned 200 calls. What went through your mind? Compassion fatigue. Um, you know, we uh, we have the the state has uh, has uh, has approached this prosecution. Um, from a standpoint of compassion for Ms. Gutierrez, for her age, for her lack of experience. Um, and uh, my compassion came to an end. With Were you surprised mind? the judge gave her the full to maximum sentence? I was not. Do you have any reaction to her statement that you just spoke? No, I don't. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Brian, hopefully we can get Mullalenghi uh, in front of that camera there. That's our, our crew that was able to get uh, just a few comments made by prosecutors. Compassion fatigue. Uh, let's expand on that. <laughs> Yeah, so never being a prosecutor myself, uh, my understanding is, I, well, I do some civil rights work. I understand being that close to a victim, being that close to someone who has lost an individual and wanting uh, to do the best for them. And there is compassion fatigue in the place of the prosecutor. And when I think the, the comment was towards those jailhouse calls, they saw a lack of compassion from Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. They saw that as their way of saying, you know what? She's not remorseful. Uh, she is not compassionate in the way that they want her to be, and that's why they ultimately ask for the highest sentence. And while we are not oh, she. able, um, she being the, the prosecutor asking for the highest amount of sentence for Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, uh, because of those jailhouse calls that they got from, from Gutierrez-Reed, uh, the compassion fatigue is they are so intertwined with Helena Hutchins' family looking for justice here that they, it's, it's a fatiguing exercise. I say that oftentimes defense attorneys and prosecutors live adjacent to trauma based on our clients and the victims they represent. And that, while it is not the same as being Helena Hutchins' uh, family, it, it is a compassion fatigue. I think that's what they're commenting on. But I think a lot of the elements here went towards that, that, that sentence of 18 months. And it looks like, Brian, that Gloria Allred uh, is, is somehow, I don't know if she's representing uh, Helena Hutchinson's family, but she's about to read a statement on behalf of family members. Has she approached uh, the mic yet, guys? Okay. 
All right, so so we're waiting to hear from her. So I guess they'll, there, there were a lot of people there uh, at the courthouse today. Brian, uh, from all sides, waiting to see uh, exactly what was going to happen to Hannah Gutierrez Reed. What happens uh, now? Uh, she's been sentenced, so does she immediately uh, go back to jail? And then we, we also were talking about how this, how she may not serve 18 months. Let's talk about what could impact the length of her sentencing here and why she may be released uh, earlier on good behavior or whatever it may be. Yeah, so I'll kind of break that down. So the next step for her is that she will be sent to a jail for processing, or she might even go to a prison that is an intermediary uh, before you go to the next jail. Fingerprinting, photos taken, um, taking her personal belongings and storing them while she does do her jail sentence. And she may ultimately end up in a more permanent uh, penitentiary system for that 18 months. Now, when it comes to what many attorneys will call good time credit or good time served, it all depends on the calculations from that state. I believe in New Mexico for every 30 days or every month of, of, of a sentence while you're not committing crimes while incarcerated, you're not breaking any new rules, I think you get about four days. So just imagine taking four days off of every one of those months for 18, I'm an attorney, not a mathematician, but I think that could shave off about three months or so. I think she could ultimately do 15 of the 18 months, depending on how she does. Uh, I know that some jails in some states also afford defendants or convicted felons, as Hannah Gutierrez-Reed is now, the possibility of doing programs while incarcerated to also reduce your sentence there as well. If she gets out sufficiently earlier, there could be a potential for parole uh, on the back end of that sentence, but that's ultimately up to her her behavior and how she conducts herself going forward so and as we wait to hear of course that statement on behalf of um, Helena Hutchins family uh, the uh, cinematographer that was killed because of that live round that it was in that gun that Alec Baldwin fired on the set of rust just um, looking back uh, with regard to Alec Baldwin's manslaughter trial that now uh, is scheduled for July um, I'm seeing here attorneys making the point that this is not a case where Hannah Gutierrez made one mistake. Uh, these are, of course, uh, various attorneys uh, speaking uh, to Alec Baldwin's uh, case now scheduled for July. All right, uh, it looks like Gloria Allred is, is uh, speaking now. All right, let's go ahead and take uh, the statement she's reading on behalf of Helena Hutchinson's uh, parents. I think All right, Brian, so we lost our camera there. If it comes back, we'll go ahead. We'd love to hear, of course, what, what, what the parents have to say uh, about this sentencing uh, on behalf of, uh, of the court there. But just uh, talking about Alec Baldwin, um, you know, it's interesting how this case has unfolded, thinking uh, he was in big trouble and then possibly in the clear and now back in trouble again. And now we're seeing what happened with Hannah Gutierrez-Reed and everything we've learned about her. And now I'm told the camera is back on Gloria Allred. All right, let's take a listen. The maximum of 18 months. And that this, that this was a serious offender and a serious offense was appropriate. I do not think the other two options that the court suggested were possible options, were options that should have been uh, exercised by the court. Probation clearly inadequate. Yeah. And even just serving the remainder of 12 months essentially in jail rather than prison would not have been appropriate. I, I do think the prosecution did an excellent job in proving their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And we're looking forward to the next case. What do you think this means for this next case when you're looking at trying to get justice for Helena Hutchins and her family? Um, what are you expecting come July now that you've seen this play out? I'm expecting a jury that's going to give a fair trial not only to the defendant but also to Helena Hutchins, may she rest in peace. Whatever happens, it's not going to bring Helena back, but 
definitely, as the family has said, everyone who's responsible should have to face the consequences and be accountable. Do you believe Alec Baldwin was part of that cascade of negligence that people talked about in the courtroom? We support the prosecution of Alec Baldwin. Was there anything about Ms. Gutierrez Reed's statement that stood out to you, considering we haven't heard from her until today? Nothing about the statement that Hannah Gutierrez gave in court today changed the fact that she should have to pay the ultimate price, which is possible under the law of New Mexico. And that's what she was ordered to do. How would you describe the, the judge's comments at the end of the proceedings today? I think the judge was very clear about the factual basis that supported her conclusion that the most serious option should be the one that she handed down. And I appreciated the fact that she explained why that was appropriate. Uh, this is the same judge that's going to be uh, overseeing the proceedings against Baldwin. Uh, uh, it's going to be a different jury, perhaps the same judge, but there should still be a fair trial. And I know Mr. Baldwin has done everything he could to try to dismiss the case, but at this point it appears the trial is going forward. I might add that at this point, still, neither, ha neither Hannah Gutierrez nor Mr. Baldwin has ever called Helena's mother, Olga, to even say they were sorry for what happened. And you could see from the video that we showed in court how devastating this has been to Olga and to Anatoly and to Svetlana. Devastating does not begin to describe it. There'll be more from the family in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I do have some still photos. <laughs> Where? And that's Gloria Allred, who's representing uh, Helena Hutchinson's family. Helena Hutchins, of course, being the cinematographer that was killed by that live bullet on the set of Rust. You are watching the uh, sentencing that just took place for the armorer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, given the maximum sentence of 18 uh, months in prison. Alec Baldwin's manslaughter trial will now be scheduled for July. Gloria Allred there saying she, of course, would like to see that actor uh, prosecuted as well. You heard the questions about just a cascade of negligence that was laid out in the courtroom today. Even Hannah Gutierrez-Reed coming forward and addressing the judge saying, Your Honor, when I took on Rust, I was young and I was naive, but I took my job as seriously as I knew how. Despite not having proper time, resources, and staffing, I just did the best to handle it. Uh, Hannah Gutierrez is going on to say, today I humbly ask you to consider probation. I beg you, please don't give me more time. You heard Gloria Allred say that uh, she was very pleased that Hannah Gutierrez did not receive probation. Mola Lenge was there inside uh, the courtroom when this was all going down. I want to bring him up now along with our Brian Buckmeyer, who's been following this from the legal uh, side of things. I guess my first question, Mola, uh, to you is Gloria Allred uh, saying that Alec Baldwin, neither Alec Baldwin nor Hannah Gutierrez ever called the family or at least the mom of Helena Hutchins to apologize for what had happened or her death. I is that true? Do we know? 
Well, that's what Miss Allred said today, and we heard a video statement from uh, Helena Hutchins' mother, Olga, who uh, echoed that, that those same uh, thoughts and, and feelings, saying that uh, she had been waiting uh, for anyone uh, involved in her daughter's death to, at some point during the last, you know, two years, uh, reach out uh, and express some sort of sorrow, express uh, something to her. And she says that her and her family uh, had never heard anything from anyone involved. So let me ask you this, uh, Brian, now that we see uh, Hannah Gutierrez uh, not receiving probation, she's going to jail, she got the maximum sentence, even though she didn't have any type of, of previous record. What do you think this could mean for Alec Baldwin? I mean, clearly there were other people responsible for safety and protocol and procedures um, along with Hannah Gutierrez. Uh, Alec Baldwin, I mean, this was his movie. He was the main actor. Yeah, I'm kind of of two minds here. One, I think, all right, let's fast forward past the, 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 the trial and say if Alec Baldwin is convicted, I would, if I was him and his attorney, I'd be worried about jail time because I can't see that a same judge gives Hannah Gutierrez Reed jail time and not Alec Baldwin. However, I'm skipping over a very important part, and that's whether or not he's going to be convicted. When you are the second co-defendant to go forward on a trial and the first one is convicted, you have a very large opportunity to say, hey, you know what, jurors, state of New York, you quote-unquote got your pound of flesh. You got the person who was in charge of the gun. You got the person who was negligent beyond belief and had live rounds all over the set. While Alec Baldwin does occupy two roles, one as actor and as producer, as an actor, as a defense attorney, I would think, you know what? He's safe. I gave this example uh, to, to some of the people working here. It's like, if I got on air and my mic didn't work, yeah, the mic's on my body, but that's not my expertise. That's the sound people that are supposed to be ensuring that's working appropriately. And I think that's the Hannah Gutierrez Reed example. However, if I'm the producer of this show as well, I better make sure that each and every element of the show is working as well. And because Alec Baldwin wears two hats in that, in that movie set, that's where I think he falls into a little bit of a problem, and he's got to have the appropriate answer as to why, why someone working under him can be negligent but not him as a producer of the movie. Well, Lo, what was it like to be inside the courtroom? Any reaction, color, comments you want to add? Yeah, it was interesting to see uh, uh, Hannah Gutierrez uh, emotional from the very start of today's sentencing. That was a sort of emotion that we uh, didn't see from her in the two weeks of, of trial uh, last month, uh, really from the start. Uh, needing tissues, crying, tearing up. Uh, and we, uh, again, heard that emotion uh, come out in her uh, when she ultimately addressed the judge, saying that uh, she wasn't a monster, that, uh, you know, that she was, uh, that she had been going through a lot and thinking about a lot and thinking about um, uh, Miss Hutchins and, and, and what had happened to her. But again, ultimately, the judge saying that uh, Miss Gutier uh, Gutierrez was not remorseful enough, that she ultimately did not uh, express any sort of uh, remorse or the kind of accountability that the judge needed to hear uh, in, in order to, 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 you know, to, 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 to decrease uh, the potential uh, sentencing. Um, and, uh, you know, we can't stress enough the, uh, the jail uh, phone calls that, that Gutierrez had made here in the last few weeks. The judge had mentioned those. The prosecution had mentioned those as having a significant impact on the way that the sentencing uh, went down. All right, Mola Lange for us outside the courthouse there in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, and also our Brian Buckmeyer. Appreciate you both. Thank you so much for bringing uh, just the, the latest on the breaking news as the sentencing uh, came down in real time. Appreciate it. Turning now to the people of the state of New York versus Donald J. Trump, the first ever criminal trial of a former president of the United States. Right now, Trump is present in the courtroom in New York City as attorneys begin jury selection in the hush money case against him. The culmination of a year-long indictment by Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Trump is charged with 34 counts of falsifying documents that he hid payments to porn star Stormy Daniels just to keep her quiet about that alleged affair that they had prior to his 2016 presidential run. Trump has pleaded not guilty to the charges, claiming that the case is just election interference as he continues to campaign for a second run at the White House. The judge has imposed a limited gag order, keeping Trump from making comments about people directly and indirectly involved with the case. But prosecutors are now seeking to hold Trump in contempt for allegedly violating that 
that gag order on social media. We have full team coverage of this historic New York criminal trial. Let's bring in our senior reporter, Catherine Falders, also our Elizabeth Schulze and Georgia prosecutor, Chris Timmons. Well, I don't know if there's any allegedly out there. I mean, he put posts out on social media, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think there's much he could say about um, what, what's going on uh, as far as that. I mean, I guess maybe he could throw his social media director under the bus, uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to be difficult. I, I think the bigger issue with regard to the contempt is what exactly is the judge going to do with these contempt charges? I mean, so if he finds him guilty of contempt, then he's got to figure out, well, do I fine him? Or do I try to figure out what to do with the former president of the United States as far as confining him? In other words, putting him in jail. There's, you know, sometimes a jail cell behind uh, the courtroom where he could hang out with his, super, his uh, secret service agents. Um, but, you know, and he could even in some cases put him in Rikers Island, which would be a complete uh, problem for all involved. I think you saw here in Georgia where the former president turned himself into the Fulton County Jail and an active jail ground itself to uh, a complete halt while we waited for that to happen. So I don't know. It's a, a, probably a fine, if anything. We'll see. But I, I guess the, the deal is the judge is not going to take it up until Wednesday. Did I just hear you say, Chris, that we could see possibly Donald Trump in Rikers Island? <laughs> if he gets a long enough sentence, sure. Uh, you know, but I, 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 that's a nightmare scenario for all involved. I can't imagine anybody involved in Rikers Island wants the former president there, uh, you know, let alone that. So probably if they're looking at any jail time, it's something he'd have to serve in the courthouse itself, which would be a way more secure facility. Um, so, I mean, Rikers is always a threat. It's a threat for you or me or anyone else who's found a contempt in the state of New York courtroom, but not a realistic threat for Donald Trump. But again, I mean, it's in the realm of possibilities never say never. Yeah, especially when it comes to Donald Trump. So Catherine, 96 perspective, perspective jurors now sworn in? 96 per perspective jurors sworn in. At the end of the day, there needs to be 12 jurors and then six alternates. So this uh, could take at the very least a week, but Chris was speaking to this earlier. There's 500 jurors that the judge said uh, are there right now awaiting to uh, go through jury selection. We know uh, what will happen during this process is the judge will read jurors a summary of the charges of the case. For example, the judge will tell the jurors that the case centers on allegations Trump engaged with others in a scheme to unlawfully influence the 2016 election. Uh, the judge will then excuse jurors that he uh, determines can't be fair or impartial or if they have a conflict. They're not able uh, to sit on a jury, for example, for six uh, to eight weeks. They also, the jurors, Kira, will be asked to answer 42 questions about themselves, their potential thoughts on the case. It's important to point out that these jurors are sitting in the same room as former President Trump. Their identities will remain secret. Uh, their names, obviously, Trump and his defense Defense will have access to their names, but he's not allowed, obviously, to make them public in any way. But right now, he's sitting in the room uh, with these jurors as they're asked questions. They'll be asked questions by the judge. The lawyers are also allowed to ask follow-ups. So at the very least, this could take a week. It could be, who knows, Kira, two or three. All right, stand by. We're watching uh, every single second of what happens today. Elizabeth, Catherine, Chris, thank you so much. We'll keep checking back with you. Straight ahead. World leaders encouraging Israel not to retaliate after Iran's unprecedented attack. We've got the latest on a potential response next. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news.
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Here's to good mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because you know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. Glad you're streaming with us. More fallout now from Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel for the second day in a row. Israeli's prime minister met to discuss its response to Saturday's attack, uh, making no announcement yet. But the country's military chief did say just a short time ago that Israel will indeed respond. World leaders are urging Israel not to retaliate, including the U.S., making it clear that if it attacks Iran, it will do so alone. President Biden still reaffirming his overall support for Israel, though, adding, together with our partners, we defeated that attack. At least half of those strikes failing before even reaching their targets, while almost all of them were intercepted and shot down. We continue to have live team coverage with our Josh Ensinger, who's there in Jerusalem. Also, our senior White House correspondent, Selena Wang, joining us outside the White House. So, Josh, uh, to you now. Are we learning anything more about Israel's potential response and, and if everyone is still active in that war cabinet meeting? Yeah, so they've been meeting all day, uh, all afternoon into the night, Kira, and I will tell you to the point that you just made about the uh, army chief who made that statement, the actual statement that he made, he said, as we weigh our steps with the launch of so many missiles, cruise missiles, UAVs to the territory of the state of Israel, will be met with a response, but it's intentionally vague, and the response really could be anything. You have right-wing members of the Netanyahu coalition saying that he needs to be able to maintain deterrence against Iran. It needs to be a forceful response with kinetic weapons. You have others who say that perhaps he should re revert to a, the shadow war that Israel and Iran have been waging for years, a war of assassinations, uh, covert assassinations, and, and IT hacks, and uh, hacking of nuclear systems. So it's really unclear what they intend to do. Life in Israel today was back to normal. They allowed schools to resume and large gatherings to resume. The beaches were busy on, in Tel Aviv today. Uh, people were in the grocery store. So uh, Israel hasn't telegraphed that it's doing anything anytime soon. Remember, just before the attack from Iran, when the intelligence showed that it was imminent, uh, they did clamp down on all of those things. So uh, it's it's not clear that anything's happening imminently, and, uh, and it's very, very hard to to know exactly what's going on in those war cabinet meetings right now, except they say they will somehow respond. Kira? Selena, the president reaffirming his support for Israel today, but still saying uh, the U.S. is not going to help Israel if it chooses to retaliate. Yeah, Kira, the president is trying to walk a fine line here. He's been repeating that he does respect Israel's right to defend itself and the U.S. clearly played a role in trying to fend off that onslaught of Iranian attacks. However, he made very clear to the prime minister that if Israel retaliates, the U.S. is not going to help. It will do so alone. And up on the 
podium right there, Admiral Kirby. He was trying to put some distance between the Israeli decision-making process and what the president has been urging. He was saying that it is up to Israel to decide how to respond. But we know that in a phone call, Biden told Netanyahu essentially to take the win, that he's already proved to the world that Israel's military is superior. He wants Netanyahu now to take it slow, to think very carefully and deliberately about his next steps. The president, ever since October 7th, he's been focused on trying to contain this conflict and make sure that it doesn't spiral into a wider war. So even though it appears that Israel is going to respond in some way, the big question is how does Netanyahu take in the president's advice? All right, Selena and President Biden did speak with congressional leaders as well about this aid to Israel. What more do we know about that and the impact that it could have on this uh, now, I guess, two fronts Israel is fighting? Yeah, Kira, well, what we saw over the weekend from Iran is certainly renewed calls in Congress, renewed efforts from the White House to get that national security supplemental passed. So we know that was the topic of discussion between the president and those big four congressional leaders. But Speaker Johnson, he hasn't made clear what his plan is moving forward. There is growing bipartisan pressure to get that national security supplemental passed. It already passed in the Senate earlier this year. It's been stalled in the House. Speaker Johnson said he wants to find some way to move forward on Israel aid, but it's unclear if that's going to include Ukraine because he's facing pressure from hard right conservatives in the House to not include any additional aid to Ukraine. So big questions here, but the White House for months, they've been urging to get that aid through and up on the podium there, Kirby making clear that passing aid to Israel is critical to maintain those defense systems that over the weekend were so critical to protecting Israel. Selena, Josh, thank you both so much. And the clock is ticking. Have you filed your tax returns? Better get that postmark or press send online. Business correspondent Alexis Christophorus does, though, have a few last-minute tips. <laughs> Where's your watch? You're tapping your I wrist. Know. It's actually my phone, but you get it. That's the universal sign. <laughs> so you're right. You have until midnight tonight, just a few hours left, to file your taxes and avoid getting hit with those penalties and interest. But it is not too late, my friends, to save on your tax bill. You want to be sure you're taking all of the credits you qualify for. So if you have kids, you may be eligible for a $2,000 tax credit per qualifying child, depending on your income and filing status. Now, not to be confused with the child tax credit is the child and dependent care tax credit. If you paid expenses, say for daycare, preschool, maybe another form of caregiving for a spouse or a parent who's unable to care for themselves, you may qualify for this credit. It starts at $3,000. And if you paid qualified education expenses, expenses, like for college for an eligible student, you might be able to claim a credit there of up to $2,500 with what's called the American Opportunity Tax Credit. If you bought an electric vehicle last year, you want to check and see if it's on the list of EVs that qualify for a credit of up to $7,500, and you have until midnight to make a tax-friendly contribution to your traditional IRA. The max there, $6,500, $7,500 if you are 50 or over. And if you know you're going to need more time to file, just go to I irs.gov and request an extension, which will give you an additional six months to submit your taxes. You'll have until October 15th. But remember, an extension to file is not an extension to pay. So if you owe money, you still need to make that payment by midnight. Use your previous year's taxes to help estimate what you owe. And if you cannot pay the entire amount right now, just go to irs.gov, set up a payment plan. The IRS says if you file electronically and enroll in direct deposit, you should get that refund within 21 days of filing four weeks if you file by mail this year. The average refund, about $3,000. Please use some of it to pay down debt. Kira? Very good advice. Thank you, Alexis. <laughs> Coming up, the latest on the investigation into the two missing Kansas moms, what we're getting from investigators next. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. There was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The crown in crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Wade Johnson reporting from Maui. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Some other top headlines we're tracking for you this hour on ABC News Live. A gruesome discovery in the investigation of two missing Kansas moms. Police say they've now recovered two bodies during their search. And the victims uh, have not yet, uh, the identities of the victims have not been released, but 27-year-old Veronica Butler and 39-year-old Jillian Kelly, Jillian Kelly, did go missing a month ago. The discovery comes after four suspects were arrested in connection to the case. They face charges of kidnapping, murder, and conspiracy in connection. More than 250 survivors of the 2017 bombing outside an Ariana Grande concert are now suing a British intelligence agency. The suit claims MI5 missed its chance to stop the attack before it happened. 22 people were killed when that man set off a bomb in his backpack in crowded Manchester. Back here at home, it's Jackie Robinson Day. How about some good news? The trailblazing athlete playing his first game in the majors on this day in 1947. Breaking baseball's color barrier, his number 42 has been immortalized within the league since 2004. Players and coaches on all MLB teams have worn that number on their jerseys today to honor Robinson's legacy. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News to all the stories that matter to you. You can always find us on your favorite streaming service, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Adam, Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. I you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. 
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? That sounds pretty good. Your health, your money, breaking news, music, and of course, good food. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, Afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Reporting from Burlington, Vermont, right in the heart of the path of totality. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, 18 months for the movie set armorer convicted of involuntary manslaughter in the Rust film shooting. I'm sentencing you to 18 months of incarceration at a New Mexico women's correctional facility. I find that what you did constitutes a zero, serious violent offense. It was committed in a physically violent manner, a fatal gunshot done with your recklessness in the face of knowledge that your acts were reasonably likely to result in serious harm. You were the armorer, the one that stood between a safe weapon and a weapon that could kill someone. You alone turned a safe weapon into a lethal weapon. But for you, Ms. Hutchins would be alive, a husband would have his partner, and a little boy would have his mother. Please take her. So a judge sentencing uh, Hannah Gutierrez to a year and a half behind bars after a jury last month found her guilty in the shooting that resulted in the death of cinematographer Alina Hutchins. For more, we want to bring in our Mola Lenghi. He's just outside court there in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and was in the courtroom when the sentencing was read. Also, our legal contributor, trial attorney Brian Buckmeyer, he was with me also when that all went down. So Mola, let's start with you and just what it was like in the courtroom and the reaction when she got the maximum sentence. Well, yeah, Kira, the morning began with the prosecution talking about how uh, they had waited uh, to try to figure out exactly what sort of sentence they wanted to, to pursue, what they wanted to try to uh, encourage the judge uh, to pursue. Uh, and they had really been sort of torn about what to pursue until last week when they got a hold of some jail uh, house phone calls that Hannah Gutierrez uh, had made in recent weeks where she expressed, according to them, uh, no remorse, no accountability, where she was very critical of the jurors who convicted her, cr critical of the judge, uh, critical of the witnesses who testified uh, during her two-week trial last month, and again, showed very little uh, remorse. And that's why the prosecution said that they were really pushing the judge for the 18-month maximum. We also heard from uh, a slew of uh, family and friends of of uh, Helena Hutchins, who described uh, the mother, described the the wife, the friend, the sister, the daughter uh, who had they, they had uh, they had lost. We heard from uh, Helena Hutchins' mother, uh, who talked about this having shattered uh, her life. How she not only lost a daughter but lost a best friend. It was a very emotional video uh, uh, testimony that we that we heard from her mother and uh, mother also saying that she's waited for the last two or three years for anyone connected to this case uh, to come. To to her uh, to express some sort of sorrow, express some sort of gratitude, or uh, uh, excuse me, uh, some sort of uh, sorrow for the loss of, of her daughter, and she's still waiting that no one has, has reached out to her. Um, Hannah Gutierrez was very emotional uh, throughout this roughly two-hour uh, hearing today, and that was notable because we saw very little emotion from Hannah Gutierrez uh, during her roughly two-week trial last month. Uh, she was uh, teary-eyed the entire time, crying uh, today, uh, needing a box of tissues, wiping away tears um, and ultimately uh, that emotion uh, also came through when she addressed uh, the court saying that she was not a monster uh, saying that her heart aches for Hutchins family and friends um, that uh, despite not having time and resources on the set that she did her best um, and she begged for probation and community service but ultimately uh, Kira this wasn't enough you know the judge also saying that uh, that she has never really heard any remorse or accountability uh, from Gutierrez that even today uh, when Gutierrez had the opportunity to address the court. Uh, she really talked about how all of this had 
inconvenienced her uh, more than anything else, not expressing uh, any remorse or any accountability. Uh, and ultimately, the judge citing that as the reason to uh, for her uh, to, to choose sentencing her to, to the maximum, to the 18-month maximum that she ultimately decided on. Kira? Well, let's go ahead and listen to what Gutierrez said then uh, to the judge just before her sentencing. My heart aches for the Hutchins family and friends and colleagues as well. And it has since the day this tragedy occurred. Helena has been and always will be an inspiration to me. I understand she was taken too soon. Brian, what did you make uh, about her statement? Because she also went on to say it was her honor uh, to work uh, on the set, that she was young, she was naive, uh, that she took her job seriously, and also uh, that despite not having the proper time, resource, and staffing, she did the best she could to handle her job. I mean, hindsight being 20 and 20, I would agree with Mola. There should have been more uh, remorse there, more my actions led to this. Someone doesn't have a family member because of my negligence. And I think that might have afforded her some grace that the judge may have considered. But I think that the defense thought they had a strong argument in saying she's had no criminal record. And typically speaking, when you have a lower level felony, and I don't mean to try to uh, disparage the seriousness of this case, case, but involuntary manslaughter is not the highest of felonies. It's a fourth degree felony in the state of New Mexico. And so when you have a lower level felony, first time arrest, you would think that a judge would come off of the top uh, sentence. You may not get the probation you're asking for. So I think the defense was very confident in what they were going to get in this case. Um, but I thought her words rung true to some extent. She seemed remorseful. Her heart ached. I'm still shocked to the 18 months, but it's clearly a message that the judge wanted to send on behalf of the family and the criminal justice system. All right, Brian and Mola, appreciate you both. Thank you so much. Turning now to the people of the state of New York versus Donald J. Trump, the first ever criminal trial of a former president of the United States. Right now, former President Trump is in the courtroom in New York City as attorneys begin jury selection in the hush money case against him. Trump coming face to face with the 96 prospective jurors for the very first time as the judge gives them instructions to act impartially if they're selected. Trump is charged with 34 counts of falsifying documents to hide payments he made to porn star Stormy Daniels to try and keep her quiet after that alleged affair prior to his 2016 presidential campaign. Trump has pleaded not guilty to the charges, claiming that the case is just election interference as he continues to campaign for a second run at the White House. We have full team coverage of the historic New York criminal trial. Let's bring in our senior investigative reporter, uh, Aaron Katursky, also our Elizabeth Schulze, who covers the White House for us here in Washington, and former Georgia prosecutor Chris Timmons, plus former Trump White House attorney Ty Cobb is with me here on set. Aaron, let's go ahead and start with you. Give us the, uh, the latest from the courtroom. Every available seat in the courtroom that isn't taken up by the defendant himself or the lawyers is filled with prospective jurors. The first batch of 96 entered the courtroom a short while ago, and the judge immediately launched into about a half an hour's worth uh, of an explanation about what this is and about how a, a potential juror needs to be fair. And a fair juror, he said, is somebody who is not biased or prejudiced for or against the defendant or witness, uh, and to weed out any potential bias, those potential jurors are soon going to begin answering a series of questions, about 42 of them, things like, have you ever attended a Trump rally, an anti-Trump rally? Do you follow the former president on social media? Where do you get your news? The, the lawyers want to spend as much as a half an hour uh, with each potential juror to make sure they get the kind of person they believe would be favorable to their case. But the judge just wants someone who can be fair and impartial. Got it. And Ty, the last time I talked to you, you were working at the White House. I was covering the White House. Um, and I have mixed minus in my ear. I'm going to take out this IFB for just a second. If you're hearing an echo, too, feel free to take the IFB out of your ear. Um, but just as you, OK, it's been a number of years now. So I have you on set. You are no longer working for Trump. You are no longer in the White House. I just want to know what it's been like for you to sit back and just observe not only this trial, but the other hearings and the other charges that have been brought against the former president. Um, your thoughts? Well, I think it's very 
sad for America. Um, I think beginning with the January 6th uh, event, for sure, uh, you saw uh, an abuse of norms that uh, have historically you know, gotten us through. Uh, and Trump really has stressed democracy, and he stressed the legal system enormously. I think, um, you know, we're here on the occasion of the New York case. I think legally the New York case is probably the least uh, compelling case, certainly as a felony case. But at the same time, it's not, it's not frivolous, at least as to the, uh, to the misdemeanor charges with regard to the uh, uh, false documents uh, that were created and the, uh, the fraudulent uh, charges that uh, were recorded. So um, I think, and there's no defense really as to, as to the facts. Uh, I mean, there's no doubt that the, uh, the documents were you know, fraudulently created. There's no doubt, doubt that they misrepresented facts. So I think where the, where the jury is going to have to do the heavy lifting there is obviously in the, uh, trying to connect it to a felony. Um, and I think both sides will be sharply focused on that. But, you know, as an American, as somebody who's spent a lot of time in public service, uh, you know, these are sad events. Uh, it's, it's sad that a former president stands accused of this. Um, so I, I don't think anybody takes any joy out of any of this. What was the hardest part about being an attorney in his circle? It was not very difficult for me. Uh, Tell because, me why. But, well, I had, a, I had an assignment uh, unique to itself in terms of uh, uh, coordinating the White House response to the Mueller investigation. And, um, uh, you know, that was something that the president was, you know, unfamiliar with. Um, and he did not, uh, um, you know, he didn't uh, have much to comment on because unlike the New York case where the conduct that he's charged with actually occurred and unlike you know the January 6th events where the conduct he's charged with actually occurred or the Mar-a-Lago case where the conduct actually occurred you know there was really nothing for him to punch back on in the Russia case because you know there was no uh, connection ultimately made by Mueller on the on the facts um, so it was it was a place where actually he was comfortable taking a lawyer's advice as opposed to a case where he was intimately involved in a central actor as you look at all the various cases that are out there, um, okay, now he owes a lot of money. We don't know if he's going to be able to pay the millions of dollars uh, that Letitia James, uh, in that case, um, you, you've got this ongoing trial right now. You've got the the, the secret documents, uh, you know, held up at, at Mar-a-Lago. I, I mean, it's it's really actually hard to keep track of all the charges and the cases. Um, do you think? that there will ever be a point that he will truly be held accountable. So I do. Certainly if he loses the election, you know, that, that will occur um, in the January 6th case. That will go to trial. The Mar-a-Lago case ultimately will go to trial, although I'm on record and firmly believe it won't go on trial with the current judge. Um, so I think there will be a real trial as opposed to what's occurring down there now. Uh, but if he, if he and, and, and even if he wins, um, you know, the Georgia case uh, will be deferred, uh, arguably, for four years. Uh, so he, he may get to trial in that uh, as a much, much more elderly, elderly man. But if he wins, you know, he will, he will dismiss both the, both the Mar-a-Lago case and the January 6th case. You're confident he will do that if he wins. Oh, he no will dismiss those cases and he will move forward. Yeah, he'll direct, he'll direct. Uh, you know, somebody at the Justice Department to, you know, take the action to dismiss those cases, and they'll, it'll be as though they never happened. And Chris, just as an attorney, um, your reaction to that? Um, you know, I, I mean, it, it would not be surprising uh, that if he were to come in, he would pardon himself in the federal cases. What he can't do, though, is pardon himself in the state cases, and Georgia is hanging out there, um, you know, as, as the RICO case that could be the biggest one and the one where he's facing a significant amount of time. He's looking at 20 years. Uh, the DA's office has indicated that they're going to want prison in that particular case if he's convicted of it. And so if he's convicted here in the state of Georgia, uh, you know, he can't pardon himself. He's probably going to prison. Uh, but it's also among the more complicated cases to try because you're talking about an over 90 page indictment with close to 200 predicate acts that they're looking at proving and months to try that case. And so it's not clear, even if the judge sets this thing in August, if it's going to be done before he would take office as the next president of the United States were he to win the election. And from a political standpoint, Elizabeth Schulze, that's what makes this so extraordinary. 
<laughs> that if indeed he wins the White House once again, all these various legal scenarios from pardoning to to uh, delaying to who knows um, what we could see uh, within this this uh, possible presidency. Extraordinary is the right word, Kira, because there is no precedent for what we're seeing here. We know that none of these legal cases are preventing the former president from running for re-election, but we do know that there's the possibility that he, if he is convicted, he might not be able to cast a vote in that election. And that is something that, of course, we have never seen when you're talking about a presidential race. The fact is that if he is convicted in this trial, which is something that this is the trial we're watching because it is possibly the only one that will actually come to this place before that November date. When you look at what voters are saying here, and this is a recent poll from Reuters and Ipsos, 13% of Trump supporters said that they would not vote for him if he's convicted of a felony. 24% of Republicans said that they would not vote for Trump. So that does put into question at least a little bit, and it is one poll, but it does put into question that ironclad support from his supporters up to this point so far. Ty, he doesn't have to pardon himself, does he? No, um, he can just direct the Justice Department to dismiss whatever's pending. Uh, probably, probably it would be an, appeal, it would be an appeal at that stage of the game if it had been tr been to trial, or if it's if it's still the indictment, uh, just the indictment, and it hasn't gone to trial, he would just have the prosecution dismiss the case. Stay tuned. Absolutely. <laughs> We're going to have you back. Ty, right. great to see you. Great to see you. And Thank a, you. Pleasure. Elizabeth, Aaron, Chris, thanks so much. We're going to keep checking, uh, of course, back into court with all of you. Glad you're streaming with us. We want to move on now to Iran and the unprecedented attack that took place on Israel for the second day now in a row. Israel's, Israel's prime minister has been meeting uh, with his cabinet to try and figure out what the next move will be. Uh, they haven't made an announcement yet. But the country's military chief did say just a short time ago, Israel will respond. The question is how? World leaders have been urging Israel not to retaliate, and that includes the U.S., making it very clear that if it does attack Iran, that, well, Israel will be doing it alone. President Biden reaffirming his overall support for Israel, though, adding together with our partners, we did defeat that Iranian attack at least half of those strikes failing before they even reached their targets, while almost all of them were intercepted and shot down. We have live team coverage, starting with our WABC correspondent, Josh Enninger. He's in Jerusalem. Also, our senior White House correspondent, Selena Wang, is there at the White House. Jay O'Prine is up on the Hill. And our contributor and former Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, Mick Mulroy, weighing in as well. Josh, let's start with you. What more do we know about Israel's potential response? Are we hearing anything out of that cabinet meeting so far? Now, it's been very, very hard to get information out of that cabinet meeting, Kira. It's now after 10 o'clock at night on a Monday night here in Jerusalem. Uh, we're almost 48 hours now past the attack of Iran. So there is not clearly a rash, snap, immediate reaction here, even though uh, Israel obviously knew this was a possibility and had been gaming out responses for weeks, actually, before this uh, attack actually took place on Saturday. They clearly are heeding the warnings that they're getting from the White House. President Biden, other world leaders, uh, to try to use some degree of reserve and try to prevent a further escalation. Iran has said any uh, attack now, not just on Iran, but also on Iranian interests, will now yield an attack by Iran onto the Israeli homeland, which does change the rules of the Iranian and Israeli relationship that goes back decades. They've had basically a shadow war, one involving secret assassinations and IT hacks. So uh, they're, they're trying to figure it out. They're getting a lot of pressure from Washington, and, and, uh, and the world is waiting to see what they end up doing. Oh. So, Selena, where does the White House stand on its involvement with Israel now? Well, look, the White House says they're not getting involved in Israel's decision making, but we know that the president has put the pressure on Netanyahu. The president told him to take the win, that he's shown the world that Israel's military is superior. But from here, he needs to take it slow, think carefully and deliberately about what his next step could mean when it comes to escalation. President Biden, he does not want this conflict to spread into a wider war, which is why he's told Netanyahu that while the U.S. is willing to defend Israel, as we saw over the weekend, they're not going to get involved on some kind of 
offensive here. And remember, this comes during a time of very frosty relations between President Biden and Netanyahu. It was less than two weeks ago when Biden threatened to change U.S. policy if Netanyahu doesn't do more to protect civilians in Gaza. Now, what happened to Israel from Iran, that has somewhat shifted the global conversation here. The G7 leaders convening and shortly after condemning Iran and saying that they have solidarity behind Israel. And this is also renewing calls here in the U.S. to pass more aid to Israel. All right, and Jay, what's the latest uh, from Congress passing this aid uh, package for Israel? Well, the House has reshaped its schedule this week, Kira, to focus on passing aid for Israel. And I talked to multiple Republican sources last night into today who said there are very real conversations happening right now amongst House Republicans about including aid for Ukraine into that legislation as well. And that would be a big uh, concession for Speaker Johnson and Republican leadership who have long stalled aid for Ukraine to pass out of the House of Representatives. But I can tell you, just as I was walking up to this camera, Moments ago, the House Freedom Caucus, a group of hardline Republicans in the House, put out a statement in which they said they would staunchly reject and oppose any move from GOP leadership to link aid for Israel to aid for Ukraine. So it makes the topic politically fraught for Speaker Johnson. It's been politically fraught for him, frankly, for months now. And while that conversation plays out in the House and they look at drafting their own legislation that has aid for Israel and may include aid for Ukraine, it's worth noting that there is is a $95 billion foreign aid package that has aid for both Ukraine and Israel that already passed out of the Senate months ago that has languished in the House, Kira, because Mike Johnson has not wanted to bring it up for a vote. All right, Selena, Josh, Mick, Jay, thank you. Coming up, severe weather targeting millions of people, where the storms are hitting right now and where they're headed next. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Glad you're streaming with us. Severe storms hitting the mid-Atlantic right now while another system is set to hit the plains. Meteorologist Samara Theodore tracking it all. Samara, what do you have for us? Well, Kara, right where you are, down there in uh, Capitol Hill, we have some storms getting ready to roll right through Washington, D.C. At the moment, you can see the storms pushing through parts of the Shenandoah Valley and the Pennsylvania-Maryland border now. As we head through the evening, there is a threat for severe weather. As a result, we have a severe thunderstorm watch for pretty much all of Virginia, or nearly all of it. West Virginia, the Delmarva Peninsula, up into Baltimore and down the I-95 corridor into D.C. That's until 10 p.m. tonight. So be aware that the storms that bubble up there could be strong to severe. The greatest risk with these storms actually happens to be damaging winds, especially in the Richmond area. Uh, we could see some large hail. The tornado threat is on the lower end of the spectrum for these storms, but that's not the case in the heartland. We have a more elevated risk for severe weather farther west. So here we go. I've timed it out. I've pushed us through tonight. You can see a lot of the strong, robust storms picking up this evening for Omaha, parts of Nebraska and Iowa, up into uh, Rapid City. We, we're anticipating very strong storms and maybe a little bit of snow for the Rockies. So here you can see from Valentine to Kearney down a Great Bend, that's where we could see some strong storms. We have an elevated risk for tornadoes in this zone as well, okay, uh, even as far south as Wichita Falls. And then tomorrow, this threat shifts a little bit farther east. We have numerous severe thunderstorms potentially for Des Moines down towards Kansas City, northern Missouri, and the threat for tornadoes will follow us farther west into cities like Chicago and down into Little Rock as well. And finally, I just want to 
end with uh, keeping in mind that there's also a fire danger risk that we have, a red flag warning from uh, Scotts Bluff through Dodge City right on down to Fort Stockton. Kira? Okay. Whew. You're a busy bee. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Samara. All right, coming up, the 128th Boston Marathon. It's off and running. No rain so far. And we've got the results racing in. We'll bring them to you. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. You every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. I'm Alex Perche in East Palestine, Ohio, one year after that toxic train derailment. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. So some of the other top headlines we're following for you this hour on ABC News Live. The latest on the Baltimore Bridge collapse or a cargo sh crew uh, there at the port might have known that something was wrong with the ship. The FBI is now investigating with a criminal investigation as the ship lost power just before crashing into the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Six construction workers, as you know, died in that collapse. And from Hopkinton to the Back Bay, the 128th Boston Marathon, as you can see, is off and running. And we've got some of the results as they cross the finish line. Ethiopia's Sise Lema won the men's race with a final time of 2 hours, 6 minute 18 seconds. Then there's Helen Obiri that came in. She's from Kenya. She broke away from the pack for a repeat in the women's race win. 2 hours, 22 minutes and 37 seconds. <laughs> She's still smiling. Then we've got Marcel Hoog from Sweden there, taking first place in the men's wheelchair chair race one hour 15 minutes and 33 seconds Britain's Eden Rainbow Cooper winning the women's wheelchair race there coming in at one hour 35 minutes and 11 seconds congratulations to all the winners I'm Kira Phillips we got a lot more news ahead we'll be right back whenever wherever news breaks it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. The Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Here's to Good Mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping make dreams come true. Wow. Yeah. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because... You know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not okay, ain't it? How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You Watch do. You every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Right now on ABC News Live, hush money makes history. Donald Trump in a New York courtroom this hour for the start of his criminal trial, the first time ever for a former U.S. president. We'll take you there. On Razor's Edge, Israel weighing its military options, what the war cabinet is considering after Iran's attack. 18 months in jail, armorer Hannah Gutierrez Reed sentenced for the death of Helena Hutchins on the set of Rust. What that means for Alec Baldwin this hour. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, the first ever criminal trier of a former president of the United States. Right now, Donald Trump is in the courtroom in New York City as attorneys begin jury selection in the hush money case against him. Trump coming face to face with prospective jurors for the very first time as the judge gives them instructions to act impartially if they're selected. Trump is charged with 34 counts of falsifying documents to hide those payments he made to porn star Stormy Daniels to keep her quiet about an alleged affair prior to his 2016 presidential campaign. Trump pleading not guilty to the charges, claiming the case is just election interference as he continues to campaign for a second run at the White House. We have full team coverage of this historic New York criminal trial. We have our senior reporter, Catherine Falders, executive editorial producer, John Santucci, Elizabeth Schulze here in Washington, and Jay O'Brien's up on the Hill. Also, former Georgia prosecutor Chris Timmons weighing in with us. Catherine, we understand 50 potential jurors have already been dismissed. What else do you know? Yeah, those jurors, uh, more than half of that first group, that first group was 96 jurors. Uh, those more than 50 said they could not be fair or impartial. They were already uh, dismissed by the judge. Another nine jurors said uh, that they had some sort of conflict. Those conflicts weren't clear, but uh, typically there would be a conflict that wouldn't allow that prospective juror to sit uh, on the trial for six to eight weeks. So uh, Judge Mershon, of course, has said, uh, told the jurors what this case centers on. Of course, allegations that Trump engaged with others in a scheme to unlawfully influenced the 2016 election. Now this has moved into the questioning process. The judge will ask jurors questions. They had to fill out a 42 question a questionnaire, which is essentially about themselves, their potential thoughts on the case. The judge will ask additional questions. Trump's lawyers, prosecutors will also be able to ask those jurors questions as well. So this is officially underway with, with the remaining group of these 96 jurors. Uh, so we'll see what comes of that. But at the end of the day, they need 12 jurors, Kira, and six alternate this could take at the very least a week, but who knows? It could be two or three. All right, so John, the judge listing several high-profile 
profile names as potential witnesses, Stormy Daniels, Steve Bannon, Rudy Giuliani, members of the Trump family, even Donald Trump himself. This could get interesting. Uh, it won't get boring, that's for sure, Kira. Listen, the reality is that at this point, what they're doing as part of the jury selection process is throwing all the names out there of possible witnesses. It doesn't mean that's a final list per se, but what prosecutors and defense lawyers are going to be asking the potential jurors is, look, do you have an opinion about any of these individuals, right? Would any of them being as part of these proceedings impact your ability to be fair and impartial? Now, obviously, as ABC News has previously reported, we know many of those names have been mentioned as likely witnesses in these proceedings. We're seeing Stormy Daniels on screen. You better bet she's absolutely going to take the stand at some point over the course of these proceedings once we do have a jury seated. But it does go to show that this is a very far and wide-reaching case, right? It involves Trump's family, his business, people that went with him to the White House in the beginning, because that's, of course, the timeline of these payments, that they happen leading up to the 2016 election, and then Donald Trump paying Michael Cohen back leading into 2017 when he was already at the White House, Kira. So, Chris, Trump is charged with falsifying his business records to conceal this alleged criminal conduct. As a former prosecutor, let's just talk about what the DA needs to prove, because so much is already out there, including a pretty saucy and scathing book that Stormy uh, Daniels put out with a lot of details, uh, far too many we want to recall. Uh, and then Michael Cohen has been very open and outspoken uh, about his relationship with uh, the former president and dealings they had. Sure, so Kira, it's a little bit of a swearing contest. It's a little bit of hand, Michael Cohen, when he says, you know, Donald Trump directed me to do this. Do you believe Stormy Daniels when she says, yes, I had an affair with Donald Trump and I was paid hush money not to tell my story before the 2016 election? And so it, this, this, those allegations seem a little less salacious now based on what we know. But remember back, that would, this was all back in 2016 before that Access Hollywood tape came out. We were thinking the Republican Party was still the Republican Party of family values. And so really the case is about, you know, did Donald Trump know that the money that he was sending to Michael Cohen that he said was for a legal retainer, that that money was being paid to Stormy Daniels to keep her hushed up before the 2016 election, Kira? So, Elizabeth, the former president's team has been, of course, firing off campaign emails all day, uh, citing all the cases, including this one, against him. Uh, they're campaigning once again off of this. And it's no surprise. And Kira, that's probably what the campaign's going to look a lot more like in the next few weeks. If the former president is sitting in a courtroom, you can see, expect to see those emails and less out on the campaign trail. That's something that the White House, the former, the President Biden, he's going to hit the campaign trail tomorrow in Pennsylvania. There is a little bit of that split screen going on. Obviously, the White House not at all commenting on any of the former president's criminal cases. But look, you know, Kira, for the former president, this has not been the liability that so many expected that it would. He's turned these legal woes into his central campaign theme, and he's running on this theme of retribution. He expects that this is going to continue to galvanize his supporters. It has up until this point, at least as far as what some of the polls have shown. There is some polling that shows that if he's actually convicted of a crime, that support from his staunch supporters could start to wane, but we'll just have to see. We are in uncharted waters, as we've been talking about all day, but there you see it on your screen. 13% of Trump supporters, according to this Reuters Ipsos poll, say they would not vote for Trump if he's convicted of a felony, something that he will be looking at, but certainly for now trying to say that, look, I'm a target, stick with me. That's been his message since the start on this, Kira. So, Jay, how does this uh, impact Donald Trump's standing among Republicans uh, there up on the Hill? Well, it's interesting. With every passing moment, as we've watched the trajectory of this, there have been these moments where we on Capitol Hill had asked Republicans if this would be their breaking point with Donald Trump, um, and, and particularly as it relates to these indictments. I remember asking Republicans here on the Hill after these charges in New York dropped, and then the classified documents case dropped, and every successive indictment, is this the line that has gone too far with Donald Trump? And at every moment, they've rallied to his defense, particularly if if you think about the classified documents case, when it was an, kind of an undeniable fact that those classified documents were found at Mar-a-Lago, although Trump has thrown up defenses in that case as well. Uh, the point being is we have heard from Republicans here on Capitol Hill and frankly writ large in the party, at least a core of the base, that these trials have only served to more embolden them to support Trump. I can tell you, I talked to uh, campaign staffers who 
worked for other candidates in the GOP primary, like Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy and Mike Pence, and each have privately acknowledged that uh, the day Trump was first charged in this New York case, this was the first indictment that he received, remember, that is when the primary fundamentally shifted, and you saw GOP base voters jump to Donald Trump's defense. And I can tell you one of the serious conversations, no doubt, being had in the Trump campaign is how do you maintain th these trials and their appeal to the base while also try to build a campaign that also appeals to more moderate and potentially independent voters as well. All right, Catherine, John, Elizabeth, Jay, and Chris, thank you all so much. So glad you're streaming with us because we continue to follow two top stories today. The other one is that unprecedented attack that Iran made on Israel. It's been the second day now uh, in a row that Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu met to discuss uh, its response to Saturday's attack. Uh, he and his cabinet announcing that the country's military chief uh, has made it clear that Israel will respond and world leaders have been urging Israel uh, not to retaliate, though, and that does include the U.S., but definitely making it clear that if the if Israel does attack Iran, they will do so alone. President Biden still reaffirming his overall support for Israel, though, and adding together with our partners that we defeated that attack uh, when referring to Iran. At least half of those strikes, as you know, failed before they even reached their targets, while almost all of them were intercepted and shot down. We've got live team coverage on this as well with our WABC correspondent Josh Enninger. He's there in Jerusalem. Senior White House correspondent Selena Wang is at the White House. And our contributor and former Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, Mick, Roy Mick Mulroy, is back with us. Uh, Josh, let's start with you. The Iranian Foreign Minister is now saying that Iran is not seeking to escalate regional tensions here. Um, but, you know, they fired toward Israel. Yeah, that's sort of a, an odd statement for them to make after what happened on Saturday night. I and mean, we were here, Kira, watching, you know, these missiles streaking through the sky behind us right over the old city of Jerusalem. This was an obvious escalation that Iran sought to, to you know, the, the, they were, of course, responding to Israel's attack on an Iranian consulate in a third country in Syria. So, so you know, that on its face is, is, the, is the issue that Israel is wrestling with right now as the war cabinet meets and tries to figure out how best to calibrate its response. You know, an army military chief just said in the last hour uh, that Israel will respond uh, after this attack, but they have not said how. And that, of course, is the million-dollar question here. They know that if they respond too forcefully, the United States has said it's not going to assist, and the United States has put a lot of pressure on them to, to withhold uh, the force to try to prevent an even more furious response from Iran. But Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, is in a very tough spot here in Israel. He is leaning on his base for support, his base which is far right wing and very hawkish and wants him to pummel Iran. There is a growing wave of dissatisfaction. There's a recall effort. There's an effort to hold early elections and turf him out of office. He has legal trouble of his own that he's not facing because he's in office, which might sound familiar to, to those of us in the United States. And so uh, he, he's in a world of trouble. Uh, he has a lot of people to please, and, and they have to make a decision that does not start World War III. Kira? Selena, well, that's definitely the last thing we want is a World War III. Uh, Kirby was very careful, Selena, avoiding uh, questions on a possible response, uh, U.S. involvement. He just stick, he, he, he stuck with that one line, that the U.S. will not be involved in any way, shape, or form. Um, tell us more, uh, kind of read between the lines of what else was said and not said during this briefing. Yeah, Kira, I mean, he dodged a lot of questions, but really he was trying to underscore and create some distance between what the Israelis are going to do and what the U.S. has been advising them to do, making very clear that it's up to the Israelis to decide what to do. And he was very careful not to get into any hypotheticals about if Israel does have some massive response, how would the U.S. respond to that? Because remember, less than two weeks ago, President Biden had threatened to change U.S. policy if Netanyahu doesn't do more to protect civilians in Gaza. So this is a very frosty relationship right now between the president and Netanyahu. And while Kirby wouldn't say that up on the podium, we have learned, according to officials, that the president did urge Netanyahu to think carefully now and to take things slow and to be careful about any of the risks of escalation here. We know the president has 
said to him to essentially take the win here, that Netanyahu has already demonstrated to the world that the Israeli military is superior to Iran's. The president's focus right now, it is to avoid any kind of escalation, to avoid this turning into a wider war, which has been his focus ever since October 7th. Mick, sort of lay out for us um, why the U.S. did get involved to a point. I mean, offering up assets, air assets off the destroyers, the carrier to help shoot down and intercept um, those those drones and, and missiles coming in at Israel. But but why does it end there? So, Carol, the policy of the United States since the beginning of the war at Gaza has been to avoid a regional conflict. Uh, of course, Israel is our partner, so we're going to defend them, but it also helps uh, prevent that from happening, quite frankly, because if these 320 projectiles would have made it through, and some would have, I think, if the United States didn't get involved, uh, that would have uh, had a huge response by Israel, and then we definitely would have had a regional conflict. So it was not only in our partner's interest, it was in the interest of the policy we have uh, not to have a, a regional conflict. Now is the time that Israel is going to have to decide what they're going to do. I think they're likely to strike in Iran. Uh, and quite frankly, the recent statements by Iran that regardless of whether they strike in Iran or potentially even in Syria against IRGC uh, members that are primarily responsible for getting proxies to strike in Israel is going to make them say, well, then why not strike in Iran? Because uh, the consequences are the same, and they're never going to take off IRGC members that are currently plotting to attack Israel and Syria. So this has a strong chance to escalate, at least with Israel responding into Iran, and then we'll have to see what Iran does. But this is not what the U.S. would like to see. Uh, but as they said, they're not going to be involved, but the ultimate decision is Israel. Mick, Josh, Selena, thank you all. Straight ahead, Rust Armour, Hannah Gutierrez, sentenced to prison. What she had to say in court next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Eighteen months for the movie set armorer convicted of involuntary manslaughter in the Rust film shooting. I am sentencing you to 18 months of incarceration at a New Mexico women's correctional facility. I find that what you did constitutes a zero, serious violent offense. It was committed in a physically violent manner, a fatal gunshot done with your recklessness in the face of knowledge that your acts were reasonably likely to result in serious harm. You were the armorer, the one that stood between a safe weapon and a weapon that could kill someone. You alone turned a safe weapon into a lethal weapon. 
But for you, Ms. Hutchins would be alive, a husband would have his partner, and a little boy would have his mother. Please take her. Well, the judge not messing around one bit. Sentencing Hannah Gutierrez there with a final word to 18 months behind bars after the jury found her guilty in the shooting that resulted in the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Legal contributor and trial attorney Brian Buckmeyer has been following this case from day one. Woo, her words were pretty straightforward and harsh, Brian. Yeah, the, the judge really wasn't mincing any words there. And I understand this is a, a homicide case, a homicide case being the larger umbrella for murder as well as manslaughter, and that includes involuntary manslaughter. And the fact of the matter is, is that Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was the armor. It was her responsibility to make sure that there was safety protocols put in place. And while I still stand by the fact this is a first-time arrest, a negligence case, I would not want to be in the judge's shoes, I am still surprised that she gave Hannah Gutierrez-Reed the maximum sentence here. But of course, the judge did uh, back up the reasoning for it in her sentencing. It also appears that by the judge's calculations, she didn't seem remorseful enough. And even the family said that Hannah Gutierrez-Reed didn't reach out. I do understand that to some degree, and I think this is where attorneys really mess things up. I, I think Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, as well as Alec Baldwin's attorney, are saying don't admit anything. Don't say you're sorry, no matter how bad you feel, because there's still civil litigation continuing on. And so that might be why the family hasn't been reached out as yet. But again, I think lawyers ruin everything when it comes to trying to really have catharsis and, and empathy for someone who clearly lost a, a very important member of their family. How do you think this is going to impact Alec Baldwin's trial now come July? I think for Alec Baldwin, there are two things here. One, he gets to point the finger and say, even the judge said that she was the sole person that caused the death of, of Helena Hutchins, that she was the armorer, she was supposed to make sure it was safe, she was the individual who kept multiple live rounds throughout the set. It is her negligence that led to the death of Helena Hutchins. And I think Alec Baldwin uses that as an argument, saying, I'm the actor. I'm supposed to be given my materials, I'm supposed to be given the props, they're supposed to be made safe. However, he also is a producer. He wears two hats on the set of Rust. And I think that is going to be a situation where it says, you cut corners. You didn't do training uh, and safety protocols as you're supposed to. And so there could be that argument. But even more for Alec Baldwin, if a judge is willing to give Hannah Gutierrez-Reed 18 months in prison, I do not think this judge will shy away if Baldwin is found guilty from giving him any amount of jail time, yet alone potentially the max. Brian, let's take a listen to what Gutierrez said to the judge just before her sentencing. My heart aches for the Hutchins family and friends and colleagues as well. And it has since the day this tragedy occurred. Helena has been and always will be an inspiration to me. I understand she was taken too soon. What did you make of what she had to say, Brian? Well, I think, don't don't forget, there was also some jailhouse calls that were also played for the judge. And so I think the judge and everyone else took those two comments and weighed them both, potentially saying that, hey, when the time came and it was appropriate uh, and maybe beneficial to you, Helena, uh, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, you were remorseful. You talked about how your heart ached for Helena, and you said some very nice words, but I don't think she went as far as saying, I did wrong. I'm sorry, I'm remorseful for my actions and my part in this. And then you take those jailhouse calls as well, where she seems pretty adamant that she is not at fault, that, that she was not the one uh, who led, uh, whose actions, sorry, led to the death of Helena. And I think that's ultimately, as the judge quoted, the reason why uh, the maximum sentence was given. So I just think far too little and far too late is a big reason why we're talking about 18 months and not something more like six or 12 months. Appreciate you, Brian. Thanks for just staying with us uh, for all the coverage all the way through sentencing. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Coming up, four arrests and a gruesome discovery in the search for two missing Kansas moms. We've got that for you next. Here's to good mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because you know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? 
We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from Buckingham Palace in London, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Some other top headlines we're tracking for you this hour on ABC News Live. Two bodies discovered amid the ongoing investigation of two missing moms from Kansas. Four suspects were arrested in connection to the case this past weekend. 27-year-old Veronica Butler and 39-year-old Jillian Kelly were reported missing late last month. The identities of the bodies, though, have not yet been released. More than 250 survivors of the 2017 bombing outside the Ariana Grande concert are now suing British intelligence agency MI5, alleging that it missed its chance to stop the attack before it happened. 22 people were killed in that attack when a man set off a bomb in his backpack in a crowd right there in Manchester. Celebrating 77 years of number 42, the trailblazing athlete Jackie Robinson played his first game in the majors on this day in 1947, breaking baseball's color barrier. And for the past 20 years, players and coaches on all MLB teams sport net number 42. Uh, they wear the number 42 on their jerseys. And today, we all come together and honor the baseball slugger and legend. Glad you're streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News to all the stories that matter to you. You can always find us on your favorite streaming service, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. I watch you every night. 
ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families. On the ground in Ukraine. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Reporting from the site of the 2024 Iowa caucuses, I'm Victor Okendo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top headlines are tracking for you here at ABC News Live this hour. The people of the state of New York versus Donald J. Trump, the first ever criminal trial of a former president of the United States. Right now, Trump sitting in a New York courtroom as attorneys begin jury selection in the hush money case against him. Trump is charged with 34 counts of allegedly falsifying documents to hide payments he made to Stormy Daniels to keep her quiet about an alleged affair prior to his run for the White House in 2016. Trump has pleaded not guilty to the charges, claiming that the case is just election interference, and he continues to campaign for the November election. The closing bell sounding on Wall Street, stocks finishing the day, suffering major losses as the sluggish spring continues to drag on Wall Street. NASDAQ S&P 500 both closing more than 1% lower as rising geopolitical tensions and disappointing economic data have left investors rattled. Among today's biggest losers, Tesla, Salesforce, and DoorDash. 18 months for the movie set armor convicted of involuntary manslaughter in the Russ film shooting. I'm sentencing you to 18 months of incarceration at a New Mexico women's correctional facility. I find that what you did constitutes a zero serious violent offense. It was committed in a physically violent manner, a fatal gunshot done with your recklessness in the face of knowledge that your acts were reasonably likely to result in serious harm. You were the armorer, the one that stood between a safe weapon and a weapon that could kill someone. You alone turned a safe weapon into a lethal weapon. But for you, Ms. Hutchins would be alive, a husband would have his partner, and a little boy would have his mother. Please take her. Judge sentencing Hannah Gutierrez there to 18 months behind bars after the jury found her guilty in the shooting that resulted in the death as you heard the judge of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on your favorite streaming service, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops, neither do we. GMA3 starts right now. What you need to know right now on GMA3. History unfolding in New York City as jury selection gets underway in the hush money criminal trial against former President Trump. Israel's war cabinet meets again today as the world watches on high alert after Iran's failed retaliatory strike of hundreds of missiles and drones. The calls to de-escalate what our team is now learning. Plus, is beef in rap music back? The primer on the war of words involving Drake, Kendrick Lamar, and J. Cole. It's today's Monday Morning Quarterback. I kick cancer's butt. Excitement about a potentially groundbreaking new treatment that researchers say shows promise in hard-to-treat cancers among children. It's also Money Monday here, teaching girls what they need to know about the bottom line in this financial literacy month. Tonight is about both Johnsons, because I'm no longer little brother. I am an A-list manager who gets things done. Plus, Gronish takes a final bow this season. Star Marcus Scribner takes us behind the scenes of the Blackish Hit spinoff. And the long-awaited WNBA draft gets into high gear tonight in Brooklyn. Tickets selling out in 15 minutes. Three dozen young players about to hear their fate. 
And as his wife is about to give birth at any moment, Scotty Scheffler wins the Masters by four strokes. His second green jacket, by the way, in just three years. Now, from Times Square, DeMarco Morgan and Eva Pilgrim with Dr. Jen Ashton and What You Need to Know. Everybody, good afternoon, and welcome to What You Need to Know. That's a way to kick off Monday. <laughs> good tunes. That yeah. song, I can see you bouncing all of a sudden. You were like over here, and then, oh. And then just slow up. Yeah, yeah, when that beat drops uh -huh. as well. You know it is good back? to see you guys. Yeah. We I missed stay you. Away. I missed you guys, too. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay, a let's lot. put you back to work. You ready? <laughs> I'm ready. Let's talk to America's let's favorite do doctor. It. Let's talk about this recent measles outbreak. Uh, there have been seven outbreaks with at least 121 reported cases this year. Yeah, so this is an important medical headline, you guys, and I think if we remember back to 2020, we've learned how important it is to keep our eye on everything that's going on in the world of public health and infectious disease, and measles is a big one. Let me take you through it. Um, first of all, some measles 101. This is actually the most highly contagious respiratory virus on Earth uh, with cold-like symptoms and a rash as the typical way that it presents. Nine out of 10 unvaccinated people, if exposed to measles, will become infected. Uh, it can easily be mistaken for another illness, and that's part of why the CDC is sounding the alarm because so many healthcare providers have never actually seen a case of measles um, in this country. It is airborne, transmissible through the air. Children are particularly vulnerable, and we have a preventative. Uh, way out of this, you guys, with a two-dose vaccine that's 97% effective at preventing illness. Um, again, it's in our toolbox. It's not being used, and that's why the CDC continues to put this on our radar, because we're seeing cases go up and up and up. We, we have seen the occasional outbreak here yeah. and there here in the United States. So is this particular outbreak any more concerning than the others? It is. Year to date, it's 17 fold higher. And again, the vast majority of people, if infected with measles, uh, will be fine. But it can cause serious illness, encephalitis, pneumonia, um, and particularly vulnerable are unvaccinated children. Almost all of these cases that we're tracking in this country are amongst unvaccinated people. So again, totally unnecessary. And alarming to yeah, say the least. Thank sure. you, Doc. We you appreciate bet. it. Let's turn now to ABC's Zareen Shaw in Los Angeles with our latest headlines. Good afternoon, Zareen. Eva, we begin with the first former American president to stand trial on criminal charges. Former President Trump in court in Manhattan today as jury selection begins in the so-called hush money case. Trump has pleaded not guilty on 34 counts of falsifying business records. Prosecutors say that Trump was at the center of an alleged scheme to keep a story about an alleged affair with an adult film star from voters just before the 2016 presidential election. Trump has denied all wrongdoing. And the battle brewing over O.J. Simpson's estate after after the former football star and convict passed away just last week. New questions about his will and whether the families of Simpson's late ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, will receive any of the more than $30 million they were awarded in a civil suit that Simpson lost decades ago. And the new development in the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse in Baltimore. Sources familiar with the matter say the FBI is now probing whether there might have been any criminal wrongdoing in the crash of that vessel that brought down the bridge. The Justice Department says FBI agents were on the cargo ship this morning as part of that investigation. And now to our Ginger Z, who has a look at your weather. The atmosphere is warming up for a severe weather outbreak this week. It'll start tonight, and that is parts of Nebraska, Kansas, and even southern South Dakota, all the way down into Texas. Abilene, watch for damaging winds. Large hail is the main threat, but tornadoes possible, too. Tomorrow, that tornado threat ramps up even more. Iowa, Missouri, Illinois in the heart of it, but Arkansas, you'll be on the trailing end as well. And just to put into perspective where we are tornado-wise so far this year, the U.S. is below average, but look where the highest counts are. Ohio. Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, and Florida, outside of traditional Tornado Alley. And golf great Scotty Scheffler taking home his second green jacket in just three years, winning the legendary Masters Classic in Georgia this weekend with his wife at home about to give birth at any moment. The 27-year-old is the number one ranked golfer in the world. And excitement is building for tonight's historic WNBA draft tipping off in Brooklyn. Caitlin Clark expecting to hear her name called first. The college superstar about to turn pro, making her Saturday Night Live debut this weekend. All eyes 
eyes will be on Clark, Angel Reese, and three dozen other top college players tonight. And you can watch it all on ESPN tonight at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Guys, I was watching SNL. She was received with so much love. You could feel the excitement. Yeah, people love her. And yep. could you imagine being her right they now? Really do. What's going through her mind? Like, yeah. this is the moment. This I is the night. I can imagine being her mama. <laughs> <laughs> Very proud. Zareen, thank you, and good to see you, friend. Still ahead on GMA3 on this Monday, tensions rising in the Middle East. Our team with a deep dive on the latest. And is beef in rap music back? The war of words between Kendrick, Drake, J. Cole, and more. We're going to explain it all in today's Monday Morning Quarterback. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The crown in crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Get ready, America. Every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Welcome back to GMA3. All eyes are on Israel as the world awaits the nation's next move. Israeli leaders are weighing their response to Iran's dramatic missile barrage that put the international community on high alert. Iran launched more than 300 missiles and attack drones at Israel. This marked Iran's first ever direct military assault on that country. And joining us now with more on what's next is ABC News national correspondent Matt Gutman from Tel Aviv and senior White House correspondent Selena Wang from Washington, D.C. Matt, let's start with you. I mean, this was an unprecedented attack on Israeli forces, but they managed to block 99% of those drones and missiles. How? It was a multi-layered approach, Eva. Um, a lot of it had to do with a massive and very powerful international coalition led by the U.S. Um, they picked up a lot of those drones, shot them out of the sky, as did they did with ballistic missiles as well. Israel picked up the slack, its own air force knocking out a lot of the drones. They also had um, anti-missile systems that for the medium range and the long range that acted and worked almost flawlessly. But the fact that it was such a big uh, network of nations that were cooperating over a very busy and congested airspace and they managed to deconflict it really is unique that's what also makes it not very replicable if Israel retaliates and then there is another salvo of missiles from Iran unclear that they can get this kind of international support again Eva Selena what did President Biden tell Netanyahu after the attack 
Well, DeMarco, the president essentially told Netanyahu to take the win, that he's already demonstrated that Israel's military is superior and that from here he should take things slow, think carefully and strategically about the risk of escalation. Now, the president also made clear to Netanyahu that if Israel decides to strike back, it will do so alone. It's clear that the U.S. was willing to defend Israel, but they're not going to go on the offensive. So right now, the ball is very much in Israel's court. But despite the pressure you've seen from the president and from U.S. officials on their Israeli counterparts, a senior administration official says that they believe Israel will strike back. And so the big question here is, is Netanyahu going to take the pressure from the president? Okay, Matt, we have to talk about this. So, you know, Iran is saying this is all about retaliation. Israel's war cabinet has met. What are you hearing about what's going to happen next? This is the second time they've met in as many days, Eva. Uh, they've been in there for hours now. We do not know the results of this meeting. Unclear if we will even once they're over. The Israeli military definitely believes that it needs to respond somehow to that massive salvo of missiles from uh, Iran. Otherwise, they're going to seem like a paper tiger. They need to reestablish a sense of deterrence, they say. And they say that they offered a spectrum of options to the Israeli government. Unclear what they're going to choose. But again, a lot is riding on this. And if it's too big of retaliation, it's unclear if Israel will be able to knock out all those missiles again if they come. If it's too small, does it reestablish that deterrence? It's very unclear right now. In the next couple of days, are going to be people are going to be on tenterhooks here. And Selena, we should also point out that the president met with G7 leaders. How are world leaders responding? Look, this really rattled global leaders, including here in the United States. In fact, one senior official said that their hand was trembling when they were taking notes after learning that more than 100 ballistic missiles could be launched. When it comes to the G7 and the meeting that the president had with them, after they convened, they released a statement expressing their full solidarity and support for Israel. That show of support, that is a shift for Israel. Remember, they've been facing months of intense and harsh criticism over their military operations in Gaza. It was less than two weeks ago that President Biden threatened to change U.S. policy if Netanyahu doesn't do more to protect civilians in Gaza. So all of this coming at a time when President Biden and Netanyahu, they have this very frosty relationship. So the question is, how does that factor into the way the president is able to put pressure on Netanyahu when the president's first priority is to prevent this from escalating into a wider war? ABC's Matt Gutman and Selena Wang, thank you to you both. Mm -hmm. Just ahead here on GMA3, the disses and the beef. We know all too well, right? The war of words and rap between superstars, but could a little beef be good for the music industry? Monday morning quarterback Mike Muse joins us to break it all down for us. Come on back. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. The Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, 
This is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Chicago. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Reporting in St. Petersburg, Florida, in the aftermath of Hurricane Adelia, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. All right, welcome back to GMA3. This weekend, social media was buzzing with the possible beef between three of hip-hop's biggest stars, superstars, Drake, Kendrick Lamar, and J. Cole. And here to catch us up on what we need to know is our Monday morning quarterback, Mike Muse. I was off of social media all weekend, and I showed up on the Monday morning and was like, what like, is happening? What's going on? <laughs> okay, so there was some major beef. Break this down for us. Well, <laughs> did you pick the wrong weekend to be off of social out, media, right? right? Because J. Cole... Kendrick and Drake. The three of them are the most dominant MCs currently uh, in music for a multitude of different reasons. Drake for his commercial success, Kendrick's for his lyrical prowess, Jake Cole for his fundamentals and lyricism of hip hop. Well, recently, uh, well, there was a time when Jake Cole and Drake teamed up to create the song called First Person Shooter. And in that, uh, Jake Cole references um, that they are the big three, right? And then he goes on further, the big three meeting Drake, Kendrick, and, and Cole, but then Cole goes on to reference himself as Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, y'all, Kendrick Lamar did not like that at all. I mean, Kendrick Lamar had the Pulitzer Prize, right? And so what Kendrick did was on a Friday, he teamed up with Future and uh, Metro Boomin, who was a hip-hop producer, and did a credible 16 bars and said, there is no big three, it's just me. And it took oh. off. It and took then off. It took off, and then the world got to talking, Eva. But wait, there's more, as I love to say. The following week, J. Cole came out with his response to uh, Kendrick Lamar. Uh, but afterwards, on Sunday at his Dreamville Festival, Eva DeMarco, he apologized. He said that he should not have done that. He should not have this Kendrick. His catalog is great. He took it off all the entire streaming platforms. But we were waiting to see what Drake was going to do. And on Friday, we all waited. Music Friday, nothing happened. But on Saturday, a diss track, track released. Take back up. Push Ups is the name of the song, and it created a firestorm where Drake responded to all of his enemies at the time. Future, Metro Rubin, The Weeknd, Ray Ross, and oh, Kendrick Lamar. for everybody. Oh, you yeah. know it. And you can't leave out the women. I mean, you look at Nicki Minaj versus uh, Meg Thee Stallion, but you say this is good for music. It's good for the industry. Absolutely. It's great for the hip-hop right now because of the fact of, like, it expands a genre. Like I said before, it's no different in sports than when you see your greats, right? Like, you think about Muhammad Ali and Frazier. Right? You think about who's the greatest, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, right? So you have all these greats that really expand and but keep the conversation going. But when does it cross the going. line? When does it become too much? If it crosses the line when it gets into the real world and gets physical, um, then it, it crosses the line. But until then, it's great. But listen, I talked about Pulitzer Prize, and I talked about Jay-Z becoming the first rapper in the, in the uh, Songwriting Hall of Fame. This is no different. Hip-hop is American literature. Hip-hop is founded on allegories, alliterations, metaphors, and when you think about the feuds that's happened in American literature, all from the greats from Ernest Hemingway, Fitzgerald, they had feud. Uh, Hemingway said, quote, if he could have had a fewer pompous musings and a little sounder education, it would have been better, maybe, talking about his literature. And then we have Proust and Lorraine. Lorraine says, one of those pretty little society boys who managed to get themselves pregnant with literature, to which they had a dual DeMarco, which then goes too far. So in literature, it's already been established. Mike, thank you. Well, what we know is the drama will continue, mm -hmm. and we will be here for it. Thank you, Mike Muse. <laughs> Let's go. We'll see you next week for our next morning, Monday morning quarterback. Up next here on GMA3, Dr. Jen's list of collaging, boosting foods. We are all ears, and we're also going on a field trip to Florida International University. Researchers there say a new treatment is showing tremendous promise among children with hard-to-treat cancer. Stay with us. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? 
an operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. All right, Dr. Jen, this is in your expertise. Okay. C-sections and pain. pain. <laughs> yeah, so first of all, there are over a million C-sections done in this country every single year. It is a major laparotomy, major abdominal surgery, even though it's done for the birth of a baby. Um, so pain control, pain relief is obviously a major issue not just after, post-operatively, but during. Because mm -hmm. remember, in a C-section, ideally, the patient, the mom, is awake. Um, so there was just a report done in an anesthesiology journal about the level of adequate pain control during surgery and found, according to this study, that there could be, even uh, amongst 5,000 uh, cases that they looked at, up to 24% of women say they did not have adequate pain control oh, during a C-section. So they felt a little bit of everything. Well, uh, it's unclear. Everything so is a I, I want to <laughs> talk you through, you know, usually we use epidural or spinal regional anesthesia, it's called, to, to get an adequate pain level for the patient. Um, we do that for the protection of the patient and also for the protection of the fetus. We don't want to expose them to general anesthesia. And we test, we literally grab a clamp and we squeeze the skin and say, are you feeling anything before we make that skin incision? And obviously, if the woman says, yes, I'm feeling that, we say, pain or just pressure? Will you feel grabbing? And if they say pain, we don't continue. Um, but this really speaks to the issue of, you know, how much are these women feeling and is it pressure or is it pain? And if it's pain, we need to do better, obviously. Mm. I don't want to feel anything. I mean, clearly I'm a man. Well, you do feel, woman, but you do feel me pressure. And, and we don't want people exposed to post-operative, to operative pain that can then go on to have long-lasting consequences. So mm. really, really interesting. All right, Doc, thank you. We're back in a moment. Eva's looking at me like, mm -hmm. <laughs> see what we have to go through? Be glad you're a man. <laughs> Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? 
an operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! <laughs> For our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. It's the first ever criminal trial of a former president of the United States. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Former President Trump in a Manhattan courtroom as attorneys begin jury selection in the hush money case against him. Trump is charged with 34 counts of falsifying documents to hide payments that he made to Stormy Daniels to keep her quiet about their alleged affair prior to his 2016 presidential campaign. Trump has pleaded not guilty to all the charges. The judge has imposed a limited gag order as well, keeping him from making comments about people directly and indirectly involved with the case. But prosecutors are now seeking to hold Trump in contempt for allegedly violating that gag order and making posts on social media. 18 months for the movie set armorer convicted of involuntary manslaughter in the Rust film shooting. I'm sentencing you to 18 months of incarceration at a New Mexico women's correctional facility. I find that what you did constitutes a zero, serious violent offense. It was committed in a physically violent manner, a fatal gunshot done with your recklessness in the face of knowledge that your acts were reasonably likely to result in serious harm. You were the armorer, the one that stood between a safe weapon and a weapon that could kill someone. You alone turned a safe weapon into a lethal weapon. But for you, Ms. Hutchins would be alive, a husband would have his partner, and a little boy would have his mother. Please take her. The judge there sentencing Hannah Gutierrez to a year and a half behind bars after the jury found her guilty in the shooting that resulted, as you heard the judge, in the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. And from Hopkinton to Back Bay, the results are in for the 128th running of the Boston Marathon, Ethiopia's Sise Lema winning the men's race with a final time of 2 hours, 6 minutes, 18 seconds. You can see there, breaking right through the finish line. Then you've got Helen Obiri from Kenya breaking from the women's pack for a repeat win in just 2 hours, 22 minutes, and 37 seconds. Then we had the wheelchair, wheelchair divisions. That's Marcel Hoog from Sweden taking first place in the men's wheelchair race at one hour, 15 minutes and 33 seconds. And then Britain's Eden Rainbow Cooper winning the women's wheelchair race right here, coming in at about an hour, 35 minutes and 11 seconds. And breaking news to bring you now, court has just wrapped in the first ever criminal trial of a former president of the United States. Yes, we're talking about Donald Trump. He was in the courtroom there in New York City all throughout the day, six hours, matter of fact, as attorneys began jury selection in the hush money case against him. As you know, Trump is being charged with 34 counts of falsifying documents that he hit those payments made to porn star Stormy Daniels to try and keep her quiet about an alleged affair that they had prior to his 2016 presidential campaign. We've got full team coverage of the historic New York criminal trial. For more, let's bring in our executive editorial producer, John Santucci. 
Okay, and Olivia Rubin also, uh, who has been covering this uh, from the very beginning. And uh, and I'm told we've got other players that will be coming to the, into the mix as well, as we are learning now that things have just wrapped up. All right, so, uh, John, I'm assuming uh, Trump will come out to the cameras and make remarks like he usually does. Yeah, it's, it's, it's another day and we better get used to it, Kira. It sounds like that's exactly what Donald Trump's about to do. The headlines so far from our team that is down in that courtroom in Lower Manhattan, no jurors were seated as of close of business today. They only got through a couple. And what's most interesting, Kira, is that of the 96 jurors that originally walked into that courtroom to potentially join that member of that, be a member of that jury, uh, instantly half of them left. They said that they could not be fair or impartial. Getting that number cut in half, then cut in half again because of some timelines, some conflicts. One person saying they had their daughter's wedding, they couldn't be on the jury. So originally, that big number of 96 here are just getting down to 11. No jurors seated yet. A couple holdovers that they'll continue to question tomorrow. But I do think this does get to this idea of how long it's going to take for a jury to get seated. Look, it's obviously complicated to seat a jury of fair and impartial people regardless of the situation. But of this juror questionnaire, a lot of people reacting almost instantly, do you have an opinion of Donald Trump that would not allow you to be fair or impartial? And we saw half immediately removed. So they end today, they resume tomorrow. And really, Kira, you know, we have heard this timeline that it would take maybe about two weeks to sit a jury. Well, they didn't do much of it today because, as you well know, as we've been reporting here on ABC News Live, half the day was spent going through motions. They didn't even get into the jury selection process until well after lunch. We've got tomorrow. This court does not seat, sit on Wednesdays. So really, you've only got three more days this week to maybe seat some jurors, and we'll see what happens. So, Chris Timmons, let's talk about can Trump even get a fair trial here? It's, you know, look, but there's there's two sides to this. I mean, well-instructed juries, you know, they've shown time and time again, right, that they can put aside what they've learned, seen, been used to outside of a courtroom, and then come in and look at the evidence and give a fair shake here uh, to whoever is uh, taking the stand. But this is Donald Trump that we're talking about, who never leaves a headline. Yeah, that's true, Kira. I mean, I, I think it's a difficult task. And as I said earlier today on ABC Live coverage, I mean, that's why they brought in 500 people this morning. I've never seen that. I've done some high profile cases here in Georgia. I've dealt with opioid cases where people have a lot of opinions. I've done gang cases where people have a lot of opinions. And so you lose a lot of jurors, but, you know, not 500 brought in on the first day and not of the 96 or however many were brought in the courtroom losing 50 straight off the bat. That is unprecedented. Nevertheless, though, to get back to your question, can you get a fair jury? That's exactly why we're going through this process. And so while it may be a small percentage of the people that are brought in that can set aside whatever opinions they may have of the former president, either positive or negative, but we'll be able to find them and finally get down to the 18 people that we finally need to serve on this particular jury. Now, they've got to qualify at least, uh, I think it, the number's around 40 or so that they've got to qualify to get down to that. Each side has 10 strikes. That's 20 jurors right there. And then for every two alternates, they've got an additional strike, which I guess would be uh, six more strikes total. So you're looking at 26 people plus 16. The quick math on that is 42. And we've got to get to those 42 people before we can even get to then the peremptory strikes and get our jury. So, Rachel Scott, let's bring you into the mix. Um, you know, what's your take? Because polls are suggesting that a guilty verdict um, would likely have a big influence on what happens come November. It certainly could, Kira. Look, there is no question. Republicans have rallied behind the former president. He has taken over the RNC. His daughter-in-law, Lara Trump, is now serving as the co-chair, along with Michael Watley, someone who has pushed Trump's false claims about the 2020 election. We have seen him break through that very crowded Republican field to become the presumptive Republican nominee. But things get tricky for the former president when you look at polls and you dig through some of those crosstabs, and you start to see that Trump supporters, about 13 percent, according to the latest Ipsos poll, would not support the former president if he were to be convicted of a crime. No, that's his own supporters. And then 24 percent of Republicans at large said that they would not vote for him if he were to be convicted of a crime. Now, that is a big red flag for the former president. And look, Donald Trump does not want to be in this courtroom. We are six, we, we are six months, two weeks out from Election Day. Who's counting? Not your campaign correspondent over here. He wants to be 
out on the campaign trail. He wants to be in these critical battleground states. He's now stuck in this courtroom for the for likely the next several weeks, and that's why we're going to probably see the former president come to the podium again and again to try to communicate his message, because this is really all he has at this point as he tries to juggle being in a courtroom and out on the campaign trail when he can. But he's going to be severely limited, Kira. All right, John, what's developing? Kira, our team is obviously still waiting as the court closes down for the day. And from our Aaron Katursky, it appears as they go through the scheduling phases of the next couple of days, Donald Trump has just indicated in court, his lawyers just indicated, that Donald Trump actually would like to attend the Supreme Court arguments next week on his efforts to delay his other trial. This is the Jack Smith special counsel case and it is Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election. As you know, Kira, Donald Trump's team has been trying to appeal that case in an effort to delay it. They delayed it up to the circuit court in D.C. They have a circuit court ruled with the district court that the case could continue. Trump's team then appealed to the Supreme Court saying that presidential immunity could be applicable in this case for Donald Trump's actions related to the team's efforts to overturn the election. And the Supreme Court had took up the case. They decided to hear it. And those arguments, as of now, are slated to happen next Thursday in Washington, D.C. What's interesting about that, Kira, is that, you know, we've talked about this collision course, right? The different hearings and cases that could happen at the same time. Next Thursday would be a normal business day for this trial, for what will probably still be jury selection here. But Trump now indicating he wants to go. You know, we talk about the historic nature of this. I don't think we've ever seen a president, a former president, go before the Supreme Court for anything. So I just think that image, if that indeed happens, if Judge Mershon gives him the day off and lets him attend, um, we've had no indication previously that Trump wanted to go. But there it is from our team, Kira, just stated in open court, Donald Trump would like to go to the Supreme Court next week. Yep, he just, uh, <laughs> he keeps uh, creating, a, well, I don't know, What's, what, what's I'm thinking? We expect it, but we don't. Uh, he's so unpredictable, but he, he is, is so predictable. Yep. <laughs> it's just, yeah. really, I mean, count all the firsts. And <laughs> uh, Olivia, you're there uh, outside uh, the courthouse. Um, you know, John's mentioning Judge Mershon. You know, let's talk about Juan Mershon. Who is he? What do we know about him? Uh, what's been the interaction like uh, there in the courtroom? Uh, is the former president being respectful? How is uh, the judge handling the former president who, as we know, uh, can be quite the handful at times? Well, I think, Kira, uh, especially, you know, with this team that's been covering Donald Trump in court for over a year now, we have really seen a development of Donald Trump in court. I remember nearly a year ago to this day when we saw Donald Trump being arraigned here for the first time and how it was a vastly different Donald Trump that we see these days. I remember reporting at the time that he walked into the courtroom for the first time because New York was the first trial, and he seemed scared. He was timid. He said hardly anything with the judge, Juan Marchand, asking him to please speak speak up because he couldn't hear him. And then you fast forward to something like the E. Jean Carroll trial where Donald Trump is muttering under his breath. He is storming out of the courtroom. So we have seen Donald Trump develop in his demeanor inside of the courtroom, becoming much more feisty at times, much more aggressive at times. And I think Juan Marchand has been shown to be someone that is not going to put up with that sort of behavior. And when he read Donald Trump back some of his rights today, you know, you have a right to be present, but if you are disruptive, I will throw you out of court. You know, that is something that he says to every single criminal defendant, he said. But it really carried a lot of weight when he said it to Donald Trump today. You could sort of tell that he meant it. You could tell that there was meaning behind it. Because it is something we have seen from Donald Trump before. So it's going to be fascinating to see how these two face off. Because remember, Donald Trump is not afraid to attack the judges overseeing his criminal cases. He is not afraid to attack the prosecutors. And he is not afraid to attack the family of Juan Marchand. And he has been going after his daughter. And now he is sitting in front of him in a courtroom today. So no real fireworks between the two today, but I think it's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out over the next six weeks, because like I said, we have seen a Donald Trump that is much more emboldened one year into his courtroom journey than we saw when he was just beginning it. Leave here for a half a day, go to D.C. and go before the United States Supreme Court, because he thinks he's superior, I guess, to the Supreme Court. We got a real problem with this judge. We have a real problem with a lot of things having to do with this trial, including the DA, because you go right outside and people are being muffed and killed all day long, and he's sitting here all day with about 10 or 12 prosecutors over nothing, over nothing. Over what, over what people 
say over what people say shouldn't be a trial. So I just want to thank you very much. But uh, that I can't go to my son's graduation or that I can't go to the United States Supreme Court, that I'm not in Georgia or Florida or North Carolina campaigning like I should be, it's perfect for the radical left Democrats. That's exactly what they want. This is about election interference. That's all it's about. Thank you very much. Hi. John, I think we can be pretty direct here. This is not about election interference. Uh, this is about a story that goes back a number of years that involved uh, his former fixer Michael Cohen and porn right. star Stormy Daniels and the allegations of their relationship and yep. payments that were made to keep her quiet. This is not Absolutely. election interference. Let's just lay right. out the evidence and the facts here that we've been covering for years. Yeah, and Kira, I think that's the most important word you just said. We've been covering this for years. This is not something that began yesterday, not not something that began before Don, began after Donald Trump announced that he would go for the White House for a third time with this bid for 2024. This has been a case that many prosecutors have been looking into for some time. And actually, it's a case that began, believe it or not, Kira, I mean, go, going back to, d to days when uh, you and I were both in the same city working in D.C., it goes back to special counsel Robert Mueller and information he obtained from Michael Cohen that was then turned over to prosecutors in New York's Southern District. Michael Cohen ended up being prosecuted for some of those crimes, and then evidently it was turned over to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, where they have been weighing what to do for it for some time, expanding the case, looking at different ways to go about it. Originally investigated by then-District Attorney Cyrus Vance, he ultimately left office to not seek re-election. Alvin Bragg comes in, continues investigating, and here we are. That indictment, of course, coming down one year ago, just about this time last March. So definitely not election interference from there. Obviously, another claim Donald Trump made earlier today, not in that statement from what we heard, um, but saying that Joe Biden and others were behind all of this. As you well know, Kira, there is no evidence to say that President Biden is behind any of these investigations, any of these four criminal cases against Donald Trump. I do just want to note um, the two Two comments he made as he was coming out of court here, if you'll let me. Um, he commented about the Supreme Court uh, case that uh, I had mentioned to you a couple seconds ago, his team making that argument in court just before they dismissed today's proceedings, uh, saying that he'd like to go next Thursday to court. Trump's team making the request, Judge Mershon denying it on the spot, saying that Donald Trump did not need to be at the Supreme Court. He needed to be in New York because these are criminal proceedings, and said he expects to see him next Thursday. Trump reacted saying that he disagreed with the judge's opinion there. The other thing he talked about is that as they were going through the calendar for these proceedings, Kira, about days that would be on and off, Trump had asked at one point, his lawyers had asked on his behalf, to have off for his son Barron's high school graduation in May. That was also denied by Judge Mershon, Trump reacting to that, saying that the judge won't even let me go to my son's high school graduation. And again, I just think, Kira, where we need to explain the difference between what we've seen so far and where we are now, now, the other cases that Donald Trump had popped in and out of court for were civil proceedings. He did not need to be at those proceedings every day. Welcome to the new world order. This is criminal court. You have to be there as a defendant every day. Donald Trump now going to learn that the hard way. And uh, Olivia, uh, Ruben, I'm seeing your note here about the judge denying this request um, from uh, Todd Blanche to excuse Trump from the proceedings. Uh, anything else you want to add to that? I was just reading through the note that was just handed to me. Well, I think to John's point, you know, he is not required to be there and now he is not allowed to be there in what is going to be a very consequential hearing. And I think something about the immunity argument that a lot of people forget because we're covering so many cases there is it's actually bigger than just the January 6th case. Donald Trump has also filed a presidential immunity argument in Fulton County, Georgia, that is still pending. And I was just recently talking to a source down there who pointed out that in their view, that case is essentially paused and the judge down there, Scott. Scott McAfee likely is not moving forward with that case because the Supreme Court still has yet to decide. The source described it as limbo. So there is a lot hanging on the line for Donald Trump with that case, and it goes beyond just the January 6th case. So important to remember how intertwined all of these cases are. And again, he is not going to be able to be there because there is this case going on, and we have said it, but you can't stress it enough. It may be the only one to go forward. So it is the one that will, for now at least, 
command Donald Trump's attention for the next six weeks. And Rachel, uh, Biden is uh, not saying anything, uh, of course, about Donald Trump or anything that's been going on today or previously. What about members of Congress? What's the uh, buzz up on the Hill? Anything? Yeah, well, look, Republicans on Capitol Hill are largely standing by the former president. They have fallen in line. It's really hard to find any Republicans who will admit uh, publicly that they have a lot of concerns about uh, the accusations against the former president. But sources have told us privately they find the subject matter to be extremely difficult. Uh, they know that it's extremely problematic. And I would even go as far as to say that sources that I've talked to uh, within Republican circles have told me they have concerns about the impact that this could have uh, going forward if there is an actual conviction. And I think it's so striking here. I just We're talking about the notes that we are getting from our reporters, Aaron Katursky, this line that he said the judge said inside that courtroom, your client is a criminal defendant in the New York County Supreme Court. He's required to be here. Kira, just how striking this is, because we are talking about the former president of the United States, the presumptive Republican nominee. Uh, this is a former president, you know, who, uh, you know, when you're president of the United States, states, you don't really get told no. Uh, you're allowed to do what you want to do. You're the presumptive Republican nominee. You're allowed to travel where you want to travel. That is not the case. I think John uh, really hit the nail on the head there when he said he is now faced with this very stark reality that is playing out in front of him. And this is a reality uh, that the former president will have to contend with, with over the next several weeks. And it could be very irritating for him. We know that he walked into that courtroom today anxious but also irritated because again every day that donald trump is spending inside of this courtroom is a day that he is not spending out on the campaign trail and guess who will be out there it will be president biden and he'll be making his case to the american people and so even though president biden isn't commenting on all of this playing out in the courts right now he's looking to draw that contrast directly as he gets back out there on the campaign trail kira and Selena Wang, let's take it to you at the at the White House. You know, Ty Cobb, who was an attorney for the White House under the Trump administration, was on set here with me. We were having the conversation that what happens if Trump indeed wins a, a second term and becomes president of the United States once again? Um, some of these cases can go bye bye. Mm -hmm. And look here, right now the White House is staying out of this. And in fact, when President Biden was asked just moments ago if he's even going to watch the Trump trial, he shook his head no. And the Biden campaign, too, they believe that this is a split screen that speaks for itself to have the former president in the courtroom there on criminal charges over covering up this salacious scandal. They think that speaks for itself. They know this is going to dominate the news cycle, and they think that actually works in their favor with Trump spending more time in the courtroom than on the campaign trail, as Rachel was saying. But look, if there is a conviction, the strategy that we're seeing from the Biden campaign, that could change with some polls showing that a conviction could impact those critical independent and swing state voters. But for now, this week, the president, he's going to be out on the campaign trail. He's going to be traveling to Pennsylvania. He's going to be delivering an economic message about what they say is the president delivering for the American people versus Trump and the MAGA Republicans' campaign of revenge and retribution. So what we're seeing play out today Trump in the courtroom, the Biden campaign believes it's just showing the American people what chaos could come with another Trump presidency. And for now, they think that sticking with their message of showing the split scene screen, the contrast, the threat that Trump poses to women's reproductive freedoms, to democracy, they believe that is a stronger message at this moment than focusing or fundraising off of his legal woes. Brian Buckmeyer, from a legal perspective, I mean, Juan Marchand, the judge here, uh, he's not giving the president any special treatment. He's being treated like anybody else that would come into his courtroom. Uh, absolutely. And I, I can tell our viewers and everyone else here, I've been a uh, public defender here at the New city of New York for the Legal Aid Society uh, for about eight and a half, nine years, and I've had clients miss the birth of their children, miss graduations. I've had clients whose parents uh, were in the hospital dying of cancer, and the judge says, you've got to show up to court. You're, you're not going to get an excuse. And so I think what Donald Trump is getting a very real and harsh reality of, uh, you're like everyone else. Everyone is equal under the law, whether you're a former president, whether you're an indigent client, uh, this is the way that it works. And he is more than welcome to articulate his frustrations in any way uh, to his base, uh, to the people of America, but you are being treated the exact same way, regardless of your status or your money, when it comes to you have to come to court. You are accused of a crime, and as I argue, sometimes it shouldn't be, but part of the punishment is showing up each and every day. 
Yep. Even if you're Donald Trump and you are used to getting your way, it's not going to happen in front of this judge for sure. We just saw that play out uh, in Judge Juan Mershon's courtroom. Uh, Chris Timmons, the gag order, the social posts, what could happen here? Yeah, so that's interesting, Kira, because they, the judge set a hearing for Wednesday. That's going to be their off day when they're not doing jury selection. That means they could do other court matters at that time, handle motions, et cetera, so that the jurors aren't hanging around like they were earlier today. But the contempt issue is really fascinating because I don't think there's much doubt that Donald Trump violated the gag order by talking about some of the witnesses on his uh, social media platform over the weekend. The real question is, what's the judge going to do about it? I mean, we saw a different judge today where he indicated that he's putting his foot down. He's not going to treat Donald Trump any differently than he would a regular criminal defendant. And if that's the case, then there's got to be some punishment there. Then the two different types of punishment are either a fine or confinement, meaning he could put him into custody. If he puts him into custody, that could be interesting as well, particularly where he puts him, because in potentially could be Rikers Island, although that's highly, highly unlikely. Oh, can you just imagine those pictures? Um, Olivia, what about the timeline here? Are we on schedule? Well, I think Judge Juan Marchand made sort of a loose reference to the fact that hypothetically they could be falling behind schedule. And I think we heard John Santucci hit on this um, already a bit earlier. They only got to actually question 11 jurors today. And some of those jurors gave answers that are probably going to get them struck either by Donald Trump's team or by the prosecutors. One of them saying, I think that no one is above the law, not even a janitor. That's not something Donald Trump's team is going to like. So it seems like we're going to be struck stretching far beyond the, you know, week or two that could it have taken to seat this jury just based on the fact that they only questioned 11 jurors in an entire day today, Kira. And Juan Marchand said that they had 500 ready to go to be questioned. So when you're talking about Donald Trump, who wants to get out on the campaign trail, who wants to go to a Supreme Court argument, who's going to be pushing up against uh, the Republican National Convention this summer, every single day that they fall behind is going to be another day that they have to tack on to the end, another day that Donald Trump is in the courtroom, another day that he's not out on the campaign trail. So what they don't want is for this trial to stretch further and further and further. But based on the timing today, that's what it seems like is going to happen. Chris, we got about 60 seconds left. Give me your final thoughts here as we wrap this up. So, I mean, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do, just like Olivia talked about, the folks that are going to get struck, we're trying to qualify the panel. And Brian can speak to this, but I believe the magic number here is 42 qualified. So that's what we've got to figure out is who are the 42 that are ultimately going to be the veneer. And then from there, they do their strikes. Thank you all so much, Olivia, John, Rachel, Selena, Chris, Brian. You helped us get through the day. Uh, six hours, Trump sat in that courtroom. We'll continue to follow, of course, the trial as jury selection wraps up and everything goes forward. I'm Kira Phillips. Thanks for streaming with us. More news ahead. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all, that's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good Morning America. We want you to know every morning we're right here and we got gotcha. you. Here's to Good Mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's ray of sunshine, highlighting the best of America and helping make dreams come true. Wow. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because you know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. <laughs> It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? That sounds pretty good. Your health, your money, breaking news, music, and of course, good food. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're gonna take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. Every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. It's time to buy the right stuff. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. ABC News, America's number one news source. I'm Katie Whitworth here in Los Angeles, and we begin at this hour with a historic trial in Manhattan, the first criminal trial in history for a former president of the United States. Jury selection began today for the start of Donald Trump's hush money criminal trial. And according to a pool report, at least 50 of the 96 potential jurors have been excused from service after they said they can't be fair or impartial. Now, Trump addressed reporters inside the courthouse earlier today, once again, blasting the judge and the trial itself. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. Well, the former president has been charged with multiple felonies related to falsifying business records to hide payments to, that he made to cover up an alleged affair with adult film star Stormy Daniels right before the 2016 election. Now, Trump has pled not guilty to all charges. We have team coverage on this historic day. Joining me right now with more is our ABC News investigative reporter and producer Olivia Rubin outside the courthouse, along with ABC News executive editorial producer John Santucci, former Georgia prosecutor Chris Timmons, and ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer, uh, thank you all for being here with us today on this very busy day. And Olivia, starting with you, uh, I know that there was several things that happened before they finally got to the jury selection part of this. But Olivia, clearly an interesting scene playing out there as the former president came face to face with the people that could potentially decide his fate. Exactly, Kena. Donald Trump sat in the courtroom and watched and listened as potential jurors one by one stood up and read aloud their answers to a 42-question questionnaire with Donald Trump looking at them. So they are answering questions, and you can hear it's rowdy because his supporters know that he's probably leaving soon. But they're answering questions about if they have read his books, if they have followed him on social media, and he is following along watching. So a really sort of personal moment there inside of the courtroom as Donald Trump followed along with his own copy. And just to sort of give you a sense of the weight that these, you know, Manhattan individuals are under with this trial, one woman essentially excused, excused herself and could be heard in the, hall room, the hallway after she left the courtroom saying, I just couldn't do it. So it is a very small but very telling moment about the task at hand here to try to find 12 jurors and six alternates who are going to be able to fairly and impartially decide this case, which is why right off the bat you heard that stat, 50 jurors left saying, I just cannot do it. I cannot be fair and impartial here. So uh, probably some long days ahead.
Uh, certainly. And John, as we go to you, you know, it's interesting you're hearing Olivia try to talk over this music. She's doing an incredible job there, as I know how challenging that can be. Uh, but John, it just goes to show uh, what we're seeing play out in New York. We anticipated scenes like that, right? Yeah. But John, you know, he's required to be in the courtroom for this. This is happening yeah. at a crucial fundraising time for his presidential campaign. How is his team preparing for that? Well, well, they're certainly not doing a good job as Olivia of not being distracted by all the noise there. You know, look, <laughs> the reality is is that Donald Trump's team right now has to find a way to bifurcate this calendar, right? Because as Judge Mershon just laid out in court, he's got to be there for so much of the proceedings. So trying to navigate this political versus campaign versus courtroom calendar is going to be such a challenge for them. You know, one of the things that they've been talking about, Kena, is that having more events that Donald Trump could do remotely, joining, you know, of course, over Zoom, Skype, other ways, um, of course, doing events on Wednesdays when he's out of court, some things they could do in and around the New York area or do quick puddle jump flights, which will be really difficult, but they're still going to try to pull it off, and taking full advantage of the weekends. And the other thing we should note is building out a team of surrogates that can be out for Donald Trump. You know, we talked a little bit about this earlier today in, in one hour of the 18 hours of coverage today we've done on these proceedings. You know, Donald Trump Trump's takeover of the RNC, the Republican National Committee, cannot be understated. The fact that his daughter-in-law, Lara Trump, is now the second in command, that just shows the full force of Team Trump. And they are using that all ready to their advantage. And quite frankly, they need to because the star of their show, their candidate, is unavailable for a couple of weeks. Except for on Wednesdays, as you pointed out there. So that will be interesting to see how that goes. Again, they'll be in court there Monday, Tuesday. They have the day off Wednesday, then Thursday, Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Chris, to you. Uh, some legal experts have called this case the weakest of all of Trump's pending legal troubles. Why is that? Well, I think it's because it's sort of a technical argument that they're making that the prosecution has to get across to the jurors, which makes it a little bit tougher. I mean, everybody understands, you know, the idea of classified documents aren't supposed to be shared. Everybody sort of understands the phone call that happened in Georgia. But here what we're talking about is, you know, you've got to link up business records that were then had something to do with the federal campaign. And so it, it gets a little lost to confusion. And, and some of it also is this is the first time that this statute's been used in this particular way. And there are going to be some jurors that just aren't going to like that. And some of those jurors potentially could end up on this jury, causing further problems for the prosecution, Kana. And in terms of the jury, Brian, to you, we heard Olivia mention it as well. At least 50 of these 96 potential jurors were excused today. Uh, one saying, you know, they can't be fair or impartial. Uh, Brian, how long is this going to take to get the jury seated? And what are the implications of that dragging out? Well, the judge can originally have said that this could last about two weeks to find a jury, but I think uh, John and I were talking earlier, and my bet was closer to three weeks, especially if you're not counting uh, the Wednesday. And I think the part of the issue is what we're seeing at the first day. Not a single juror was selected, and then it takes time for what one would call a qualified juror, meaning that there is no for-cause reason, there's no reason why they themselves believe they cannot be eliminated, when they cannot, sorry, um, think about this case and be fair and impartial. And then we get to the point where each side has what's called 10 peremptory challenges to pick that 12. Basically, the ability to just say, you know what, we don't want you for whatever unstated reason, so long as they're not discriminating based on sex, ethnicity, or race. And then they get two more peremptory challenges for the alternates. And so when you do that math, Chris had kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, we're looking for about 40 to 42 qualified jurors for then, for then the uh, defense and prosecution to whittle it down to that 12 and 6. But getting to that number seems to be very difficult. So I think, at least in my humble opinion, two to three weeks at least, and then push back the actual length of the trial itself, and then all the other issues that John has talked about, about campaigning and not being able to be out there uh, because of the length of this case that he has to be there for. Right, and also, Chris, let's quickly talk about this hearing that's also set uh, for next week after prosecutors asked to hold uh, Trump in contempt for violating his gag order. Look, I know this gag order is pretty limited, but what do you expect to hear from that hearing? So, Kena, it's never a good day when you're a criminal defendant and you hear that you're, uh, you've got a hearing set for uh, criminal contempt to find out whether you committed misdemeanor contempt of court, which could carry up to a year in, in some cases. Highly unlikely that that happens. So here, first, the issue is whether Donald Trump violated the gag order, and I don't think there's any doubt there. Maybe he could throw his social media people under the bus. But the bigger issue is what to do with Donald Trump if he's found to have violated that order.
All right, and John, lastly to you, I want to elaborate a little bit more on this calendar here based on the things that we just heard from the former president as he was leaving. I and mean, in this lead up, right, we've often discussed this packed legal calendar, but it sounds like next week he also wants to be in the room when the Supreme Court takes up his immunity case. So how does this collision course play out? I mean, he even brought up, John, that he can't go to his son's graduation now. Yeah, I mean, talk about trying to book travel or anything over the next couple of weeks. Look, on that issue regarding the Supreme Court, you know, Olivia and the team were flagging that in real time, and it was denied almost instantly. Judge Mershon saying that Donald Trump is a defendant in New York County, being Manhattan, being that Supreme Court building in Lower Manhattan, and he is expected to be there. And I do think that's where things are very different for Donald Trump compared to all of the cases we have seen previously, in the sense that all of those cases, the New York Attorney General's probe, the Eugene Carroll cases, those were civil proceedings. Welcome to criminal court. The rules are different. If you're a defendant, you got to be there. So that's exactly what's going to be happening now. Donald Trump can't take a day off for pretty much anything. And I think the fact that it was such a striking comparison, right, a personal matter. We, we know we all have uh, children here, right? I mean, everybody wants to go and be a part of their children's events and, and activities and celebrations and big moments. The fact that he can't go to his son's high school graduation as of now just shows how tough this judge is going to be and how, how he's really going to stick to this calendar. Now, on the Supreme Court of it, you know, I had heard for quite some time, and speaking to sources close to the former president, that he did indeed maybe want to go to this, but, you know, it'd be too complicated, it wouldn't happen. The fact that that came up in court today, I mean, my eyes almost popped out of my head. Our team, I think uh, Olivia, Aaron Gutersky, and I were all texting in real time saying, wait, what? He wants to go to that too? And again, it just shows the collision course, right? Because while this trial is happening, we have that argument next Thursday at the Supreme Court. We are going to have other court calendar activities, motions, hearings, et cetera, in the other cases he faces, right? There are two criminal cases on the federal level and, of course, Fulton County, Georgia, the other state case, Kana. All right, John and John, as you were laying that all out for us, we were showing our viewers video of him leaving the courthouse. And again, he does not get to pick and choose when he wants to show up for this. Olivia Rubin, John Santucci, Chris Timmons, and Brian Buckmeyer, thanks to all of you on what I know has been a very long day. Also today, we are tracking the latest for you out of the Middle East. This is after, of course, Iran launched an unprecedented attack against Israel over the weekend. Iran unleashing a barrage of more than 300 drones and missiles towards Israeli targets on Saturday night. Night. Officials confirming that all but a few were intercepted by Israel and its allies, including the United States. The IDF saying that a small number of Iranian missiles did land in Israeli territory, including a military base. Dozens of Israeli citizens have been treated for things like stress or minor injuries. A seven-year-old girl also critically wounded, according to local police. The retaliatory strike coming after a deadly attack on an Iranian consulate in Syria earlier this month that killed a top commander in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, along with six other officers. The Iranian envoy to the United Nations just yesterday said saying that this issue can now, quote, be considered closed, warning the U.S. to stay away from the conflict. Now, the White House was quick to condemn the attack on Israel, with President Biden reaffirming America's ironclad commitment to the security of its ally. But we have learned that U.S. officials are telling Israel that if it chooses to strike back at Israel, it will do so alone. Joining me now is our ABC News Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman, who is back in Tel Aviv, along with ABC News Senior White House Correspondent Selena Wang, ABC News Senior Pentagon Reporter Louis Martinez, and ABC News National Security and Defense Analyst Mick Mulroy. Thank you all for being here with us. And Matt, let's start here with you. Uh, we know Israel's War Cabinet uh, convened today as officials are considering a response to Iran's attack. Matt, what more do we know about that? And in general, what is the overall mood in the country today? I think, Kena, the mood can be summed up with two words, caution and ambivalence. Caution because something pretty significant was achieved here, right? Israel was part of a multinational coalition that included Arab countries that knocked down a massive salvo of ballistic missiles, drones, and cruise missiles. Something like this has really never been done before. The deconfliction, all these different air forces and missiles flying over the same air space at once. This took massive planning, years of preparation. It's a huge achievement, 
and they don't want to squander it with this retaliation. That's where the ambivalence comes in. So on the one hand, Israel feels that it must retaliate. It must show deterrence. It must tell Iran that this cannot stand. Nobody expected Iran to come out with such a large salvo. Nobody, really very few, expected that Iran would attack Israel directly from its own territory. So Israel has to somehow send a very clear message that this will not be tolerated. How big of a message? When does it come? How many people are killed? They're being very, very cautious about that, and that's the other side of the ambivalence. They don't want to squander this, and they are listening very clearly to what the Pentagon and the White House are saying, which is, Israel, tread carefully here. We support you, but do not do anything that will escalate this and turn this into a larger regional war, which is what we've been trying so hard to prevent here. Okay, now. All right, Matt Gutman in Tel Aviv, our thanks as always to you. Uh, Selena, to you now. Now, we heard the president say that America's commitment again to Israel's security is again using that term ironclad, but the U.S. is also telling Israel that if it goes after Iran militarily, that it's on its own. Uh, also, some scathing words from Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who criticized President Biden as well today. What more can you tell us from the White House? Well, Kana, look, the president is walking a very fine line here. The White House is making clear that what Israel decides to do is their own decision, but the president has been urging restraint. We know that in that phone call between President Biden and Netanyahu, the president was urging him to take the win, that he's already shown the world how strong Israel is. They've come out on top here and that they do not need to respond to establish strength and deterrence. As one senior official put it to me, the president's message was that Israel already looks, quote, untouchable. Despite the barrage of missiles and drones, they were able to take almost all of them down and there was no significant damage. So the president here, he's been laser focused on not escalating this conflict, not wanting this to turn into a wider war, but relations between Netanyahu and Biden are frosty. So the big question is how much of the president's advice does Netanyahu take? Absolutely. And as it sounds like he also will have a, a meeting with uh, House Majority Leader Steve Scalise, uh, speaking on the telephone with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, also, Louis, to you, look, we understand the majority of the intelligence about this attack actually came from coalition partners before it happened. So, Louis, what more do we know there? Okay, now we know that the United States, as well as other countries, provided intelligence to Israel, which has its own very large and very sophisticated intelligence gathering system about Iran. Um, and one of the things that we we were heard we heard last week was that essentially every Iranian weapon system was on the table for potentially being used against Israel uh, whenever that time came. And that time came the, this past Saturday. But one of the things that was surprising to American officials was the number of ballistic missiles that Iran did use. In the end, they ended up using more than 100 ballistic missiles. Well, that was a surprise to U.S. officials. They had been expecting the more than 150 and 100 uh, cruise missiles. But in the end, it was a smaller number of cruise missiles that were used. Oh, that's interesting, Louis. Uh, thank you for that assessment. Uh, Mick, actually, I'd like for you to weigh in directly uh, on that assessment there. There was a bit of a surprise here that it was just 100, of course, talking about this as Israel weighs its potential response. Oh, Mick, I don't know if your mic is on. Cruise missiles are a bit of a big problem because they have the ability to adjust and move and don't have the same trajectory as a ballistic missile, which is easier to shoot down. So that was a surprise, but a good one. But it is important to note, as John Kirby said today, the Iranians did not give warning that they were going to do this. So this had to be exquisite intelligence, as Louis just said, not just from the United States, not just from Israel, but also from our partners, our Arab partners. And this has been a long time com coming. The United States has been working to do this for, for a while, having this integrated air and missile defense system, which includes the intelligence that goes into shooting these down. It, sh it looks like it worked uh, very well in this circumstance. It certainly did. All right, Matt, Selena, Louie, and Mick, our thanks to all of you. And coming up next here, the armorer from the Rust movie found guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Her sentence revealed in a New Mexico courtroom today. We'll bring you details on how her sentencing could now affect Alec Baldwin's upcoming trial. That's after the break. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. 
reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America this morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. All right, welcome back. The armor from Alec Baldwin's movie Rust has been sentenced to 18 months in jail. Hannah Gutierrez was given the maximum sentence. She was convicted of involuntary manslaughter last month in the set in the shooting death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Now, Baldwin was holding the gun when it off, when, when, when it went off. Uh, the movie star has also been charged with involuntary manslaughter. His trial is set to start in July. But Gutierrez today addressing the court, saying she was young and naive while on the set of Russ, but the judge responding that she didn't see a lot of remorse from the 26-year-old. You were the armorer, the one that stood between a safe weapon and a weapon that could kill someone. You alone turned a safe weapon into a lethal weapon. But for you, Ms. Hutchins would be alive a husband would have his partner, and a little boy would have his mother. Strong words there from that judge. I want to bring in Mola Lange, who was in the courtroom in Santa Fe today at the sentencing, along with our ABC News legal contributor, Brian Buckmeyer. Uh, so, Mola, again, uh, really strong words there from the judge. What was the reaction in the courtroom? Well, Kena, it was an emotional one, especially from Hannah Gutierrez, who was really emotional uh, from the start of today's hearing. Uh, uh, you know, uh, teary-eyed, uh, crying throughout. That was notable because we saw very little emotion from her uh, during the course of her two-week trial about a month ago. But really from the start of today's hearing, again, uh, very emotional uh, when she gave her uh, uh, address the court and address the judge uh, today. Uh, again, she was emotional throughout that, begging the judge uh, to give her probation as opposed to sending her to prison. Uh, she also uh, talked about how her heart ached for uh, Helena Hutchins and her family. Uh, and as we heard uh, a moment ago, uh, she also talked about how she was young and overworked on the set of Rust and under-resourced, uh, uh, you know, talking about her time as armor. Uh, but, it, you know, it seems that that emotion, those tears were perhaps too little too late for this judge who uh, blasted Gutierrez for not being remorseful enough, not taking enough accountability uh, from the moment of the incident uh, up until today when she had the opportunity to address the court, saying that she wasn't uh, remorseful enough, and that's why she handed down the maximum sentence. All right, Mola and Brian, I know this is one of many courtrooms uh, that you were paying close attention to today. And so as Mola points out there, the judge says there really was a lack of remorse, a lack of responsibility here on behalf of Gutierrez. Uh, was, this a, was this a surprise to you today that she got the full 18 months? Kenny, it was a very big surprise for me. I understand the judge's point as to the lack of remorse and, and how she articulated that and felt that, especially when you look at some of the jailhouse calls that the prosecutors put forward. But I thought to myself, while you may weigh that as an aggravating circumstance to increase a jail sentence, uh, every criminal defendant, or at least the majority of them that I have seen, whether it be representing clients or as a, as a legal contributor, shares some lack of remorse, pointing the finger elsewhere. But the lack of a criminal 
criminal record, I thought would have been a larger mitigating factor, which would have reduced the jail sentence to somewhere around six uh, to 12 months. I thought that 18 months for a first time offender was a heavy uh, sentence, but it seems like the judge had enough information to believe that this was appropriate. All right, that's interesting. And of course, we know that her defense team uh, lied the issues squarely at the feet of the production team, including Alec Baldwin himself, and his trial will start this summer. Mola Lange and Brian Buckmeyer, our thanks to both of you. All right, coming up next here, New England Patriots Rob Gronkowski making a triumphant return to Boston today. We'll show you why the Super Bowl champ drew cheers at Fenway after the break. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families. On the ground in Ukraine. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Former President Trump's classified documents case is back in court. I'm Aaron Katursky in Fort Pierce, Florida. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And welcome back. Today is Patriots Day in Massachusetts, and that's always a big sports day. Legendary Patriots Super Bowl champ Rob Gronkowski throwing out the first pitch at the Red Sox game at Fenway. Oh! Oh! I mean, doing it only with the way Gronk can do it, right? The Super Bowl champ playfully spiking the ball into the dirt on the mound. The crowd goes nuts at Fenway, uh, responding with cheers and Boston strong. This is tens of thousands of racers made their 26.2 mile trek through the city for the famed Boston Marathon. It was 33 year old Cisse Lima from Ethiopia on the win uh, for the marathon in two hours, six minutes and 18 seconds. Uh, he began his career running at seven 17 years old, training barefoot because he didn't have shoes. Also on the women's side, Kenya's Helen Obiri winning the women's race, two hours, 22 minutes, 37 seconds. Also in the wheelchair competition, Great Britain's Eden Rainbow Cooper winning in the women's category. And then Marcel Hug breaking his own record, defending the men's wheelchair title for a second year. He actually had to receive medical attention after crossing the finish line because he crashed during the race. Uh, law enforcement agents were on high alert. Uh, Although police say they had no specific threats to that area, it's been 11 years since the bombing at the Boston Marathon. And I worked there in Boston when that happened. It has a special place in my heart always. Uh, we have a lot more news ahead here on ABC News Live. In today's big story, the historic start of Donald Trump's hush money trial in New York City. The first time a former president has been tried on criminal charges. I'll speak with Florida Republican Congressman Byron Donalds for his take on the case and how he thinks it will impact Trump's presidential campaign. Also in our spotlight, Israel's weighing a response after that unprecedented retaliatory strike from Iran. We have more on what the U.S. is saying. If Israel Israel chooses to attack back.
What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? An operation to capture ISIS fighters. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate now. Militants came in from four or five different directions. Operational nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag, there's not a tear in it. Not a tear in it. How important is this label right here made the USA? Look at your smile. You're proud of this. I love this. Great work. Hi. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, David. Good to meet you. Ismail? David. David. Yes, yes. I'm David Muir. I, I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. You have another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. I'm Ken Whitworth here in Los Angeles and today's big story, former President Donald Trump on trial in New York City where he's facing felony charges related to a hush money payment made to adult film actress Stormy Daniels in 2016. Also because Congressman Byron Donalds for his reaction on today's court proceedings and if the Florida Republican thinks that the case will have any bearing on Trump's 2024 chances. Also in our spotlight, Israel reeling from Iran's retaliatory attack. Officials there say they're weighing a response, but the United States says it'll hold back if Israel chooses force. Now, of course, we begin here with a historic trial in Manhattan, the first criminal trial in history for a former president of the United States. Jury selection began today for the start of Donald Trump's hush money criminal trial. Trump addressed reporters inside the courthouse earlier today, once again blasting the judge and the trial itself. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. Well, the former president has been charged with multiple felonies related to falsifying business records to hide payments made to cover up an alleged affair with adult film star Stormy Daniels right before the 2016 election. Trump has pled not guilty to all charges. 
And joining me now with more is Republican Congressman from Florida and surrogate for the Trump campaign, Byron Donalds. Thank you so much for being here with us. And look, let's jump right in. We have a lot to go over today. Uh, let's start with us hearing from the former president today uh, as he was walking into the courtroom. He talked about how he believes that this is an assault on America, saying it's political persecution. But from your standpoint right now, are you worried about how Republican or even moderate voters will take all the information from this trial, particularly the accusation that his campaign wasn't honest with voters in 2016. Well, first of all, it's good to be with you. I am not concerned because what voters in our country are going to see is that unless you're an extreme partisan on the Democrat side of the aisle, this case is absolute garbage. This is foolishness. There is no, there is actually no criminality here whatsoever. They're trying to take a misdemeanor bookkeeping charge and then ramp it up to be a felony when the actual agency responsible for looking into campaign finance, the, the Federal Election Commission, looked at this and said there was nothing there. So over the the course of this highly publicized uh, trial, the American people are going to see that this is political persecution. This is Alvin Bragg and uh, Judge Mershon grandstanding trying to increase their name ID and increase uh, their popularity in cocktail parties in Manhattan. But it does not matter to the American people. And this is a real stain on the legal system, especially for Manhattan, for the state of New York, but really for the United States of America. This is not the way the justice system is supposed to be used. Well, but let's get your take here on Michael Cohen at the center of this case, right, is these hush money payments that prosecutors say Trump's former fixer, Michael Cohen, was responsible for. He's taken a plea deal. He's working with prosecutors. Do you at this point really believe that Trump was unaware of the bookkeeping related to this case? Michael Cohen was also uh, was also convicted of perjury. So he's a convicted liar. He's had his law license revoked. So in the court of law, every witness that goes in there, that information's got to be made available to the jury as well. But this is important, and this is for the jury that's going to end up be, that's going to end up being picked. You got to decide: Do you want to continue this political charade in the courthouse, or do you want to do the right thing, say not guilty, because there is no underlying crime, even in the indictment that was put forward by Alvin Bragg, there was no underlying crime. This case should be kicked immediately. All right, well, a, length, a very lengthy jury selection process underway right now. But since I have you, I'd like to ask you about the Middle East. I know that you are a member of the House Freedom Caucus. And today, in a statement, the caucus warning Republican leadership not to use the emergency situation in Israel as, quote, bogus justification to ram through Ukraine aid with no offset and no security for our own wide open borders. So first of all, how do you think the speaker will respond? And will you personally vote down any funding that includes aid to Ukraine? Well, let's be very clear on a number of matters. What happened in Israel, um, once again, is an atrocity. Uh, the Biden administration's weakness has led us to this point. But secondarily, the House of Representatives has now passed two different vehicles uh, to actually have aid to Israel. The first one we passed, all we said was we want to fund it by, uh, by paying for it with the IRS agents that Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi wanted to fund to the tune of $80 billion. We wanted to claw back $14 billion of that to pay for aid to Israel. It passed the House overwhelmingly on a bipartisan basis. Chuck Schumer tabled that measure in the Senate. So the Senate should bring that bit that bring that uh, that measure up again. They should pass it immediately so Israel gets its aid. Ukraine is a different matter altogether. House Republicans have been very clear on this, that if the White House wants to negotiate on funding Ukraine, they have to first secure the southern border. It is still massively unsecured. It is hurting every major city in our country, every state in our country. The president needs to do his job if he expects to negotiate with Congress. In this emergency situation, as you have called it, what are you looking for in particular when it comes to the border? Oh, it's very simple. We need to halt all, all encounters into our country immediately. The drug cartel is abusing Joe Biden's protocol at the southern border to move 10 million people into this country illegally and then to move millions and millions of pounds of fentanyl into this country, which is killing Americans. So we do need to reinstate Remain in Mexico. We do need to end the parole releases. We need to end cash and release altogether. If people want to claim asylum, they need to claim it in Mexico or in their home country where 
where there, where there is a U.S. embassy. That's what needs to happen going forward. If the administration just did that very simple, common sense thing, then there would be room to negotiate aid to Ukraine. But they have refused to do so. So if Ukraine falls, that is at the feet of Joe Biden. But why am I surprised? I'm not, because he is the master of disaster and everything has gone wrong under his presidency. In terms of aid, though, to Israel, uh, is it on the table to discuss sending aid to Israel alone? And if Speaker Johnson doesn't consider something like that, do you think that his position might be in danger here? Well, I'm not going to go that far because there's a lot of discussions that are going to happen this week. I firmly believe that what the House should do once again is pass aid to Israel, clean aid. Let's go ahead and pass it, send it over to the Senate, and then Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden are going to have to make a decision. Are they going to side with the radicals within their own party, or are they going to side with the 80 percent of the American people that want to stand by Israel and give them everything that they need to protect their sovereignty and protect their interests? I think that's the issue in front of Speaker Johnson, but it's also the issue in front of President Biden and Chuck Schumer. All right, Congressman Donalds, I hope that you come back and talk with us as I know that this will be a very busy week. I know you have an important meeting to attend, so I hope we get to talk with you again soon. Thanks for being here. Of course, anytime. Big story to our panel now. So joining us today is our ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host Mike Muse, our former assistant secretary for public affairs at the Department of Homeland Security, Marsha Espinoza, ABC News political contributor, senior editor at The Dispatch, Sarah Isker, and ABC News contributor and trial attorney at Hamilton Clark, Brian Buckmeyer. So thank you all for being here with us. Brian, let's start here with you. Look, I know it hasn't been all sorted out yet in terms of Trump and this hush money trial and if he will take the stand, if he will in fact testify. What did you make of that Sandoval hearing this morning, and where do you think they'll go with that? So the Sandoval hearing is a hearing that happens in every criminal case where the defense gets a bit of a preview as to what the prosecution could ask if their client takes the stand. I'm very hesitant to put on any defendant, yet alone the former president, in a case like this. I would say that he shouldn't testify, but as we all know, Donald Trump does what he wants to do, and when it comes to being a criminal defendant, it's ultimately his choice as to whether or not he'll testify. I think for him, he's thinking more of the campaign pain and rather less of the criminal case against him. So I think he would testify, but I think there could be more harm than good there from a legal standpoint, maybe not necessarily from a campaigning standpoint. All right, interesting. And Sarah, to you, in terms of who will be responsible for deciding the fate of the former president here, look, they started with 96 potential jurors today. Uh, they're down to about a third of those that are, are remaining under consideration. Uh, clearly, this is going to be very tricky to get a jury seated. And I want to share with you, uh, Sarah, that one prospective juror was overheard in the hallway after leaving the courtroom saying, I just couldn't do it. Uh, we have had large trials in this country before. Uh, think O.J. Simpson, obviously, back in the news this week, Marcia, uh, Martha Stewart, Michael Jackson. But I actually think the trial that the jury selection will be most like is the Boston bombing trial, uh, the marathon mm -hmm. from 2013 that was bombed. That trial was held in 2015. It took two months to impanel a jury of Boston residents. And even then, of the 12 jurors, four of them said that they believed the defendant was guilty, but they were seated because they thought they could set that aside and weigh the evidence. That is still under appeal even as of last month because of jury selection now nearly mm -hmm. 10 years later. So certainly something that could come up again and again and be appealed again and again. Uh, Marsha, to you, there are concerns from both Trump's lawyers and his campaign advisors right now in terms of this gag order. Uh, what is in the best interest of this case? Do you think that he'll adhere to it? I mean, it's not an extensive gag order. Look, it seems to be that Donald Trump's strategy has been to deny, delay, and denigrate everything mm -hmm. that comes his way. But um, he should also add, drink some coffee to that list because there were reports today that he couldn't stay awake during the proceedings. And if he couldn't stay awake uh, during this one, uh, he's got many more to come. So, uh, you know, for all that, that he, the talk that's been about sleepy people, he is sleepy Don in this case. So, yep. I mean, he did have to sit in there for six hours today. It was a, it was a lengthy day uh, in court, and it sounds like he has many more of those days in front of him. Uh, uh, Mike, to you, though, how does the general voter watch this trial? In particular, uh, what could be drawn out in this jury selection? And then do you think, Mike, the voters are going to be hung up really on the hush money payments part of this, the misdemeanor versus felony part of it? What strikes you as the biggest concern? 
are great questions. I think it's really going to be uncommon upon the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg and his team to really restate what this case is about. Uh, and it mm -hmm. doesn't, it's not really about the guilt or innocence of former President Donald Trump as he deserves his day in court and to adjudicate himself, but it's really about protecting the sanctity of our judicial system. I, I believe really, even listening to your previous guests, that our judicial system is under attack. And so in order to make sure that this isn't about politics or politicizing a case, but it's merely mere about the facts. I think that uh, Alvin Rax needs to come out and really reframe this about election interference and lay out to the public what is exactly at stake so that the public can make a determination uh, on how they view this case, because this is the first time uh, that a former president has been tried in a criminal case. So it's historic nature unto itself today, Kana. All right, Mike, Marsha, Sarah, and Brian, our thanks to all of you. All right, coming up next here on ABC News Live, Israel considers its options after that retaliatory strike from Iran. What is next for the conflicts in the region and how the U.S. is responding? We'll talk about that with my panel next. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The crown in crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. All right, in our spotlight, the growing tensions in the Middle East after Iran launched an unprecedented attack against Israel over the weekend. The U.S. and allies calling for restraint following the Iranian barrage of more than 300 drones and missiles towards Israeli targets. The IDF saying that a small number of Iranian missiles landed inside the country, including at a military base. The retaliatory strike coming after a deadly attack on a consulate in Syria earlier this month that killed a top commander in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, along with with six other officers at that facility in Damascus. ABC News has learned that U.S. officials are now telling Israel that if it chooses to strike back at Iran, it will do so 
alone. So I want to bring back my panel here, Mike, Marsha, Sarah, and joining us is our ABC News contributor and op-ed columnist for the LA Times, LZ Granderson. So thank you all for being here. Uh, Mike, I want to start here with you, and I want to just share with you some words from the Senate Minority Leader, Mitch McConnell, today, who is being very critical of President Biden, accusing him of trying to tie the hands of an ally under attack. And Mike, he went on to say, it's time for our Commander-in-Chief to lead allies and partners in an international effort to impose meaningful costs on Iran. What do you see as the answer here? What I see right now in that statement that you just read is both a domestic play and then there is a geopolitical play. Uh, from mm -hmm. a domestic play, what we're seeing is the divide between Democrats and Republicans on how they view the Israel-Gaza conflict, uh, where it seems like the Republicans are tactically uh, hammering in on the progressive wing of the Democratic Party calling for a ceasefire, where Senator Mitch McConnell and the Republican Party are really standing hawkish on Israel's right to defend itself. Um, um, and without issuing a ceasefire. From a geopolitical space, what we do see uh, is President Biden with the allies, in particular, Kena, if you look on, on Saturday when they're in the Situation Room, really leading a cause to be proactive to really help Israel defend itself. And we saw that in action with the Iron Dome and Israel being successfully mm -hmm. able to defend itself right. along with our allied partners, which is a technology um, that the United States has helped to assist. So I think we have to be mindful as we discuss this from a domestic political space versus a geopolitical space. And also, though, domestically, McConnell is urging House colleagues to take up legislation and send funding not just to Israel, uh, but Ukraine as well. Uh, Marsha, to you, you've worked for the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, what is the biggest thing that the U.S. should be keeping its eye on right now since this conflict clearly is far from over? Yeah, and, and like John Kirby said, you know, he's the spokesperson for the NSC, that this underscores the threat that Israel faces in a very, very tough neighborhood. So mm -hmm. what we should be watching right now is what the House is going to do. And they've got a Republican conference this evening. And what they can do is take up funding and putting on the floor. The votes seem to be there, and everyone is looking for some leadership out of the Speaker's office to get it on the floor and get it voted on so that not only um, Israel can get additional resources and defend itself, which they clearly need, but um, so that we can move on as well. So we have seen action from the president. Um, he's been clear that the U.S. doesn't seek a war with Iran and um, has, has taken action from the very beginning. That's, that's leadership. Yeah, but also, Sarah, to you, I mean, President Biden is essentially walking a fine line here, if you will, uh, saying that his administration's commitment to Israel is ironclad. We hear that terminology over and over again, but also saying that if Israel strikes back, it's on its own. They won't even refuel planes in the air. What do you make of that? Yeah, I mean... Uh Joe Biden seems more worried about the domestic politics around Israel right now in an election year. In that sense, it's real bad timing for our closest ally in the region. It's important to remember, you're picking sides here between Israel and Iran, the biggest sponsor of terror in the region. These are not the good guys. And one of those missiles fell. It has a seven-year-old Arab-Israeli girl in critical condition tonight. This was not mm -hmm. costless. And in the meantime, Israel's testing, sorry, Iran is testing Israel's defenses. Uh, this was not that they wanted every missile shot down. They clearly didn't, but they're learning from this. And if we don't strike back, they're just going to keep doing it until they land. And they did not give warning, uh, as Louis Martinez has reported there. And LZTU, uh, Israel said that it's going to respond no matter what. It's sort of just a matter of how, uh, keeping in mind, of course, what's happening in Gaza in the backdrop of all of this. So how do you view this situation now further hurting the situation in Gaza? Well, I will start by saying I don't believe that President Biden is solely making these decisions, as Sarah sort of alluded to, based solely upon domestic politics. I think that discounts the fact that there are thousands of people starving right now, waiting for aid and assistance since October 7th. And that the world, not just the United States, but the world is looking at the actions of Israel through that prism, in addition to the attack of October 7th and weighing the pros and cons. So I do believe it is quite possible to be pro-Israel and question Netanyahu's decision-making, which I believe is what is happening right now. The world is not questioning its love of Israel. It's questioning the decision-making of Netanyahu. We should not conflate those two things. And Sarah, I want to give you a chance to respond to that. 
Yeah, I mean, we're not talking about the war in Gaza or Palestinians. We're talking about Iran's attack on Israel. It's a totally different issue. Iran has been funding terrorism intended to eradicate Israel from the map. Um, they're just two totally separate issues. Netanyahu's extremely unpopular. Nobody I've heard is defending Netanyahu. But Israel's fighting for existence at this point. Kane, if I could Anna, add, though, pre-October pre pre the well, 7th, it listen, was... Here's the, here's pre the thing, Kana. Wait, hold on, I want to let LZ history, respond, and Mike, I'll let you jump in. Listen, when it comes to world history, the problem with our foreign policy is that for some reason, we think these things are isolated. And by these things, I mean these various attacks. We try to address these issues as if they are connected to other parts. So, Sarah, you are correct. This is in response to the attack that uh, Israel had with Iran in terms of killing one of their leaders, but to try and make this entire thing without the without factoring in the fact that people are starving to death, that there are hospitals still discovering mass graves, and this is happening in a region of the world in which a lot of Muslim people are upset about it. So I don't You're think right. that we can see Iran here. funded Hamas's attack on October 7th. Well, in 2018, I, I President Trump had the information about how Hamas was being funded, and that administration, along with Netanyahu, decided not to do anything about it, and they had that information in 2018. So, again, I'm all for having this conversation, but it has to be about all the decision-making that's been happening, not just October 7th. I want to let this cont conversation continue to play out. I know that there's a lot of emotions here and a, a lot of really important uh, thoughts, and we will continue this conversation in a moment. We do have to go to break. So, Mike, Marsha, Sarah, and LZ, our thanks to all of you. We'll be right back coming up here in our last call. Anticipation is building for tonight's WNBA draft. We'll talk about that Caitlin Clark effect. That's up next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I'm telling you the truth. I need to ask you about your marriage and infidelity. The husband is always the top suspect. Always the top suspect. Come stand up for me. Face that wall. The interrogation tapes tonight on ABC. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? That sounds pretty good. Your health, your money, breaking news, music, and of course, good food. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. 
Reporting from a hot air balloon over Russellville, Arkansas, 350 couples have signed up to be married moments before totality. You're streaming ABC News Live. All right, it's time now for our last call with possibly the most highly anticipated WNBA draft tipping off tonight. Superstars like LSU's Angel Reese and NCAA champ South Carolina's Camilla Cardozo and, of course, Iowa superstar Caitlin Clark all stepping into the spotlight to make their professional basketball dreams a reality. Everyone can tune in to the WNBA Draft Live tonight at 7.30 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. All right, thank you so much for streaming with us. I'm Kana Whitworth, and you can follow ABC News Live on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and more. And coming up here at 7 p.m. Eastern, be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for the day's biggest stories and the impact that they have on you. The news never stops, neither do we. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. This is our combat operations center. We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a pair, in it? How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families. On the ground in Ukraine. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Reporting in Las Vegas at the UNLV shootings, I'm Jacqueline Lee. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. All right, I'm Ken Whitworth here in Los Angeles, and right now on ABC News Live, former President Donald Trump on trial in New York City, where he's facing felony charges related to a hush money payment to adult film actress Stormy Daniels. What happened in the courtroom today and why more than half of the potential jurors were excused? And tensions in the Middle East reaching a boiling point after Iran unleashes a retaliatory attack on Israel. The IDF weighing its options as the U.S. cautions restraint over a direct response against Iran. Also, in tonight's prime preview, marking one year of war in Sudan, why the conflict has impacted the North African nation as much of its population right now is on the brink of famine. But we begin here at this hour with a historic trial in Manhattan, the first criminal trial 
trial in history for a former president of the United States. Jury selection began today for the start of Donald Trump's hush money criminal trial. Trump addressed reporters inside the courthouse earlier today, once again blasting the judge and the trial itself. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. All right, the former president has been charged with multiple felonies related to falsifying business records to hide payments made to cover up an alleged affair with adult film star Stormy Daniels right before that 2016 election. Trump has pled not guilty to all charges, and we have team coverage on this historic day. Joining me right now is our ABC News investigative reporter and producer Olivia Rubin, who is outside the courthouse, along with ABC News executive editorial producer John Santucci, our former Georgia prosecutor Chris Timmons, and ABC News legal contributor Brian Buckmeyer, and ABC News. News political director Rick Klein, a packed house in here with me tonight. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Olivia, first of all, to you, uh, quite the day in court there when the former president came face to face with these potential jurors as they got whittled down. I mean, these are the people that will ultimately decide his fate. It was. It was quite interesting because, like you said at the top there, over half of those jurors, their immediate reaction was, I just can't do this. Over 50 of them excused themselves, and that is the protocol for this jury uh, procedure, is that if a juror says that they can't decide this case fair and impartially, no questions asked, they are gone. But then even after that, it's been a little less reported, Kena, but there was another approximately 10 jurors who excused themselves, likely because of scheduling issues. Remember, this is going to be something Something that's going on for almost two months and it's very hard to find people that don't have commitments that they need to get to in that time and then even after that individuals whittling down one by one one woman saying she just couldn't do it another man saying he had his uh, you know family members wedding to get to so all said and done in just those few hours it went from 96 potential jurors just down to over a third so showing how tough it's going to be and Donald Trump of course watching them as they got up one by one by one and answered the 42 question questionnaire including do you you know know Donald Trump have you bought his books do you follow him on social media have you ever worked for him trying to weed out who may have some bias there all right this could take weeks I know Brian Buckmeyer's anticipated even three weeks uh, Chris to you though uh, some legal experts have called this case in particular the weakest of all of Trump's pending cases why is that I think it's because it's more of a technical case. It's a little bit difficult to get your mind wrapped around the idea that, you know, at the end of the day, what he's accused of doing is um, falsifying campaign records when you, it takes a few steps to get there. I mean, you're talking about first the payment went to Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen then paid it to Stormy Daniels. And then you've got to link it back up to the fact that this had something to do with the 2016 campaign. Jurors are not incredibly excited about technical legal cases with heavy documents in them. Them. And so I think that's part of the struggle here is keeping the jury interested and helping them connect all of the dots. All right. And John, to you, the assistant district attorney has actually formally asked the judge to fine Trump $1,000 for each post that violates this court authorized gag order. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you make of that? Well, I think it's surprising that it came on day one. I mean, I think Donald Trump has really skirted the line here. I mean, I would say he probably jumped it a couple of times, and quite clearly, prosecutors agreed with that assessment. Look, it's not so much what Donald Trump has said in this case. It's what he posted. It's three separate posts that Donald Trump did in earlier portions of this month related to Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen that are going to get him in trouble here because... Quite clearly, the judge laid out this directive when he issued this gag order, saying you can't attack or intimidate any witnesses. And those posts, the way you read them at one of them, uh, I think it was the third of the three, uh, called Michael Cohen a liar. That's pretty much attacking a witness. I don't really think a liar is a compliment in the English language. So that's going to be something that is going to drive Donald Trump crazy in the fact that it's a fine, it's a consequence, and he's going to have to really abide by it. And look, if he doesn't, if ultimately the judge agrees with prosecutors, they did violate it, and it's a $3,000 fine, $1,000 for each, Donald Trump does it again, more fines. If you keep doing it, and you'll remember this when we went through the New York Attorney General civil case, the judge in that case said, listen, I don't want to have to throw you in jail at some point for being in contempt of court. If Donald Trump continues to violate that gag order, certainly possible. 
Certainly possible. All right. Also, Rick, to you, as we know, uh, this is a critical time for candidate Trump, right? He's not going to be on the campaign trail. I heard John Santucci say earlier, this the time is now for him to be filling those campaign coffers. Uh, what is the strategy going to be here for him in terms of how he campaigns to try to be president? Kena, he has perfected the art of, of a legal strategy and a political strategy being intertwined. And he is he knows mm. where those cameras are right outside the courtroom. He knows how to, to reach his followers, either via social media or fundraising appeals. And he's already using day one to do that and fashioning it in part into the argument. Part of the argument he's used for his, his supporters, which is, look, they're trying to get me because they want me to stop. They want me they want to stop me from doing the business that, that you demand, uh, and calling it election interference. And again, linking Joe Biden without any evidence to the proceedings inside the courtroom. So he has for some time found a way to message, despite the fact that he is sometimes going to be called away to courtrooms. This, though, I think the scale of it has to start to dawn on Trump and his team. Uh, it's not just today and tomorrow, as you mentioned. This could be months stuck in that courtroom uh, in a time where normally you'd be out campaigning and fundraising and trying to get a message out. And so as he says that, uh, Brian, I want to take that to you. I do want you to weigh in here a little bit on how long you think even just the jury selection process can take. How long can it go, given what we saw today? I mean, Kenny, I'm doing the math, right? There are no court. The court's not being held on Wednesdays. So it's only Monday, Tuesday, uh, f Thursday and Friday. And then I think every Monday is going to be what did Donald Trump text or put on Truth Social and do we have to have another argument as to whether or not he's going to be held in contempt of court and jurors are already self-selecting themselves out. Before we get to that 42 question questionnaire, I think we're talking about a two, three week long, and I say business week long, uh, jury selection process. I think it's going to take some time. All right, uh, Brian Buckmeyer and Olivia Rubin, John Santucci and Chris Timmons, along with Rick Klein. I know it has been a busy day for all of you, so thank you for being here uh, with me. I appreciate it. We're also, of course, tracking the latest out of the Middle East after Iran launched an unprecedented attack against Israel over the weekend. Iran unleashing a barrage of more than 300 drones and missiles towards Israeli targets on Saturday night. Officials confirming that all but a few were intercepted by Israel and its allies, including the United States. The IDF said saying that a small number of Iranian missiles landed in Israeli territory, including a military base. Dozens of Israeli citizens have been treated for things like stress or minor injuries. Also, a young girl was critically injured as well, according to local police. Uh, the retaliatory strike coming after a deadly attack on an Iranian consulate in Syria earlier this month. They killed a top commander in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, along with six other officers. The Iranian envoy to the United Nations just yesterday saying this issue can now, quote, be considered closed, warning the U.S. to stay away from the conflict. The White House also was quick to condemn the attack on Israel, with President Biden reaffirming America's ironclad commitment to the security of its ally. But we've learned that U.S. officials are telling Israel that if it chooses to strike back at Iran, it'll do so alone. ABC News Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman is in Tel Aviv with the latest. And Canada tonight, Israel's military chief of staff mincing no words, saying that there will be a military response to Iran's massive salvo of drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles, one of the largest that we've seen ever. So question is, when is that going to happen and what will that look like? The Israeli military tells me that it has presented a, uh, a number of options to the government, from the assassination of leading Iranian figures somewhere in the world to a direct attack on Iran of some size. The question is, what will the cabinet choose? They've met for hours yesterday, hours today. They have announced nothing yet. Clearly, there's a tremendous amount of caution here because Israel knows that this coalition that the U.S. led that included France and England and Jordan and Saudi Arabia was something novel, something big, was one of um, really one of the, the most unique military uh, anti-ballistic networks ever established. And they don't want to squander it by launching some sort of massive retaliation that will trigger a larger regional war. And because the U.S. has said they will not support a large Israeli retaliation. On the other hand, they feel like they have to reestablish Israeli deterrence. So a lot of hand wringing here about what this next step is going to look like, Kena. All right, Matt Gutman there in Tel Aviv. I appreciate it. Thank you. I want to now bring in our ABC News senior Pentagon reporter, Louis Martinez, along with ABC News' Jay O'Brien and ABC News' national security and defense analyst, Mick Mulroy. So thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Uh, Louis, as we start here with you, look, we understand now that the majority of the intelligence about this attack came from coalition partners before it happened. So what else do we know about that? 
You know, that's right. A lot of the information about what Iran was planning came from the United States, came from other Western countries, and most importantly, from some of the Arab partners in the region. Uh, they were able to get a good picture of what exactly it was that Iran was preparing. Uh, when I spoke to one official, they said then last week, they said they were anticipating that everything was on the table in terms of drones, in terms of um, ballistic missiles, in terms of cruise missiles. I think one of the things that was a surprise to officials uh, as the attack was occurring was the hundred or so ballistic missiles that Iran did eventually launch towards Israel. We're told that only half of those actually did make it in a trajectory so they could be intercepted by Israeli uh, air defense systems. But I think um, going into this, the United States had some good intelligence that they shared with Israel, and that gives them the advantage. And now another thing is the advantage of this coalition of air defenses that has been built up and that essentially uh, really prevented a, a major catastrophe taking place there uh, because of all these systems headed towards Israel. Now the question is, is now that this system has been established, how much longer can it continue? And I guess that's going to depend on world events, most notably uh, whether Israel responds against uh, Iran for their attack this weekend. All right, Louis, thank you. And JT, look, congressional leaders and lawmakers on both sides of the aisle uh, quick to condemn this attack. But Jay, again, it seems they're divided over how to pass additional funding for Israel. I know that things are moving right now there in Washington. What more can you tell us? Well, we have some breaking news actually right now, Kana, so let's break some news together. I've got sources coming into my phone here that say Mike Johnson is meeting behind closed doors right now with House Republicans. The meeting is just breaking up. And the plan he just pitched them for this week is to vote on four separate bills. One is aid for Israel, one is aid for Ukraine, another is aid for Taiwan, and the fourth is a grab bag of a number of different topics, including more legislation of a ban on TikTok, similar to something the House has already passed, but aimed at trying to get the Senate to vote on this because they haven't voted on that, and seizing Russian assets and things of that nature. Those four bills will be brought to the House floor. It looks like sources tell me together, and they will be each voted on individually. This would be a big concession for Speaker Mike Johnson, who has not brought Ukraine aid to the House floor for a vote in the better part of a year. Um, it's unclear exactly what the path would be to passing this, what Democrats think of this, what the White House thinks of this, but that is the plan Mike Johnson has just laid out for House Republicans for this week. All right, that's interesting, Jay. You know, we just spoke with someone with the House Freedom Caucus. They expressed interest in voting uh, on a bill that would, you know, fund Israel, but nothing else. And so it would be really interesting to see how all of that plays out. I know you'll be watching that closely. Uh, and Mick, there to you. Uh, look, this is Iran's first ever direct attack on Israel. And so in your mind, how do you view that? What do you view the significance of that? And then in the end, what are the security implications in the United States? Okay, and it's very significant. Since uh, the uh, 1979, when the, uh, it became the Islamic Republic, there hasn't been attacked directly by Iran against Israel. That's completely changed. And although it was uh, thwarted 99%, uh, it was significant. And if it wasn't for the great actions of Israel, United States, our Arab partners, and European partners, this could have been catastrophic. So Israel, I think, is going to feel that it has to respond in Iran, or they will set up a paradigm where anytime they strike anywhere, including against IRGC Quds Force, who are primarily responsible for getting proxy forces to attack Israel, uh, they're going to have to take uh, incoming from Iran. And eventually, some are going to get through and cause catastrophic damage. So I think that, although the United States does not want to see it, that is the is what uh, Israel is looking at right now. And we should find out within the next 24 hours, I believe, uh, whether it's going to be in Iran and whether it's going to be targets like nuclear facilities, which would be on the high end of causing an escalation, or potentially uh, like the manufacturing uh, plant for Shahid missiles, which they shot at them. It could be anything in between, uh, and it could essentially escalate based on those targets. All right, certainly a critical 24 hours then. To your point there, Mick, uh, Louis, and Jay, thanks to all of you as always. And today also marks one year since the conflict in Sudan became between their armed forces and the paramilitary group. Uh, the situation deteriorating into what the United Nations is now calling one of the worst humanitarian disasters in recent memory, uh, claiming the lives of at least 14,000 people and displacing more than 8 million. In tonight's prime preview, ABC's foreign correspondent Marcus Moore takes a closer look Look at a country on the brink of collapse and starvation. 
In the days following the start of hostilities, there was a scramble to safely remove foreign staff from embassies in Khartoum. The U.S. conducting a daring operation, deploying SEAL Team 6 to airlift dozens of American staff out of the country. Calls for a ceasefire have gone unanswered. So far, there has been no pause in the violence. How brutal has the fighting been in, in Sudan? How brutal can you, can you think? Um, that's, that's literally the, the answer I can give you. In terms of the stories um, from people being dismembered, uh, tortures uh, of the most horrible scenes. Well, it's just terrifying, and we appreciate that tough reporting there by Marcus Moore. Um, make sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis is coming up at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live and, of course, streaming on Hulu as well. Also coming up next here, Golden Gate shutdown protesters blocking traffic across the Bay Area in a massive pro-Palestinian demonstration. We have the latest from the scene after a short break. Whenever news breaks... We are here in Israel, a nation at war, after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back. Let's take a look at some other stories that we're following at this hour. Protesters bring traffic to a halt in the Golden Gate Bridge area of Oakland, California. People demonstrating against the war in Gaza also chained themselves on a barrel sitting in the middle of the roadway. The protest was part of a broader blockade for a free Palestine, a national movement that has also blocked streets in central Philadelphia and Chicago as well. Also, O.J. Simpson will be cremated tomorrow. His brain will not be donated for scientific research. A longtime attorney and executor Exeter to his estate says that Simpson's family did not approve to have his brain studied for CTE, which is a degenerative neurological disease mainly affecting athletes who've suffered repeated concussions and brain injuries. Simpson's final will was filed in Clark County, Nevada on April 12th, just two days after his death. The former NFL star was acquitted of the 1994 murders of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman, who were both found dead at her home in Los Angeles. Also, layoffs are coming to Tesla. CEO Elon Musk cutting out 10% of Tesla's global workforce in order to cut costs amid declining sales and increasing competition. Shares of Tesla have been tumbling, losing about one-third of their value this year. Also, today is Jackie Robinson Day. MLB players and coaches all around the country wearing the baseball legend's uniform number 42 to honor his legacy. He retired when the now Los Angeles Dodgers still played in Brooklyn. He became the first African-American to play in Major League Baseball on this day in 1947. 
All right, it's an important question. Have you filed your taxes yet? Uh, the clock is ticking. Fortunately, it's not too late. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophers has some last-minute tips for you procrastinators on tax day. Alexis? Hey, Kana, you have until midnight tonight to file your taxes and avoid getting hit with penalties and interest, but it's not too late to save on your tax bill. Be sure you're taking all of the credits you qualify for. If you have a child, you may be eligible for a $2,000 tax credit per qualifying child, depending on your income and filing status. Now, not to be confused with the child tax credit is the child and dependent care tax credit. If you paid expenses for daycare, preschool, or another form of caregiving for, say, a spouse or parent who's unable to care for themselves, you might qualify for this credit, which starts at $3,000. And if you paid qualified education expenses for, say, a college student, you may be able to claim a credit of up to $2,500 with the American Opportunity Tax Credit. And if you bought an electric vehicle last year, check to see if it's on the list of EVs that qualify for a credit of up to $7,500. And you have until midnight to make a tax-friendly contribution to your traditional IRA. The max is $6,500, $7,500 if you're 50 or over. And if you know you're going to need more time to file, just go to irs.gov and request an extension, which will get you an additional six months to submit your taxes until October 15th. But an extension to file is not an extension to pay. So if you owe money, you still need to make that payment by tonight. Use your previous year's taxes to help estimate what you owe. And if you can't pay the entire amount right now, just go to irs.gov, set up a payment plan. Now the IRS says if you file electronically and enroll in direct deposit, you should get that refund within 21 days of filing, four weeks if you filed by mail. And this year, the average refund, about $3,000. Kena? All right, Alexis, thank you so much for your expertise. All right, coming up next here, the WNBA draft kicks off just hours from now. Excitement at a fever pitch for superstar Caitlin Clark's draft class, the rising interest in women's sports after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I'm telling you the truth. I mean, they asked you about your marriage and infidelity. The husband is always the top suspect. Always the top suspect. Don't stand up for me. Face that wall. The interrogation tapes tonight on ABC. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? That sounds pretty good. Your health, your money, breaking news, music, and of course, good food. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. I'm Rob Marciano in Tampa, Florida, reporting in Hurricane Adalia. Wherever the weather may take you, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. The WNBA draft kicks off tonight in Brooklyn after that epic championship game between the Iowa Hawkeyes and the South Carolina Gamecocks. It's now the second most watched non-Olympic women's sporting event in U.S. history. Our Faith Abube has more on the rise of popularity in women's sports and the growing trend of sports bars that are celebrating those female athletes. <laughs> It's a rite of passage for any sports fan, catching the big game at your local sports bar. 
And with the popularity of women's sports on the rise, sports bars aren't just for the boys anymore. It's great that this is finally happening and that women's sports are finally getting the, the platform that they deserve. Bars for women's sports popping up across the country, from a bar of their own in Minneapolis to the sports bra in Portland. Women's sports are what everyone's excited about, what everyone's talking about, what everyone is tuning into. Undefeated South Carolina has won its third national championship. The women's NCAA championship game drawing more viewers than the men's final for the first time ever. No one has done more to grow the popularity of this game than Caitlin Clark. Caitlin Clark, the likely number one pick, generating huge crowds. Interest in the game with that number one pick, the Indiana Fever, surging with 13 times as many tickets sold compared to this time last year. It feels really comfortable to walk in a space where you already know that you're going to have some sort of shared interest with the people who are in there. like this one in Minnesota, bar of their own, allowing fans to get a front row seat and witness history. Of course, we're all glued into the WNBA draft this evening, 7.30 Eastern, live on ESPN. Kana. Faith Abube with the assignment of the day. That was awesome. All right, you can tune into the WNBA draft, as she said, tonight at 7.30 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. All right, there's a lot more news ahead here on ABC News Live. And today's big story, the historic start of Donald Trump's hush money trial in New York City, the first time a former president has been tried on criminal charges. I'll speak with Florida Republican Congressman Byron Donalds for his take on the case and how he thinks it will impact Trump's presidential campaign. Also in our spotlight, Israel is weighing a response after that unprecedented Unprecedented retaliatory strike from Iran. More on what the U.S. is saying if Israel chooses to attack back. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The crown in crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all? That's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good morning, America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here, and we got you. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. ABC News, America's number one news source. 
I'm Ken Whitworth here in Los Angeles and today's big story, former President Donald Trump on trial in New York City, where he's facing felony charges related to a hush money payment made to adult film actress Stormy Daniels in 2016. Also, he goes Congressman Byron Donalds for his reaction on today's court proceedings and if the Florida Republican thinks that the case will have any bearing on Trump's 2024 chances. Also in our spotlight, Israel reeling from Iran's retaliatory attack. Officials there say they're weighing a response, but the United State says it'll hold back if Israel chooses force. Now, of course, we begin here with a historic trial in Manhattan, the first criminal trial in history for a former president of the United States. Jury selection began today for the start of Donald Trump's hush money criminal trial. Trump addressed reporters inside the courthouse earlier today, once again blasting the judge and the trial itself. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. Well, the former president has been charged with multiple felonies related to falsifying business records to hide payments made to cover up an alleged affair with adult film star Stormy Daniels right before the 2016 election. Trump has pled not guilty to all charges. And joining me now with more is Republican Congressman from Florida and surrogate for the Trump campaign, Byron Donalds. Thank you so much for being here with us. And look, let's jump right in. We have a lot to go over today. Uh, let's start with us hearing from the former president today uh, as he was walking into the courtroom. He talked about how he believes that this is an assault on America, saying it's political persecution. But from your standpoint right now, are you worried about how Republican or even moderate voters will take all the information from this trial, particularly the accusation that his campaign wasn't honest with voters in 2016. Well, first of all, it's good to be with you. I am not concerned because what voters in our country are going to see is that unless you're an extreme partisan on the Democrat side of the aisle, this case is absolute garbage. This is foolishness. There is no, there is actually no criminality here whatsoever. They're trying to take a misdemeanor bookkeeping charge and then ramp it up to be a felony when the actual agency responsible for looking into campaign finance, the, the Federal Election Commission, looked at this and said there was nothing there. So over the course of this highly publicized uh, trial, the American people are going to see that this is political persecution. This is Alvin Bragg and uh, Judge Mershon grandstanding trying to increase their name ID and increase uh, their popularity in cocktail parties in Manhattan. But it does not matter to the American people. And this is a real stain on the legal system, especially for Manhattan, for the state of New York, but really for the United States of America. This is not the way the justice system is supposed to be used. Well, but let's get your take here on Michael Cohen at the center of this case, right, is these hush money payments that prosecutors say Trump's former fixer, Michael Cohen, was responsible for. He's taken a plea deal. He's working with prosecutors. Do you at this point really believe that Trump was unaware of the bookkeeping related to this case? Michael Cohen was also uh, was also convicted of perjury. So he's a convicted liar. He's had his law license revoked. So in the court of law, every witness that goes in there, that information has got to be made available to the jury as well. But this is important, and this is for the jury that's going to end up be, that's going to end up being picked. You got to decide: Do you want to continue this political charade in the courthouse, or do you want to do the right thing, say not guilty, because there is no underlying crime, even in the indictment that was put forward by Alvin Bragg, there was no underlying crime. This case should be kicked immediately. All right, well, a, length, a very lengthy jury selection process underway right now. But since I have you, I'd like to ask you about the Middle East. I know that you are a member of the House Freedom Caucus. And today, in a statement, the caucus warning Republican leadership not to use the emergency situation in Israel as, quote, bogus justification to ram through Ukraine aid with no offset and no security for our own wide open borders. So first of all, how do you think the speaker will respond? And will you personally vote down any funding that includes aid to Ukraine? Well, let's be very clear on a number of matters. What happened in Israel, um, once again, is an atrocity. Uh, the Biden administration's weakness has led us to this point. But secondarily, the House of Representatives has now passed two different vehicles uh, to actually have aid to Israel. The first one we passed, all we said was we want to fund it by, uh, by paying for it with the IRS agents that Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi wanted to fund to the tune of $80 billion. We wanted to claw back 14 
$15 billion of that to pay for aid to Israel. It passed the House overwhelmingly on a bipartisan basis. Chuck Schumer tabled that measure in the Senate. So the Senate should bring that, that, bring that, uh, that measure up again. They should pass it immediately so Israel gets its aid. Ukraine is a different matter altogether. House Republicans have been very clear on this, that if the White House wants to negotiate on funding Ukraine, they have to first secure the southern border. It is still massively unsecured. It is hurting every major city in our country, every state in our country. The president needs to do his job if he expects to negotiate with Congress. In this emergency situation, as you have called it, what are you looking for in particular when it comes to the border? Oh, it's very simple. We need to halt all, all encounters into our country immediately. The drug cartel is abusing Joe Biden's protocol at the southern border to move 10 million people into this country illegally and then to move millions and millions of pounds of fentanyl into this country, which is killing Americans. So we do need to reinstate Remain in Mexico. We do need to end the parole releases. We need to end cash and release altogether. If people want to claim asylum, they need to claim it in Mexico or in their home country where where there, where there is a U.S. embassy, that's what needs to happen going forward. If the administration just did that very simple, common sense thing, then there would be room to negotiate aid to Ukraine. But they have refused to do so. So if Ukraine falls, that is at the feet of Joe Biden. But why am I surprised? I'm not, because he is the master of disaster and everything has gone wrong under his presidency. In terms of aid, though, to Israel, uh, is it on the table to discuss sending aid to Israel alone? And if Speaker Johnson doesn't consider something like that, do you think that his position might be in danger here? Well, I'm not going to go that far because there's a lot of discussions that are going to happen this week. I firmly believe that what the House should do once again is pass aid to Israel, clean aid. Let's go ahead and pass it, send it over to the Senate, and then Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden are going to have to make a decision. Are they going to side with the radicals within their own party, or are they going to side with the 80 percent of the American people that want to stand by Israel and give them everything that they need to protect their sovereignty and protect their interests? I think that's the issue. In in front of Speaker Johnson, but it's also the issue in front of President Biden and Chuck Schumer. All right, Congressman Donald, I hope that you come back and talk with us as I know that this will be a very busy week. I know you have an important meeting to attend, so I hope we get to talk with you again soon. Thanks for being here. Of course, anytime. Big story to our panel now. So joining us today is our ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host Mike Muse, our former assistant secretary for public affairs at the Department of Homeland Security, Marsha Espinoza, ABC News political contributor, senior editor at The Dispatch, Sarah Isker, and ABC News contributor and trial attorney at Hamilton Clark, Brian Buckmeyer. So thank you all for being here with us. Brian, let's start here with you. Look, I know it hasn't been all sorted out yet in terms of Trump and this hush money trial and if he will take the stand, if he will in fact testify. What did you make of that Sandoval hearing this morning, and where do you think they'll go with that? So the Sandoval hearing is a hearing that happens in every criminal case where the defense gets